Chapter 8 Seven Years' War, 1756-1763 England's overwhelming power and conquests on the seas, in North America, Europe, and East and West Indies. Sea battles, Bing off Menorca, Hawk and Conflans, Pocock and Datch in East Indies. The urgency with which peace was desired by the principal parties to the war of the Austrian succession may perhaps be inferred from the neglect to settle definitely and conclusively many of the questions outstanding between them. And notably the very disputes about which the war between England and Spain began. It seems as though the powers feared to treat thoroughly matters that contained the germs of future quarrels, lest the discussion should prolong the war that then existed. England made peace because the fall of Holland was otherwise inevitable, not because she had enforced, or surrendered, her claims of 1739 against Spain. The right of uninterrupted navigation in West Indian seas, free from any search, was left undetermined, as were other kindred matters. Not only so, but the boundaries between the English and French colonies in the Valley of the Ohio, toward Canada, and on the land side of the Nova Scotian Peninsula, remained as vague as they had before been. It was plain that peace could not last. And by it, if she had saved Holland, England surrendered the control of the sea which she had won. The true character of the strife, shrouded for a moment by the Continental War, was revealed by the so-called peace. Though formally allayed, the contention continued in every part of the world. In India, Duplex, no longer able to attack the English openly, sought to undermine their power by the line of policy already described. Mingling adroitly in the quarrels of surrounding princes, and advancing his own power while so doing, he attained by rapid steps to the political control, in 1751, of the southern extremity of India, a country nearly as large as France. Given the title of Nabob, he now had a place among the princes of the land. A merely commercial policy was in his eyes a delusion, there could be no middle course between conquest and abandonment. In the course of the same year further grants extended the French power through extensive regions to the north and east, embracing all the coast of Orissa, and made Duplex ruler of a third of India. To celebrate his triumphs, perhaps also in accordance with his policy of impressing the native mind, he now founded a town and put up a pillar setting forth his successes. But his doings caused the directors of the company only disquietude. Instead of the reinforcements he asked for they sent him exhortations to peace, and at about this time Robert Clive, then but twenty-six years old, began to show his genius. The success of Duplex and his allies became checkered with reverses. The English under Clive's leadership supported the native opponents of the French. The company at home was but little interested in his political schemes, and was annoyed at the failure of dividends. Negotiations were opened at London for a settlement of difficulties, and Duplex was summoned home, the English government, it is said, making his recall an absolute condition of continued peace. Two days after his departure, in 1754, his successor signed a treaty with the English governor, wholly abandoning his policy, stipulating that neither company should interfere in the internal politics of India and that all possessions acquired during the war in the Carnatic should be given back to the Mughal. What France thus surrendered was in extent and population an empire, and the mortification of French historians has branded the concession as ignominious. But how could the country have been held, with the English navy cutting off the eagerly desired reinforcements? In North America, the declaration of peace was followed by renewed agitation, which sprang from and betokened the deep feeling and keen sense of the situation had by the colonists and local authorities on either side. The Americans held to their points with the stubbornness of their race. There is no repose for our thirteen colonies, wrote Franklin, so long as the French are masters of Canada. The rival claims to the central unsettled region, which may accurately enough be called the Valley of the Ohio, involved, if the English were successful, the military separation of Canada from Louisiana. While on the other hand, occupation by the French, linking the two extremes of their acknowledged possessions, would shut up the English colonists between the Allegheny Mountains and the sea. The issues were apparent enough to leading Americans of that day, though they were more far-reaching than the wisest of them could have foreseen. There is room for curious speculation as to the effect, not only upon America, but upon the whole world, 
if the French government had had the will, and the French people the genius. Effectively to settle and hold the northern and western regions which they then claimed. But while Frenchmen upon the spot saw clearly enough the coming contest and the terrible disadvantage of unequal numbers and inferior navy under which Canada must labor. The home government was blind alike to the value of the colony and to the fact that it must be fought for. While the character and habits of the French settlers, lacking in political activity and in use to begin and carry through measures for the protection of their own interests, did not remedy the neglect of the mother country. The paternal centralizing system of French rule had taught the colonists to look to the mother country, and then failed to take care of them. The governors of Canada of that day acted as careful and able military men, doing what they could to supply defects and weaknesses, it is possible that their action was more consistent and well-planned than that of the English governors. But with the carelessness of both home governments, nothing in the end could take the place of the capacity of the English colonists to look out for themselves. It is odd and amusing to read the conflicting statements of English and French historians as to the purposes and aims of the opposing statesmen in these years when the first murmurings of the storm were heard. The simple truth seems to be that one of those conflicts familiarly known to us as irrepressible was at hand, and that both governments would gladly have avoided it. The boundaries might be undetermined, the English colonists were not. The French governors established posts where they could on the debatable ground, and it was in the course of a dispute over one of these, in 1754, that the name of Washington first appears in history. Other troubles occurred in Nova Scotia, and both home governments then began to awake. In 1755 Braddock's disastrous expedition was directed against Fort Duquesne, now Pittsburgh, where Washington had surrendered the year before. Later in the year another collision between the English and French colonists happened near Lake George. Although Braddock's expedition had been first to start, the French government was also moving. In May of the same year a large squadron of ships of war, mostly armed and flute, sailed from Brest with 3,000 troops, and a new governor, de Vaudrill, for Canada. Admiral Boscoen had already preceded this fleet, and lay in wait for it off the mouth of the St. Lawrence. There was as yet no open war, and the French were certainly within their rights in sending a garrison to their own colonies. But Boscoen's orders were to stop them. A fog which scattered the French squadron also covered its passage, but two of the ships were seen by the English fleet and captured, June 8, 1755. As soon as this news reached Europe, the French ambassador to London was recalled, but still no declaration of war followed. In July, Sir Edward Hawke was sent to sea with orders to cruise between Ushant and Cape Finisterre, and to seize any French ships of the line he might see. To which were added in August further orders to take all French ships of every kind, men of war, privateers, and merchantmen, and to send them into English ports. Before the end of the year, 300 trading vessels, valued at $6 million, had been captured, and 6,000 French seamen were imprisoned in England enough to man nearly ten ships of the line. All this was done while nominal peace still existed. War was not declared until six months later. France still seemed to submit, but she was biding her time, and preparing warily a severe stroke for which she had now ample provocation. Small squadrons, or detachments of ships, continued to be sent to the West Indies and to Canada, while noisy preparations were made in the dockyard of Brest, and troops assembled upon the shores of the Channel. England saw herself threatened with invasion, a menace to which her people have been peculiarly susceptible. The government of the day, weak at best, was singularly unfit for waging war, and easily misled as to the real danger. Besides, England was embarrassed, as always at the beginning of a war, not only by the numerous points she had to protect in addition to her commerce, but also by the absence of a large number of her seamen in trading vessels all over the world. The Mediterranean was therefore neglected. And the French, while making loud demonstrations on the channel, quietly equipped at Toulon twelve ships of the line, which sailed on the 10th of April, 1756, under Admiral La Galissonier. Convoying 150 transports with 15,000 troops, commanded by the Duke of Richelieu. A week later the army was safely landed in Menorca, and Port Mahone invested, while the fleet established itself in blockade before the harbour. 
practically this was a complete surprise. For though the suspicions of the English government had been at last aroused, its action came too late. The garrison had not been reinforced and numbered a scant 3,000 men, from which 35 officers were absent on leave, among them the governor and the colonels of all the regiments. Admiral Bing sailed from Portsmouth with ten ships of the line only three days before the French left Toulon. Six weeks later, when he reached the neighborhood of Port Mahon, his fleet had been increased to thirteen ships of the line, and he had with him four thousand troops. It was already late. A practicable breach had been made in the fortress a week before. When the English fleet came in sight, La Galissonier stood out to meet it and bar the entrance to the harbor. The battle that followed owes its historical celebrity wholly to the singular and tragic event which arose from it. Unlike Matthews's battle off Toulon, it does afford some tactical instruction, though mainly applicable to the obsolete conditions of warfare under sail. But it is especially linked to the earlier action through the effect produced upon the mind of the unfortunate Bing by the sentence of the court-martial upon Matthews. During the course of the engagement he repeatedly alluded to the censure upon that admiral for leaving the line, and seems to have accepted the judgment as justifying, if not determining, his own course. Briefly, it may be said that the two fleets, having sighted each other on the morning of the 20th of May, were found after a series of maneuvers both on the port tack, with an easterly wind, heading southerly, the French to leeward. Between the English and the harbour. Bing ran down in line ahead off the wind, the French remaining by it, so that when the former made the signal to engage, the fleets were not parallel, but formed an angle of from 30 to 40 degrees, plate VIIA. A. A. The attack which Bing by his own account meant to make, each ship against its opposite in the enemy's line, difficult to carry out under any circumstances. Was here further impeded by the distance between the two rears being much greater than that between the vans. So that his whole line could not come into action at the same moment. When the signal was made, the van ships kept away in obedience to it, and ran down for the French so nearly head on, b, b, as to sacrifice their artillery fire in great measure. They received three raking broadsides, and were seriously dismantled aloft. The sixth English ship, counting from the van, had her foretopmast shot away, flew up into the wind, and came aback, stopping and doubling up the rear of the line. Then undoubtedly was the time for Bing, having committed himself to the fight, to have set the example and borne down, just as Farragut did at Mobile when his line was confused by the stopping of the next ahead. But according to the testimony of the flag captain, Matthews's sentence deterred him. You see, Captain Gardiner, that the signal for the line is out, and that I am ahead of the ships Louisa and Trident, which in the order should have been ahead of him. You would not have me, as the admiral of the fleet, run down as if I were going to engage a single ship. It was Mr. Matthews's misfortune to be prejudiced by not carrying down his force together, which I shall endeavor to avoid. The affair thus became entirely indecisive, the English van was separated from the rear and got the brunt of the fight, c. One French authority blames Galissonier for not tacking to windward of the enemy's van and crushing it. Another says he ordered the movement, but that it could not be made from the damage to the rigging. But this seems improbable, as the only injury the French squadron underwent aloft was the loss of one topsail yard, whereas the English suffered very badly. The true reason is probably that given and approved by one of the French authorities on naval warfare. Galissonier considered the support of the land attack on Mahone paramount to any destruction of the English fleet, if he thereby exposed his own. The French navy has always preferred the glory of assuring or preserving a conquest to that more brilliant perhaps, but actually less real, of taking some ships, and therein has approached more nearly the true end that has been proposed in war. The justice of this conclusion depends upon the view that is taken of the true end of naval war. If it is merely to assure one or more positions ashore, the navy becomes simply a branch of the army for a particular occasion, and subordinates its action accordingly. But if the true end is to preponderate over the enemy's navy and so control the sea, then the enemy's ships and fleets are the true objects to be assailed on all occasions. A glimmer of this view seems to have been present to Morogues when he wrote that at sea there is no field of battle to be held, 
nor places to be won. If naval warfare is a war of posts, then the action of the fleets must be subordinate to the attack and defense of the posts. If its object is to break up the enemy's power on the sea, cutting off his communications with the rest of his possessions, drying up the sources of his wealth in his commerce, and making possible a closure of his ports. Then the object of attack must be his organized military forces afloat. In short, his navy. It is to the latter course, for whatever reason adopted, that England owed a control of the sea that forced the restitution of Menorca at the end of this war. It is to the former that France owed the lack of prestige in her navy. Take this very case of Menorca, had Galissonier been beaten, Richelieu and his 15,000 troops must have been lost to France, cooped up in Menorca, as the Spaniards, in 1718, were confined to Sicily. The French navy therefore assured the capture of the island. But so slight was the impression on the ministry and the public, that a French naval officer tells us, incredible as it may seem, the minister of marine, after the glorious affair off Mahon. Instead of yielding to the zeal of an enlightened patriotism and profiting by the impulse which this victory gave to France to build up the navy, saw fit to sell the ships and rigging which we still had in our ports. We shall soon see the deplorable consequences of this cowardly conduct on the part of our statesmen. Neither the glory nor the victory is very apparent. But it is quite conceivable that had the French admiral thought less of Mahone and used the great advantage luck had given him to take, or sink, for a five of the enemy. The French people would have anticipated the outbreak of naval enthusiasm which appeared too late, in 1760. During the remainder of this war the French fleets, except in the East Indies, appear only as the pursued in a general chase. The action imposed upon the French fleets was, however, consistent with the general policy of the French government. And John Clerk was probably right in saying that there is apparent in this action off Menorca a tactics too well defined to be merely accidental, a tactics essentially defensive in its scope and aim. In assuming the lee gauge the French admiral not only covered Mahon, but took a good defensive position, imposing upon his enemy the necessity of attacking with all the consequent risks. Clerk seems to bring evidence enough to prove that the leading French ships did, after roughly handling their assailants, astutely withdraw, c, thus forcing the latter to attack again with like results. The same policy was repeatedly followed during the American War twenty years later, and with pretty uniform success. So much so that, although formal avowal of the policy is wanting, it may be concluded that circumspection, economy, defensive war, remain the fixed purpose of the French authorities, based doubtless upon the reasons given by Admiral Grivel. Of that navy. If two maritime powers are at strife, the one that has the fewest ships must always avoid doubtful engagements. It must run only those risks necessary for carrying out its missions, avoid action by maneuvering, or at worst, if forced to engage, assure itself of favorable conditions. The attitude to be taken should depend radically upon the power of your opponent. Let us not tire of repeating, according as she has to do with an inferior or superior power, France has before her two distinct strategies, radically opposite both in means and ends, grand war and cruising war. Such a formal utterance by an officer of rank must be received with respect, and the more so when it expresses a consistent policy followed by a great and warlike nation. Yet it may be questioned whether a sea power worthy of the name can thus be secured. Logically, it follows from the position assumed, that combats between equal forces are to be discouraged, because the loss to you is greater than the loss to your opponent. In fact, says Ramachuel, upholding the French policy, of what consequence to the English would be the loss of a few ships. But the next inevitable step in the argument is that it is better not to meet the enemy. As another Frenchman, previously quoted, says, it was considered a mishap to their ships to fall in with a hostile force, and, if one was met, their duty was to avoid action if possible to do so honorably. They had ulterior objects of more importance than fighting the enemy's navy. Such a course cannot be consistently followed for years without affecting the spirit and tone of the officers charged with it. And it led directly to as brave a man as ever commanded a fleet, the Comte de Grasse, failing to crush the English under Rodney when he had the chance, in 1782. 
On the 9th of April of that year, being chased by the English among the Windward Islands, it happened to him to have sixteen of their fleet under his lee while the main body was becalmed under Dominica. Though greatly superior to the separated ships, during the three hours that this state of things lasted, de Grasse left them undisturbed, except by a distant cannonade by his own van. And his action was justified by the court which tried him, in which were many officers of high rank and doubtless of distinction, as being an act of prudence on the part of the admiral, dictated to him by the ulterior projects of the crews. Three days later he was signally beaten by the fleet he had failed to attack at disadvantage, and all the ulterior projects of the crews went down with him. To return to Menorca. After the action of the 20th, Bing called a council of war, which decided that nothing more could be done, and that the English fleet should go to Gibraltar and cover that place from an attack. At Gibraltar, Bing was relieved by Hawk and sent home to be tried. The court-martial, while expressly clearing him of cowardice or disaffection, found him guilty of not doing his utmost either to defeat the French fleet or to relieve the garrison at Mahone. And, as the article of war prescribed death with no alternative punishment for this offence, it felt compelled to sentence him to death. The king refused to pardon, and Bing was accordingly shot. The expedition against Menorca was begun while nominal peace still lasted. On the 17th of May, three days before Bing's battle, England declared war, and France replied on the 20th of June. On the 28th, Port Mahone surrendered and Menorca passed into the hands of France. The nature of the troubles between the two nations, and the scenes where they occurred, pointed out clearly enough the proper theatre of the strife, and we should by rights now be at the opening of a sea war. Illustrated by great naval actions and attended with great modifications in the colonial and foreign possessions of the two powers. Of the two, England alone recognised the truth. France was again turned aside from the sea by causes which will shortly be given. Her fleet scarcely appeared. And losing the control of the sea, she surrendered one by one her colonies and all her hopes in India. Later in the struggle she drew in Spain as her ally, but it was only to involve that country in her own external ruin. England, on the other hand, defended and nourished by the sea, rode it everywhere in triumph. Secure and prosperous at home, she supported with her money the enemies of France. At the end of seven years the Kingdom of Great Britain had become the British Empire. It is far from certain that France could have successfully contended with England on the sea, without an ally. In 1756 the French navy had 63 ships of the line, of which 45 were in fair condition, but equipments and artillery were deficient. Spain had 46 ships of the line. But from the previous and subsequent performances of the Spanish navy, it may well be doubted if its worth were equal to its numbers. England at this time had 130 ships of the line. Four years later she had 120 actually in commission. Of course, when a nation allows its inferiority, whether on land or sea, to become as great as that of France now was, it cannot hope for success. Nevertheless, she obtained advantages at first. The conquest of Menorca was followed in November of the same year by the acquisition of Corsica. The Republic of Genoa surrendered to France all the fortified harbours of the island. With Toulon, Corsica, and Port Mahone, she now had a strong grip on the Mediterranean. In Canada, the operations of 1756, under Montcalm, were successful despite the inferiority of numbers. At the same time an attack by a native prince in India took from the English Calcutta, and gave an opportunity to the French. Yet another incident offered a handle for French statesmanship to strengthen her position on the ocean. The Dutch had promised France not to renew their alliance with England, but to remain neutral. England retaliated by declaring all the ports of France in a state of blockade, and all vessels bound to those ports liable to seizure as lawful prize. Such a violation of the rights of neutrals can only be undertaken by a nation that feels it has nothing to fear from their rising against it. The aggressiveness, born of the sense of power, which characterized England might have been used by France to draw Spain and possibly other states into alliance against her. Instead of concentrating against England, France began another continental war, this time with a new and extraordinary alliance. 
The Empress of Austria, working on the religious superstitions of the king and upon the anger of the king's mistress, who was piqued at sarcasms uttered against her by Frederick the Great, drew France into an alliance with Austria against Prussia. This alliance was further joined by Russia, Sweden and Poland. The Empress urged that the two Roman Catholic powers should unite to take Silesia away from a Protestant king, and expressed her willingness to give to France a part of her possessions in the Netherlands, which France had always desired. Frederick the Great, learning the combination against him, instead of waiting for it to develop, put his armies in motion and invaded Saxony, whose ruler was also king of Poland. This movement, in October, 1756, began the Seven Years' War. Which, like the War of the Austrian Succession, but not to the same extent, drew some of the contestants off from the original cause of difference. But while France, having already on hand one large quarrel with her neighbor across the Channel, was thus needlessly entering upon another struggle. With the avowed end of building up that Austrian empire which a wiser policy had long striven to humble, England this time saw clearly where her true interests lay. Making the Continental War wholly subsidiary, she turned her efforts upon the sea and the colonies. At the same time supporting Frederick both with money and cordial sympathy in the war for the defense of his kingdom, which so seriously diverted and divided the efforts of France. England thus had really but one war on hand. In the same year the direction of the struggle was taken from the hands of a weak ministry and given in to those of the bold and ardent William Pitt, who retained his office till 1761, by which time the ends of the war had practically been secured. In the attack upon Canada there were two principal lines to be chosen, that by the way of Lake Champlain, and that by the way of the St. Lawrence. The former was entirely inland, and as such does not concern our subject, beyond noting that not till after the fall of Quebec, in 1759, was it fairly opened to the English. In 1757 the attempt against Louisbourg failed. The English admiral being unwilling to engage sixteen ships of the line he found there, with the fifteen under his own command, which were also, he said, of inferior metal. Whether he was right in his decision or not, the indignation felt in England clearly shows the difference of policy underlying the action of the French and English governments. The following year an admiral of a higher spirit, Boscoen, was sent out accompanied with 12,000 troops, and, it must in fairness be said, found only five ships in the port. The troops were landed, while the fleet covered the siege from the only molestation it could fear, and cut off from the besieged the only line by which they could look for supplies. The island fell in 1758, opening the way by the St. Lawrence to the heart of Canada, and giving the English a new base both for the fleet and army. The next year the expedition under Wolfe was sent against Quebec. All his operations were based upon the fleet, which not only carried his army to the spot, but moved up and down the river as the various feints required. The landing which led to the decisive action was made directly from the ships. Montcalm, whose skill and determination had blocked the attacks by way of Lake Champlain the two previous years, had written urgently for reinforcements. But they were refused by the Minister of War, who replied that in addition to other reasons it was too probable that the English would intercept them on the way, and that the more France sent, the more England would be moved to send. In a word, the possession of Canada depended upon sea power. Montcalm, therefore, in view of the certain attack upon Quebec by the river, was compelled to weaken his resistance on the Champlain route. Nevertheless, the English did not get farther than the foot of the lake that year, and their operations, though creditable, had no effect upon the result at Quebec. In 1760, the English, holding the course of the St. Lawrence, with Louisbourg at one end and Quebec at the other, seemed firmly seated. Nevertheless, the French governor, de Vaudreuil, still held out at Montreal, and the colonists still hoped for help from France. The English garrison at Quebec, though inferior in numbers to the forces of the Canadians, was imprudent enough to leave the city and meet them in the open field. Defeated there, and pursued by the enemy, the latter nearly entered Quebec pell-mell with the English troops, and trenches were opened against the city. A few days later an English squadron came in sight, and the place was relieved. Thus, says the old English chronicler of the navy, 
the enemy saw what it was to be inferior at sea, for, had a French squadron got the start of the English in sailing up the river, Quebec must have fallen. Wholly cut off now, the little body of Frenchmen that remained in Montreal was surrounded by three English armies, which had come, one by way of Lake Champlain, the others from Oswego and from Quebec. The surrender of the city on the 8th of September, 1760, put an end forever to the French possession of Canada. In all other quarters of the world, after the accession of Pitt to power, the same good fortune followed the English arms, checkered only at the first by some slight reverses. It was not so on the continent, where the heroism and skill of Frederick the Great maintained with difficulty his brilliant struggle against France, Austria, and Russia. The study of the difficulties of his position, of the military and political combinations attending it, do not belong to our subject. Sea power does not appear directly in its effects upon the struggle, but indirectly it was felt in two ways, first, by the subsidies which the abundant wealth and credit of England enabled her to give Frederick, in whose thrifty and able hands they went far, and second, in the embarrassment caused to France by the attacks of England upon her colonies and her own sea coast, in the destruction of her commerce, and in the money, all too little, it is true, and grudgingly given, which France was forced to bestow on her navy. Stung by the constant lashing of the power of the sea, France, despite the blindness and unwillingness of the rulers, was driven to undertake something against it. With a navy much inferior, unable to cope in all quarters of the world, it was rightly decided to concentrate upon one object, and the object chosen was Great Britain itself, whose shores were to be invaded. This decision, soon apprehended by the fears of the English nation, caused the great naval operations to center for some years around the coast of France and in the Channel. Before describing them, it will be well to sum up the general plan by which England was guided in the use of her overwhelming sea power. Besides the operations on the North American continent already described, this plan was fourfold. 1. The French Atlantic ports were watched in force, especially Brest, so as to keep the great fleets or small squadrons from getting out without fighting. 2. Attacks were made upon the Atlantic and Channel coasts with flying squadrons, followed at times by the descent of small bodies of troops. These attacks, the direction of which could not be foreseen by the enemy, were chiefly intended to compel him to keep on hand forces at many points, and so to diminish the army acting against the King of Prussia. While the tendency would certainly be that way, it may be doubted whether the actual diversion in favor of Frederick was of much consequence. No particular mention will be made of these operations, which had but little visible effect upon the general course of the war. 3. A fleet was kept in the Mediterranean and near Gibraltar to prevent the French Toulon fleet from getting round to the Atlantic. It does not appear that any attempt was seriously made to stop communications between France and Menorca. The action of the Mediterranean fleet, though an independent command, was subsidiary to that in the Atlantic. 4. Distant foreign expeditions were sent against the French colonies in the West India Islands and on the coast of Africa, and a squadron was maintained in the East Indies to secure the control of those seas. Thereby supporting the English in the peninsula, and cutting off the communications of the French. These operations in distant waters, never intermitted, assumed greater activity in larger proportions after the destruction of the French navy had relieved England from the fear of invasion, and when the ill-advised entrance of Spain into the war. In 1762, offered yet richer prizes to her enterprise. The close blockade of the enemy's fleet in Brest, which was first systematically carried out during this war, may be considered rather a defensive than an offensive operation. For though the intention certainly was to fight if opportunity offered, the chief object was to neutralize an offensive weapon in the enemy's hands, the destruction of the weapon was secondary. The truth of this remark is shown by the outburst of fear and anger which swept over England and an unavoidable absence of the blockading fleet in 1759 allowed the French to escape. The effect of the blockade in this and after wars was to keep the French in a state of constant inferiority in the practical handling of their ships, however fair showing their outward appearance or equal their numerical force. The position of the port of Brest was such that a blockaded fleet could not get out during the heavy westerly gales that endangered the blockaders. 
The latter, therefore, had the habit of running away from them to Torbay or Plymouth, sure, with care, of getting back to their station with an east wind before a large and ill-handled fleet could get much start of them. In the latter part of 1758, France, depressed by the sense of failure upon the continent, mortified and harassed by English descents upon her coasts, which had been particularly annoying that year. And seeing that it was not possible to carry on both the continental and sea wars with her money resources, determined to strike directly at England. Her commerce was annihilated while the enemies throve. It was the boast of London merchants that under pit commerce was united with and made to flourish by war. And this thriving commerce was the soul also of the land struggle, by the money it lavished on the enemy of France. At this time a new and active-minded minister, Choiseul, was called into power by Louis XV. From the beginning of 1759, preparations were made in the ocean and channel ports. Flat boats to transport troops were built at Haver, Dunkirk, Brest, and Roquefort. It was intended to embark as many as 50,000 men for the invasion of England, while 12,000 were to be directed upon Scotland. Two squadrons were fitted out, each of respectable strength, one at Toulon, the other at Brest. The junction of these two squadrons at Brest was the first step in the great enterprise. It was just here that it broke down, through the possession of Gibraltar by the English, and their naval superiority. It seems incredible that even the stern and confident William Pitt should, as late as 1757, have offered to surrender to Spain the watchtower from which England overlooks the road between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. As the price of her help to recover Menorca. Happily for England, Spain refused. In 1759, Admiral Boscoen commanded the English Mediterranean fleet. In making an attack upon French frigates in Toulon roads, some of his ships were so damaged that he sailed with his whole squadron to Gibraltar to refit. Taking the precaution, however, to station lookout frigates at intervals, and to arrange signals by guns to notify him betimes of the enemy's approach. Taking advantage of his absence, and in obedience to orders, the French Commodore, de la Clue, left Toulon with twelve ships of the line on the 5th of August, and on the 17th found himself at the Straits of Gibraltar. With a brisk east wind carrying him out into the Atlantic. Everything seemed propitious, a thick haze and falling night concealing the French ships from the land, while not preventing their sight of each other, when an English frigate loomed up in the near distance. As soon as she saw the fleet, knowing they must be enemies, she hauled in for the land and began firing signal guns. Pursuit was useless, flight alone remained. Hoping to elude the chase he knew must follow, the French Commodore steered west-northwest for the open sea, putting out all lights. But either from carelessness or disaffection, for the latter is hinted by one French naval officer, five out of the twelve ships headed to the northward and put into Cadiz when on the following morning they could not see the Commodore. The latter was dismayed when at daylight he saw his forces thus diminished. At eight o'clock some sails made their appearance, and for a few minutes he hoped they were the missing ships. Instead of that, they were the lookouts of Boscoen's fleet, which, numbering fourteen ships of the line, was in full pursuit. The French formed their order on one of the close-hauled lines, and fled. But of course their fleet speed was less than that of the fastest English ships. The general rule for all chases where the pursuer is decidedly superior, namely, that order must be observed only so far as to keep the leading ships within reasonable supporting distance of the slower ones. So that they may not be singly overpowered before the latter can come up, was by this time well understood in the English navy, and that is certainly the fitting time for a melee. Boscoen acted accordingly. The rear ship of the French, on the other hand, nobly emulated the example of Letendware when he saved his convoy. Overtaken at two o'clock by the leading English ship, and soon after surrounded by four others, her captain made for five hours a desperate resistance, from which he could hope, not to save himself. But to delay the enemies long enough for the better sailors to escape. He so far succeeded that, thanks to the injury done by him and their better speed, they did that day escape action at close quarters, which could only have ended in their capture. When he hauled down his flag, his three topmasts were gone, the mizzenmast fell immediately after, 
and the hull was so full of water that the ship was with difficulty kept afloat. M. De Sabrin, his name is worthy to be remembered, had received eleven wounds in this gallant resistance, by which he illustrated so signally the duty and service of a rear guard in retarding pursuit. That night two of the French ships hauled off to the westward, and so escaped. The other four continued their flight as before. But the next morning the Commodore, despairing of escape, headed for the Portuguese coast, and ran them all ashore between Lagos and Cape St. Vincent. The English admiral followed and attacked them, taking two and burning the others, without regard to the neutrality of Portugal. For this insult no amend was made beyond a formal apology. Portugal was too dependent upon England to be seriously considered. Pitt, writing to the English minister to Portugal about the affair, told him that while soothing the susceptibilities of the Portuguese government he must not allow it to suppose that either the ships would be given up or the distinguished admiral censured. The destruction or dispersal of the Toulon fleet stopped the invasion of England, though the five ships that got into Cadiz remained a matter of anxiety to Sir Edward Hawke, who cruised before Brest. Choiseul, balked of his main object, still clung to the invasion of Scotland. The French fleet at Brest, under Marshal de Conflans, a sea officer despite his title, numbered twenty sail of the line, besides frigates. The troops to be embarked are variously stated at fifteen to twenty thousand. The original purpose was to escort the transports with only five ships of the line, besides smaller vessels. Conflans insisted that the whole fleet ought to go. The Minister of the Navy thought that the Admiral was not a sufficiently skillful tactician to be able to check the advance of an enemy. And so ensure the safe arrival of the convoy at its destination near the Clyde without risking a decisive encounter. Believing therefore that there would be a general action, he considered that it would be better to fight it before the troops sailed, for if disastrous, the convoy would not be sacrificed, and if decisively victorious, the road would then be clear. The transports were assembled, not at Brest, but in the ports to the southward as far as the mouth of the lawyer. The French fleet therefore put to sea with the expectation and purpose of fighting the enemy. But it is not easy to reconcile its subsequent course with that purpose, nor with the elaborate fighting instructions issued by the admiral before sailing. About the 5th or 6th of November there came on a tremendous westerly gale. After buffeting it for three days, Hawk bore up and ran into Torbay, where he waited for the wind to shift, keeping his fleet in readiness to sail at once. The same gale, while keeping back the French already in Brest, gave the chance to a small squadron under M. Bompart, which was expected from the West Indies, to slip in during Hawk's absence. Conflans made his preparations with activity, distributed Bompart's crews among his own ships, which were not very well manned, and got to sea with an easterly wind on the 14th. He stood at once to the southward, flattering himself that he had escaped Hawk. The latter, however, had sailed from Torbay on the 12th, and though again driven back, sailed a second time on the 14th, the same day that Conflans left Brest. He soon readied his station, learned that the enemy had been seen to the southward steering east, and easily concluding that they were bound to Quiberon Bay, shaped his own course for the same place under a press of sail. At 11 p.m. of the 19th the French admiral estimated his position to be 70 miles southwest by west from Belle Isle. And the wind springing up fresh from the westward, he stood for it under short sail, the wind continuing to increase and hauling to west-northwest. At daybreak several ships were seen ahead, which proved to be the English squadron of Commodore Duff, blockading Quiberon. The signal was made to chase. And the English, taking flight, separated into two divisions, one going off before the wind, the other hauling up to the southward. The greater part of the French fleet continued its course after the former division, that is, toward the coast. But one ship hauled up for the second. Immediately after, the rear French ships made signal of sails to windward, which were also visible from aloft on board the flagship. It must have been about the same moment that the lookout frigate in advance of the English fleet informed her admiral of sails to leeward. Hawke's diligence had brought him up with Conflans, who, in his official reports, says he had considered it impossible that the enemy could have in that neighborhood forces superior or even equal to his own. 
Conflans now ordered his rear division to haul its wind in support of the ship chasing to the southward and eastward. In a few moments more it was discovered that the fleet to windward numbered 23 ships of the line to the French 21, and among them some three-deckers. Conflans then called in the chasing ships and got ready for action. It remained to settle his course under circumstances which he had not foreseen. It was now blowing hard from the west-northwest, with every appearance of heavy weather, the fleet not far from a lee shore, with an enemy considerably superior in numbers, for besides Hawks 23 of the line, Duff had four fifty-gun ships. Conflans therefore determined to run for it and lead his squadron into Quiberon Bay, trusting and believing that Hawk would not dare to follow, under the conditions of the weather. Into a bay which French authorities describe as containing banks and shoals, and lined with reefs which the navigator rarely sees without fright and never passes without emotion. It was in the midst of these ghastly dangers that forty-four large ships were about to engage pell-mell, for the space was too contracted for fleet maneuvers. Conflans flattered himself that he would get in first and be able to haul up close under the western shore of the bay, forcing the enemy, if he followed, to take position between him and the beach, six miles to leeward. None of his expectations were fulfilled. In the retreat he took the head of his fleet. A step not unjustifiable, since only by leading in person could he have shown just what he wanted to do, but unfortunate for his reputation with the public, as it placed the admiral foremost in the flight. Hawk was not in the least, nor for one moment, deterred by the dangers before him, whose full extent he, as a skillful seaman, entirely realized. But his was a calm and steadfast as well as a gallant temper, that weighed risks justly, neither dissembling nor exaggerating. He has not left us his reasoning, but he doubtless felt that the French, leading, would serve partially as pilots, and must take the ground before him. He believed the temper and experience of his officers, tried by the severe school of the blockade, to be superior to those of the French. And he knew that both the government and the country demanded that the enemy's fleet should not reach another friendly port in safety. On the very day that he was thus following the French, amid dangers and under conditions that have made this one of the most dramatic of sea fights, he was being burnt in effigy in England for allowing them to escape. As Conflans, leading his fleet, was rounding the cardinals, as the southernmost rocks at the entrance of Quiberon Bay are called, the leading English ships brought the French rear to action. It was another case of a general chase ending in a melee, but under conditions of exceptional interest and grandeur from the surrounding circumstances of the gale of wind, the heavy sea, the lee shore, the headlong speed, shortened canvas. And the great number of ships engaged. One French 74, closely pressed and outnumbered, ventured to open her lower deck ports, the sea sweeping and carried her down with all on board but twenty men. Another was sunk by the fire of Hawke's flagship. Two others, one of which carried a Commodore's pennant, struck their colors. The remainder were dispersed. Seven fled to the northward and eastward, and anchored off the mouth of the little river Villain, into which they succeeded in entering at the top of high water in two tides, a feat never before performed. Seven others took refuge to the southward and eastward in Roquefort. One, after being very badly injured, ran ashore and was lost near the mouth of the lawyer. The flagship bearing the same name as that of Tourville burned at La Hogue, the Royal Sun, anchored at nightfall off Croizic, a little to the northward of the lawyer, where she rode in safety during the night. The next morning the admiral found himself alone, and, somewhat precipitately it would seem, ran the ship ashore to keep her out of English hands. This step has been blamed by the French, but needlessly, as Hawk would never have let her get away. The great French fleet was annihilated, for the fourteen ships not taken or destroyed were divided into two parts, and those in the Villain only succeeded in escaping, two at a time, between fifteen months and two years later. The English lost two ships which ran upon a shoal, a, and were hopelessly wrecked, their losses in action were slight. At nightfall Hawk anchored his fleet and prizes in the position shown in the plate, b. pl. 8. All possibility of an invasion of England passed away with the destruction of the Brest fleet. The Battle of November 20, 1759, was the Trafalgar of this war. 
And though a blockade was maintained over the fractions that were laid up in the Villain and at Roquefort, the English fleets were now free to act against the colonies of France, and later of Spain, on a grander scale than ever before. The same year that saw this great sea fight and the fall of Quebec witnessed also the capture of Guadeloupe in the West Indies, of Gori on the west coast of Africa. And the abandonment of the East Indian seas by the French flag after three indecisive actions between their Commodore, Datch, and Admiral Pocock, an abandonment which necessarily led to the fall of the French power in India, never again to rise. In this year also the King of Spain died, and his brother succeeded, under the title of Charles III. This Charles had been King of Naples at the time when an English Commodore had allowed one hour for the court to determine to withdraw the Neapolitan troops from the Spanish army. He had never forgotten this humiliation, and brought to his new throne a heart unfriendly to England. With such feelings on his part, France and Spain drew more readily together. Charles's first step was to propose mediation, but Pitt was averse to it. Looking upon France as the chief enemy of England, and upon the sea and the colonies as the chief source of power and wealth, he wished, now that he had her down, to weaken her thoroughly for the future as well as the present. And to establish England's greatness more firmly upon the wreck. Later on he offered certain conditions, but the influence of Louis's mistress, attached to the Empress of Austria, prevailed to accept Prussia from the negotiations, and England would not allow the exception. Pitt, indeed, was not yet ready for peace. A year later, October 25, 1760, George II. died, and Pitt's influence then began to wane, the new king being less bent on war. During these years, 1759 and 1760, Frederick the Great still continued the deadly and exhausting strife of his small kingdom against the great states joined against him. At one moment his case seemed so hopeless that he got ready to kill himself. But the continuance of the war diverted the efforts of France from England and the sea. The hour was fast approaching for the great colonial expeditions, which made the last year of the war illustrious by the triumph of the sea power of England over France and Spain united. It is first necessary to tell the entirely kindred story of the effect of that sea power in the East Indian Peninsula. The recall of Duplex and the entire abandonment of his policy, which resulted in placing the two East India companies on equal terms, have already been told. The treaty stipulations of 1754 had not, however, been fully carried out. The Marquis de Bussy, a brave and capable soldier who had been a second to Duplex, and was wholly in accord with his policy and ambitions, remained in the Deccan, a large region in the southern central part of the peninsula, over which Duplex had once ruled. In 1756, troubles arose between the English and the native prince in Bengal. The Nabob of that province had died, and his successor, a young man of nineteen, attacked Calcutta. The place fell, after a weak resistance, in June, and the surrender was followed by the famous tragedy known as that of the Black Hole of Calcutta. The news reached Madras in August, and Clive, whose name has already been mentioned, sailed with the fleet of Admiral Watson, after a long and vexatious delay. The fleet entered the river in December and appeared before Calcutta in January, when the place fell into English hands again as easily as it had been lost. The Nabob was very angry, and marched against the English. Sending meanwhile an invitation to the French at Shannonagore to join him. Although it was now known that England and France were at war, the French company, despite the experience of 1744, weakly hoped that peace might be kept between it and the English. The native invitation was therefore refused, and offers of neutrality made to the other company. Clive marched out, met the Indian forces and defeated them, and the Nabob at once asked for peace, and sought the English alliance, yielding all the claims on the strength of which he had first attacked Calcutta. After some demur his offers were accepted. Clive and Watson then turned upon Shannonagore and compelled the surrender of the French settlement. The Nabob, who had not meant to allow this, took umbrage, and entered into correspondence with Bussy in the Deccan. Clive had full knowledge of his various intrigues, which were carried on with the vacillation of a character as weak as it was treacherous. And seeing no hope of settled peace or trade under the rule of this man, 
entered into an extensive conspiracy for his dethronement, the details of which need not be given. The result was that war broke out again, and that Clive with three thousand men, one third of whom were English, met the Nabob at the head of fifteen thousand horse and thirty-five thousand foot. The disproportion in artillery was nearly as great. Against these odds was fought and won the Battle of Plassey, on the 23d of June, 1757, the date from which, by common consent, the British Empire in India is said to begin. The overthrow of the Nabob was followed by placing in power one of the conspirators against him, a creature of the English, and dependent upon them for support. Bengal thus passed under their control, the first fruits of India. Clive, says a French historian, had understood and applied the system of duplex. This was true, yet even so it may be said that the foundation thus laid could never have been kept nor built upon, had the English nation not controlled the sea. The conditions of India were such that a few Europeans, headed by men of nerve and shrewdness, dividing that they might conquer, and advancing their fortunes by judicious alliances, were able to hold their own, and more too. Amidst overwhelming numerical odds. But it was necessary that they should not be opposed by men of their own kind, a few of whom could turn the wavering balance the other way. At the very time that Clive was acting in Bengal, Bussey invaded Orissa, seized the English factories, and made himself master of much of the coast regions between Madras and Calcutta. While a French squadron of nine ships, most of which, however, belonged to the East India Company and were not first-rate men of war, was on its way to Pondicherry with 1,200 regular troops. An enormous European army for Indian operations of that day. The English naval force on the coast, though fewer in numbers, may be considered about equal to the approaching French squadron. It is scarcely too much to say that the future of India was still uncertain, and the first operations showed it. The French division appeared off the Coromandel coast to the southward of Pondicherry on the 26th of April, 1758, and anchored on the 28th before the English station called Fort St. David. Two ships kept on to Pondicherry, having on board the new governor, Comte de Lally, who wished to go at once to his seat of government. Meanwhile, the English admiral, Pocock, having news of his enemies coming, and fearing specially for this post, was on his way to it, and appeared on the 29th of April, before the two ships with the governor were out of sight. The French at once got under way and stood out to sea on the starboard tack, Plate Virginia, heading to the northward and eastward, the wind being southeast, and signals were made to recall the ship and frigate, A, escorting Lally. But they were disregarded by the latter's order, an act which must have increased, if it did not originate, the ill will between him and Commodore Dieck, through which the French campaign in India miscarried. The English, having formed to windward on the same tack as the French, made their attack in the then usual way, and with the usual results. The seven English ships were ordered to keep away together for the French eight, and the four leading ships, including the admirals, came into action handsomely. The last three, whether by their own fault or not, were late in doing so, but it will be remembered that this was almost always the case in such attacks. The French Commodore, seeing this interval between the van and the rear, formed the plan of separating them, and made signal to wear together, but in his impatience did not wait for an answer. Putting his own helm up, he wore round, and was followed in succession by the rear ships, while the van stood on. The English admiral, who had good reason to know, gives Datch more credit than the French writers, for he describes this movement thus. At half past four p.m. the rear of the French line had drawn pretty close up to their flagship. Our three rear ships were signaled to engage closer. Soon after, M. Dick broke the line, and put before the wind. His second astern, who had kept on the Yarmouth's English flagship, quarter most part of the action, then came up alongside, gave his fire, and then bore away, and a few minutes after, the enemy's van bore away also. By this account, which is by no means irreconcilable with the French, the latter effected upon the principal English ship a movement of concentration by defiling past her. The French now stood down to their two separated ships, while the English vessels that had been engaged were too much crippled to follow. This battle prevented the English fleet from relieving Fort St. David, which surrendered on the 2d of June. 
After the fall of this place, the two opposing squadrons having refitted at their respective ports and resumed their station, a second action was fought in August, under nearly the same conditions and in much the same fashion. The French flagship met with a series of untoward accidents, which determined the Commodore to withdraw from action, but the statement of his further reasons is most suggestive of the necessary final overthrow of the French cause. Prudence, a writer of his own country says, commanded him not to prolong a contest from which his ships could not but come out with injuries very difficult to repair in a region where it was impossible to supply the almost entire lack of spare stores. This want of so absolute a requisite for naval efficiency shows in a strong light the fatal tendency of that economy which always characterized French operations at sea, and was at once significant and ominous. Returning to Pondicherry, Datch found that, though the injuries to the masts and rigging could for this time be repaired, there was lack of provisions, and that the ships needed caulking. Although his orders were to remain on the coast until October 15, he backed himself with the opinion of a council of war which decided that the ships could not remain there longer, because, in case of a third battle, there was neither rigging nor supplies remaining in Pondicherry. And disregarding the protests of the governor, Lally, he sailed on the 2d of September for the Isle of France. The underlying motive of Datch, it is known, was hostility to the governor, with whom he quarreled continually. Lally, deprived of the help of the squadron, turned his arms inland instead of against Madras. Upon arriving at the islands, Datch found a state of things which again singularly illustrates the impotence and short-sightedness characteristic of the general naval policy of the French at this time. His arrival there was as unwelcome as his departure from India had been to Lally. The islands were then in a state of the most complete destitution. The naval division, increased by the arrival of three ships of the line from home, so exhausted them that its immediate departure was requested of the Commodore. Repairs were pushed ahead rapidly, and in November several of the ships sailed to the Cape of Good Hope, then a Dutch colony, to seek provisions. But these were consumed soon after being received, and the pressure for the departure of the squadron was renewed. The situation of the ships was no less precarious than that of the colony. And accordingly the Commodore replied by urging his entire lack of food and supplies. The condition was such that, a little later, it was necessary to make running rigging out of the cables, and to put some of the ships on the bottom, so as to give their materials to others. Before returning to India, Datch wrote to the Minister of the Navy that he was about to leave, only to save the crews from dying of hunger, and that nothing need be expected from the squadron if supplies were not sent. For both men and things were in a deplorable state. Under these circumstances Datch sailed from the islands in July, 1759, and arrived off the Coromandel coast in September. During his year of absence Lally had besieged Madras for two months, during the northeast monsoon. Both squadrons were absent, that season being unfit for naval operations on this coast, but the English returned first, and are said by the French to have caused, by the English to have hastened, the raising of the siege. Datch, upon his return, was much superior in both number and size of ships, but when the fleets met, Pocock did not hesitate to attack with nine against eleven. This action, fought September 10, 1759, was as indecisive as the two former. But Datch retreated, after a very bloody contest. Upon it Campbell, in his, Lives of the Admirals, makes a droll, but seemingly serious, comment, Pocock had reduced the French ships to a very shattered condition, and killed a great many of their men. But what shows the singular talents of both admirals, they had fought three pitched battles in eighteen months without the loss of a ship on either side. The fruits of victory, however, were with the weaker fleet. For Datch returned to Pondicherry and then sailed on the first of the next month for the islands, leaving India to its fate. From that time the result was certain. The English continued to receive reinforcements from home, while the French did not. The men opposed to Lally were superior in ability, place after place fell, and in January, 1761, Pondicherry itself surrendered, surrounded by land and cut off from the sea. This was the end of the French power in India. For though Pondicherry and other possessions were restored at the peace, the English tenure there was never again shaken, even under the attacks of the skillful and bold Suffren. 
who twenty years later met difficulties as great as Dachess with a vigor and conduct which the latter at a more hopeful moment failed to show. France having thus lost both Canada and India by the evident failure of her power to act at a distance by sea, it would seem scarcely possible that Spain, with her own weak navy and widely scattered possessions, would choose this moment for entering the war. Yet so it was. The maritime exhaustion of France was plain to all, and is abundantly testified to by her naval historians. The resources of France were exhausted, says one. The year 1761 saw only a few single ships leave her ports, and all of them were captured. The alliance with Spain came too late. The occasional ships that went to sea in 1762 were taken, and the colonies still remaining to France could not be saved. Even as early as 1758, another Frenchman writes, want of money, the depression of commerce given over to English cruisers, the lack of good ships, the lack of supplies, etc. Compelled the French ministry, unable to raise large forces, to resort to stratagems, to replace the only rational system of war, grand war, by the smallest of petty wars, by a sort of game in which the great aim is not to be caught. Even then, the arrival of four ships of the line at Louisbourg, by avoiding the enemy, was looked on as a very fortunate event. In 1759 the lucky arrival of the West India convoy caused as much surprise as joy to the merchants. We see how rare had become such a chance in seas ploughed by the squadrons of England. This was before the disasters of La Clue and Conflans. The destruction of French commerce, beginning by the capture of its merchant ships, was consummated by the reduction of the colonies. It can hardly, therefore, be conceded that the family compact now made between the two courts, containing, as it did, not only an agreement to support each other in any future war, but also a secret clause binding Spain to declare war against England within a year, if peace were not made, was honorable to the wisdom of the two governments. It is hard to pardon, not only the Spanish government, but even France for alluring a kindred people into such a bad bargain. It was hoped, however, to revive the French navy and to promote an alliance of neutral powers. Many of which, besides Spain, had causes of complaint against England. During the war with France, confesses an English historian, the Spanish flag had not always been respected by British cruisers. During 1758, says another, not less than 176 neutral vessels, laden with the rich produce of the French colonies or with military or naval stores, fell into the hands of the English. The causes were already at work which twenty years later gave rise to the armed neutrality of the Baltic powers directed against the claims of England on the sea. The possession of unlimited power, as the sea power of England then really was, is seldom accompanied by a profound respect for the rights of others. Without a rival upon the ocean, it suited England to maintain that enemy's property was liable to capture on board neutral ships, thus subjecting these nations not only to vexatious detentions, but to loss of valuable trade. Just as it had suited her earlier in the war to establish a paper blockade of French ports. Neutrals of course chafed under these exactions, but the year 1761 was ill-chosen for an armed protest, and of all powers Spain risked most by a war. England had then 120 ships of the line in commission, besides those in reserve, manned by 70,000 seamen trained and hardened by five years of constant warfare afloat, and flushed with victory. The navy of France, which numbered 77 ships of the line in 1758, lost as prizes to the English in 1759-27, besides eight destroyed and many frigates lost. Indeed, as has been seen, their own writers confess that the navy was ruined, root and branch. The Spanish navy contained about fifty ships, but the personnel, unless very different from the days before and after, must have been very inferior. The weakness of her empire, in the absence of an efficient navy, has before been pointed out. Neutrality, too, though at times outraged, had been of great advantage to her, permitting her to restore her finances and trade and to re-establish her internal resources, but she needed a still longer period of it. Nevertheless, the king, influenced by family feeling and resentment against England, allowed himself to be drawn on by the astute Choiseul, 
and the family compact between the two crowns was signed on the 15th of August, 1761. This compact, into which the King of Naples was also to enter, guaranteed their mutual possessions by the whole power of both kingdoms. This in itself was a weighty undertaking. But the secret clause further stipulated that Spain should declare war against England on the 1st of May, 1762, if peace with France had not then been made. Negotiations of this character could not be kept wholly secret, and Pitt learned enough to convince him that Spain was becoming hostile in intention. With his usual haughty resolve, he determined to forestall her by declaring war. But the influence against him in the councils of the new king was too strong. Failing to carry the ministry with him, he resigned on 5 October, 1761. His provision was quickly justified. Spain had been eager in professing goodwill until the treasure ships from America should arrive laden with the specie so needed for carrying on war. On 21 September the flotta of galleons anchored safely in Cadiz. And on the 2d of November the British ambassador announced to his government that two ships had safely arrived with very extraordinary rich cargoes from the West Indies. So that all the wealth that was expected from Spanish America is now safe in old Spain, and in the same dispatch reports a surprising change in the words of the Spanish minister, and the haughty language now used. The grievances and claims of Spain were urged peremptorily, and the quarrel grew so fast that even the new English ministry, though ardently desiring peace, recalled their ambassador before the end of the year. And declared war on the 4th of January, 1762. Thus adopting Pitt's policy, but too late to reap the advantages at which he had aimed. However, no such delay on the part of England could alter the essential inequality, in strength and preparation, between the two nations. The plans formed by Pitt were in the main adopted by his successor, and carried out with a speed which the readiness of the English navy permitted. On the 5th of March, Pocock, who had returned from the East Indies, sailed from Portsmouth, convoying a fleet of transports to act against Havana. In the West Indies he was reinforced from the forces in that quarter, so that his command contained nineteen ships of the line besides smaller vessels, and ten thousand soldiers. In the previous January, the West India fleet, under the well-known Rodney, had acted with the land forces in the reduction of Martinique, the gem and tower of the French islands and the harbour of an extensive privateering system. It is said that 1400 English merchantmen were taken during this war in the West Indian seas by cruisers whose principal port was Fort Royal in Martinique. With this necessary base fell also the privateering system resting upon it. Martinique was surrendered February 12th, and the loss of this chief commercial and military centre was immediately followed by that of the smaller islands, Granada, Sta Lucia, St. Vincent. By these acquisitions the English colonies at Antigua, St. Kitts, and Nevis, as well as the ships trading to those islands, were secured against the enemy, the commerce of England received large additions, and all the lesser Antilles, or Windward Islands, became British possessions. Admiral Pocock was joined off Cape St. Nicholas by the West Indian reinforcement on the 27th of May, and as the season was so far advanced, he took his great fleet through the old Bahama Channel instead of the usual route around the south side of Cuba. This was justly considered a great feat in those days of poor surveys, and was accomplished without an accident. Lookout and sounding vessels went first, frigates followed, and boats or sloops were anchored on shoals with carefully arranged signals for day or night having good weather, the fleet got through in a week and appeared before Havana. The operations will not be given in detail. After a forty days siege the Moro Castle was taken on the 30th of July, and the city surrendered on the 10th of August. The Spaniards lost not only the city and port, but twelve ships of the line, besides three million pounds in money and merchandise belonging to the Spanish king. The importance of Havana was not to be measured only by its own size, or its position as centre of a large and richly cultivated district. It was also the port commanding the only passage by which the treasure and other ships could sail from the Gulf of Mexico to Europe in those days. With Havana in an enemy's hands it would be necessary to assemble them at Cartagena and from there beat up against the trade winds, an operation always difficult. 
and which would keep ships long in waters where they were exposed to capture by English cruisers. Not even an attack upon the Isthmus would have been so serious a blow to Spain. This important result could only be achieved by a nation confident of controlling the communications by its sea power, to which the happy issue must wholly be ascribed. And which had another signal illustration in the timely conveying of 4,000 American troops to reinforce the English ranks, terribly wasted by battle and fever. It is said that only 2,500 serviceable fighting men remained on foot when the city fell. While the long reach and vigor of England's sea power was thus felt in the West Indies, it was receiving further illustration in Portugal and in the Far East. The Allied crowns in the beginning had invited Portugal to join their alliance against those whom they had taken to calling the tyrants of the seas, reminding her how the English monopoly of her trade was draining the country of gold. And recalling the deliberate violation of her neutrality by the fleet under Boscoan. The Portuguese minister of the day well knew all this, and keenly felt it. But though the invitation was accompanied by the plain statement that Portugal would not be allowed to continue a neutrality she could not enforce. He judged rightly that the country had more to fear from England and her fleet than from the Spanish army. The Allies declared war and invaded Portugal. They were for a time successful. But the tyrants of the seas answered Portugal's call, sent a fleet and landed at Lisbon 8,000 soldiers, who drove the Spaniards over the frontiers, and even carried the war into Spain itself. Simultaneous with these significant events, Manila was attacked. With so much already on hand, it was found impossible to spare troops or ships from England. The successes in India and the absolute security of the establishments there, with the control of the sea, allowed the Indian officials themselves to undertake this colonial expedition. It sailed in August, 1762, and reaching Malacca on the 19th, was supplied at that neutral port with all that was needed for the siege about to be undertaken, the Dutch, though jealous of the English advance, not venturing to refuse their demands. The expedition, which depended entirely upon the fleet, resulted in the whole group of Philippine islands surrendering in October and paying a ransom of $4 million. At about the same time the fleet captured the Acapulco galleon having $3 million on board, and an English squadron in the Atlantic took a treasure ship from Lima with $4 million in silver for the Spanish government. Never had the colonial empire of Spain received such blows. Spain, whose opportune intervention might have modified the fate of the war, entered it too late to help France, but in time to share her misfortunes. There was reason to fear yet more. Panama and San Domingo were threatened, and the Anglo-Americans were preparing for the invasion of Florida and Louisiana. The conquest of Havana had in great measure interrupted the communications between the wealthy American colonies of Spain and Europe. The reduction of the Philippine Islands now excluded her from Asia. The two together severed all the avenues of Spanish trade and cut off all intercourse between the parts of their vast but disconnected empire. The selection of the points of attack, due to the ministry of Pitt, was strategically good, cutting effectually the sinews of the enemy's strength. And if his plans had been fully carried out and Panama also seized, the success would have been yet more decisive. England had lost also the advantage of the surprise he would have effected by anticipating Spain's declaration of war. But her arms were triumphant during this short contest, through the rapidity with which her projects were carried into execution, due to the state of efficiency to which her naval forces and administration had been brought. With the conquest of Manila ended the military operations of the war. Nine months, counting from the formal declaration by England in January, had been sufficient to shatter the last hope of France, and to bring Spain to a peace in which was conceded every point on which she had based her hostile attitude and demands. It seems scarcely necessary, after even the brief summary of events that has been given, to point out that the speed and thoroughness with which England's work was done was due wholly to her sea power. Which allowed her forces to act on distant points, widely apart as Cuba, Portugal, India, and the Philippines, without a fear of serious break in their communications. Before giving the terms of peace which ought to summarize the results of the war, but do so imperfectly, Owing to the weak eagerness of the English ministry to conclude it, it is necessary to trace and outline the effect of the war upon commerce. 
Upon the foundations of sea power and national prosperity. One prominent feature of this war may be more strongly impressed upon the mind by a startling, because paradoxical, statement that the prosperity of the English is shown by the magnitude of their losses. From 1756 to 1760, states a French historian, French privateers captured from the English more than 2,500 merchantmen. In 1761, though France had not, so to speak, a single ship of the line at sea, and though the English had taken 240 of our privateers, their comrades still took 812 English vessels. The explanation of the number of these prizes lies in the prodigious growth of the English shipping. In 1760 it is claimed that the English had at sea 8,000 sail, of these the French captured nearly one-tenth, despite escorts and cruisers. In the four years from 1756 to 1760 the French lost only 950 vessels. But this discrepancy is justly attributed by an English writer, to the diminution of the French commerce and the dread of falling into the hands of the English, which kept many of their trading vessels from going to sea. And he goes on to point out that the capture of vessels was not the principal benefit resulting from the efficiency of England's fleets. Captures like Duquesne, Louisbourg, Prince Edward's Island, the reduction of Senegal, and later on of Guadeloupe and Martinique, were events no less destructive to French commerce and colonies than advantageous to those of England. The multiplication of French privateers was indeed a sad token to an instructed eye, showing behind the merchant shipping an enforced idleness, whose crews and whose owners were driven to speculative pillage in order to live. Nor was this risk wholly in vain. The same Englishman confesses that in 1759 the losses of merchantmen showed a worse balance than the ships of war. While the French were striving in vain to regain equality upon the sea and repair their losses, but to no purpose, for, in building and arming vessels they labored only for the English fleet, yet. Notwithstanding the courage and vigilance of English cruisers, French privateers so swarmed that in this year they took 240 British vessels, chiefly coasters and small craft. In 1760 the same authority gives the British loss in trading vessels at over 300, and in 1761 at over 800, three times that of the French, but he adds, it would not have been wonderful had they taken more and richer ships. While their commerce was nearly destroyed, and they had few merchant ships at sea, the trading fleets of England covered the seas. Every year her commerce was increasing. The money which the war carried out was returned by the produce of her industry. Eight thousand vessels were employed by the traders of Great Britain. The extent of her losses is attributed to three causes, of which the first only was preventable, one, the inattention of merchant ships to the orders of the convoying vessels, two, the immense number of English ships in all seas. Three, the enemy's venturing the whole remains of his strength in privateering. During the same year, 1761, the navy lost one ship of the line, which was retaken, and one cutter. At the same time, notwithstanding the various exchanges, the English still held 25,000 French prisoners, while the English prisoners in France were but 1,200. These were the results of the sea war. Finally, in summing up the commercial condition of the kingdom at the end of the war, after mentioning the enormous sums of specie taken from Spain, the writer says. These strengthened trade and fostered industry. The remittances for foreign subsidies were in great part paid by bills on merchants settled abroad, who had the value of the drafts in British manufacturers. The trade of England increased gradually every year, and such a scene of national prosperity while waging a long, costly, and bloody war, was never before shown by any people in the world. No wonder, with such results to her commerce and such unvarying success attending her arms, and seeing the practical annihilation of the French navy, that the Union of France and Spain, which was then lowering on her future and had once excited the fears of all Europe, was now beheld by Great Britain alone without the smallest fear or despondency. Spain was by her constitution and the distribution of her empire peculiarly open to the attack of a great sea people. And whatever the views of the government of the day, Pitt and the nation saw that the hour had come, which had been hoped for in vain in 1739. Because then years of peace and the obstinate bias of a great minister had relaxed the muscles of her fleet. Now she but reached forth her hand and seized what she wished, 
nor could there have been any limit to her prey, had not the ministry again been untrue to the interests of the country. The position of Portugal with reference to Great Britain has been alluded to, but merits some special attention as instancing an element of sea power obtained not by colonies, but by alliance, whether necessary or prudential. The commercial connection before spoken of was strengthened by the strongest political ties. The two kingdoms were so situated as to have little to fear from each other, while they might impart many mutual advantages. The harbours of Portugal gave shelter as well as supplies to the English fleet, while the latter defended the rich trade of Portugal with Brazil. The antipathy between Portugal and Spain made it necessary for the former to have an ally, strong yet distant. None is so advantageous in that way as England, which in her turn might, and always has, derived great advantages from Portugal in a war with any of the southern powers of Europe. This is an English view of a matter which to others looks somewhat like an alliance between a lion and a lamb. To call a country with a fleet like England's distant from a small maritime nation like Portugal is an absurdity. England is, and yet more in those days was, wherever her fleet could go. The opposite view of the matter, showing equally the value of the alliance, was well set forth in the memorial by which, under the civil name of an invitation, the crowns of France and Spain ordered Portugal to declare against England. The grounds of that memorial, namely, the unequal benefit to Portugal from the connection and the disregard of Portuguese neutrality, have already been given. The King of Portugal refused to abandon the alliance, for the professed reason that it was ancient and wholly defensive. To this the two crowns replied. The defensive alliance is actually an offensive one by the situation of the Portuguese dominions and the nature of the English power. The English squadrons cannot in all seasons keep the sea, nor cruise on the principal coasts of France and Spain for cutting off the navigation of the two countries, without the ports and assistance of Portugal. And these islanders could not insult all maritime Europe, if the whole riches of Portugal did not pass through their hands, which furnishes them with the means to make war and renders the alliance truly and properly offensive. Between the two arguments the logic of situation and power prevailed. Portugal found England nearer and more dangerous than Spain, and remained for generations of trial true to the alliance. This relationship was as useful to England as any of her colonial possessions, depending of course upon the scene of the principal operations at any particular time. The preliminaries of peace were signed at Fontainebleau, November 3, 1762. The definitive treaty on the 10th of the following February, at Paris, whence the peace takes its name. By its terms France renounced all claims to Canada, Nova Scotia, and all the islands of the St. Lawrence. Along with Canada she ceded the Valley of the Ohio and all her territory on the east side of the Mississippi, except the city of New Orleans. At the same time Spain, as an equivalent for Havana, which England restored, yielded Florida, under which name were comprised all her continental possessions east of the Mississippi. Thus England obtained a colonial empire embracing Canada, from Hudson's Bay, and all of the present United States east of the Mississippi. The possibilities of this vast region were then only partially foreseen, and as yet there was no foreshadowing of the revolt of the thirteen colonies. In the West Indies, England gave back to France the important islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique. The four so-called neutral islands of the Lesser Antilles were divided between the two powers, Sta Lucia going to France, St. Vincent, Tobago, and Dominica to England, which also retained Grenada. Menorca was given back to England. And as the restoration of the island to Spain had been one of the conditions of the alliance with the latter, France, unable to fulfill her stipulation, ceded to Spain Louisiana west of the Mississippi. In India, France recovered the possessions she had held before Duplex began his schemes of aggrandizement but she gave up the right of erecting fortifications or keeping troops in Bengal, and so left the station at Shannonagore defenseless. In a word, France resumed her facilities for trading, but practically abandoned her pretensions to political influence. It was tacitly understood that the English company would keep all its conquests. The right of fishing upon the coasts of Newfoundland and in parts of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which France had previously enjoyed, was conceded to her by this treaty but it was denied to Spain, who had claimed it for her fishermen. 
This concession was among those most attacked by the English opposition. The nation at large and Pitt, the favorite of the nation, were bitterly opposed to the terms of the treaty. France, said Pitt, is chiefly formidable to us as a maritime and commercial power. What we gain in this respect is valuable to us above all through the injury to her which results from it. You leave to France the possibility of reviving her navy. In truth, from the point of view of sea power and of the national jealousies which the spirit of that age sanctioned, these words, though illiberal, were strictly justifiable. The restoration to France of her colonies in the West Indies and her stations in India, together with the valuable right of fishery in her former American possessions, put before her the possibility and the inducement to restore her shipping, her commerce, and her navy, and thus tended to recall her from the path of continental ambition which had been so fatal to her interests, and in the same proportion favorable to the unprecedented growth of England's power upon the ocean. The opposition, and indeed some of the ministry, also thought that so commanding and important a position as Havana was poorly paid for by the cession of the yet desolate and unproductive region called Florida. Puerto Rico was suggested, Florida accepted. There were other minor points of difference, into which it is unnecessary to enter. It could scarcely be denied that with the commanding military control of the sea held by England, grasping as she now did so many important positions, with her navy overwhelmingly superior in numbers, and her commerce and internal condition very thriving, more rigorous terms might easily have been exacted and would have been prudent. The ministry defended their eagerness and spirit of concession on the ground of the enormous growth of the debt, which then amounted to £122 million, a sum in every point of view much greater then than now. But while this draft upon the future was fully justified by the success of the war, it also imperatively demanded that the utmost advantages which the military situation made attainable should be exacted. This the ministry failed to do. As regards the debt, it is well observed by a French writer that, in this war, and for years afterward, England had in view nothing less than the conquest of America and the progress of her East India Company. By these two countries her manufactures and commerce acquired more than sufficient outlets, and repaid her for the numerous sacrifices she had made. Seeing the maritime decay of Europe, its commerce annihilated, its manufactures so little advanced, how could the English nation feel afraid of a future which offered so vast a perspective? Unfortunately the nation needed an exponent in the government, and its chosen mouthpiece, the only man, perhaps, able to rise to the level of the great opportunity, was out of favor at court. Nevertheless, the gains of England were very great, not only in territorial increase, nor yet in maritime preponderance, but in the prestige and position achieved in the eyes of the nations, now fully open to her great resources and mighty power. To these results, won by the sea, the issue of the Continental War offered a singular and suggestive contrast. France had already withdrawn, along with England, from all share in that strife, and peace between the other parties to it was signed five days after the Peace of Paris. The terms of the peace were simply the status quo antebellum. By the estimate of the King of Prussia, 180,000 of his soldiers had fallen or died in this war, out of a kingdom of five million souls. While the losses of Russia, Austria, and France aggregated 460,000 men. The result was simply that things remained as they were. To attribute this only to a difference between the possibilities of land and sea war is of course absurd. The genius of Frederick, backed by the money of England, had proved an equal match for the mismanaged and not always hardy efforts of a coalition numerically overwhelming. What does seem a fair conclusion is, that states having a good seaboard, or even ready access to the ocean by one or two outlets, will find it to their advantage to seek prosperity and extension by the way of the sea and of commerce. Rather than in attempts to unsettle and modify existing political arrangements in countries where a more or less long possession of power has conferred acknowledged rights and created national allegiance or political ties. Since the Treaty of Paris in 1763, the waste places of the world have been rapidly filled, witness our own continent, Australia, and even South America. A nominal and more or less clearly defined political possession now generally exists in the most forsaken regions, though to this statement there are some marked exceptions. 
but in many places this political possession is little more than nominal, and in others of a character so feeble that it cannot rely upon itself alone for support or protection. The familiar and notorious example of the Turkish Empire, kept erect only by the forces pressing upon it from opposing sides, by the mutual jealousies of powers that have no sympathy with it, is an instance of such weak political tenure. And though the question is wholly European, all know enough of it to be aware that the interest and control of the sea powers is among the chief, if not the first, of the elements that now fix the situation. And that they, if intelligently used, will direct the future inevitable changes. Upon the western continents the political condition of the Central American and tropical South American states is so unstable as to cause constant anxiety about the maintenance of internal order and seriously to interfere with commerce and with the peaceful development of their resources. So long as, to use a familiar expression, they hurt no one but themselves, this may go on. But for a long time the citizens of more stable governments have been seeking to exploit their resources, and have borne the losses arising from their distracted condition. North America and Australia still offer large openings to immigration and enterprise. But they are filling up rapidly, and as the opportunities there diminish, the demand must arise for a more settled government in those disordered states. For security to life and for reasonable stability of institutions enabling merchants and others to count upon the future. There is certainly no present hope that such a demand can be fulfilled from the existing native materials. If the same be true when the demand arises, no theoretical positions, like the Monroe Doctrine, will prevent interested nations from attempting to remedy the evil by some measure, which, whatever it may be called, will be a political interference. Such interferences must produce collisions, which may be at times settled by arbitration, but can scarcely fail at other times to cause war. Even for a peaceful solution, that nation will have the strongest arguments which has the strongest organized force. It need scarcely be said that the successful piercing of the Central American Isthmus at any point may precipitate the moment that is sure to come sooner or later. The profound modification of commercial routes expected from this enterprise, the political importance to the United States of such a channel of communication between her Atlantic and Pacific seaboards, are not, however, the whole nor even the principal part of the question. As far as can be seen, the time will come when stable governments for the American tropical states must be assured by the now existing powerful and stable states of America or Europe. The geographical position of those states, the climatic conditions, make it plain at once that sea power will there, even more than in the case of Turkey, determine what foreign state shall predominate, if not by actual possession. By its influence over the native governments. The geographical position of the United States and her intrinsic power give her an undeniable advantage. But that advantage will not avail if there is a great inferiority of organized brute force, which still remains the last argument of republics as of kings. Herein lies to us the great and still living interest of the Seven Years' War. In it we have seen and followed England, with an army small as compared with other states, as is still her case today, first successfully defending her own shores, then carrying her arms in every direction. Spreading her rule and influence over remote regions, and not only binding them to her obedience, but making them tributary to her wealth, her strength, and her reputation. As she loosens the grasp and neutralizes the influence of France and Spain in regions beyond the sea, there is perhaps seen the prophecy of some other great nation in days yet to come, that will incline the balance of power in some future sea war. Whose scope will be recognized afterward, if not by contemporaries, to have been the political future and the economical development of regions before lost to civilization. But that nation will not be the United States if the moment find her indifferent, as now, to the empire of the seas. The direction then given to England's efforts, by the instinct of the nation and the fiery genius of Pitt, continued after the war, and has profoundly influenced her subsequent policy. Mistress now of North America, lording it in India, through the company whose territorial conquests had been ratified by native princes, over twenty millions of inhabitants. A population larger than that of Great Britain and having a revenue respectable alongside of that of the home government, England, with yet other rich possessions scattered far and wide over the globe, had ever before her eyes, as a salutary lesson. 
the severe chastisement which the weakness of Spain had allowed her to inflict upon that huge disjointed empire. The words of the English naval historian of that war, speaking about Spain, apply with slight modifications to England in our own day. Spain is precisely that power against which England can always contend with the fairest prospect of advantage and honor. That extensive monarchy is exhausted at heart, her resources lie at a great distance, and whatever power commands the sea, may command the wealth and commerce of Spain. The dominions from which she draws her resources, lying at an immense distance from the capital and from one another, make it more necessary for her than for any other state to temporize. Until she can inspire with activity all parts of her enormous but disjointed empire. It would be untrue to say that England is exhausted at heart, but her dependence upon the outside world is such as to give a certain suggestiveness to the phrase. This analogy of positions was not overlooked by England. From that time forward up to our own day, the possessions won for her by her sea power have combined with that sea power itself to control her policy. The road to India, in the days of Clive a distant and perilous voyage on which she had not a stopping place of her own, was reinforced as opportunity offered by the acquisition of St. Helena, of the Cape of Good Hope, of the Mauritius. When steam made the Red Sea and Mediterranean route practicable, she acquired Aden, and yet later has established herself at Socotra. Malta had already fallen into her hands during the wars of the French Revolution, and her commanding position, as the cornerstone upon which the coalitions against Napoleon rested, enabled her to claim it at the Peace of 1815. Being but a short thousand miles from Gibraltar, the circles of military command exercised by these two places intersect. The present day has seen the stretch from Malta to the Isthmus of Suez, formerly without a station, guarded by the cession to her of Cyprus. Egypt, despite the jealousy of France, has passed under English control. The importance of that position to India, understood by Napoleon and Nelson, led the latter at once to send an officer overland to Bombay with the news of the Battle of the Nile and the downfall of Bonaparte's hopes. Even now, the jealousy with which England views the advance of Russia in Central Asia is the result of those days in which her sea power and resources triumphed over the weakness of Dach and the genius of Suffren. And wrenched the peninsula of India from the ambition of the French. For the first time since the Middle Ages, says M. Martin, speaking of the Seven Years' War, England had conquered France single handed almost without allies, France having powerful auxiliaries. She had conquered solely by the superiority of her government. Yes. But by the superiority of her government using the tremendous weapon of her sea power. This made her rich, and in turn protected the trade by which she had her wealth. With her money she upheld her few auxiliaries, mainly Prussia and Hanover, in their desperate strife. Her power was everywhere that her ships could reach, and there was none to dispute the sea to her. Where she would she went, and with her went her guns and her troops. By this mobility her forces were multiplied, those of her enemies distracted. Ruler of the seas, she everywhere obstructed its highways. The enemy's fleets could not join. No great fleet could get out, or if it did, it was only to meet at once, with uninured officers and crews, those who were veterans in gales and warfare. Save in the case of Menorca, she carefully held her own sea bases and eagerly seized those of the enemy. What a lion in the path was Gibraltar to the French squadrons of Toulon and Brest. What hope for French succor to Canada, when the English fleet had Louisbourg under its lee? The one nation that gained in this war was that which used the sea in peace to earn its wealth, and ruled it in war by the extent of its navy, by the number of its subjects who lived on the sea or by the sea, and by its numerous bases of operations scattered over the globe. Yet it must be observed that these bases themselves would have lost their value if their communications remained obstructed. Therefore the French lost Louisbourg, Martinique, Pondicherry, so England herself lost Menorca. The service between the bases and the mobile force between the ports and the fleets is mutual. In this respect the navy is essentially a light corps, it keeps open the communications between its own ports, it obstructs those of the enemy. But it sweeps the sea for the service of the land, it controls the desert that man may live and thrive on the habitable globe. Footnotes 
that is, with the guns on board, but for the most part not mounted on their carriages, in order to give increased accommodation for troops. When the troops were landed, the guns were mounted. Ramachuel, Tactique Navale. Lapiraus Bonfils, Histoire de la Marine. Clerk, Naval Tactics. Julien de la Gravier, Guerres Maritimes. Mahone, History of England. Mahone, History of England. For these, see Troud, Butterley's Navals. See Plate 8. Troud, Butterley's Navals de la France. Lapiraus Bonfils. Mahone, History of England. Campbell, Lives of the Admirals. Mahone, History of England. Martin, History of France. Martin, History of France. Campbell, Lives of the Admirals. See Annual Register, 1762, page 63. Campbell, Lives of the Admirals. These remarks, always true, are doubly so now since the introduction of steam. The renewal of coal is a want more frequent, more urgent, more peremptory, than any known to the sailing ship. It is vain to look for energetic naval operations distant from coal stations. It is equally vain to acquire distant coaling stations without maintaining a powerful navy, they will but fall into the hands of the enemy. But the vainest of all delusions is the expectation of bringing down an enemy by commerce destroying alone, with no coaling stations outside the national boundaries. Chapter 9 Course of Events from the Peace of Paris to 1778 Maritime War Consequent Upon the American Revolution. See Battle of Ushant. If England had reason to complain that she had not reaped from the Treaty of Paris all the advantages that her military achievements and position entitled her to expect, France had every cause for discontent at the position in which the war left her. The gain of England was nearly measured by her losses, even the cession of Florida, made to the conqueror by Spain, had been bought by France at the price of Louisiana. Naturally the thoughts of her statesmen and of her people, as they bent under the present necessity to bear the burden of the vanquished, turned to the future with its possibilities of revenge and compensation. The Duc de Choiseul, able though imperious, remained for many years more at the head of affairs, and worked persistently to restore the power of France from the effects of the treaty. The Austrian alliance had been none of his seeking. It was already made and working when he came to office in 1758, but he had even at the first recognized that the chief enemy was England, and tried as far as could be to direct the forces of the nation against her. The defeat of Conflans having thwarted his projects of invasion, he next sought, in entire consistency with his main purpose, to stir up Spain and gain her alliance. The united efforts of the two kingdoms with their fine seaboards could, under good administration and with time for preparation, put afloat a navy that would be a fair counterpoise to that of England. It was also doubtless true, that weaker maritime states, if they saw such a combination successfully made and working efficiently, would pluck up heart to declare against a government whose greatness excited envy and fear, and which acted with the disregard to the rights and welfare of others common to all uncontrolled power. Unhappily for both France and Spain, the alliance came too late. The virtual annihilation of the French fleet in 1759 was indeed followed by an outburst of national enthusiasm for the navy, skillfully fostered and guided by Choiseul. Popular feeling took up the cry, from one end of France to the other, the navy must be restored. Gifts of cities, corporations, and private individuals raised funds. A prodigious activity sprang up in the lately silent ports. Everywhere ships were building and repairing. The minister also recognized the need of restoring the discipline and tone, as well as the material of the navy. The hour, however, was too late. The middle of a great and unsuccessful war is no time to begin preparations. Better late than never, is not so safe a proverb as, in time of peace prepare for war. The condition of Spain was better. When war broke out, the English naval historian estimates that she had 100 ships of all sizes, of these, probably 60 were of the line. Nevertheless, although the addition of Spain to her numerous enemies might make the position of England seem critical, 
the combination in her favor of numbers, skill, experience, and prestige, was irresistible. With 70,000 veteran seamen, she had only to maintain a position already won. The results we know. After the peace, Choiseau wisely remained faithful to his own first ideas. The restoration of the navy continued, and was accompanied and furthered by a spirit of professional ambition and of desire to excel, among the officers of the navy, which has been before mentioned, and which, in the peculiar condition of the United States Navy at the present day, may be commended as a model. The building of ships of war continued with great activity and on a large scale. At the end of the war, thanks to the movement begun in 1761, there were forty ships of the line in good condition. In 1770, when Choiseul was dismissed, the Royal Navy numbered sixty-four of the line and fifty frigates afloat. The arsenals and storehouses were filled, and a stock of ship timber laid up. At the same time the minister tried to improve the efficiency of the officers by repressing the arrogant spirit of those of noble birth, which showed itself both toward superiors and toward another order of officers, not of the nobility, whose abilities made them desired on board the fleet. This class feeling carried with it a curious sentiment of equality among officers of very different grades, which injuriously affected the spirit of subordination. Members, all, of a privileged social order, their equality as such was more clearly recognized than their inequality as junior and senior. The droll story told by Marriott of the midshipman, who represented to his captain that a certain statement had been made in confidence, seems to have had a realization on the French quarterdeck of that day. Confidence, cried the captain. Who ever heard of confidence between a post-captain and a midshipman? No sir, replied the youngster, not between a captain and a midshipman, but between two gentlemen. Disputes, arguments, suggestions, between two gentlemen, forgetful of their relative rank, would break out at critical moments, and the feeling of equality, which wild democratic notions spread throughout the fleets of the Republic, was curiously forestalled by that existing among the members of a most haughty aristocracy. I saw by his face, says one of Marriott's heroes, that the first lieutenant did not agree with the captain, but he was too good an officer to say so at such a moment. The phrase expresses one of the deepest rooted merits of the English system, the want of which is owned by French writers. Under Louis XVI. The intimacy and fellowship existing between the chief and the subordinate led the latter to discuss the orders which were given him. The relaxation of discipline and the spirit of independence were due also to another cause than that pointed out, they can be partly attributed to the regulation of the officers' messes. Admiral, captain, officers, midshipmen, ate together. Everything was in common. They the end out each other like chums. In handling the ship, the inferior gave his opinion, argued, and the chief, irritated, often preferred to yield rather than make enemies. Facts of this kind are asserted by witnesses whose truthfulness is above suspicion. Insubordination of this character, to which weaker men gave way, dashed in vain against the resolute and fiery temper of Suffren. But the spirit of discontent rose almost to the height of mutiny, causing him to say in his dispatches to the minister of the navy, after his fourth battle, my heart is pierced by the most general defection. It is frightful to think that I might four times have destroyed the English fleet, and that it still exists. Choiseul's reforms broke against this rock, which only the uprising of the whole nation finally removed. But in the personnel of the crews a great improvement was made. In 1767 he reorganized the artillery of the fleet, forming a body of 10,000 gunners, who were systematically drilled once a week during the ten years still to intervene before the next war with England. Losing sight of no part of his plans, Choiseul, while promoting the naval and military power of France, paid special attention to the alliance with Spain and judiciously encouraged and furthered the efforts of that country in the path of progress under Charles III. The best of her kings of the Bourbon line. The Austrian alliance still existing was maintained, but his hopes were chiefly fixed upon Spain. The wisdom and insight which had at once fastened upon England as the centre of enmity to France had been justified and further enlightened by the whole course of the Seven Years' War. In Spain was the surest, and, with good administration, the most powerful ally. 
the close proximity of the two countries, the relative positions of their ports, made the naval situation particularly strong. And the alliance which was dictated by sound policy, by family ties, and by just fear of England's sea power, was further assured to France by recent and still existing injuries that must continue to rankle with Spain. Gibraltar, Menorca, and Florida were still in the hands of England, no Spaniard could be easy till this reproach was wiped out. It may be readily believed, as is asserted by French historians, that England viewed with disquietude the growth of the French navy, and would gladly have nipped it betimes. But it is more doubtful whether she would have been willing to force a war for that purpose. During the years succeeding the Peace of Paris a succession of short ministries, turning mainly upon questions of internal policy or unimportant party arrangement, caused her foreign policy to present a marked contrast to the vigorous, overbearing, but straightforward path followed by Pitt. Internal commotions, such as are apt to follow great wars, and above all the controversy with the North American colonies, which began as early as 1765 with the well-known Stamp Act, conspired with other causes to stay the hand of England. Twice at least during the years of Choiseul's ministry there occurred opportunities which a resolute, ready, and not too scrupulous government might easily have converted into a cause of war. The more so as they involved that sea power which is to England above all other nations the object of just and jealous concern. In 1764 the Genoese, weary of their unsuccessful attempts to control Corsica, again asked France to renew the occupation of the ports which had been garrisoned by her in 1756. The Corsicans also sent an ambassador to France in order to solicit recognition of the independence of the island, in consideration of a tribute equivalent to that which they had formerly paid to Genoa. The latter, feeling its inability to reconquer the island, at length decided practically to cede it. The transaction took the shape of a formal permission for the King of France to exercise all the rights of sovereignty over all the places and harbours of Corsica, as security for debts owing to him by the Republic. This session, disguised under the form of a security in order to palliate the aggrandizement of France in the eyes of Austria and England, recalls the conditional and thinly veiled surrender of Cyprus to England nine years ago. A transfer likely to be as final and far reaching as that of Corsica. England then remonstrated and talked angrily. But though Burke said, Corsica as a province of France is terrible to me, only one member of the House of Commons, the veteran Admiral Sir Charles Saunders, was found to say that it would be better to go to war with France than consent to her taking possession of Corsica. Having in view the then well-recognized interests of England in the Mediterranean, it is evident that an island so well situated as Corsica for influencing the shores of Italy and checking the naval station at Menorca would not have been allowed to go into the hands of a strong master if the nation had felt ready and willing for war. Again, in 1770, a dispute arose between England and Spain relative to the possession of the Falkland Islands. It is not material to state the nature of either claim to what was then but a collection of barren islands, destitute of military as well as of natural advantages. Both England and Spain had had a settlement, on which the national colours were flying, and at the English station a captain in the navy commanded. Before this settlement, called Port Egmont, there suddenly appeared, in June, 1770, a Spanish expedition, fitted out in Buenos Aires, of five frigates and sixteen hundred soldiers. To such a force the handful of Englishmen could make no serious resistance, so after a few shots, exchanged for the honour of the flag, they capitulated. The news of this transaction, which reached England in the following October, showed by its reception how much more serious is an insult than an injury, and how much more bitterly resented. The transfer of Corsica had scarcely occasioned a stir outside the offices of statesmen, the attack on Port Egmont roused the people and Parliament. The minister to Madrid was ordered to demand the immediate restoration of the islands, with a disavowal of the action of the officer who had ordered the attack. Without waiting for a reply, ships were ordered into commission, press gangs swept the streets, and in a short time a powerful fleet was ready at Spithead to revenge the insult. Spain, relying upon the Bourbon family compact and the support of France, was disposed to stand firm, but the old king, Louis XV, was averse to war, and Choiseul, among whose enemies at court was the last mistress, was dismissed. 
With his fall disappeared the hopes of Spain, which at once complied with the demands of England, reserving, however, the question as to the rights of sovereignty. This conclusion shows clearly that England, though still wielding an effective sea power able to control Spain, was not eager for a war merely in order to break down the rival navies. It is not wholly alien to the question of sea power to note, without dwelling upon it, a great event which now happened, seemingly utterly removed from all relation to the sea. The first partition of Poland between Prussia, Russia, and Austria, carried out in 1772, was made easier by the preoccupation of Choiseul with his naval policy and the Spanish alliance. The friendship and support of Poland and Turkey, as checks upon the House of Austria, were part of the tradition received from Henry IV. And Richelieu, the destruction of the former was a direct blow to the pride and interest of France. What Choiseul would have done had he been in office, cannot be known, but if the result of the Seven Years' War had been different, France might have interfered to some purpose. On the 10th of May, 1774, Louis XV. died, at the time when the troubles in the North American colonies were fast coming to a head. Under his youthful successor, Louis XVI. The policy of peace on the continent, of friendly alliance with Spain, and of building up the navy in numbers and efficiency, was continued. This was the foreign policy of Choiseul, directed against the sea power of England as the chief enemy, and toward the sea power of France as the chief support, of the nation. The instructions which, according to a French naval author, the new king gave to his ministers show the spirit with which his reign up to the revolution was inspired whether or not they originated with the king himself. To watch all indications of approaching danger. To observe by cruisers the approaches to our islands and the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico, to keep track of what was passing on the banks of Newfoundland, and to follow the tendencies of English commerce. To observe in England the state of the troops and armaments, the public credit and the ministry, to meddle adroitly in the affairs of the British colonies to give the insurgent colonists the means of obtaining supplies of war, while maintaining the strictest neutrality, to develop actively, but noiselessly, the navy, to repair our ships of war. To fill our storehouses and to keep on hand the means for rapidly equipping a fleet at Brest and at Toulon, while Spain should be fitting one at Ferrol. Finally, at the first serious fear of rupture, to assemble numerous troops upon the shores of Brittany and Normandy, and get everything ready for an invasion of England, so as to force her to concentrate her forces. And thus restrict her means of resistance at the extremities of the empire. Such instructions, whether given all at once as a symmetrical, well thought out plan, or from time to time, as occasion arose, showed that an accurate forecast of the situation had been made, and breathed a conviction which, if earlier felt, would have greatly modified the history of the two countries. The execution was less thorough than the conception. In the matter of developing the navy, however, fifteen years of peace and steady work showed good results. When war openly broke out in 1778, France had eighty ships of the line in good condition, and sixty-seven thousand seamen were borne on the rolls of the maritime conscription. Spain, when she entered the war in 1779 as the ally of France, had in her ports nearly sixty ships of the line. To this combination England opposed a total number of 228 ships of all classes, of which about 150 were of the line. The apparent equality in material which would result from these numbers was affected, to the disadvantage of England, by the superior size and artillery of the French and Spaniards. But on the other hand her strength was increased by the unity of aim imparted by belonging to one nation. The Allies were destined to feel the proverbial weakness of naval coalitions, as well as the degenerate administration of Spain, and the lack of habit, may it not even be said without injustice, of aptitude for the sea, of both nations. The naval policy with which Louis XVI began his reign was kept up to the end. In 1791, two years after the assembly of the States General, the French navy numbered 86 ships of the line, generally superior both in dimensions and model, to English ships of the same class. We have come, therefore, to the beginning of a truly maritime war, which, as will be granted by those who have followed this narrative, had not been seen since the days of de Ruyter and Tourville. 
The magnificence of sea power and its value had perhaps been more clearly shown by the uncontrolled sway, and consequent exaltation, of one belligerent. But the lesson thus given, if more striking, is less vividly interesting than the spectacle of that sea power meeting a foe worthy of its steel, and excited to exertion by a strife which endangered, not only its most valuable colonies, but even its own shores. Waged, from the extended character of the British Empire, in all quarters of the world at once, the attention of the student is called now to the East Indies and now to the West, now to the shores of the United States and thence to those of England. From New York and Chesapeake Bay to Gibraltar and Menorca, to the Cape Verde Islands, the Cape of Good Hope, and Ceylon. Fleets now meet fleets of equal size, and the general chase and the melee, which mark the actions of Hawk, Boscoen, and Anson, though they still occur at times, are for the most part succeeded by wary and complicated maneuvers. Too often barren of decisive results as naval battles, which are the prevailing characteristic of this coming war. The superior tactical science of the French succeeded in imparting to this conflict that peculiar feature of their naval policy, which subordinated the control of the sea by the destruction of the enemy's fleets, of his organized naval forces. To the success of particular operations, the retention of particular points, the carrying out of particular ulterior strategic ends. It is not necessary to endeavor to force upon others the conviction of the present writer that such a policy, however applicable as an exception, is faulty as a rule. But it is most desirable that all persons responsible for the conduct of naval affairs should recognize that the two lines of policy, in direct contradiction to each other, do exist. In the one there is a strict analogy to a war of posts. While in the other the objective is that force whose destruction leaves the posts unsupported and therefore sure to fall in due time. These opposing policies being recognized, consideration should also be had of the results of the two as exemplified in the history of England and France. It was not, however, with such cautious views that the new king at first sought to impress his admirals. In the instructions addressed to the Count d'Orvilliers, commanding the first fleet sent out from Brest, the minister, speaking in the name of the king, says. Your duty now is to restore to the French flag the luster with which it once shone. Past misfortunes and faults must be buried out of sight, only by the most illustrious actions can the navy hope to succeed in doing this. His majesty has the right to expect the greatest efforts from his officers. Under whatever circumstances the king's fleet may be placed, his majesty's orders, which he expressly charges me to impress upon you, as well as upon all officers in command, are that his ships attack with the greatest vigor, and defend themselves. On all occasions, to the last extremity. More follows to the same effect, upon which a French officer, who has not before been quoted in connection with this phase of French naval policy, says. How different this language from that held to our admirals during the last war. For it would be an error to believe that they followed by choice and temper the timid and defensive system which predominated in the tactics of the navy. The government, always finding the expenses exacted by the employment of the navy excessive, too often prescribed to its admirals to keep the sea as long as possible without coming to pitched battles, or even to brushes, generally very expensive and from which might follow the loss of ships difficult to replace. Often they were enjoined, if driven to accept action, carefully to avoid compromising the fate of their squadron by two decisive encounters. They thought themselves, therefore, obliged to retreat as soon as an engagement took too serious a turn. Thus they acquired the unhappy habit of voluntarily yielding the field of battle as soon as an enemy, even inferior, boldly disputed it with them. Thus to send a fleet to meet the enemy, only to retire shamefully from his presence. To receive action instead of offering it, to begin battles only to end them with the semblance of defeat, to ruin moral force in order to save physical force, that was the spirit which, as has been very judiciously said by M. Charles de Pan, guided the French ministry of that epoch. The results are known. The brave words of Louis XVI were followed almost immediately by others, of different and qualifying tenor, to Admiral d'Orvilliers before he sailed. He was informed that the king, having learned the strength of the English fleet, 
relied upon his prudence as to the conduct to be followed at a moment when he had under his orders all the naval force of which France could dispose. As a matter of fact the two fleets were nearly equal, it would be impossible to decide which was the stronger, without detailed information as to the armament of every ship. D'Orvilliers found himself, as many a responsible man has before, with two sets of orders, on one or the other of which he was sure to be impaled, if unlucky, while the government, in the same event, was sure of a scapegoat. The consideration of the relative force of the two navies, material and moral, has necessarily carried us beyond the date of the opening of the American Revolutionary War. Before beginning with that struggle, it may be well to supplement the rough estimate of England's total naval force, given, in lack of more precise information. By the statement of the First Lord of the Admiralty made in the House of Lords in November, 1777, a very few months before the war with France began. Replying to a complaint of the opposition as to the smallness of the Channel Fleet, he said. We have now 42 ships of the line in commission in Great Britain, without counting those on foreign service. 35 of which are completely manned, and ready for sea at a moment's warning. I do not believe that either France or Spain entertains any hostile disposition toward us, but from what I have now submitted to you, I am authorized to affirm that our navy is more than a match for that of the whole House of Bourbon. It must, however, be said that this pleasing prospect was not realized by Admiral Keppel when appointed to command in the following March, and looking at his fleet with, to use his own apt expression, a seaman's eye. And in June he went to sea with only twenty ships. It is plainly undesirable to insert in a narrative of this character any account of the political questions which led to the separation of the United States from the British Empire. It has already been remarked that the separation followed upon a succession of blunders by the English ministry, not unnatural in view of the ideas generally prevalent at that day as to the relations of colonies to the mother country. It needed a man of commanding genius to recognize, not only the substantial justice of the American claims, many did that, but also the military strength of their situation, as before indicated. This lay in the distance of the colonies from home, their nearness to each other independently of the command of the sea, the character of the colonists, mainly of English and Dutch stock, and the probable hostility of France and Spain. Unfortunately for England, the men most able to cope with the situation were in the minority and out of office. It has been said before that, had the thirteen colonies been islands, the sea power of Great Britain would have so completely isolated them that their fall, one after the other, must have ensued. To this it may be added that the narrowness of the strip then occupied by civilized man, and the manner in which it was intersected by estuaries of the sea and navigable rivers, practically reduced to the condition of islands. So far as mutual support went, great sections of the insurgent country, which were not large enough to stand alone, yet too large for their fall not to have been a fatal blow to the common cause. The most familiar case is that of the line of the Hudson, where the Bay of New York was held from the first by the British, who also took the city in September, 1776, two months after the Declaration of Independence. The difficulties in the way of moving up and down such a stream were doubtless much greater to sailing vessels than they now are to steamers. Yet it seems impossible to doubt that active and capable men wielding the great sea power of England could so have held that river and Lake Champlain with ships of war at intervals and accompanying galleys as to have supported a sufficient army moving between the headwaters of the Hudson and the lake. While themselves preventing any intercourse by water between New England and the states west of the river. This operation would have closely resembled that by which in the Civil War the United States fleets and armies gradually cut in twain the Southern Confederacy by mastering the course of the Mississippi. And the political results would have been even more important than the military. For at that early stage of the war the spirit of independence was far more general and bitter in the section that would have been cut off, in New England, than in New York and New Jersey, perhaps than anywhere except in South Carolina. In 1777 the British attempted to accomplish this object by sending General Burgoyne from Canada to force his way by Lake Champlain to the Hudson. At the same time Sir Henry Clinton moved north from New York with 3,000 men, and reached West Point, whence he sent by shipping a part of his force up the river to within 40 miles of Albany. Here the officer in command learned of the surrender of Burgoyne at Saratoga, and returned, 
but what he did at the head of a detachment from a main body of only 3,000, shows what might have been done under a better system. While this was happening on the Hudson, the English commander-in-chief of the troops acting in America had curiously enough made use of the sea power of his nation to transport the bulk of his army, 14,000 men, from New York to the head of Chesapeake Bay, so as to take Philadelphia in the rear. This eccentric movement was successful as regarded its objective, Philadelphia, but it was determined by political considerations, because Philadelphia was the seat of Congress, and was contrary to sound military policy. The conquest therefore was early lost, but it was yet more dearly won, for by this diversion of the British forces the different corps were placed out of mutual support, and the control of the waterline of the Hudson was abandoned. While Burgoyne, with 7,000 regular troops, besides auxiliaries, was moving down to seize the headwaters of the river, 14,000 men were removed from its mouth to the Chesapeake. The 8,000 left in or near New York were consequently tied to the city by the presence of the American army in New Jersey. This disastrous step was taken in August, in October Burgoyne, isolated and hemmed in, surrendered. In the following May the English evacuated Philadelphia, and after a painful and perilous march through New Jersey, with Washington's army in close pursuit, regained New York. This taking of the British fleet to the head of the Chesapeake, coupled with the ascent of the Potomac in 1814 by English sailing frigates, shows another weak line in the chain of the American colonies. But it was not, like that of the Hudson and Champlain, a line both ends of which rested in the enemy's power, in Canada on the one hand, on the sea on the other. As to the sea warfare in general, it is needless to enlarge upon the fact that the colonists could make no head against the fleets of Great Britain, and were consequently forced to abandon the sea to them, resorting only to a cruising warfare. Mainly by privateers, for which their seamanship and enterprise well fitted them, and by which they did much injury to English commerce. By the end of 1778 the English naval historian estimates that American privateers had taken nearly a thousand merchant ships, valued at nearly two million pounds, he claims, however, that the losses of the Americans were heavier. They should have been. For the English cruisers were both better supported and individually more powerful, while the extension of American commerce had come to be the wonder of the statesmen of the mother country. When the war broke out, it was as great as that of England herself at the beginning of the century. An interesting indication of the number of the seafaring population of North America at that time is given by the statement in Parliament by the First Lord of the Admiralty. That the Navy had lost 18,000 of the seamen employed in the last war by not having America, no inconsiderable loss to a sea power, particularly if carried over to the ranks of the enemy. The course of warfare on the sea gave rise, as always, to grievances of neutrals against the English for the seizures of their ships in the American trade. Such provocation, however, was not necessary to excite the enmity and the hopes of France in the harassed state of the British government. The hour of reckoning, of vengeance, at which the policy of Choiseul had aimed, seemed now at hand. The question was early entertained at Paris what attitude should be assumed, what advantage drawn from the revolt of the colonies. It was decided that the latter should receive all possible support short of an actual break with England. And to this end a Frenchman named Beaumarchais was furnished with money to establish a business house which should supply the colonists with warlike stores. France gave a million francs, to which Spain added an equal sum, and Beaumarchais was allowed to buy from government arsenals. Meanwhile agents were received from the United States, and French officers passed into its service with little real hindrance from their government. Beaumarchais House was started in 1776. In December of that year Benjamin Franklin landed in France, and in May, 1777, Lafayette came to America. Meanwhile, the preparations for war, especially for a sea war, were pushed on. The navy was steadily increased, and arrangements were made for threatening an invasion from the Channel, while the real scene of the war was to be in the colonies. There France was in the position of a man who has little to lose. Already despoiled of Canada, she had every reason to believe that a renewal of war, with Europe neutral and the Americans friends instead of enemies, would not rob her of her islands. Recognizing that the Americans, who less than twenty years before had insisted upon the conquest of Canada, 
would not consent to her regaining it, she expressly stipulated that she would have no such hopes. But exacted that in the coming war she should retain any English West Indian possessions which she could seize. Spain was differently situated. Hating England, wanting to regain Gibraltar, Menorca, and Jamaica, no mere jewels in her crown, but foundation stones of her sea power. She nevertheless saw that the successful rebellion of the English colonists against the hitherto unrivaled sea power of the mother country would be a dangerous example to her own enormous colonial system, from which she yearly drew so great subsidies. If England with her navy should fail, what could Spain achieve? In the introductory chapter it was pointed out that the income of the Spanish government was drawn, not as a light tax upon a wealthy sea power, built upon the industry and commerce of the kingdom but from a narrow stream of gold and silver trickling through a few treasure ships loaded with the spoils of colonies administered upon the narrowest system. Spain had much to lose, as well as to gain. It was true still, as in 1760, that she was the power with which England could war to the greatest advantage. Nevertheless, existing injuries and dynastic sympathy carried the day. Spain entered upon the secretly hostile course pursued by France. To this explosive condition of things the news of Burgoyne's surrender acted as a spark. The experience of former wars had taught France the worth of the Americans as enemies, and she was expecting to find in them valuable helpers in her schemes of revenge. Now it seemed that even alone they might be able to take care of themselves, and reject any alliance. The tidings reached Europe on the 2d of December, 1777. On the 16th the French foreign minister informed the commissioners of Congress that the king was ready to recognize the independence of the United States, and to make with them a commercial treaty and contingent defensive alliance. The speed with which the business was done shows that France had made up her mind, and the treaty, so momentous in its necessary consequences, was signed on the 6th of February, 1778. It is not necessary to give the detailed terms of the treaty. But it is important to observe, first, that the express renunciation of Canada and Nova Scotia by France foreshadowed that political theory which is now known as the Monroe Doctrine. The claims of which can scarcely be made good without an adequate sea force. And next, that the alliance with France, and subsequently with Spain, brought to the Americans that which they above all needed, a sea power to counterbalance that of England. Will it be too much for American pride to admit that, had France refused to contest the control of the sea with England, the latter would have been able to reduce the Atlantic seaboard. Let us not kick down the ladder by which we mounted, nor refuse to acknowledge what our fathers felt in their hour of trial. Before going on with the story of this maritime war, the military situation as it existed in the different parts of the world should be stated. The three features which cause it to differ markedly from that at the opening of the Seven Years' War, in 1756, are, 1, the hostile relation of America to England, 2, the early appearance of Spain as the ally of France, and, 3, the neutrality of the other continental states, which left France without preoccupation on the land side. On the North American continent the Americans had held Boston for two years. Narragansett Bay and Rhode Island were occupied by the English, who also held New York and Philadelphia. Chesapeake Bay and its entrance, being without strong posts, were in the power of any fleet that appeared against them. In the South, since the unsuccessful attack upon Charlestown in 1776, no movement of importance had been made by the English, up to the declaration of war by France the chief events of the war had been north of the Chesapeake, of Baltimore. In Canada, on the other hand, the Americans had failed, and it remained to the end a firm base to the English power. In Europe the most significant element to be noted is the state of preparedness of the French navy, and to some extent of the Spanish, as compared with previous wars. England stood wholly on the defensive, and without allies. While the Bourbon kings aimed at the conquest of Gibraltar and Port Mahone, and the invasion of England. The first two, however, were the dear objects of Spain, the last of France. And this divergence of aims was fatal to the success of this maritime coalition. In the introductory chapter allusion was made to the strategic question raised by these two policies. In the West Indies the grip of the two combatants on the land was in fact about equal, 
though it should not have been so. Both France and England were strongly posted in the Windward Islands, the one at Martinique, the other at Barbados. It must be noted that the position of the latter, to windward of all others of the group, was a decided strategic advantage in the days of sail. As it happened, the fighting was pretty nearly confined to the neighborhood of the Lesser Antilles. Here, at the opening of the struggle, the English island of Dominica lay between the French Martinique and Guadeloupe, it was therefore coveted and seized. Next south of Martinique lay Sta Lucia, a French colony. Its strong harbor on the lee side, known as Gros Islet Bay, was a capital place from which to watch the proceedings of the French navy in Fort Royal, Martinique. The English captured the island, and from that safe anchorage Rodney watched and pursued the French fleet before his famous action in 1782. The islands to the southward were of inferior military consequence. In the greater islands, Spain should have outweighed England, holding as she did Cuba, Puerto Rico, and, with France, Haiti, as against Jamaica alone. Spain, however, counted here for nothing but a dead weight. And England had elsewhere too much on her hands to attack her. The only point in America where the Spanish arms made themselves felt was in the great region east of the Mississippi, then known as Florida, which, though at that time an English possession, did not join the revolt of the colonies. In the East Indies it will be remembered that France had received back her stations at the Peace of 1763, but the political predominance of the English in Bengal was not offset by similar control of the French in any part of the peninsula. During the ensuing years the English had extended and strengthened their power, favoured in so doing by the character of their chief representatives, Clive and Warren Hastings. Powerful native enemies had, however, risen against them in the south of the peninsula, both on the east and west, affording an excellent opportunity for France to regain her influence when the war broke out. But her government and people remained blind to the possibilities of that vast region. Not so England. The very day the news of the outbreak of war reached Calcutta, July 7, 1778, Hastings sent orders to the governor of Madras to attack Pondicherry, and set the example by seizing Shandanagor. The naval force of each nation was insignificant. But the French Commodore, after a brief action, forsook Pondicherry, which surrendered after a siege by land in sea of seventy days. The following March, 1779, Mahe, the last French settlement, fell, and the French flag again disappeared. While at the same time there arrived a strong English squadron of six ships of the line under Admiral Hughes. The absence of any similar French force gave the entire control of the sea to the English until the arrival of Suffren, nearly three years later. In the meanwhile Holland had been drawn into the war, and her stations, Negapatam on the Coromandel coast, and the very important harbour of Trincomalee in Ceylon, were both captured, the latter in January, 1782, by the joint forces of the army and navy. The successful accomplishment of these two enterprises completed the military situation in Hindostan at the time when the arrival of Suffren, just one month later, turned the nominal war into a desperate and bloody contest. Suffren found himself with a decidedly stronger squadron, but without a port, either French or Allied, on which to base his operations against the English. Of these four chief theatres of the war, two, North America and the West Indies, as might be expected from their nearness, blend and directly affect each other. This is not so obviously the case with the struggles in Europe and India. The narrative therefore naturally falls into three principal divisions, which may to some extent be treated separately. After such separate consideration their mutual influence will be pointed out, together with any useful lessons to be gathered from the goodness or badness, the success or failure, of the grand combinations, and from the part played by sea power. On the 13th of March, 1778, the French ambassador at London notified the English government that France had acknowledged the independence of the United States, and made with them a treaty of commerce and defensive alliance. England at once recalled her ambassador, but though war was imminent and England at disadvantage, the Spanish king offered mediation, and France wrongly delayed to strike. In June, Admiral Keppel sailed from Portsmouth, with twenty ships, on a cruise. Falling in with two French frigates, his guns, to bring them to, opened the war. 
finding from their papers that 32 French ships lay in Brest, he at once returned for reinforcements. Sailing again with 30 ships, he fell in with the French fleet under Dorvilliers to the westward of Ushant, and to windward, with a westerly wind. On the 27th of July was fought the first fleet action of the war, generally known as the Battle of Ushant. This battle, in which 30 ships of the line fought on either side, was wholly indecisive in its results. No ship was taken or sunk. Both fleets, after separating, returned to their respective ports. The action nevertheless obtained great celebrity in England from the public indignation at its lack of result, and from the storm of naval and political controversy which followed. The admiral and the officer third in command belonged to different political parties, they made charges, one against the other, and in the following courts martial all England divided, chiefly on party lines. Public and naval sentiment generally favoured the commander-in-chief, Keppel. PL 9. Tactically, the battle presents some interesting features, and involves one issue which is still living today. Keppel was to leeward and wished to force an action, in order to do this he signalled a general chase to windward, so that his fastest ships might overtake the slower ones of the enemy. Granting equal original fleet speed, this was quite correct. Dorvilliers, to windward, had no intention of fighting except on his own terms. As will generally be the case, the fleet acting on the offensive obtained its wish. At daybreak of the 27th both fleets were on the port tack, heading west-northwest, with a steady breeze at southwest, plate 9, A, A, A. The English rear, R, had fallen to leeward, and Keppel consequently made signal to six of its ships to chase to windward, so as to place them in a better position to support the main body if it could get into action. Dorvilliers observed this movement, and construed it to show an intention to attack his rear with a superior force. The two fleets being then from six to eight miles apart, he wore his fleet in succession, French A to B, by which he lost ground to leeward, but approached the enemy, and was able to see them better, positions B, B, B. At the completion of this evolution the wind hauled to the southward, favouring the English. So Keppel, instead of going about, stood on for half an hour more, English B to C, and then tacked together in wake of the French. This confirmed Dorvilliers' suspicions, and as the wind, which certainly favoured the English that morning, now hauled back again to the westward, permitting them to lay up for the French rear, he wore his fleet together, B to C. Thus bringing the rest to aid the rear, now become the van, and preventing Keppel from concentrating on or penetrating it. The two fleets thus passed on opposite tacks, C, exchanging ineffective broadsides, the French running free to windward and having the power to attack, but not using it. Dorvilliers then made the signal for his van, formerly the rear, to wear to leeward of the English rear, which was to leeward of its own main body, intending himself to remain to windward and so attack it on both sides. But the commander of that division, a prince of the blood royal, did not obey, and the possible advantage was lost. On the English side the same maneuver was attempted. The admiral of the van and some of his ships tacked, as soon as out of fire, d, and stood after the French rear, but for the most part the damage to rigging prevented tacking, and wearing was impossible on account of the ships coming up behind. The French now stood to leeward and formed line again, but the English were not in condition to attack. This was the end of the battle. It has been said that there are some interesting points about this resultless engagement. One is, that Keppel's conduct was approved throughout, on oath before the court-martial, by one of the most distinguished admirals England has brought forth, Sir John Jervis, who commanded a ship in the fleet. It does not indeed appear what he could have done more, but his lack of tactical understanding is shown by a curious remark in his defence. If the French admiral really meant to come to action, says he, I apprehend he would never have put his fleet on the contrary tack to that on which the British fleet was approaching. This remark can only proceed from ignorance or thoughtlessness of the danger to which the rear of the French fleet would have been exposed, and is the more curious as he himself had said the English were lying up for it. Keppel's idea seems to have been that the French should have waited for him to come up abreast, and then go at it, ship for ship, in what was to him the good old style, Dorvilliers was too highly trained to be capable of such action. The failure of the Duc de Chartres 
commanding the French van during the firing, to wear in obedience to orders, whether due to misunderstanding or misconduct, raises the question, which is still debated. As to the proper position for a naval commander-in-chief in action. Had Dorvilliers been in the van, he could have ensured the evolution he wished. From the center the admiral has the extremities of his fleet equally visible, or invisible, as it may be. At the head he enforces his orders by his example. The French toward the end of this war solved the question by taking him out of the line altogether and putting him on board a frigate. For the avowed reasons that he could thus better see the movements of his fleet and of the enemy without being blinded by smoke or distracted by the occurrences on board his own ship, and that his signals could be better seen. This position, resembling somewhat that of a general on shore, being remote from personal risk, was also assumed by Lord Howe in 1778, but both that officer and the French abandoned the practice later. Nelson at Trafalgar, the end of his career, led his column, but it may be doubted whether he had any other motive than his ardor for battle. The two other great attacks in which he commanded in chief were directed against ships at anchor, and in neither did he take the head of the column. For the good reason that, his knowledge of the ground being imperfect, the leading ship was in most danger of grounding. The common practice in the days of broadside sailing ships, except when a general chase was ordered, was for the admiral to be in the line, and in the center of it. The departure from this custom on the part of both Nelson and Collingwood, each of whom led his own columns at Trafalgar, may have had some reason, and an ordinary man rather shrinks from criticizing the action of officers of their eminence. The danger to which were exposed the two senior officers of the fleet, upon whom so much depended, is obvious. And had any serious injury befallen their persons, or the head of their columns, the lack of their influence would have been seriously felt. As it was, they were speedily obliterated, as admirals, in the smoke of the battle, leaving to those who came after them no guidance or control except the brilliancy of their courage and example. A French admiral has pointed out that the practical effect of the mode of attack at Trafalgar, two columns bearing down upon a line at right angles to them, was to sacrifice the head of the columns in making two breaches in the enemy's line. So far, very well, the sacrifice was well worthwhile, and into these breaches came up the rear ships of each column, nearly fresh, forming in fact a reserve which fell upon the shattered ships of the enemy on either side of the breaks. Now this idea of a reserve prompts a thought as to the commander-in-chief. The size of his ship was such as precluded its being out of the order. But would it not have been well had the admiral of each column been with this reserve, keeping in his hands the power of directing it according to the chances of the action, making him a reality as well as a name for some time longer. And to a very useful purpose. The difficulty of arranging any system of signals or light dispatch boats which could take the place of the aides or messengers of a general, coupled with the fact that ships cannot stand still, as divisions of men do, waiting orders. But that they must have steerage way, precludes the idea of putting an admiral of a fleet under way in a light vessel. By so doing he becomes simply a spectator. Whereas by being in the most powerful ship of the fleet he retains the utmost weight possible after action is once engaged, and, if this ship be in the reserve. The admiral keeps to the latest possible moment the power of commander-in-chief in his own hands. Half a loaf is better than no bread, if the admiral cannot, from the conditions of sea warfare, occupy the calmly watchful position of his brother on shore, let there be secured for him as much as may be. The practice of Farragut after New Orleans and Vicksburg, that is to say, in the latter part of his career, when it may be believed experience had determined his views, was to lead in person. It is known that he very reluctantly, at the solicitation of various officers, yielded his convictions in this matter at Mobile so far as to take the second place, and afterward freely expressed his regrets for having done so. It may, however, be argued that the character of all the actions in which Farragut commanded had a peculiarity, differentiating them from battles in the strict sense of the word. At New Orleans, at Vicksburg, at Port Hudson, and at Mobile, the task was not to engage, but to pass fortifications which the fleet confessedly could not stand up to. And the passage was to be made under conditions mainly of pilotage upon ground as to which, unlike Nelson, he had good knowledge. 
There was thus imposed upon the commander-in-chief the duty of leadership in the literal, as well as the military, sense of the term. So leading, he not only pointed out to the fleet the safe road, but, drawing continually ahead of the smoke, was better able to see and judge the path ahead. And to assume the responsibility of a course which he may have prescribed and intended throughout, but from which a subordinate might shrink. It has not perhaps been commonly noted, that at Mobile the leaders, not only of one but of both columns, at the critical point of the road hesitated and doubted as to the admiral's purpose. Not that they had not received it clearly, but because circumstances seemed to them to be different from what he had supposed. Not only Alden in the Brooklyn, but Craven also in the Tecumseh, departed from the admiral's orders and left the course dictated to them, with disastrous results. There is no necessity to condemn either captain. But the irresistible inference is that Farragut was unqualifiedly right in his opinion that the man who alone has the highest responsibility should, under the conditions of his battles, be in the front. And here it must be remarked that at such critical moments of doubt any but the highest order of mind tends to throw off the responsibility of decision upon the superior, though from the instancy of the case hesitation or delay may be fatal. A man who as the commissioned chief would act intelligently, as the mere subordinate will balk. Nelson's action at ST. Vincent will rarely be emulated, a truth which is strongly shown by the fact that Collingwood was immediately in his rear that day, and did not imitate his action till signaled by the commander-in-chief. Yet after receiving the authority of the signal, he particularly distinguished himself by his judgment and daring. It will be recalled, also, in connection with this question of pilot ground battles, that a central position nearly lost the flagship at New Orleans, owing to the darkness and to the smoke from the preceding ships. The United States fleet came near finding itself without its leader after the passage of the forts. Now as the mention of a reserve prompted one set of considerations, so the name of pilotage suggests certain ideas, broader than itself, which modify what has been said of keeping the admiral with the reserve. The ease and quickness with which a steam fleet can change its formation make it very probable that a fleet bearing down to attack may find itself, almost at the very moment of collision, threatened with some unlooked for combination. Then where would be the happiest position for an admiral? Doubtless in that part of his own order where he could most readily pilot his ships into the new disposition, or direction, by which he would meet the changed conditions. That is, in the position of leading. It would seem that there are always two moments of greatest importance in a sea fight, one which determines the method of the main attack, the other the bringing up and directing the effort of the reserve. If the first is more important, the second perhaps requires the higher order of ability, for the former may and should proceed on a before-determined plan, while the latter may, and often must, be shaped to meet unforeseen exigencies. The conditions of sea battles of the future contain one element that land battles cannot have, the extreme rapidity with which encounters and changes of order can take place. However troops may be moved by steam to the field of battle, they will there fight on foot or on horseback, and with a gradual development of their plan, which will allow the commander-in-chief time to make his wishes known, as a rule, of course. In case of a change in the enemy's attack. On the other hand, a fleet, comparatively small in numbers and with its component units clearly defined, may be meditating an important change of which no sign can appear until it begins, and which will occupy but a few minutes. So far as these remarks are sound, they show the need of a second in command thoroughly conversant with not only the plans, but with the leading principles of action of his chief. A need plain enough from the fact that the two extremities of the order of battle may be necessarily remote, and that you want the spirit of the leader at both extremities. As he cannot be there in person, the best thing is to have an efficient second at one end. As regards Nelson's position at Trafalgar, mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, it is to be noted that the De Victory did nothing that another ship could not have done as well. And that the lightness of the wind forbade the expectation of any sudden change in the enemy's order. The enormous risk run by the person of the admiral, on whose ship was concentrated the fire of the enemy's line, and which led several captains to implore a change, was condemned long before by Nelson himself in one of his letters after the Battle of the Nile. I think, if it had pleased God I had not been wounded, not a boat would have escaped to have told the tale. 
but do not believe that any individual in the fleet is to blame. I only mean to say that if my experience could in person have directed those individuals, there was every appearance that Almighty God would have continued to bless my endeavors, etc. Yet, notwithstanding such an expression of opinion based upon experience, he took the most exposed position at Trafalgar, and upon the loss of the leader there followed a curious exemplification of its effects. Collingwood at once, rightly or wrongly, avoidably or unavoidably, reversed Nelson's plans, urged with his last breath. Anchor. Hardy, do you anchor, said the dying chief. Anchor, said Collingwood. It is the last thing I should have thought of. Footnotes. Troud, Butterley's Navels. Mahone, History of England. Lapiraus Bonfils, Volume 3. Page 5. Troud, Volume 2. Pages 3 to 5. For other quotations from French authors to the same effect, see Ante, pages 77, 80, 81. Mahone, History of England, Gentleman's Magazine, 1777, page 553. Keppel's Defense. A candid view of our affairs, which I am going to exhibit, will make you a judge of the difficulties under which we labor. Almost all our supplies of flour and no inconsiderable part of our meat are drawn from the states westward of Hudson's River. This renders a secure communication across that river indispensably necessary, both to the support of your squadron and the army. The enemy, being masters of that navigation, would interrupt this essential intercourse between the states. They have been sensible of these advantages. If they could by any demonstration in another part draw our attention and strength from this important point, and by anticipating our return possess themselves of it, the consequences would be fatal. Our dispositions must therefore have equal regard to cooperating with you, at Boston, in a defensive plan, and securing the North River, which the remoteness of the two objects from each other renders peculiarly difficult. Washington to Destang, September 11, 1778. Annual Register, 1778, page 201. In this plate the plan followed in every other instance, of showing only the characteristic phases of a battle, in succession, but disconnected, has been abandoned. And the attempt is to indicate continuously the series of maneuvers and the tracks by which the fleets at last came into contact, from A to C. As the battle consisted merely in the passage by each other of two fleets, moving in opposite parallel directions, an encounter always indecisive and futile. The previous maneuvers constitute the chief interest in an affair whose historical importance is due to other than tactical reasons. The line drawn through the center of the English fleet at a shows the close-hauled line, south-southeast, on which, by strict tactical requirement, the English ships should have borne from each other. The leading ships of the two fleets diverged from each other, C, which is, by the French, attributed to the English van keeping away, by the English it is said that the French van luffed. The latter account is followed in the diagrams. The position D, separated from the rest of the plan, shows the end of the passage by, which began at C. It could not be shown in connection with the other tracks without producing confusion. Afterward Duc d'Orleans. The Philippe Egalité of the French Revolution, and father of Louis Philippe. The capture of the French commander-in-chief on board his flagship, in the Battle of April 12, 1782, was also a motive for this new order. The following incident, occurring during Rodney's chase of de Grasse, in April, 1782, shows how far subordination may be carried. Hood was one of the finest of the British officers, nor does the author undertake to criticize his action. He was some miles from Rodney at the time. The separated French ship in the NW, having got the breeze at the same time as our van division, boldly stood for and endeavoured to weather the British advanced ships. That being the only way to regain her own fleet, then to windward. To such a length did she carry her audacity that she compelled the Alfred, the headmost ship of Sir Samuel Hood's division, to bear up in order to allow her to pass. Every eye was fixed upon the bold Frenchman, excepting those who were anxiously looking out on the commander-in-chief to make the signal to engage, but who, most likely from not supposing it could be an enemy, did not throw out the ardently looked-for signal, 
and therefore not a gun was fired. This is mentioned to show the state of discipline on board the ships composing Sir Samuel Hood's division, and that he, though second in command, would not fire a single shot until directed to do so by his commander-in-chief. It is more than probable that Sir S. Hood's reason for having waited for the signal to engage from his commander-in-chief, ere he would fire, arose from the supposition that had he been the occasion of prematurely bringing on an action under the above circumstances, he would have been responsible for the results. White's Naval Researches, page 97 Hood may have been influenced by Rodney's bearing toward inferiors whose initiative displeased him. The relations of the two seem to have been strained. Sir N. H. Nicholas, Dispatches and Letters of Lord Nelson Chapter 10 Maritime War in North America and West Indies, 1778-1781. Its influence upon the course of the American Revolution. Fleet actions off Granada, Dominica, and Chesapeake Bay. On the 15th of April, 1778, Admiral Comte d'Estaing sailed from Toulon for the American continent, having under his command twelve ships of the line and five frigates. With him went as a passenger a minister accredited to Congress who was instructed to decline all requests for subsidies, and to avoid explicit engagements relative to the conquest of Canada and other British possessions. The cabinet of Versailles, says a French historian, was not sorry for the United States to have near them a cause of anxiety, which would make them feel the value of the French alliance. While acknowledging the generous sympathy of many Frenchmen for their struggle, Americans need not blind themselves to the self-interestedness of the French government neither should they find fault. For its duty was to consider French interests first. D'Estaing's progress was very slow. It is said that he wasted much time in drills, and even uselessly. However that may be, he did not reach his destination, the Capes of the Delaware, until the 8th of July, making a passage of twelve weeks, four of which were spent in reaching the Atlantic. The English government had news of his intended sailing. And in fact, as soon as they recalled their ambassador at Paris, orders were sent to America to evacuate Philadelphia, and concentrate upon New York. Fortunately for them, Lord Howe's movements were marked by a vigor and system other than Destang's. First assembling his fleet and transports in Delaware Bay, and then hastening the embarkation of stores and supplies, he left Philadelphia as soon as the army had marched from there for New York. Ten days were taken up in reaching the mouth of the bay, but he sailed from it the 28th of June, ten days before D'Estaing arrived, though more than ten weeks after he had sailed. Once outside, a favoring wind took the whole fleet to Sandy Hook in two days. War is unforgiving, the prey that D'Estaing had missed by delays foiled him in his attempts upon both New York and Rhode Island. The day after Howe's arrival at Sandy Hook the English army reached the heights of Nevisink after an harassing march through New Jersey, with Washington's troops hanging upon its rear. By the active cooperation of the Navy it was carried up to New York by the 5th of July, and Howe then went back to bar the entrance to the port against the French fleet. As no battle followed, the details of his arrangements will not be given. But a very full and interesting account by an officer of the fleet can be found in Ekins's Naval Battles. Attention, however, may well be called to the combination of energy, thought, skill, and determination shown by the admiral. The problem before him was to defend a practicable pass with six 64-gun ships and three of 50, against eight of 74 guns or over, three 64s, and 150, it may be said against nearly double his own force. Destang anchored outside, south of the Hook, on the 11th of July, and there remained until the 22d, engaged in sounding the bar, and with every apparent determination to enter. On the 22d a high northeast wind, coinciding with a spring tide, raised the water on the bar to 30 feet. The French fleet got under way, and worked up to windward to a point fair for crossing the bar. Then Destang's heart failed him under the discouragement of the pilots, he gave up the attack and stood away to the southward. Naval officers cannot but sympathize with the hesitation of a seaman to disregard the advice of pilots, especially on a coast foreign to him, but such sympathy should not close their eyes to the highest type of character. Let anyone compare the action of Destang at New York with that of Nelson at Copenhagen and the Nile, 
or that of Farragut at Mobile and Port Hudson, and the inferiority of the Frenchman as a military leader, guided only by military considerations. Is painfully apparent. New York was the very center of the British power, its fall could not but have shortened the war. In fairness to D'Estaing, however, it must be remembered that other than military considerations had to weigh with him. The French admiral doubtless had instructions similar to those of the French minister, and he probably reasoned that France had nothing to gain by the fall of New York, which might have led to peace between America and England. And left the latter free to turn all her power against his own country. Less than that would have been enough to decide his wavering mind as to risking his fleet over the bar. How was more fortunate than D'Estaing, in having no divided purposes? Having escaped from Philadelphia and saved New York by his diligence, he had in store the further honor of saving Rhode Island by the like rapid movements. Scattered ships of war from a fleet dispatched from England now began to arrive. On the 28th of July Howe was informed that the French fleet, which had disappeared to the southward, had been seen heading for Rhode Island. In four days his fleet was ready for sea, but owing to contrary winds did not reach Point Judith till the 9th of August. There he anchored, and learned that D'Estaing had run the batteries the day before and anchored between Gould and Canonicut Islands. The Seaconet and Western Passages had also been occupied by French ships, and the fleet was prepared to sustain the American army in an attack upon the British works. The arrival of Howe, although his reinforcements did not raise the English fleet to over two-thirds the strength of the French, upset D'Estaing's plans. With the prevailing summer southwest breezes blowing straight into the bay, he was exposed to any attempts his adversary might make. That same night the wind shifted unexpectedly to the northward, and D'Estaing at once got under way and stood out to sea. Howe, though surprised by this unlooked-for act, for he had not felt himself strong enough to attack, also made sail to keep the weather gauge. The next twenty-four hours passed in maneuvering for the advantage. But on the night of the 11th of August a violent gale of wind dispersed the fleets. Great injury was done to the vessels of both, and among others the French flagship Languedoc of ninety guns lost all her masts and her rudder. Immediately after the gale two different English fifty-gun ships, in fighting order, fell in, the one with the Languedoc, the other with the Tunnant, of eighty guns, having only one mast standing. Under such conditions both English ships attacked, but night coming on, they ceased action, intending to begin again in the morning. When morning came, other French ships also came, and the opportunity was lost. It is suggestive to note that one of the captains was Hotham, who as admiral of the Mediterranean fleet, seventeen years later, so annoyed Nelson by his cool satisfaction in having taken only two ships, we must be contented. We have done very well. This was the immediate occasion of Nelson's characteristic saying, had we taken ten sail, and allowed the eleventh to escape, being able to get at her, I could never have called it well done. The English fell back on New York. The French rallied again off the entrance of Narragansett Bay, but D'Estaing decided that he could not remain on account of the damage to the squadron, and accordingly sailed for Boston on the 21st of August. Rhode Island was thus left to the English, who retained it for a year longer, evacuating then for strategic reasons. Howe on his part diligently repaired his ships, and sailed again for Rhode Island when he heard of the French being there. But meeting on the way a vessel with word of their going to Boston, he followed them to that harbor, in which they were too strongly placed to be attacked. Taking into consideration his enforced return to New York, the necessary repairs, and the fact that he was only four days behind the French at Boston. It may be believed that Howe showed to the end the activity which characterized the beginning of his operations. Scarcely a shot had been exchanged between the two fleets, yet the weaker had thoroughly outgeneraled the stronger. With the exception of the maneuvers for the weather gauge after D'Estaing left Newport, which have not been preserved, and of Howe's dispositions to receive the expected attack in New York Bay, the lessons are not tactical, but strategic. And of present application. Chief among them undoubtedly stands the value of celerity in watchfulness, combined with knowledge of one's profession. How learned of his danger by advices from home three weeks after D'Estaing sailed from Toulon. He had to gather in his cruisers from the Chesapeake and outside, 
get his ships of the line from New York and Rhode Island, embark the supplies of an army of 10,000 men, move down the Delaware, which unavoidably took 10 days. And round to New York again. Destang was 10 days behind him at the Delaware, 12 days at Sandy Hook, and only one day ahead of him in entering Newport, outside which harbor he had lain 10 days before sailing in. An English narrator in the fleet, speaking of the untiring labor between June 30, when the English army reached Nevisink, and the arrival of the French fleet on the 11th of July, says, Lord Howe attended in person as usual. And by his presence animated the zeal and quickened the industry of officers and men. In this quality he was a marked contrast to his amiable but indolent brother, General Howe. The same industry and watchfulness marked his remaining operations. As soon as the French ships hauled off to the southward, lookout vessels followed them, and preparations continued, notably of fire ships, for pursuit. The last ship that joined from England crossed the bar at New York on the 30th of July. On the 1st of August the fleet was ready for sea, with four fire ships. The accident of the wind delayed his next movements. But, as has been seen, he came up only one day after the entrance of the enemy into Newport, which his inferior force could not have prevented. But the object of the enemy, which he could not oppose, was frustrated by his presence. Destang was no sooner in Newport than he wished himself out. Howe's position was strategically excellent. With his weatherly position in reference to the prevailing winds, the difficulty of beating a fleet out through the narrow entrance to the harbour would expose the French ships trying it to be attacked in detail. While if the wind unluckily came fair, the admiral relied upon his own skill to save his squadron. Cooper, in one of his novels, The Two Admirals, makes his hero say to a cavilling friend that if he had not been in the way of good luck, he could not have profited by it. The sortie of the French, the subsequent gale, and the resulting damage were all what is commonly called luck, but if it had not been for Howe's presence off Point Judith threatening them, they would have ridden out the gale at their anchors inside. Howe's energy and his confidence in himself as a seaman had put him in the way of good luck, and it is not fair to deny his active share in bringing it about. But for him the gale would not have saved the British force in Newport. Destang, having repaired his ships, sailed with his whole force for Martinique on the 4th of November. On the same day Commodore Hotham left New York for Barbados, with five 64 and 50-gun ships and a convoy of 5,000 troops, destined for the conquest of Sta. Lucia Island. On the way a heavy gale of wind injured the French fleet more than the English, the French flagship losing her main and mizzen topmasts. The loss of these spars, and the fact that twelve unencumbered ships of war reached Martinique only one day before the convoy of fifty-nine English transports reached Barbados, a hundred miles farther on, tells badly for the professional skill which then and now is a determining feature in naval war. Admiral Barrington, commanding at Barbados, showed the same energy as Howe. The transports arrived on the 10th, the troops were kept on board, sailed on the morning of the 12th for Sta. Lucia, and anchored there at 3 p.m. the 13th. The same afternoon half the troops were landed, and the rest the next morning. They seized at once a better port, to which the admiral was about to move the transports when the appearance of Destang prevented him. All that night the transports were being warped inside the ships of war, and the latter anchored across the entrance to the bay, a special care being taken to strengthen the two extremities of the line. And to prevent the enemy from passing inside the weather end, as the English ships in after years did at the Battle of the Nile. The French was much more than double the English fleet, and if the latter were destroyed, the transports and troops would be trapped. Destang stood down along the English order twice from north to south, cannonading at long range, but did not anchor. Abandoning then his intentions against the fleet, he moved to another bay, landed some French soldiers, and assaulted the position of the English troops. Failing here also, he retired to Martinique. And the French garrison, which had been driven into the interior of the island, surrendered. It seems scarcely necessary to point out the admirable diligence of Admiral Barrington, to which and to the skill of his dispositions he owed this valuable strategic success, for such it was. Sta. Lucia was the island next south of Martinique, 
and the harbor of Gros Islet at its northern end was especially adapted to the work of watching the French depot at Fort Royal, their principal station in the West Indies. Thence Rodney pursued them before his great action in 1782. The absence of precise information causes hesitation in condemning Destang for this mortifying failure. His responsibility depends upon the wind, which may have been light under the land, and upon his power to anchor. The fact, however, remains that he passed twice along the enemy's line within cannon shot, yet did not force a decisive action. His course was unfavorably criticized by the great Suffren, then one of his captains. The English had thus retrieved the capture of Dominica, which had been taken on the 8th of September by the French governor of the West India Islands. There being no English squadron there, no difficulty had been met. The value of Dominica to the French has been pointed out, and it is necessary here to use the example of both Dominica and Estier. Lucia to enforce what has before been said, that the possession of these smaller islands depended solely upon the naval preponderance. Upon the grasp of this principle held by any one will depend his criticism upon the next action of Destang, to be immediately related. Six months of almost entire quiet followed the affair of Sta Lucia. The English were reinforced by the fleet of Byron, who took chief command, but the French, being joined by ten more ships of the line, remained superior in numbers. About the middle of June, Byron sailed with his fleet to protect a large convoy of merchant ships, bound for England, till they were clear of the islands. Destang then sent a very small expedition which seized St. Vincent, June 16, 1779, without difficulty, and on the 30th of June he sailed with his whole fleet to attack Granada. Anchoring off Georgetown on the 2d of July, he landed his soldiers, and on the 4th the garrison of 700 men surrendered the island. Meanwhile Byron, hearing of the loss of St. Vincent and probable attack on Granada, sailed with a large convoy of vessels carrying troops, and with twenty-one ships of the line, to regain the one and relieve the other. Receiving on the way definite information that the French were before Granada, he kept on for it, rounding the northwest point of the island at daybreak of July 6. His approach had been reported the day before to Destang, who remained at anchor, fearing lest with the currents and light winds he might drop too far to leeward if he let go the bottom. When the English came in sight, the French got under way. But the confused massing of their ships prevented Byron from recognizing at once the disparity of numbers, they having twenty-five ships of the line. He made signal for a general chase, and as the disorder of the French fleet forced it to form on the leewardmost ships, the English easily retained the advantage of the wind with which they approached. As the action began, therefore, the French were to the westward with a partly formed line, on the starboard tack, heading north, the rear in disorder, and to windward of the van in center, plate X, A. The English stood down with a fair wind, steering south by west on the port tack, between the island and the enemy, their leading ships approaching at a slight angle, but heading more directly for his yet unformed rear. While the English convoy was between its own fleet and the island, under special charge of three ships, A, A, which were now called in. As the signal so far commanded a general chase, the three fastest of the English, among which was the flag of the second in command, Admiral Barrington, came under fire of the French center and rear, apparently unsupported, b. and suffered much from the consequent concentration of fire upon them. When they reached the sternmost ships they wore upon the same tack with them and stood north, after and to windward of them, and at about the same time Byron, who had not before known of the surrender, saw the French flag flying over the forts. Signals followed to wear in succession, and for the advanced ships to form line for mutual support, ceasing the general chase under which the engagement had hitherto been fought. While the main body was still standing south on the port tack, three ships, Cornwall, Grafton, and Lyon, C., obeying literally the signal for close action, had passed much to leeward of the others drawing upon themselves most of the fire of the enemy's line. They thus suffered very severely in men and spars. And though finally relieved by the advanced ships, as these approached from the southward on the opposite tack, they were unable, after wearing, b, c, c, to keep up with the fleet, and so dropped astern and toward the French. 
The bulk of the injury sustained by the English fell upon these three, upon the three advanced ships under Barrington, and upon two others in the rear, a, a, which, seeing the van so heavily engaged, did not follow the successive movement. But bore down straight out of the order, and took their places at the head of the column, b, a, an act strongly resembling that which won Nelson such high renown at Capest. Vincent, but involving less responsibility. PLX. So far Byron had conducted his attack, using the initiative permitted him by the advantage of the wind and the disorder of the French rear. It will be observed that, though it was desirable to lose no time in assailing the latter while in confusion, it is questionable whether Barrington's three ships should have been allowed to separate as far as they seem to have done from the rest of the fleet. A general chase is permissible and proper when, from superiority of numbers, original or acquired, or from the general situation, the ships first in action will not be greatly outnumbered. Or subjected to overpowering concentration before support comes up, or when there is probability that the enemy may escape unless promptly struck. This was not so here. Nor should the Cornwall, Grafton, and Lyon have been permitted to take a course which allowed, almost compelled, the enemy to concentrate rather than diffuse his fire. The details of the affair are not precise enough to warrant more comment than naming these mistakes, without necessarily attributing them to fault on the part of the admiral. The French had up to this time remained strictly on the defensive, in accordance with their usual policy. There was now offered an opportunity for offensive action which tested Destang's professional qualities, and to appreciate which the situation at the moment must be understood. Both fleets were by this on the starboard tack, heading north, B, 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 the French to leeward. The latter had received little injury in their motive power, though their line was not in perfect order. But the English, owing to the faulty attack, had seven ships seriously crippled, four of which, the Monmouth, Grafton, Cornwall, C, and Lyon, C, were disabled. The last three, by 3 p.m., were a league astern and much to leeward of their line, being in fact nearer the French than the English, while the speed of the English fleet was necessarily reduced to that of the crippled ships remaining in line. These conditions bring out strongly the embarrassments of a fleet whose injuries are concentrated upon a few ships, instead of being distributed among all. The ten or twelve which were practically untouched had to conform to the capabilities of the others. Destang, with twenty-five ships, now had Byron to windward of him with seventeen or eighteen capable of holding together, but slower and less handy than their enemies. And saw him tactically embarrassed by the care of a convoy to windward and three disabled ships to leeward. Under these circumstances three courses were open to the French admiral, one, he might stretch ahead, and, tacking in succession, place himself between Byron and the convoy, throwing his frigates among the latter. Two, he might tack his fleet together and stand up to the English line to bring on a general action, or, three, he could, after going about, cut off the three disabled ships, which might bring on a general action with less exposure. None of these did he do. As regards the first, he, knowing the criticisms of the fleet, wrote home that his line was too much disordered to allow it. Whatever the technical irregularity, it is difficult to believe that, with the relative power of motion in the two fleets, the attempt was hopeless. The third alternative probably presented the greatest advantage, for it ensured the separation between the enemy's main body and the crippled ships. And might very probably exasperate the British admiral into an attack under most hazardous conditions. It is stated by English authorities that Byron said he would have borne down again, had any attack been made on them. At 3 p.m. Destang tacked altogether, forming line on the lee ship, and stood to the southward again. The English imitated this movement, except the van ship Monmouth, which being too badly hurt to maneuver kept on to the northward, and the three separated ships. Two of these, C, kept on north and passed once more under the French broadsides, but the Lion, C, unable to keep to the wind, kept broad off before it across the bows of the enemy, for Jamaica, a thousand miles away. She was not pursued. A single transport was the sole maritime trophy of the French. Had the admiral's seamanship equaled his courage, wrote the celebrated Suffren, 
who commanded the French van ship, we would not have suffered four dismasted vessels to escape. Destang, at the age of thirty, had been transferred from the army to the navy with the premature rank of rear admiral. The navy did not credit him with nautical ability when the war broke out, and it is safe to say that its opinion was justified by his conduct during it. Brave as his sword, Destang was always the idol of the soldier, the idol of the seaman. But moral authority over his officers failed him on several occasions, notwithstanding the marked protection extended to him by the king. Another cause than incapacity as a seaman has usually been assigned by French historians for the impotent action of Destang on this occasion. He looked upon Granada, they say, as the real objective of his efforts, and considered the English fleet a very secondary concern. Ramachuel, a naval tactician who served actively in this war and wrote under the empire, cites this case, which he couples with that of Yorktown and others, as exemplifying the true policy of naval war. His words, which probably reflect the current opinion of his service in that day, as they certainly do the policy of French governments, call for more than passing mention. As they involve principles worthy of most serious discussion. The French navy has always preferred the glory of assuring or preserving a conquest to that, more brilliant perhaps, but actually less real, of taking a few ships. And in that it has approached more nearly the true end to be proposed in war. What in fact would the loss of a few ships matter to the English? The essential point is to attack them in their possessions, the immediate source of their commercial wealth and of their maritime power. The War of 1778 furnishes examples which prove the devotion of the French admirals to the true interests of the country. The preservation of the island of Granada, the reduction of Yorktown where the English army surrendered, the conquest of the island of Esti. Christopher, were the result of great battles in which the enemy was allowed to retreat undisturbed, rather than risk giving him a chance to succor the points attacked. The issue could not be more squarely raised than in the case of Granada. No one will deny that there are moments when a probable military success is to be foregone, or postponed, in favor of one greater or more decisive. The position of de Grasse at the Chesapeake, in 1781, with the fate of Yorktown hanging in the balance, is in point, and it is here coupled with that of Destang at Granada, as though both stood on the same grounds. Both are justified alike. Not on their respective merits as fitting the particular cases, but upon a general principle. Is that principle sound? The bias of the writer quoted betrays itself unconsciously, in saying, a few ships. A whole navy is not usually to be crushed at a blow, a few ships mean an ordinary naval victory. In Rodney's famous battle only five ships were taken, though Jamaica was saved thereby. In order to determine the soundness of the principle, which is claimed as being illustrated by these two cases, St. Christopher will be discussed later on, it is necessary to examine what was the advantage sought, and what the determining factor of success in either case. At Yorktown the advantage sought was the capture of Cornwallis's army. The objective was the destruction of the enemy's organized military force on shore. At Granada the chosen objective was the possession of a piece of territory of no great military value. For it must be remarked that all these smaller Antilles, if held in force at all, multiplied large detachments, whose mutual support depended wholly upon the navy. These large detachments were liable to be crushed separately, if not supported by the navy, and if naval superiority is to be maintained, the enemy's navy must be crushed. Granada, near and to leeward of Barbados and Estia. Lucia, both held strongly by the English, was peculiarly weak to the French, but sound military policy for all these islands demanded one or two strongly fortified and garrisoned naval bases, and dependence for the rest upon the fleet. Beyond this, security against attacks by single cruisers and privateers alone was needed. Such were the objectives in dispute. What was the determining factor in this strife? Surely the navy, the organized military force afloat. Cornwallis's fate depended absolutely upon the sea. It is useless to speculate upon the result, had the odds on the 5th of September, 1781, in favor of de Grasse, been reversed. If the French, instead of five ships more, had had five ships less than the English. 
As it was, de Grasse, when that fight began, had a superiority over the English equal to the result of a hard-won fight. The question then was, should he risk the almost certain decisive victory over the organized enemy's force ashore, for the sake of a much more doubtful advantage over the organized force afloat? This was not a question of Yorktown, but of Cornwallis and his army, there is a great deal in the way things are put. So stated, and the statement needs no modifications, there can be but one answer. Let it be remarked clearly, however, that both de Grasse's alternatives brought before him the organized forces as the objective. Not so with de Stang at Granada. His superiority in numbers over the English was nearly as great as that of de Grasse. His alternative objectives were the organized force afloat in a small island, fertile, but militarily unimportant. Granada is said to have been a strong position for defense. But intrinsic strength does not give importance, if the position has not strategic value. To save the island, he refused to use an enormous advantage fortune had given him over the fleet. Yet upon the strife between the two navies depended the tenure of the islands. Seriously to hold the West India Islands required, first, a powerful seaport, which the French had, second, the control of the sea. For the latter it was necessary, not to multiply detachments in the islands, but to destroy the enemy's navy, which may be accurately called the army in the field. The islands were but rich towns. And not more than one or two fortified towns, or posts, were needed. It may safely be said that the principle which led to Destang's action was not, to say the least, unqualifiedly correct, for it led him wrong. In the case of Yorktown, the principle as stated by Ramachuel is not the justifying reason of de Grasse's conduct, though it likely enough was the real reason. What justified de Grasse was that, the event depending upon the unshaken control of the sea, for a short time only, he already had it by his greater numbers. Had the numbers been equal, loyalty to the military duty of the hour must have forced him to fight, to stop the attempt which the English admiral would certainly have made. The destruction of a few ships, as Ramachuel slightingly puts it, gives just that superiority to which the happy result at Yorktown was due. As a general principle, this is undoubtedly a better objective than that pursued by the French. Of course, exceptions will be found, but those exceptions will probably be where, as at Yorktown, the military force is struck at directly elsewhere, or, as at Port Mahone, a desirable and powerful base of that force is at stake. Though even at Mahone it is doubtful whether the prudence was not misplaced. Had Hawk or Boscoen met with Bing's disaster, they would not have gone to Gibraltar to repair it, unless the French admiral had followed up his first blow with others, increasing their disability. Granada was no doubt very dear in the eyes of Destang, because it was his only success. After making the failures at the Delaware, at New York, and at Rhode Island, with the mortifying affair at Estie. Lucia, it is difficult to understand the confidence in him expressed by some French writers. Gifted with a brilliant and contagious personal daring, he distinguished himself most highly, when an admiral, by leading in person assaults upon entrenchments at Estie. Lucia and Granada, and a few months later in the unsuccessful attack upon Savannah. During the absence of the French navy in the winter of 1778-79, the English, controlling now the sea with a few of their ships that had not gone to the West Indies, determined to shift the scene of the Continental War to the southern states. Where there was believed to be a large number of loyalists. The expedition was directed upon Georgia, and was so far successful that Savannah fell into their hands in the last days of 1778. The whole state speedily submitted. Operations were thence extended into South Carolina, but failed to bring about the capture of Charleston. Word of these events was sent to Destang in the West Indies, accompanied by urgent representations of the danger to the Carolinas, and the murmurings of the people against the French, who were accused of forsaking their allies. Having rendered them no service, but on the contrary having profited by the cordial help of the Bostonians to refit their crippled fleet. There was a sting of truth in the alleged failure to help, which impelled Destang to disregard the orders actually in his hands to return at once to Europe with certain ships. Instead of obeying them he sailed for the American coast with twenty-two ships of the line, 
having in view two objects, the relief of the southern states and an attack upon New York in conjunction with Washington's army. Arriving off the coast of Georgia on the 1st of September, Destang took the English wholly at unawares, but the fatal lack of promptness, which had previously marked the command of this very daring man, again betrayed his good fortune. Dallying at first before Savannah, the fleeting of precious days again brought on a change of conditions, and the approach of the bad weather season impelled him, too slow at first, into a premature assault. In it he displayed his accustomed gallantry, fighting at the head of his column, as did the American general, but the result was a bloody repulse. The siege was raised, and Destang sailed at once for France, not only giving up his project upon New York, but abandoning the southern states to the enemy. The value of this help from the great sea power of France, thus cruelly dangled before the eyes of the Americans only to be withdrawn, was shown by the action of the English. Who abandoned Newport in the utmost haste when they learned the presence of the French fleet. Withdrawal had been before decided upon, but Destang's coming converted it into flight. After the departure of Destang, which involved that of the whole French fleet, for the ships which did not go back to France returned to the West Indies, the English resumed the attack upon the southern states. Which had for a moment been suspended. The fleet and army left New York for Georgia in the last weeks of 1779, and after assembling at Tybee, moved upon Charleston by way of Edisto. The powerlessness of the Americans upon the sea left this movement unembarrassed save by single cruisers, which picked up some stragglers, affording another lesson of the petty results of a merely cruising warfare. The siege of Charleston began at the end of March, the English ships soon after passing the bar in Fort Moultrie without serious damage and anchoring within gunshot of the place. Fort Moultrie was soon and easily reduced by land approaches, and the city itself was surrendered on the 12th of May, after a siege of forty days. The whole state was then quickly overrun and brought into military subjection. The fragments of Destang's late fleet were joined by a reinforcement from France under the Comte de Guéchin, who assumed chief command in the West Indian Seas March 22, 1780. The next day he sailed for Sta. Lucia, which he hoped to find unprepared, but a crusty, hard-fighting old admiral of the traditional English type, Sir Hyde Parker, had so settled himself at the anchorage, with sixteen ships, that Guichen with his twenty-two would not attack. The opportunity, if it were one, did not recur. De Guichen, returning to Martinique, anchored there on the twenty-seventh, and the same day Parker at Sta. Lucia was joined by the new English commander-in-chief, Rodney. This since celebrated, but then only distinguished, Admiral was sixty-two years old at the time of assuming a command where he was to win an undying fame. Of distinguished courage and professional skill, but with extravagant if not irregular habits, money embarrassments had detained him in exile in France at the time the war began. A boast of his ability to deal with the French fleet, if circumstances enabled him to go back to England, led a French nobleman who heard it to assume his debts, moved by feelings in which chivalry and national pique probably bore equal shares. Upon his return he was given a command, and sailed, in January, 1780, with a fleet of twenty ships of the line, to relieve Gibraltar, then closely invested. Off Cadiz, with a good luck for which he was proverbial, he fell in with a Spanish fleet of eleven ships of the line, which awkwardly held their ground until too late to fly. Throwing out the signal for a general chase, and cutting into leeward of the enemy, between them and their port, Rodney, despite a dark and stormy night, succeeded in blowing up one ship and taking six. Hastening on, he relieved Gibraltar, placing it out of all danger from want, and then, leaving the prizes and the bulk of his fleet, sailed with the rest for his station. Despite his brilliant personal courage and professional skill, which in the matter of tactics was far in advance of his contemporaries in England, Rodney, as a commander-in-chief, belongs rather to the wary. Cautious school of the French tacticians than to the impetuous, unbounded eagerness of Nelson. As in Tourville we have seen the desperate fighting of the seventeenth century, unwilling to leave its enemy, merging into the formal, artificial, we may almost say trifling, parade tactics of the eighteenth. So in Rodney we shall see the transition from those ceremonious duels to an action which, while skillful in conception, aimed at serious results. 
for it would be unjust to Rodney to press the comparison to the French admirals of his day. With a skill that de Guichen recognized as soon as they crossed swords, Rodney meant mischief, not idle flourishes. Whatever incidental favors fortune might bestow by the way, the objective from which as I never wandered was the French fleet, the organized military force of the enemy on the sea. And on the day when fortune forsook the opponent who had neglected her offers, when the conqueror of Cornwallis failed to strike while he had Rodney at a disadvantage, the latter won a victory which redeemed England from the depths of anxiety. And restored to her by one blow all those islands which the cautious tactics of the Allies had for a moment gained, save only Tobago. De Guichen and Rodney met for the first time on the 17th of April, 1780, three weeks after the arrival of the latter. The French fleet was beating to windward in the channel between Martinique and Dominica, when the enemy was made in the southeast. A day was spent in maneuvering for the weather gauge, which Rodney got. The two fleets being now well to leeward of the islands, played eleven. Both on the starboard tack heading to the northward and the French on the lee bow of the English, Rodney, who was carrying a press of sail, signaled to his fleet that he meant to attack the enemy's rear and center with his whole force. And when he had reached the position he thought suitable, ordered them to keep away eight points, ninety degrees, together, a, a, a. De Guichen, seeing the danger of the rear, wore his fleet all together and stood down to succor it. Rodney, finding himself foiled, hauled up again on the same tack as the enemy, both fleets now heading to the southward and eastward. Later, he again made signal for battle, followed an hour after, just at noon, by the order, quoting his own dispatch, for every ship to bear down and steer for her opposite in the enemy's line. This, which sounds like the old story of ship to ship, Rodney explains to have meant her opposite at the moment, not her opposite in numerical order. His own words are, in a slanting position, that my leading ships might attack the van ships of the enemy's center division, and the whole British fleet be opposed to only two-thirds of the enemy, b, b. The difficulty and misunderstanding which followed seem to have sprung mainly from the defective character of the signal book. Instead of doing as the admiral wished, the leading ships, a, carried sail so as to reach their supposed station abreast their numerical opposite in the order. Rodney stated afterward that when he bore down the second time, the French fleet was in a very extended line of battle, and that, had his orders been obeyed, the center and rear must have been disabled before the van could have joined. PL 11. There seems every reason to believe that Rodney's intentions throughout were to double on the French, as asserted. The failure sprang from the signal book and tactical inefficiency of the fleet. For which he, having lately joined, was not answerable. But the ugliness of his fence was so apparent to de Guichen, that he exclaimed, when the English fleet kept away the first time, that six or seven of his ships were gone. And sent word to Rodney that if his signals had been obeyed he would have had him for his prisoner. A more convincing proof that he recognized the dangerousness of his enemy is to be found in the fact that he took care not to have the lee gauge in their subsequent encounters. Rodney's careful plans being upset, he showed that with them he carried all the stubborn courage of the most downright fighter. Taking his own ship close to the enemy and ceasing only when the latter hauled off, her foremast and mainyard gone, and her hull so damaged that she could hardly be kept afloat. An incident of this battle mentioned by French writers and by Bada, who probably drew upon French authorities, but not found in the English accounts, shows the critical nature of the attack in the apprehension of the French. According to them, Rodney, marking a gap in their order due to a ship in rear of the French admiral being out of station, tried to break through, b. But the captain of the, Destin, 74, pressed up under more sail and threw himself across the path of the English 90-gun ship. The action of the Destin was justly praised, says Lapiraus Bonfils. The fleet ran the danger of almost certain defeat, but for the bravery of M. de Goimpy. Such, after the affair, was the opinion of the whole French squadron. Yet, admitting that our line was broken, what disasters then would necessarily threaten the fleet? Would it not always have been easy for our rear to remedy the accident by promptly standing on to fill the place of the vessels cut off? That movement would necessarily have brought about a melee, 
which would have turned to the advantage of the fleet having the bravest and most devoted captains. But then, as under the empire, it was an acknowledged principle that ships cut off were ships taken, and the belief wrought its own fulfillment. The effect of breaking an enemy's line, or order of battle, depends upon several conditions. The essential idea is to divide the opposing force by penetrating through an interval found, or made, in it, and then to concentrate upon that one of the fractions which can be least easily helped by the other. In a column of ships this will usually be the rear. The compactness of the order attacked, the number of the ships cut off, the length of time during which they can be isolated and outnumbered, will all affect the results. A very great factor in the issue will be the moral effect, the confusion introduced into a line thus broken. Ships coming up toward the break are stopped, the rear doubles up, while the ships ahead continue their course. Such a moment is critical, and calls for instant action, but the men are rare who in an unforeseen emergency can see, and at once take the right course, especially if, being subordinates, they incur responsibility. In such a scene of confusion the English, without presumption, hope to profit by their better seamanship, for it is not only courage and devotion, but skill, which then tells. All these effects of breaking the line received illustration in Rodney's great battle in 1782. The Guichen and Rodney met twice again in the following month, but on neither occasion did the French admiral take the favorite lee gauge of his nation. Meanwhile a Spanish fleet of twelve ships of the line was on its way to join the French. Rodney cruised to windward of Martinique to intercept them. But the Spanish admiral kept a northerly course, sighted Guadeloupe, and then sent a dispatch to the Guichen, who joined his allies and escorted them into port. The great preponderance of the coalition, in numbers, raised the fears of the English islands, but lack of harmony led to delays and hesitations, a terrible epidemic raged in the Spanish squadron, and the intended operations came to nothing. In August the Guichen sailed for France with fifteen ships. Rodney, ignorant of his destination, and anxious about both North America and Jamaica, divided his fleet, leaving one half in the islands, and with the remainder sailing for New York, where he arrived on the 12th of September. The risk thus run was very great, and scarcely justifiable, but no ill effect followed the dispersal of forces. Had de Guichen intended to turn upon Jamaica, or, as was expected by Washington, upon New York, neither part of Rodney's fleet could well have withstood him. Two chances of disaster, instead of one, were run, by being in small force on two fields instead of in full force on one. Rodney's anxiety about North America was well grounded. On the 12th of July of this year the long-expected French succor arrived, 5,000 French troops under Rochambeau and seven ships of the line under de Tournay. Hence the English, though still superior at sea, felt forced to concentrate at New York, and were unable to strengthen their operations in Carolina. The difficulty and distance of movements by land gave such an advantage to sea power that Lafayette urged the French government further to increase the fleet. But it was still naturally and properly attentive to its own immediate interests in the Antilles. It was not yet time to deliver America. Rodney, having escaped the great hurricane of October, 1780, by his absence, returned to the West Indies later in the year, and soon after heard of the war between England and Holland. Which, proceeding from causes which will be mentioned later, was declared December 20, 1780. The Admiral at once seized the Dutch islands of St. Eustatius and St. Martin, besides numerous merchant ships, with property amounting in all to $15 million. These islands, while still neutral, had played a role similar to that of Nassau during the American Civil War, and had become a great depot of contraband goods, immense quantities of which now fell into the English hands. The year 1780 had been gloomy for the cause of the United States. The Battle of Camden had seemed to settle the English yoke on South Carolina, and the enemy formed high hopes of controlling both North Carolina and Virginia. The treason of Arnold following had increased the depression, which was but partially relieved by the victory at King's Mountain. The substantial aid of French troops was the most cheerful spot in the situation. Yet even that had a checkered light, the second division of the intended help being blocked in Brest by the English fleet, 
while the final failure of the Guichen to appear, and Rodney coming in his stead, made the hopes of the campaign fruitless. A period of vehement and decisive action was, however, at hand. At the end of March, 1781, the Comte de Grasse sailed from Brest with 26 ships of the line and a large convoy. When off the Azores, five ships parted company for the East Indies, under Suffren, of whom more will be heard later on. De Grasse came in sight of Martinique on the 28th of April. Admiral Hood, Rodney having remained behind at St. Eustatius, was blockading before Fort Royal, the French port and arsenal on the lee side of the island, in which were four ships of the line, when his lookouts reported the enemy's fleet. Hood had two objects before him, one to prevent the junction of the four blockaded ships with the approaching fleet, the other to keep the latter from getting between him and Gros Islet Bay in Sta. Lucia. Instead of effecting this in the next twenty-four hours, by beating to windward of the Diamond Rock, his fleet got so far to leeward that de Grasse, passing through the channel on the 29th, headed up for Fort Royal. Keeping his convoy between the fleet and the island. For this false position Hood was severely blamed by Rodney, but it may have been due to light winds and the lee current. However that be, the four ships in Fort Royal got underway and joined the main body. The English had now only eighteen ships to the French twenty-four, and the latter were to windward, but though thus in the proportion of four to three, and having the power to attack, de Grasse would not do it. The fear of exposing his convoy prevented him from running the chance of a serious engagement. Great must have been his distrust of his forces, one would say. When is a navy to fight, if this was not a time? He carried on a distant cannonade, with results so far against the English as to make his backwardness yet more extraordinary. Can a policy or a tradition which justifies such a line of conduct be good? The following day, April 30th, de Grasse, having thrown away his chance, attempted to follow Hood, but the latter had no longer any reason for fighting, and his original inferiority was increased by the severe injuries of some ships on the 29th. De Grasse could not overtake him, owing to the inferior speed of his fleet, many of the ships not being coppered, a fact worthy of note, as French vessels by model and size were generally faster than English. But this superiority was sacrificed through the delay of the government in adopting the new improvement. Hood rejoined Rodney at Antigua. And de Grasse, after remaining a short time at Fort Royal, made an attempt upon Gros Islet Bay, the possession of which by the English kept all the movements of his fleet under surveillance. Foiled here, he moved against Tobago, which surrendered June 2, 1781. Sailing thence, after some minor operations, he anchored on 26 July at Cap Francais, now Cape Haitien, in the island of Haiti. Here he found awaiting him a French frigate from the United States, bearing dispatches from Washington and Rochambeau, upon which he was to take the most momentous action that fell to any French admiral during the war. The invasion of the southern states by the English, beginning in Georgia and followed by the taking of Charleston and the military control of the two extreme states, had been pressed on to the northward by way of Camden into North Carolina. On the 16th of August, 1780, General Gates was totally defeated at Camden, and during the following nine months the English under Cornwallis persisted in their attempts to overrun North Carolina. These operations, the narration of which is foreign to our immediate subject, had ended by forcing Cornwallis, despite many successes in actual encounter, to fall back exhausted toward the seaboard, and finally upon Wilmington. In which place depots for such a contingency had been established. His opponent, General Green, then turned the American troops toward South Carolina. Cornwallis, too weak to dream of controlling, or even penetrating, into the interior of an unfriendly country, had now to choose between returning to Charleston, to assure there and in South Carolina the shaken British power. And moving northward again into Virginia, there to join hands with a small expeditionary force operating on the James River under Generals Phillips and Arnold. To fall back would be a confession that the weary marching and fighting of months past had been without results, and the general readily convinced himself that the Chesapeake was the proper seat of war, even if New York itself had to be abandoned. The commander-in-chief, Sir Henry Clinton, by no means shared this opinion, 
upon which was justified a step taken without asking him. Operations in the Chesapeake, he wrote, are attended with great risk unless we are sure of a permanent superiority at sea. I tremble for the fatal consequences that may ensue. For Cornwallis, taking the matter into his own hands, had marched from Wilmington on the 25th of April, 1781, joining the British already at Petersburg on the 20th of May. The forces thus united numbered 7,000 men. Driven back from the open country of South Carolina into Charleston, there now remained two centers of British power, at New York and in the Chesapeake. With New Jersey and Pennsylvania in the hands of the Americans, communication between the two depended wholly upon the sea. Despite his unfavorable criticism of Cornwallis's action, Clinton had himself already risked a large detachment in the Chesapeake. A body of 1,600 men under Benedict Arnold had ravaged the country of the James and burned Richmond in January of this same year. In the hopes of capturing Arnold, Lafayette had been sent to Virginia with a nucleus of 1,200 troops, and on the evening of 8 March the French squadron at Newport sailed, in concerted movement, to control the waters of the bay. Admiral Arbuthnot, commanding the English fleet lying in Gardiner's Bay, learned the departure by his lookouts, and started in pursuit on the morning of the 10th, 36 hours later. Favored either by diligence or luck, he made such good time that when the two fleets came in sight of each other, a little outside of the capes of the Chesapeake, the English were leading, plate 12, a, a. They at once went about to meet their enemy, who, on his part, formed a line of battle. The wind at this time was west, so that neither could head directly into the bay. The two fleets were nearly equal in strength, there being eight ships on each side, but the English had one ninety-gun ship, while of the French one was only a heavy frigate, which was put into the line. Nevertheless, the case was eminently one for the general French policy to have determined the action of a vigorous chief, and the failure to see the matter through must fall upon the goodwill of Commodore Destouches. Or upon some other cause than that preference for the ulterior objects of the operations, of which the reader of French naval history hears so much. The weather was boisterous and threatening, and the wind, after hauling once or twice, settled down to northeast, with a big sea, but was then fair for entering the bay. The two fleets were by this time both on the port tack standing out to sea, the French leading, and about a point on the weather bow of the English, B, B. From this position they wore in succession, C, ahead of the latter, taking the lee gauge, and thus gaining the use of their lower batteries, which the heavy sea forbade to the weather gauge. The English stood on till abreast the enemy's line, B, when they wore together, and soon after attacked in the usual manner, and with the usual results, C. The three van ships were very badly injured aloft, but in their turn, throwing their force mainly on the two leaders of the enemy, crippled them seriously in hulls and rigging. The French van then kept away, and Arbuthnot, in perplexity, ordered his van to haul the wind again. M. Destouches now executed a very neat movement by defiling. Signaling his van to haul up on the other tack, E., he led the rest of his squadron by the disabled English ships, and after giving them the successive broadsides of his comparatively fresh ships, wore, D., and out to sea, D. This was the end of the battle, in which the English certainly got the worst. But with their usual tenacity of purpose, being unable to pursue their enemy afloat, they steered for the bay, D., made the junction with Arnold, and thus broke up the plans of the French and Americans. From which so much had been hoped by Washington. There can be no doubt, after careful reading of the accounts, that after the fighting the French were in better force than the English, and they in fact claimed the victory. Yet the ulterior objects of the expedition did not tempt them again to try the issue with a fleet of about their own size. PL 12. The way of the sea being thus open and held in force, 2,000 more English troops sailing from New York reached Virginia on the 26th of March, and the subsequent arrival of Cornwallis in May raised the number to 7,000. The operations of the contending forces during the spring and summer months, in which Lafayette commanded the Americans, do not concern our subject. Early in August, Cornwallis, acting under orders from Clinton, withdrew his troops into the peninsula between the York and James Rivers, and occupied Yorktown. 
Washington and Rochambeau had met on the 21st of May, and decided that the situation demanded that the effort of the French West Indian fleet, when it came, should be directed against either New York or the Chesapeake. This was the tenor of the dispatch found by de Grasse at Cap Francais, and meantime the Allied generals drew their troops toward New York, where they would be on hand for the furtherance of one object. And nearer the second if they had to make for it. In either case the result, in the opinion both of Washington and of the French government, depended upon superior sea power. But Rochambeau had privately notified the admiral that his own preference was for the Chesapeake as the scene of the intended operations, and moreover the French government had declined to furnish the means for a formal siege of New York. The enterprise therefore assumed the form of an extensive military combination, dependent upon ease and rapidity of movement, and upon blinding the eyes of the enemy to the real objective. Purposes to which the peculiar qualities of a navy admirably lent themselves. The shorter distance to be traversed, the greater depth of water and easier pilotage of the Chesapeake, were further reasons which would commend the scheme to the judgment of a seaman. And de Grasse readily accepted it, without making difficulties or demanding modifications which would have involved discussion and delay. Having made his decision, the French admiral acted with great good judgment, promptitude, and vigor. The same frigate that brought dispatches from Washington was sent back, so that by August 15 the Allied generals knew of the intended coming of the fleet. 3,500 soldiers were spared by the governor of Cap Francais, upon the condition of a Spanish squadron anchoring at the place, which de Grasse procured. He also raised from the governor of Havana the money urgently needed by the Americans, and finally, instead of weakening his force by sending convoys to France, as the court had wished, he took every available ship to the Chesapeake. To conceal his coming as long as possible, he passed through the Bahama Channel, as a less frequented route, and on the 30th of August anchored in Linhaven Bay, just within the capes of the Chesapeake, with 28 ships of the line. Three days before, August 27, the French squadron at Newport, eight ships of the line with four frigates and eighteen transports under M. de Barris, sailed for the rendezvous, making, however, a wide circuit out to sea to avoid the English. This course was the more necessary as the French siege artillery was with it. The troops under Washington and Rochambeau had crossed the Hudson on the 24th of August, moving toward the head of Chesapeake Bay. Thus the different armed forces, both land and sea, were converging toward their objective, Cornwallis. The English were unfortunate in all directions. Rodney, learning of de Grasse's departure, sent fourteen ships of the line under Admiral Hood to North America, and himself sailed for England in August, on account of ill health. Hood, going by the direct route, reached the Chesapeake three days before de Grasse, looked into the bay, and finding it empty went on to New York. There he met five ships of the line under Admiral Graves, who, being senior officer, took command of the whole force and sailed on the 31st of August for the Chesapeake, hoping to intercept de Barris before he could join de Grasse. It was not till two days later that Sir Henry Clinton was persuaded that the Allied armies had gone against Cornwallis, and had too far the start to be overtaken. Admiral Graves was painfully surprised, on making the Chesapeake, to find anchored there a fleet which from its numbers could only be an enemy's. Nevertheless, he stood in to meet it, and as de Grasse got under way, allowing his ships to be counted, the sense of numerical inferiority, 19 to 24, did not deter the English admiral from attacking. The clumsiness of his method, however, betrayed his gallantry, many of his ships were roughly handled, without any advantage being gained. De Grasse, expecting de Barris, remained outside five days, keeping the English fleet in play without coming to action, then returning to port he found de Barris safely at anchor. Graves went back to New York, and with him disappeared the last hope of succor that was to gladden Cornwallis's eyes. The siege was steadily endured, but the control of the sea made only one issue possible, and the English forces were surrendered October 19, 1781. With this disaster the hope of subduing the colonies died in England. The conflict flickered through a year longer, but no serious operations were undertaken. In the conduct of the English operations, which ended thus unfortunately, there was both bad management and ill fortune. 
Hood's detachment might have been strengthened by several ships from Jamaica, had Rodney's orders been carried out. The dispatch ship, also, sent by him to Admiral Graves commanding in New York, found that officer absent on a cruise to the eastward, with a view to intercept certain very important supplies which had been forwarded by the American agent in France. The English court had laid great stress upon cutting off this convoy. But, with the knowledge that he had of the force accompanying it, the admiral was probably ill-advised in leaving his headquarters himself, with all his fleet. At the time when the approach of the hurricane season in the West Indies directed the active operations of the navies toward the continent. In consequence of his absence, although Rodney's dispatches were at once sent on by the senior officer in New York, the vessel carrying them being driven ashore by enemy's cruisers, Graves did not learn their contents until his return to port. August 16. The information sent by Hood of his coming was also intercepted. After Hood's arrival, it does not appear that there was avoidable delay in going to sea, but there does seem to have been misjudgment in the direction given to the fleet. It was known that de Barris had sailed from Newport with eight ships, bound probably for the Chesapeake, certainly to effect a junction with de Grasse. And it has been judiciously pointed out that if Graves had taken up his cruising ground near the Capes, but out of sight of land, he could hardly have failed to fall in with him in overwhelming force. Knowing what is now known, this would undoubtedly have been the proper thing to do, but the English admiral had imperfect information. It was nowhere expected that the French would bring nearly the force they did. And Graves lost information, which he ought to have received, as to their numbers, by the carelessness of his cruisers stationed off the Chesapeake. These had been ordered to keep under way, but were both at anchor under Cape Henry when de Grasse's appearance cut off their escape. One was captured, the other driven up York River. No single circumstance contributed more to the general result than the neglect of these two subordinate officers, by which Graves lost that all-important information. It can readily be conceived how his movements might have been affected, had he known two days earlier that de Grasse had brought twenty-seven or twenty-eight sail of the line. How natural would have been the conclusion, first, to waylay de Barris, with whom his own nineteen could more than cope. Had Admiral Graves succeeded in capturing that squadron, it would have greatly paralyzed the besieging army, it had the siege train on board, if it would not have prevented its operations altogether. It would have put the two fleets nearly on an equality in point of numbers, would have arrested the progress of the French arms for the ensuing year in the West Indies. And might possibly have created such a spirit of discord between the French and Americans as would have sunk the latter into the lowest depths of despair, from which they were only extricated by the arrival of the forces under de Grasse. These are true and sober comments upon the naval strategy. In regard to the Admiral's tactics, it will be enough to say that the fleet was taken into battle nearly as Bing took his, that very similar mishaps resulted. And that, when attacking twenty-four ships with nineteen, seven, under that capable officer Hood, were not able to get into action, owing to the dispositions made. On the French side de Grasse must be credited with a degree of energy, foresight, and determination surprising in view of his failures at other times. The decision to take every ship with him, which made him independent of any failure on the part of de Barris, the passage through the Bahama Channel to conceal his movements. The address with which he obtained the money and troops required, from the Spanish and the French military authorities. The provision which led him, as early as March 29, shortly after leaving Brest, to write to Rochambeau that American coast pilots should be sent to Cap Francais. The coolness with which he kept Graves amused until de Barris's squadron had slipped in, are all points worthy of admiration. The French were also helped by the Admiral's power to detain the 200 merchant ships, the West India trade, awaiting convoy at Cap Francais, where they remained from July till November. When the close of operations left him at liberty to convoy them with ships of war. The incident illustrates one weakness of a mercantile country with representative government, compared with a purely military nation. If the British government, wrote an officer of that day, had sanctioned, or a British admiral had adopted, such a measure, the one would have been turned out and the other hanged. Rodney at the same time had felt it necessary to detach five ships of the line with convoys, while half a dozen more went home with the trade from Jamaica. 
It is easier to criticize the division of the English fleet between the West Indies and North America in the successive years 1780 and 1781, than to realize the embarrassment of the situation. This embarrassment was but the reflection of the military difficulty of England's position, all over the world, in this great and unequal war. England was everywhere outmatched and embarrassed, as she has always been as an empire, by the number of her exposed points. In Europe the Channel Fleet was more than once driven into its ports by overwhelming forces. Gibraltar, closely blockaded by land and sea, was only kept alive in its desperate resistance by the skill of English seamen triumphing over the inaptness and discords of their combined enemies. In the East Indies, Sir Edward Hughes met in Suffren an opponent as superior to him in numbers as was de Grasse to Hood, and of far greater ability. Menorca, abandoned by the home government, fell before superior strength, as has been seen to fall, one by one, the less important of the English Antilles. The position of England from the time that France and Spain opened their maritime war was everywhere defensive, except in North America, and was therefore, from the military point of view, essentially false. She everywhere awaited attacks which the enemies, superior in every case, could make at their own choice and their own time. North America was really no exception to this rule, despite some offensive operations which in no way injured her real, that is her naval, foes. Thus situated, and putting aside questions of national pride or sensitiveness, what did military wisdom prescribe to England? The question would afford an admirable study to a military inquirer, and is not to be answered offhand, but certain evident truths may be pointed out. In the first place, it should have been determined what part of the assailed empire was most necessary to be preserved. After the British islands themselves, the North American colonies were the most valuable possessions in the eyes of the England of that day. Next should have been decided what others by their natural importance were best worth preserving, and by their own inherent strength, or that of the empire, which was mainly naval strength, could most surely be held. In the Mediterranean, for instance, Gibraltar and Mahone were both very valuable positions. Could both be held? Which was more easily to be reached and supported by the fleet? If both could not probably be held, one should have been frankly abandoned, and the force and efforts necessary to its defense carried elsewhere. So in the West Indies the evident strategic advantages of Barbados and Sta. Lucia prescribed the abandonment of the other small islands by garrisons as soon as the fleet was fairly outnumbered, if not before. The case of so large an island as Jamaica must be studied separately, as well as with reference to the general question. Such an island may be so far self-supporting as to defy any attack but one in great force and numbers, and that would rightly draw to it the whole English force from the windward stations at Barbados and Sta. Lucia. With the defense thus concentrated, England's great weapon, the navy, should have been vigorously used on the offensive. Experience has taught that free nations, popular governments, will seldom dare wholly to remove the force that lies between an invader and its shores or capital. Whatever the military wisdom, therefore, of sending the Channel Fleet to seek the enemy before it united, the step may not have been possible. But at points less vital the attack of the English should have anticipated that of the Allies. This was most especially true of that theatre of the war which has so far been considered. If North America was the first object, Jamaica and the other islands should have been boldly risked. It is due to Rodney to say that he claims that his orders to the admirals at Jamaica and New York were disobeyed in 1781, and that to this was owing the inferiority in number of Graves' fleet. But why, in 1780, when the departure of de Guichin for Europe left Rodney markedly superior in numbers during his short visit to North America, from September 14 to November 14? Should no attempt have been made to destroy the French detachment of seven ships of the line in Newport? These ships had arrived there in July, but although they had at once strengthened their position by earthworks, great alarm was excited by the news of Rodney's appearance off the coast. A fortnight passed by Rodney in New York and by the French in busy work, placed the latter, in their own opinion, in a position to brave all the naval force of England. We twice feared, and above all at the time of Rodney's arrival, wrote the chief of staff of the French squadron, that the English might attack us in the road itself. 
and there was a space of time during which such an undertaking would not have been an act of rashness. Now, October 20th, the anchorage is fortified so that we can there brave all the naval force of England. The position thus taken by the French was undoubtedly very strong. It formed a re-entrant angle of a little over 90 degrees, contained by lines drawn from Goat Island to what was then called Brenton's Point, the site of the present Fort Adams on the one side, and to Rose Island on the other. On the right flank of the position Rose Island received a battery of 36 24-pounders, while 12 guns of the same size were placed on the left flank at Brenton's Point. Between Rose and Goat Island's four ships, drawn up on a west-northwest line, bore upon the entrance and raked an approaching fleet, while three others, between Goat Island and Brenton's Point, crossed their fire at right angles with the former four. On the other hand, the summer winds blow directly up the entrance, often with great force. There could be no question even of a considerably crippled attacking ship reaching her destined position, and when once confused with the enemy's line, the shore batteries would be neutralized. The work on Rose Island certainly, that on Brenton's Point probably, had less height than the two upper batteries of a ship of the line, and could be vastly outnumbered. They could not have been casemate, and might indisputably have been silenced by the grape shot of the ships that could have been brought against them. Rose Island could be approached on the front and on the west flank within 200 yards, and on the north within half a mile. There was nothing to prevent this right flank of the French, including the line of ships, being enfiladed and crushed by the English ships taking position west of Rose Island. The essential points of close range and superior height were thus possible to the English fleet, which numbered twenty to the enemy's seven. If successful in destroying the shipping and reducing Rose Island, it could find anchorage farther up the bay and await a favorable wind to retire. In the opinion of a distinguished English naval officer of the day, closely familiar with the ground, there was no doubt of the success of an attack, and he urged it frequently upon Rodney, offering himself to pilot the leading ship. The security felt by the French in this position, and the acquiescence of the English in that security, mark clearly the difference in spirit between this war and the wars of Nelson and Napoleon. It is not, however, merely as an isolated operation, but in relation to the universal war, that such an attempt is here considered. England stood everywhere on the defensive, with inferior numbers. From such a position there is no salvation except by action vigorous almost to desperation. It is impossible for us, wrote with great truth the First Lord of the Admiralty to Rodney, to have a superior fleet in every part. And unless our commanders-in-chief will take the great line, as you do, and consider the king's whole dominions under their care, our enemies must find us unprepared somewhere, and carry their point against us. Attacks which considered in themselves alone might be thought unjustifiable, were imposed upon English commanders. The Allied Navy was the key of the situation, and its large detachments, as at Newport, should have been crushed at any risk. The effect of such a line of action upon the policy of the French government is a matter of speculation, as to which the present writer has no doubts. But no English officer in chief command rose to the level of the situation, with the exception of Hood, and possibly of Howe. Rodney was now old, infirm, and though of great ability, a careful tactician rather than a great admiral. The defeat of Graves and subsequent surrender of Cornwallis did not end the naval operations in the Western Hemisphere. On the contrary, one of the most interesting tactical feats and the most brilliant victory of the whole war were yet to grace the English flag in the West Indies, but with the events at Yorktown the patriotic interest for Americans closes. Before quitting that struggle for independence, it must again be affirmed that its successful ending, at least at so early a date, was due to the control of the sea, to see power in the hands of the French. And its improper distribution by the English authorities. This assertion may be safely rested on the authority of the one man who, above all others, thoroughly knew the resources of the country, the temper of the people, the difficulties of the struggle. And whose name is still the highest warrant for sound, quiet, unfluttered good sense and patriotism. The keynote to all Washington's utterances is set in the memorandum for concerting a plan of operations with the French army, dated July 15, 1780. And sent by the hands of Lafayette. 
The Marquis de Lafayette will be pleased to communicate the following general ideas to Count de Rochambeau and the Chevalier de Tournay, as the sentiments of the underwritten. I. In any operation, and under all circumstances, a decisive naval superiority is to be considered as a fundamental principle, and the basis upon which every hope of success must ultimately depend. This, however, though the most formal and decisive expression of Washington's views, is but one among many others equally distinct. Thus, writing to Franklin, December 20, 1780, he says. Disappointed of the second division of French troops, blockaded in Brest, but more especially in the expected naval superiority, which was the pivot upon which everything turned. We have been compelled to spend an inactive campaign after a flattering prospect at the opening of it. Latterly we have been obliged to become spectators of a succession of detachments from the army at New York in aid of Lord Cornwallis. While our naval weakness, and the political dissolution of a large part of our army, put it out of our power to counteract them at the southward, or to take advantage of them here. A month later, January 15, 1781, in a memorandum letter to Colonel Lawrence, sent on a special mission to France, he says. Next to a loan of money, a constant naval superiority upon these coasts is the object most interesting. This would instantly reduce the enemy to a difficult defensive. Indeed, it is not to be conceived how they could subsist a large force in this country, if we had the command of the seas to interrupt the regular transmission of supplies from Europe. This superiority, with an aid in money, would enable us to convert the war into a vigorous offensive. With respect to us it seems to be one of two deciding points. In another letter to the same person, then in Paris, dated April 9, he writes. If France delays a timely and powerful aid in the critical posture of our affairs, it will avail us nothing, should she attempt it hereafter. Why need I run into detail, when it may be declared in a word that we are at the end of our tether, and that now or never our deliverance must come? How easy would it be to retort the enemy's own game upon them, if it could be made to comport with the general plan of the war to keep a superior fleet always in these seas, and France would put us in condition to be active by advancing us money. Ships and money are the burden of his cry. May 23, 1781, he writes to the Chevalier de la Luzerne, I do not see how it is possible to give effectual support to the southern states and avert the evils which threaten, while we are inferior in naval force in these seas. As the season for active operations advances, his utterances are more frequent and urgent. To Major General Green, struggling with his difficulties in South Carolina, he writes, June 1, 1781, our affairs have been attentively considered in every point of view, and it was finally determined to make an attempt upon New York. In preference to a southern operation, as we had not decided command of the water. To Jefferson, June 8, should I be supported in the manner I expect, by the neighboring states, the enemy will, I hope, be reduced to the necessity of recalling part of their force from the southward to support New York. Or they will run the most imminent risk of being expelled from that post, which is to them invaluable. And should we, by a lucky coincidence of circumstances, gain a naval superiority, their ruin would be inevitable. While we remain inferior at sea, Policy dictates that relief should be attempted by diversion rather than by sending reinforcements immediately to the point in distress, that is, to the south. To Rochambeau, June 13, Your Excellency will recollect that New York was looked upon by us as the only practicable object under present circumstances. But should we be able to secure a naval superiority, we may perhaps find others more practicable and equally advisable. By the 15th of August the letters of de Grasse announcing his sailing for the Chesapeake were received, and the correspondence of Washington is thenceforth filled with busy preparations for the campaign in Virginia. Based upon the long-delayed fleet. The discouragement of de Grasse, and his purpose to go to sea, upon learning that the English fleet in New York had been reinforced, drew forth an appealing letter dated September 25th, which is too long for quotation. But the danger passed, Washington's confidence returns. The day after the capitulation he writes to de Grasse, the surrender of York. The honor of which belongs to your excellency, has greatly anticipated, in time, our most sanguine anticipations. 
He then goes on to urge further operations in the south, seeing so much of the good season was still left, the general naval superiority of the British, previous to your arrival, gave them decisive advantages in the south. In the rapid transport of their troops and supplies. While the immense land marches of our suckers, too tardy and expensive in every point of view, subjected us to be beaten in detail. It will depend upon your excellency, therefore, to terminate the war. De Grasse refusing this request, but intimating an intention to cooperate in the next year's campaign. Washington instantly accepts, with your excellency I need not insist upon the indispensable necessity of a maritime force capable of giving you an absolute ascendancy in these seas. You will have observed that, whatever efforts are made by the land armies, the navy must have the casting vote in the present contest. A fortnight later, November 15, he writes to Lafayette, who is on the point of sailing for France. As you expressed a desire to know my sentiments respecting the operations of the next campaign, I will, without a tedious display of reasoning, declare in one word that it must depend absolutely upon the naval force which is employed in these seas, and the time of its appearance next year. No land force can act decisively unless accompanied by a maritime superiority. A doubt did not exist, nor does it at this moment, in any man's mind, of the total extirpation of the British force in the Carolinas and Georgia, if Count de Grasse could have extended his cooperation two months longer. Such, in the opinion of the revered commander-in-chief of the American armies, was the influence of sea power upon the contest which he directed with so much skill and such infinite patience, and which, amidst countless trials and discouragements, he brought to a glorious close. It will be observed that the American cause was reduced to these straits, notwithstanding the great and admitted losses of British commerce by the cruisers of the Allies and by American privateers. This fact, and the small results from the general war, dominated as it was by the idea of commerce destroying, show strongly the secondary and indecisive effect of such a policy upon the great issues of war. Footnotes Martin, History of France this delay was due to comms. Howe's Dispatch, Gentleman's Magazine, 1778. Most accounts say between Goat Island and Canonicut, but the position given seems more probable. The names, Goat and Gould, often written Gold, are easily confused. Since writing the above, the author has been favored with the sight of a contemporary manuscript map obtained in Paris, which shows the anchorage as near Canonicut and a breast coaster's harbor island. The latter being marked Wild Door OU Gold Isle. The sketch, while accurate in its main details, seems the more authentic from its mistakes being such as a foreigner, during a hurried and exciting stay of 24 hours, might readily make. The arrival of the French fleet upon the coast of America is a great and striking event. But the operations of it have been injured by a number of unforeseen and unfavorable circumstances, which, though they ought not to detract from the merit and good intention of our great ally, have nevertheless lessened the importance of its services in a great degree. The length of the passage, in the first instance, was a capital misfortune, for had even one of common length taken place, Lord Howe, with the British ships of war and all the transports in the River Delaware, must inevitably have fallen and Sir Henry Clinton must have had better luck than is commonly dispensed to men of his profession under such circumstances, if he and his troops had not shared at least the fate of Burgoyne. The long passage of Count de Stang was succeeded by an unfavorable discovery at the Hook, which hurt us in two respects, first, in a defeat of the Enterprise upon New York and the shipping and troops at that place and next in the delay occasioned in ascertaining the depth of water over the bar which was essential to their entrance into the harbor of New York. And, moreover, after the enterprise upon Rhode Island had been planned and was in the moment of execution, that Lord Howe with the British ships should interpose merely to create a diversion and draw the French fleet from the island was again unlucky, as the Count had not returned on the 17th to the island, though drawn off from it on the 10th by which means the land operations were retarded, and the whole subjected to a miscarriage in case of the arrival of Byron's squadron. Washington's Letter, August 20, 1778 C. The Stang's position at anchor is marked by the anchor in Plate X. Of one of these, the Monmouth, 
64. It is said that the officers of the French flagship drank to the health of the captain of the little black ship. Ships' names, like those of families, often have a marked career. A former Monmouth, 20 years before, had attacked and taken, practically single-handed, the Foudroyant, 84, one of the finest ships in the French Navy. She was then commanded by a Captain Gardiner, who, having commanded Bing's ship in the battle which led to his execution, was moved by his mortification at the result of that affair to dare such desperate odds, and thereby lost his life. The same ship, here punished so severely off Granada, will be found in like sturdy fight, under another captain, three years later in India. The line BC shows the final direction of the French line of battle. The lee ship, O, having tacked and standing to O, while the other ships took position in her wake. Though not expressly stated, Byron doubtless formed in the same way on a parallel line. Into this new line the disabled ships, C, which could scarcely have made good the course they were heading, would be easily received. Chevalier, Histoire de la Marine Française. Guerin, Histoire Maritime. Drinkwater, in his History of the Siege of Gibraltar, explains that the Spanish admiral believed that Rodney would not accompany the convoy to the Straits, but had separated from it. He did not detect his mistake until too late. The place where the battle was fought is shown by the crossed flags. The black ships, in position A, represent the English ships bearing down upon the French center and rear. The line VR is the line of battle from van to rear before bearing down. The positions VR are those of the van and rear ships after hauling up on the port tack, when the French war. In a severe reprimand addressed to Captain Carcutt, commanding the leading ship of the English line, by Rodney, he says, your leading in the manner you did, induced others to follow so bad an example. And thereby, forgetting that the signal for the line was at only two cables length distance from each other, the van division was led by you to more than two leagues distance from the center division which was thereby exposed to the greatest strength of the enemy and not properly supported, life, volume. I, page 351. By all rules of tactical common sense it would seem that the other ships should have taken their distance from their next astern, that is, should have closed toward the center. In conversation with Sir Gilbert Blaine, who was not in this action, Rodney stated that the French line extended for leagues in length, as if de Goetchen thought we meant to run away from him, Naval Chronicle, Volume 25. Page 402. History of the American Revolution. For Rodney's reasons, see his life, Volume 1, pages 365 to 376. At the eastern end of Long Island. The French ascribed this disadvantage to the fact that some of their ships were not coppered. That the French government was not satisfied with him, de Stutches's action can be safely inferred from its delay to reward the officers of the squadron, which called forth much feeling and very lively remonstrances. The French asserted that Arbuthnot was hooted in the streets of New York and recalled by his government. The latter is a mistake, as he went home by his own request, but the former is likely enough. Both commanders reversed in this case the usual naval policy of their nations. Bancroft, History of the United States. Life of Rodney, Volume 2. Page 152, Clerk, Naval Tactics, Page 84. De Barris had been unwilling to go to the Chesapeake, fearing to be intercepted by a superior force, and had only yielded to the solicitation of Washington and Rochambeau. Naval Researches, Captain Thomas White, R.N. White, Naval Researches. Buclone, La Marine de Louis XVI, page 281. Under a rather misleading title this work is really a lengthy biography of Liberge de Grand Chain, Chief of Staff to the French Squadron under Ternay. Diary of a French Officer, 1781. Magazine of American History for March, 1880. The works at the time of Rodney's visit to New York were doubtless less complete than in 1781. This authority, year later, gives the work on Rose Island 2036 pounders. Sir Thomas Graves, afterwards second in command to Nelson in the attack at Copenhagen in 1801, an enterprise fully as desperate and encompassed with greater difficulties of pilotage than the one here advocated. See Biographical Memoir, 
Naval Chronicle, Volume 8. Rodney's Life, Volume 1, Page 402. Chapter 11. Maritime War in Europe, 1779-1782. The last chapter closed with the opinions of Washington, expressed in many ways and at many times, as to the effect of sea power upon the struggle for American independence. If space allowed, these opinions could be amply strengthened by similar statements of Sir Henry Clinton, the English commander-in-chief. In Europe the results turned yet more entirely upon the same factor. There the Allies had three several objectives, at each of which England stood strictly upon the defensive. The first of these was England herself, involving, as a preliminary to an invasion, the destruction of the Channel Fleet, a project which, if seriously entertained, can scarcely be said to have been seriously attempted. The second was the reduction of Gibraltar, the third, the capture of Menorca. The last alone met with success. Thrice was England threatened by a largely superior fleet, thrice the threat fell harmless. Thrice was Gibraltar reduced to straits. Thrice was it relieved by the address and fortune of English seamen, despite overpowering odds. After Keppel's action off Ushant, no general encounter took place between fleets in European seas during the year 1778 and the first half of 1779. Meantime Spain was drawing toward a rupture with England and an active alliance with France. War was declared by her on 16 June, 1779. But as early as April 12, a treaty between the two Bourbon kingdoms, involving active war upon England, had been signed. By its terms the invasion of Great Britain or Ireland was to be undertaken, every effort made to recover for Spain, Menorca, Pensacola, and Mobile, and the two courts bound themselves to grant neither peace, nor truce, nor suspension of hostilities. Until Gibraltar should be restored. The declaration of war was withheld until ready to strike, but the English government, doubtless, should have been upon its guard in the strained relations of the two countries, and prepared to prevent a junction of the two fleets. As it was, no efficient blockade of Brest was established, and 28 French sail of the line went out unopposed June 3, 1779, under Dorvilliers, Keppel's opponent of the year before. The fleet steered for the coasts of Spain, where it was to find the Spanish ships, but it was not till the 22d of July that the full contingent joined. Seven precious summer weeks thus slipped by unimproved, but that was not all the loss. The French had been provisioned for only thirteen weeks, and this truly great armada of sixty-six ships of the line and fourteen frigates had not more than forty working days before it. Sickness, moreover, ravaged the fleet. And although it was fortunate enough to enter the channel while the English were at sea, the latter, numbering little more than half their enemies, succeeded in passing within them. The flabbiness of coalitions increased the weakness due to inefficient preparation. A great and not unnatural panic on the English Channel coast, and the capture of one ship of the line, were the sole results of a cruise extending, for the French, over fifteen weeks. The disappointment, due to bad preparation, mainly on the part of Spain, though the French ministry utterly failed to meet the pressing wants of its fleet, fell, of course, upon the innocent Admiral d'Orvilliers. That brave and accomplished but unfortunate officer, whose only son, a lieutenant, had died of the pestilence which scourged the Allies, could not support the odium. Being of a deeply religious character, the refuge which Villeneuve after Trafalgar found in suicide was denied him, but he threw up his command and retired into a religious house. The scanty maritime interest of the year 1780, in Europe, centers round Cadiz and Gibraltar. This fortress was invested by Spain immediately upon the outbreak of war, and, while successfully resisting direct attack, the supply of provisions and ammunition was a matter of serious concern to England, and involved both difficulty and danger. For this purpose, Rodney sailed on 29 December, 1779, having under his command twenty ships of the line with a large convoy and reinforcements for Gibraltar and Menorca, as well as the West India trade. The latter parted company on the 7th of January, under the care of four frigates, and the following morning the fleet fell in with and captured a Spanish squadron of seven ships of war and sixteen supply ships. Twelve of the latter being laden with provisions were carried on to Gibraltar. 
A week later, at 1 p.m. of the 16th, a Spanish fleet of 11 sail of the line was seen in the southeast. They held their ground, supposing the approaching vessels to be only supply ships for Gibraltar, without a strong force of men of war, an unfortunate error from which they did not awake until too late to escape. Owing to the yet more unfortunate oversight of having no lookout frigates thrown out. When the Spanish admiral, Don Juan de Langara, recognized his mistake, he attempted to escape. But the English ships were copper bottomed, and Rodney making the signal for a general chase overtook the enemy, cut in between him and his port, regardless of a blowy night, lee shore, and dangerous shoals. And succeeded in capturing the commander in chief with six ships of the line. A seventh was blown up. The weather continuing very tempestuous, one of the prizes was wrecked, and one forced into Cadiz. Several of the English ships were also in great danger, but happily escaped, and within a few days the entire force entered Gibraltar Bay. The convoy for Menorca was at once dispatched, and immediately after the return of the ships of war guarding it, on the 13th of February, Rodney sailed for the West Indies with four ships of the line, sending the rest of his force, with the prizes. To England under Admiral Digby. The state of politics and parties in England at this time was such that, combined with the unavoidable inferiority of the Channel Fleet, it was difficult to find an admiral willing to accept the chief command. An admirable officer, Barrington, the captor of Sta. Lucia, refused the first place, though willing to serve as second, even to a junior. The Allied fleet, to the number of 36 sail of the line, assembled at Cadiz. Their cruises, however, were confined to the Portuguese coast, and their only service, a most important one, was the capture of an entire convoy, largely laden with military stores, for the East and West Indies. The entrance of sixty English prizes, with nearly three thousand prisoners, into Cadiz, was a source of great rejoicing to Spain. On the 24th of October, de Goechen, returning from his contest with Rodney, came into the same port with his West Indian squadron, of nineteen ships of the line, but the immense armament thus assembled did nothing. The French ships returned to Brest in January, 1781. While thus unproductive of military results in Europe, the war in 1780 gave rise to an event which cannot wholly be passed over by any history of sea power. This was the armed neutrality, at the head of which stood Russia, joined by Sweden and Denmark. The claim of England to seize enemies' goods in neutral ships bore hard upon neutral powers, and especially upon those of the Baltic and upon Holland, into whose hands, and those of the Austrian Netherlands. The war had thrown much of the European carrying trade. While the products of the Baltic, naval stores and grain, were those which England was particularly interested in forbidding to her enemies. The declarations finally put forth by Russia, and signed by Sweden and Denmark, were four in number. 1. That neutral vessels had a right, not only to sail to unblockaded ports, but also from port to port of a belligerent nation, in other words, to maintain the coasting trade of a belligerent. 2. That property belonging to the subjects of a power at war should be safe on board neutral vessels. This was the principle involved in the now familiar maxim, free ships make free goods. 3. That no articles are contraband, except arms, equipments, and munitions of war. This ruled out naval stores and provisions unless belonging to the government of a belligerent. 4. That blockades, to be binding, must have an adequate naval force stationed in close proximity to the blockaded port. The contracting parties being neutral in the present war, but binding themselves to support these principles by a combined armed fleet of a fixed minimum number, the agreement received the name of the armed neutrality. The discussion of the propriety of the various declarations belongs to international law, but it is evident that no great maritime state, situated as England then was, would submit to the first and third as a matter of right. Policy only could induce her to do so. Without meeting the declarations by a direct contradiction, the ministry and the king determined to disregard them, a course which was sustained in principle even by prominent members of the bitter opposition of that day. The undecided attitude of the United Provinces, divided as in the days of Louis XIV. 
between the partisans of England and France, despite a century of alliance with the former, drew the especial attention of Great Britain. They had been asked to join the armed neutrality, they hesitated, but the majority of the provinces favoured it. A British officer had already gone so far as to fire upon a Dutch man-of-war which had resisted the search of merchant ships under its convoy, an act which, whether right or wrong, tended to incense the Dutch generally against England. It was determined by the latter that if the United Provinces acceded to the coalition of neutrals, war should be declared. On the 16th of December, 1780, the English ministry was informed that the States-General had resolved to sign the declarations of the armed neutrality without delay. Orders were at once sent out to Rodney to seize the Dutch West India and South American possessions, similar orders to the East Indies, and the ambassador at The Hague was recalled. England declared war four days later. The principal effect, therefore, of the armed neutrality upon the war was to add the colonies and commerce of Holland to the prey of English cruisers. The additional enemy was of small account to Great Britain, whose geographical position effectually blocked the junction of the Dutch fleet with those of her other enemies. The possessions of Holland fell everywhere, except when saved by the French. While a bloody but wholly uninstructive battle between English and Dutch squadrons in the North Sea, in August, 1781, was the only feat of arms illustrative of the old Dutch courage and obstinacy. The year 1781, decisive of the question of the independence of the United States, was marked in the European seas by imposing movements of great fleets followed by puny results. At the end of March de Grasse sailed from Brest with 26 ships of the line. On the 29th he detached five under Suffern to the East Indies, and himself continued on to meet success at Yorktown and disaster in the West Indies. On the 23d of June de Goetchen sailed from Brest with 18 ships of the line for Cadiz, where he joined 30 Spanish ships. This immense armament sailed on the 22d of July for the Mediterranean, landed 14,000 troops at Menorca, and then moved upon the English Channel. The English had this year first to provide against the danger to Gibraltar. That beset fortress had had no supplies since Rodney's visit, in January of the year before, and was now in sore want, the provisions being scanty and bad, the biscuits weevilly, and the meat tainted. Amid the horrors and uproar of one of the longest and most exciting sieges of history, the sufferings of the combatants were intensified by the presence of many peaceful inhabitants. Including the wives and families of soldiers as well as of officers. A great fleet of 28 ships of the line sailed from Portsmouth on the 13th of March, convoying 300 merchant ships for the East and West Indies, besides 97 transports and supply ships for the Rock. A delay on the Irish coast prevented its falling in with de Grasse, who had sailed nine days after it. Arriving off Cape St. Vincent, it met no enemy, and looking into Cadiz saw the great Spanish fleet at anchor. The latter made no move, and the English admiral, Derby, threw his supplies into Gibraltar on the 12th of April, undisturbed. At the same time he, like de Grasse, detached to the East Indies a small squadron, which was destined before long to fall in with Suffren. The inaction of the Spanish fleet, considering the eagerness of its government about Gibraltar and its equal if not superior numbers, shows scanty reliance of the Spanish admiral upon himself or his command. Derby, having relieved Gibraltar and Menorca, returned to the Channel in May. Upon the approach of the combined fleet of nearly fifty sail in August following, Derby fell back upon Torbay and there anchored his fleet, numbering thirty ships. De Guichen, who held chief command, and whose caution when engaged with Rodney has been before remarked, was in favour of fighting. But the almost unanimous opposition of the Spaniards, backed by some of his own officers, overruled him in a council of war, and again the great Bourbon coalition fell back, foiled by their own discord and the unity of their enemy. Gibraltar relieved, England untouched, were the results of these gigantic gatherings, they can scarcely be called efforts. A mortifying disaster closed the year for the Allies. De Guichen sailed from Brest with seventeen sail, protecting a large convoy of merchantmen and ships with military supplies. The fleet was pursued by twelve English ships under Admiral Kempenfelt, an officer whose high professional abilities have not earned the immortality with which poetry has graced his tragical death. 
Falling in with the French 150 miles west of Ushant, he cut off a part of the convoy, despite his inferior numbers. A few days later a tempest dispersed the French fleet. Only two ships of the line and five merchantmen out of 150 reached the West Indies. The year 1782 opened with the loss to the English of Port Mahone, which surrendered on 5 February, after a siege of six months. A surrender induced by the ravages of scurvy, consequent upon the lack of vegetables, and confinement in the foul air of bomb-proofs and casemates, under the heavy fire of an enemy. On the last night of the defense the call for necessary guards was 415, while only 660 men were fit for duty, thus leaving no reliefs. The Allied fleets assembled this year in Cadiz, to the number of 40 ships of the line. It was expected that this force would be increased by Dutch ships, but a squadron under Lord Howe drove the latter back to their ports. It does not certainly appear that any active enterprise was intended against the English coast, but the Allies cruised off the mouth of the Channel and in the Bay of Biscay during the summer months. Their presence ensured the safe arrival and departure of the homeward and outward bound merchantmen, and likewise threatened English commerce. Notwithstanding which, Howe, with twenty-two ships, not only kept the sea and avoided an engagement, but also succeeded in bringing the Jamaica fleet safe into port. The injury to trade and to military transportation by sea may be said to have been about equal on either side, and the credit for successful use of sea power for these most important ends must therefore be given to the weaker party. Having carried out their orders for the summer cruise, the combined fleets returned to Cadiz. On the 10th of September they sailed thence for Algeciras, on the opposite side of the bay from Gibraltar, to support a grand combined attack by land and sea, which, it was hoped, would reduce to submission the key to the Mediterranean. With the ships already there, the total rose to nearly fifty ships of the line. The details of the mighty onslaught scarcely belong to our subject, yet cannot be wholly passed by, without at least such mention as may recognize and draw attention to their interest. The three years' siege which was now drawing to its end had been productive of many brilliant feats of arms, as well as of less striking but more trying proofs of steadfast endurance, on the part of the garrison. How long the latter might have held out cannot be said, seeing the success with which the English sea power defied the efforts of the Allies to cut off the communications of the fortress. But it was seemingly certain that the place must be subdued by main force or not at all, while the growing exhaustion of the belligerents foretold the near end of the war. Accordingly Spain multiplied her efforts of preparation and military ingenuity, while the report of them and of the approaching decisive contest drew to the scene volunteers and men of eminence from other countries of Europe. Two French Bourbon princes added, by their coming, to the theatrical interest with which the approaching drama was invested. The presence of royalty was needed adequately to grace the sublime catastrophe. For the sanguine confidence of the besiegers had determined a satisfactory denouement with all the security of a playwright. Besides the works on the isthmus which joins the rock to the mainland, where three hundred pieces of artillery were now mounted, the chief reliance of the assailants was upon ten floating batteries elaborately contrived to be shot and fireproof. And carrying one hundred and fifty-four heavy guns. These were to anchor in a close north and south line along the west face of the works, at about 900 yards distance. They were to be supported by 40 gunboats and as many bomb vessels, besides the efforts of the ships of the line to cover the attack and distract the garrison. 12,000 French troops were brought to reinforce the Spaniards in the grand assault, which was to be made when the bombardment had sufficiently injured and demoralized the defenders. At this time the latter numbered 7,000, their land opponents 33,000 men. The final act was opened by the English. At seven o'clock on the morning of September 8, 1782, the commanding general, Elliot, began a severe and most injurious fire upon the works on the isthmus. Having effected his purpose, he stopped. But the enemy took up the glove the next morning, and for four days successively poured in a fire from the isthmus alone of 6,500 cannonballs and 1,100 bombs every 24 hours. So approached the great closing scene of September 13. At 7 a.m. of that day the ten battering ships unmoored from the head of the bay and stood down to their station. Between 9 and 10 they anchored, and the general fire at once began. 
the besieged replied with equal fury. The battering ships seem in the main, and for some hours, to have justified the hopes formed of them. Cold shot glanced or failed to get through their sides, while the self-acting apparatus for extinguishing fires balked the hot shot. About two o'clock, however, smoke was seen to issue from the ship of the commander-in-chief, and though controlled for some time, the fire continued to gain. The same misfortune befell others. By evening, the fire of the besieged gained a marked superiority, and by one o'clock in the morning the greater part of the battering ships were in flames. Their distress was increased by the action of the naval officer commanding the English gunboats, who now took post upon the flank of the line and raked it effectually, a service which the Spanish gunboats should have prevented. In the end, nine of the ten blew up at their anchors, with a loss estimated at fifteen hundred men, four hundred being saved from the midst of the fire by the English seamen. The tenth ship was boarded and burned by the English boats. The hopes of the assailants perished with the failure of the battering ships. There remained only the hope of starving out the garrison. To this end the Allied fleets now gave themselves. It was known that Lord Howe was on his way out with a great fleet, numbering thirty-four ships of the line, beside supply vessels. On the 10th of October a violent westerly gale injured the combined ships, driving one ashore under the batteries of Gibraltar, where she was surrendered. The next day Howe's force came in sight, and the transports had a fine chance to make the anchorage, which, through carelessness, was missed by all but four. The rest, with the men of war, drove eastward into the Mediterranean. The Allies followed on the 13th. But though thus placed between the port and the relieving force, and not encumbered, like the latter, with supply ships, they yet contrived to let the transports, with scarcely an exception, slip in and anchor safely. Not only provisions and ammunition, but also bodies of troops carried by the ships of war, were landed without molestation. On the 19th the English fleet repassed the straits with an easterly wind, having within a week's time fulfilled its mission, and made Gibraltar safe for another year. The Allied fleet followed, and on the 20th an action took place at long range, the Allies to windward, but not pressing their attack close. The number of ships engaged in this magnificent spectacle, the closing scene of the great drama in Europe, the afterpiece to the successful defense of Gibraltar, was 83 of the line, 49 Allies and 34 English. Of the former, 33 only got into action, but as the duller sailors would have come up to a general engagement, Lord Howe was probably right in declining, so far as in him lay, a trial which the Allies did not too eagerly court. Such were the results of this great contest in the European seas, marked on the part of the Allies by efforts gigantic in size, but loose-jointed and flabby in execution. By England, so heavily overmatched in mere numbers, were shown firmness of purpose, high courage and seamanship. But it can scarcely be said that the military conceptions of her councils, or the cabinet management of her sea forces, were worthy of the skill and devotion of her seamen. The odds against her were not so great, not nearly so great, as the formidable lists of guns and ships seemed to show. And while allowance must justly be made for early hesitations, the passing years of indecision and inefficiency on the part of the Allies should have betrayed to her their weakness. The reluctance of the French to risk their ships, so plainly shown by de Stang, de Grasse, and de Guichen, the sluggishness and inefficiency of the Spaniards, should have encouraged England to pursue her old policy. To strike at the organized forces of the enemy afloat. As a matter of fact, and probably from the necessities of the case, the opening of every campaign found the enemies separated, the Spaniards in Cadiz, the French in Brest. To blockade the latter in full force before they could get out, England should have strained every effort. Thus she would have stopped at its head the main stream of the Allied strength, and, by knowing exactly where this great body was, would have removed that uncertainty as to its action which fettered her own movements as soon as it had gained the freedom of the open sea. Before Brest she was interposed between the Allies, by her lookout she would have known the approach of the Spaniards long before the French could know it. She would have kept in her hands the power of bringing against each, singly, ships more numerous and individually more effective. A wind that was fair to bring on the Spaniards would have locked their allies in the port. 
The most glaring instances of failure on the part of England to do this were when de Grasse was permitted to get out unopposed in March, 1781. For an English fleet of superior force had sailed from Portsmouth nine days before him, but was delayed by the Admiralty on the Irish coast. And again at the end of that year, when Kempenfelt was sent to intercept de Goetien with an inferior force, while ships enough to change the odds were kept at home. Several of the ships which were to accompany Rodney to the West Indies were ready when Kempenfelt sailed, yet they were not associated with an enterprise so nearly affecting the objects of Rodney's campaign. The two forces united would have made an end of de Guachin's seventeen ships and his invaluable convoy. Gibraltar was indeed a heavy weight upon the English operations, but the national instinct which clung to it was correct. The fault of the English policy was in attempting to hold so many other points of land, while neglecting, by rapidity of concentration, to fall upon any of the detachments of the Allied fleets. The key of the situation was upon the ocean. A great victory there would have solved all the other points in dispute. But it was not possible to win a great victory while trying to maintain a show of force everywhere. North America was a yet heavier clog, and there undoubtedly the feeling of the nation was mistaken, pride, not wisdom, maintained that struggle. Whatever the sympathies of individuals and classes in the Allied nations, by their governments American rebellion was valued only as a weakening of England's arm. The operations there depended, as has been shown, upon the control of the sea. And to maintain that, large detachments of English ships were absorbed from the contest with France and Spain. Could a successful war have made America again what it once was, a warmly attached dependency of Great Britain, a firm base for her sea power, it would have been worth much greater sacrifices, but that had become impossible. But although she had lost, by her own mistakes, the affection of the colonists, which would have supported and secured her hold upon their ports and sea coast, there nevertheless remained to the mother country, in Halifax, Bermuda. And the West Indies, enough strong military stations, inferior, as naval bases, only to those strong ports which are surrounded by a friendly country, great in its resources and population. The abandonment of the contest in North America would have strengthened England very much more than the Allies. As it was, her large naval detachments there were always liable to be overpowered by a sudden move of the enemy from the sea, as happened in 1778 and 1781. To the abandonment of America as hopelessly lost, because no military subjection could have brought back the old loyalty, should have been added the giving up, for the time, all military occupancy which fettered concentration. While not adding to military strength. Most of the Antilles fell under this head, and the ultimate possession of them would depend upon the naval campaign. Garrisons could have been spared for Barbados and Sta. Lucia, for Gibraltar and perhaps for Mahone, that could have effectually maintained them until the empire of the seas was decided. And to them could have been added one or two vital positions in America, like New York and Charleston, to be held only till guarantees were given for such treatment of the loyalists among the inhabitants as good faith required England to exact. Having thus stripped herself of every weight, rapid concentration with offensive purpose should have followed. Sixty ships of the line on the coast of Europe, half before Cadiz and half before Brest, with a reserve at home to replace injured ships, would not have exhausted by a great deal the role of the English navy. And that such fleets would not have had to fight, may not only be said by us, who have the whole history before us, but might have been inferred by those who had watched the tactics of de Stang in de Guichen, and later on of de Grasse. Or, had even so much dispersal been thought unadvisable. Forty ships before Brest would have left the sea open to the Spanish fleet to try conclusions with the rest of the English navy when the question of controlling Gibraltar and Mahone came up for decision. Knowing what we do of the efficiency of the two services, there can be little question of the result, and Gibraltar, instead of a weight, would, as often before and since those days, have been an element of strength to Great Britain. The conclusion continually recurs. Whatever may be the determining factors in strifes between neighboring continental states, when a question arises of control over distant regions, politically weak, whether they be crumbling empires, anarchical republics, colonies. Isolated military posts or islands below a certain size, it must ultimately be decided by naval power, 
by the organized military force afloat, which represents the communications that form so prominent a feature in all strategy. The magnificent defense of Gibraltar hinged upon this, upon this depended the military results of the war in America, upon this the final fate of the West India Islands, upon this certainly the possession of India. Upon this will depend the control of the Central American Isthmus, if that question take a military coloring. And though modified by the continental position and surroundings of Turkey, the same sea power must be a weighty factor in shaping the outcome of the eastern question in Europe. If this be true, military wisdom and economy, both of time and money, dictate bringing matters to an issue as soon as possible upon the broad sea, with the certainty that the power which achieves military preponderance there will win in the end. In the War of the American Revolution the numerical preponderance was very great against England, the actual odds were less, though still against her. Military considerations would have ordered the abandonment of the colonies. But if the national pride could not stoop to this, the right course was to blockade the hostile arsenals. If not strong enough to be in superior force before both, that of the more powerful nation should have been closed. Here was the first fault of the English Admiralty. The statement of the First Lord as to the available force at the outbreak of the war was not borne out by facts. The First Fleet, under Keppel, barely equaled the French. And at the same time House force in America was inferior to the fleet under D'Estaing. In 1779 and 1781, on the contrary, the English fleet was superior to that of the French alone. Yet the Allies joined unopposed, while in the latter year de Grasse got away to the West Indies, and Suffren to the east. In Kempenfeldt's affair with de Guéchen, the Admiralty knew that the French convoy was of the utmost importance to the campaign in the West Indies, yet they sent out their admiral with only twelve ships. While at that time, besides the reinforcement destined for the West Indies, a number of others were stationed in the Downs, for what Fox justly called the paltry purpose of distressing the Dutch trade. The various charges made by Fox in the speech quoted from, and which, as regarded the Franco-Spanish War, were founded mainly on the expediency of attacking the Allies before they got away into the ocean wilderness, were supported by the high professional opinion of Lord Howe, who of the Kempenfeldt affair said, not only the fate of the West India Islands, but perhaps the whole future fortune of the war, might have been decided, almost without a risk. In the Bay of Biscay not without a risk, but with strong probabilities of success, the whole fortune of the war should at the first have been staked on a concentration of the English fleet between Brest and Cadiz. No relief for Gibraltar would have been more efficacious, no diversion surer for the West India Islands, and the Americans would have appealed in vain for the help, scantily given as it was, of the French fleet. For the great results that flowed from the coming of de Grasse must not obscure the fact that he came on the 31st of August, and announced from the beginning that he must be in the West Indies again by the middle of October. Only a providential combination of circumstances prevented a repetition to Washington, in 1781, of the painful disappointments by de Stang in de Guéchen in 1778 and 1780. Footnotes The curious reader can consult Clinton's letters and notes, in the Clinton Cornwallis Controversy, by B. F. Stevens. London, 1888. Bancroft, History of the United States, Volume 10, page 191. Although the English thus culpably failed to use their superiority to the French alone, the Channel Fleet numbering over 40 of the line, the fear that it might prevent the junction caused the Brest Fleet to sail in haste and undermanned. A fact which had an important effect upon the issue of the cruise. Chevalier, page 159. The details of the mismanagement of this huge mob of ships are so numerous as to confuse a narrative, and are therefore thrown into a footnote. The French fleet was hurried to see 4,000 men short. The Spaniards were seven weeks in joining. When they met, no common system of signals had been arranged five fair summer days were spent in remedying this defect. Not till a week after the junction could the fleet sail for England. No steps were taken to supply the provisions consumed by the French during the seven weeks. The original orders to Dorvilliers contemplated a landing at Portsmouth, or the seizure of the Isle of Wight, for which a large army was assembled on the coast of Normandy. Upon reaching the Channel, 
these orders were suddenly changed, and Falmouth indicated as the point of landing. By this time, August 16, summer was nearly over, and Falmouth, if taken, would offer no shelter to a great fleet. Then an easterly gale drove the fleet out of the channel. By this time the sickness which raged had so reduced the crews that many ships could be neither handled nor fought. Ship's companies of eight hundred or a thousand men could muster only from three to five hundred. Thus bad administration crippled the fighting powers of the fleet. While the unaccountable military blunder of changing the objective from a safe and accessible roadstead to a fourth-rate and exposed harbor completed the disaster by taking away the only hope of a secure base of operations during the fall and winter. Months. France then had no first-class port on the channel, hence the violent westerly gales which prevail in the autumn and winter would have driven the Allies into the North Sea. Life of Admiral Keppel, Volume 2 pages 72, 346, 403. See also Barrow, Life of Lord Howe, pages 123 to 126. Beetson gives quite at length, volume 5, page 395, the debate in the Allied Council of War. The customary hesitation of such councils, in face of the difficulties of the situation, was increased by an appeal to the delusion of commerce destroying as a decisive mode of warfare. M. De Busset urged that the Allied fleets should direct their whole attention to that great and attainable object, the intercepting of the British homeward bound West India fleets. This was a measure which, as they were now masters of the sea, could scarcely fail of success, and it would prove a blow so fatal to that nation that she could not recover it during the whole course of the war. The French account of Lapirous Bonfils is essentially the same. Chevalier, who is silent as to details, justly remarks, the cruise just made by the Allied fleet was such as to injure the reputation of France and Spain. These two powers had made a great display of force which had produced no result. The English trade also received little injury. Guichen wrote home, I have returned from a cruise fatiguing but not glorious. This mishap of the French was largely due to mismanagement by de Guichen, a skillful and usually a careful admiral. When Kempenfeldt fell in with him, all the French ships of war were to leeward of their convoy, while the English were to windward of it. The former, therefore, were unable to interpose in time. And the alternative remedy, of the convoy running down to leeward of their escort, could not be applied by all the merchant ships in so large a body. In the spring of 1780 the British Admiralty had assembled in the Channel Ports 45 ships of the line. The squadron at Brest was reduced to 12 or 15. To please Spain, 20 French ships of the line had joined the flag of Admiral Cordova in Cadiz. In consequence of these dispositions, the English with their Channel fleet held in check the forces which we had in Brest and in Cadiz. Enemies' cruisers traversed freely the space between the Lizard and the Straits of Gibraltar. Chevalier, page 202. In 1781, the Cabinet of Versailles called the attention of Holland and Spain to the necessity of assembling at Brest a fleet strong enough to impose upon the ships which Great Britain kept in the Channel. The Dutch remained in the Texel, and the Spaniards did not leave Cadiz. From this state of things it resulted that the English, with forty ships of the line, blocked 70 belonging to the Allied powers. Page 265. A question was very much agitated both in and out of Parliament. Namely, whether the intercepting of the French fleet under the Count de Grasse should not have been the first object of the British fleet under Vice Admiral Darby, instead of losing time in going to Ireland, by which that opportunity was missed. The defeat of the French fleet would certainly totally have disconcerted the great plans which the enemies had formed in the East and West Indies. It would have ensured the safety of the British West India Islands. The Cape of Good Hope must have fallen into the hands of Britain, and the campaign in North America might have had a very different termination. Beetson's Memoirs, Volume 5, page 341, where the contrary arguments are also stated. This is one of the most common and flagrant violations of the principles of war, stretching a thin line, everywhere inadequate, over an immense frontier. The clamors of trade and local interests make popular governments especially liable to it. Annual Register, 1782 
Chapter 12 Events in the East Indies, 1778-1781. Suffren sails from Brest, 1781. His brilliant naval campaign in the Indian Seas, 1782-1783. The very interesting and instructive campaign of Suffren in the East Indies, although in itself by far the most noteworthy and meritorious naval performance of the War of 1778, failed, through no fault of his, to affect the general issue. It was not till 1781 that the French court felt able to direct upon the East naval forces adequate to the importance of the issue. Yet the conditions of the peninsula at that time were such as to give an unusual opportunity for shaking the English power. Hyder Ali, the most skillful and daring of all the enemies against whom the English had yet fought in India, was then ruling over the kingdom of Mysore, which, from its position in the southern part of the peninsula, threatened both the Carnatic and the Malabar coast. Hyder, ten years before, had maintained alone a most successful war against the intruding foreigners, concluding with a peace upon the terms of a mutual restoration of conquests, and he was now angered by the capture of Maha. On the other hand, a number of warlike tribes, known by the name of the Marathas, of the same race and loosely knit together in a kind of feudal system, had become involved in war with the English. The territory occupied by these tribes, whose chief capital was at Pune, near Bombay, extended northward from Mysore to the Ganges. With boundaries thus conterminous, and placed centrally with reference to the three English presidencies of Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras. Hyder and the Marathas were in a position of advantage for mutual support and for offensive operations against the common enemy. At the beginning of the war between England and France, a French agent appeared at Pune. It was reported to Warren Hastings, the Governor-General, that the tribes had agreed to terms and ceded to the French a seaport on the Malabar coast. With his usual promptness, Hastings at once determined on war, and sent a division of the Bengal army across the Jumna and into Birar. Another body of 4,000 English troops also marched from Bombay. But being badly led, was surrounded and forced to surrender in January, 1779. This unusual reverse quickened the hopes and increased the strength of the enemies of the English. And although the material injury was soon remedied by substantial successes under able leaders, the loss of prestige remained. The anger of Hyder Ali, roused by the capture of Maha, was increased by imprudent thwarting on the part of the governor of Madras. Seeing the English entangled with the Marathas, and hearing that a French armament was expected on the Coromandel coast, he quietly prepared for war. In the summer of 1780 swarms of his horsemen descended without warning from the hills, and appeared near the gates of Madras. In September one body of English troops, 3,000 strong, was cut to pieces, and another of 5,000 was only saved by a rapid retreat upon Madras, losing its artillery and trains. Unable to attack Madras, Hyder turned upon the scattered posts separated from each other and the capital by the open country, which was now wholly in his control. Such was the state of affairs when, in January, 1781, a French squadron of six ships of the line and three frigates appeared on the coast. The English fleet under Sir Edward Hughes had gone to Bombay. To the French Commodore, Count d'Orves, Hyder appealed for aid in an attack upon Cudlore. Deprived of support by sea, and surrounded by the myriads of natives, the place must have fallen. D'Orves, however, refused, and returned to the Isle of France. At the same time one of the most skillful of the English Indian soldiers, Sir Eyre Coote, took the field against Hyder. The latter at once raised the siege of the beleaguered posts, and after a series of operations extending through the spring months, was brought to battle on 1 July, 1781. His total defeat restored to the English the open country, saved the Carnatic, and put an end to the hopes of the partisans of the French in their late possession of Pondicherry. A great opportunity had been lost. Meanwhile a French officer of very different temper from his predecessors was on his way to the East Indies. It will be remembered that when de Grasse sailed from Brest, March 22, 1781, for the West Indies, there went with his fleet a division of five ships of the line under Suffren. The latter separated from the main body on the 29th of the month, taking with him a few transports destined for the Cape of Good Hope, then a Dutch colony. 
the French government had learned that an expedition from England was destined to seize this important halting place on the road to India, and Suffren's first mission was to secure it. In fact, the squadron under Commodore John Stone had got away first, and had anchored at Porto Praia, in the Cape Verde Islands, a Portuguese colony, on the 11th of April. It numbered two ships of the line, and three of fifty guns, with frigates and smaller vessels, besides thirty-five transports, mostly armed. Without apprehension of attack, not because he trusted to the neutrality of the port but because he thought his destination secret, the English Commodore had not anchored with a view to battle. It so happened that at the moment of sailing from Brest one of the ships intended for the West Indies was transferred to Suffern's squadron. She consequently had not water enough for the longer voyage, and this with other reasons determined Suffern also to anchor at Porto Praia. On the 16th of April, five days after John Stone, he made the island early in the morning and stood for the anchorage, sending a coppered ship ahead to reconnoiter. Approaching from the eastward, the land for some time hid the English squadron. But at quarter before nine the advance ship, the Artesian, signaled that enemy's ships were anchored in the bay. The latter is open to the southward, and extends from east to west about a mile and a half. The conditions are such that ships usually lie in the northeast part, near the shore, plate 13. The English were there, stretching irregularly in a west-northwest line. Both Suffren and John Stone were surprised, but the latter more so. And the initiative remained with the French officer. Few men were fitter, by natural temper and the teaching of experience, for the prompt decision required. Of ardent disposition and inborn military genius, Suffren had learned, in the conduct of Boscoin toward the squadron of de la Clue, in which he had served, not to lay weight upon the power of Portugal to enforce respect for her neutrality. He knew that this must be the squadron meant for the Cape of Good Hope. The only question for him was whether to press on to the Cape with the chance of getting there first, or to attack the English at their anchors, in the hope of so crippling them as to prevent their further progress. He decided for the latter. And although the ships of his squadron, not sailing equally well, were scattered, he also determined to stand in at once, rather than lose the advantage of a surprise. Making signal to prepare for action at anchor, he took the lead in his flagship, the Heroes, of seventy-four guns, hauled close round the southeast point of the bay, and stood for the English flagship, F. He was closely followed by the Hannibal, seventy-four, line A-B, the advance ship Artesian, C, a 64, also stood on with him, but the two rear ships were still far astern. PL 13. The English Commodore got ready for battle as soon as he made out the enemy, but had no time to rectify his order. Suffren anchored 500 feet from the flagship starboard beam, by a singular coincidence the English flagship was also called Hero, thus having enemy's ships on both sides, and opened fire. The Hannibal anchored ahead of her Commodore, B, and so close that the latter had to veer cable and drop astern, A. But her captain, ignorant of Suffren's intention to disregard the neutrality of the port, had not obeyed the order to clear for action, and was wholly unprepared, his decks lumbered with water casks which had been got up to expedite watering. And the guns not cast loose. He did not add to this fault by any hesitation, but followed the flagship boldly, receiving passively the fire, to which for a time he was unable to reply. Luffing to the wind, he passed to windward of his chief, chose his position with skill, and atoned by his death for his first fault. These two ships were so placed as to use both broadsides. The Artesian, in the smoke, mistook an East India ship for a man-of-war. Running alongside, see, her captain was struck dead at the moment he was about to anchor, and the critical moment being lost by the absence of a head, the ship drifted out of close action, carrying the East Indiaman along with her, C. The remaining two vessels, coming up late, failed to keep close enough to the wind, and they too were thrown out of action, D, E. Then Suffren, finding himself with only two ships to bear the brunt of the fight, cut his cable and made sail. The Hannibal followed his movement but so much injured was she that her fore and main masts went over the side, fortunately not till she was pointed out from the bay, which she left shorn to a hulk. Putting entirely aside questions of international law, 
the wisdom and conduct of Suffren's attack, from the military point of view, invite attention. To judge them properly, we must consider what was the object of the mission with which he was charged, and what were the chief factors in thwarting or forwarding it. His first object was to protect the Cape of Good Hope against an English expedition, the chief reliance for effecting his purpose was to get there first, the obstacle to his success was the English fleet. To anticipate the arrival of the latter, two courses were open to him, to run for it in the hope of winning the race, or to beat the enemy and so put him out of the running altogether. So long as his whereabouts was unknown, a search, unless with very probable information, would be a waste of time. But when fortune had thrown his enemy across his path, the genius of Suffren at once jumped to the conclusion that the control of the sea in southern waters would determine the question, and should be settled at once. To use his own strong expression, the destruction of the English squadron would cut off the root of all the plans and projects of that expedition, gain us for a long time the superiority in India, a superiority whence might result a glorious peace. And hinder the English from reaching the Cape before me, an object which has been fulfilled and was the principal aim of my mission. He was ill-informed as to the English force, believing it greater than it was, but he had it at disadvantage and surprised. The prompt decision to fight, therefore, was right, and it is the most pronounced merit of suffering in this affair, that he postponed for the moment, dismissed, so to speak, from his mind, the ulterior projects of the cruise. But in so doing he departed from the traditions of the French navy and the usual policy of his government. It cannot be imputed to him as a fault that he did not receive from his captains the support he was fairly entitled to expect. The accidents and negligence which led to their failure have been mentioned, but having his three best ships in hand, there can be little doubt he was right in profiting by the surprise, and trusting that the two in reserve would come up in time. The position taken by his own ship and by the Hannibal, enabling them to use both broadsides, in other words, to develop their utmost force, was excellently judged. He thus availed himself to the full of the advantage given by the surprise and by the lack of order in the enemy's squadron. This lack of order, according to English accounts, threw out of action two of their fifty-gun ships, a circumstance which, while discreditable to John Stone, confirmed Suffren's judgment in precipitating his attack. Had he received the aid upon which, after all deductions, he was justified in counting, he would have destroyed the English squadron, as it was, he saved the Cape Colony at Porto Praia. It is not surprising, therefore, that the French court, notwithstanding its traditional sea policy and the diplomatic embarrassment caused by the violation of Portuguese neutrality, should have heartily and generously acknowledged a vigor of action to which it was unused in its admirals. It has been said that Suffren, who had watched the cautious movements of D'Estaing in America, and had served in the Seven Years' War, attributed in part the reverses suffered by the French at sea to the introduction of tactics, which he stigmatized as the veil of timidity. But that the results of the fight at Porto Praia, necessarily engaged without previous arrangement, convinced him that system and method had their use. Certainly his tactical combinations afterward were of a high order. Especially in his earlier actions in the East, for he seems again to have abandoned them in the later fights under the disappointment caused by his captain's disaffection or blundering. But his great and transcendent merit lay in the clearness with which he recognized in the English fleets, the exponent of the British sea power, the proper enemy of the French fleet, to be attacked first and always when with any show of equality. Far from blind to the importance of those ulterior objects to which the action of the French navy was so constantly subordinated, he yet saw plainly that the way to assure those objects was not by economizing his own ships, but by destroying those of the enemy. Attack, not defense, was the road to sea power in his eyes, and sea power meant control of the issues upon the land, at least in regions distant from Europe. This view out of the English policy he had the courage to take, after forty years of service in a navy sacrificed to the opposite system. But he brought to its practical application a method not to be found in any English admiral of the day, except perhaps Rodney, and a fire superior to the latter. Yet the course thus followed was no mere inspiration of the moment. It was the result of clear views previously held and expressed. However informed by natural ardor, 
it had the tenacity of an intellectual conviction. Thus he wrote to Destang, after the failure to destroy Barrington's squadron at Sta. Lucia, remonstrating upon the half-man condition of his own and other ships, from which men had been landed to attack the English troops. Notwithstanding the small results of the two cannonades of the 15th of December, directed against Barrington's squadron, and the unhappy check our land forces have undergone, we may yet hope for success. But the only means to have it is to attack vigorously the squadron, which, with our superiority, cannot resist, notwithstanding its land batteries, whose effects will be neutralized if we run them aboard, or anchor upon their buoys. If we delay, they may escape. Besides, our fleet being unmanned, it is in condition neither to sail nor to fight. What would happen if Admiral Byron's fleet should arrive? What would become of ships having neither crews nor admiral? Their defeat would cause the loss of the army and the colony. Let us destroy that squadron, their army, lacking everything and in a bad country, would soon be obliged to surrender. Then let Byron come, we shall be pleased to see him. I think it is not necessary to point out that for this attack we need men and plans well concerted with those who are to execute them. Equally did he condemn the failure of Destang to capture the four crippled ships of Byron's squadron, after the action off Granada. Owing to a combination of misfortunes, the attack at Porto Praia had not the decisive result it deserved. Commodore John Stone got under way and followed Suffren, but he thought his force was not adequate to attack in face of the resolute bearing of the French, and feared the loss of time consequent upon chasing to leeward of his port. He succeeded, however, in retaking the East India ship which the Fartesian had carried out. Suffren continued his course and anchored at the Cape, in Simons Bay, on the 21st of June. John Stone followed him a fortnight later. But learning by an advance ship that the French troops had been landed, he gave up the enterprise against the colony, made a successful commerce-destroying attack upon five Dutch India ships in Saldana Bay, which poorly repaid the failure of the military undertaking, and then went back himself to England, after sending the ships of the line on to join Sir Edward Hughes in the East Indies. Having seen the Cape secured, Suffren sailed for the Isle of France, arriving there on the 25th of October, 1781. Count d'Orves, being senior, took command of the United Squadron. The necessary repairs were made, and the fleet sailed for India, December 17. On the 22d of January, 1782, an English 50-gun ship, the Hannibal, was taken. On the 9th of February Count d'Orves died, and Suffren became commander-in-chief, with the rank of Commodore. A few days later the land was seen to the northward of Madras but owing to headwinds the city was not sighted until February 15. Nine large ships of war were found anchored in order under the guns of the forts. They were the fleet of Sir Edward Hughes, not in confusion like that of John Stone. Here, at the meeting point between these two redoubtable champions, each curiously representative of the characteristics of his own race, the one of the stubborn tenacity in seamanship of the English. The other of the ardor and tactical science of the French, too long checked and betrayed by a false system, is the place to give an accurate statement of the material forces. The French fleet had three 74s, seven 64s, and two 50-gun ships, one of which was the lately captured English Hannibal. To these Sir Edward Hughes opposed two 74s, one 70, one 68, four 64s, and one 50-gun ship. The odds, therefore, 12 to 9, were decidedly against the English. And it is likely that the advantage in single ship power, class for class, was also against them. It must be recalled that at the time of his arrival Suffren found no friendly port or roadstead, no base of supplies or repair. The French posts had all fallen by 1779, and his rapid movement, which saved the Cape, did not bring him up in time to prevent the capture of the Dutch Indian possessions. The invaluable harbour of Trincomalee, in Ceylon, was taken just one month before Suffren saw the English fleet at Madras. But if he thus had everything to gain, Hughes had as much to lose. To Suffren, at the moment of first meeting, belonged superiority of numbers and the power of taking the offensive, with all its advantages in choice of initiative. 
Upon Hughes fell the anxiety of the defensive, with inferior numbers, many assailable points, and uncertainty as to the place where the blow would fall. It was still true, though not so absolutely as thirty years before, that control in India depended upon control of the sea. The passing years had greatly strengthened the grip of England, and proportionately loosened that of France. Relatively, therefore, the need of suffering to destroy his enemy was greater than that of his predecessors, Datch and others. Whereas Hughes could count upon a greater strength in the English possessions, and so bore a somewhat less responsibility than the admirals who went before him. Nevertheless, the sea was still by far the most important factor in the coming strife, and for its proper control it was necessary to disable more or less completely the enemy's fleet, and to have some reasonably secure base. For the latter purpose, Trincomalee, though unhealthy, was by far the best harbour on the east coast, but it had not been long enough in the hands of England to be well supplied. Hughes, therefore, inevitably fell back on Madras for repairs after an action, and was forced to leave Trincomalee to its own resources until ready to take the sea again. Suffren, on the other hand, found all ports alike destitute of naval supplies, while the natural advantages of Trincomalee made its possession an evident object of importance to him, and Hughes so understood it. Independently, therefore, of the tradition of the English navy impelling Hughes to attack, the influence of which appears plainly between the lines of his letters, Suffren had, in moving toward Trincomalee. A threat which was bound to draw his adversary out of his port. Nor did Trincomalee stand alone. The existing war between Hyder Ali and the English made it imperative for Suffren to seize a port upon the mainland, at which to land the 3,000 troops carried by the squadron to cooperate on shore against the common enemy. And from which supplies, at least of food, might be had. Everything, therefore, concurred to draw Hughes out, and make him seek to cripple or hinder the French fleet. The method of his action would depend upon his own and his adversary's skill, and upon the uncertain element of the weather. It was plainly desirable for him not to be brought to battle except on his own terms, in other words, without some advantage of situation to make up for his weaker force. As a fleet upon the open sea cannot secure any advantages of ground, the position favoring the weaker was that to windward, giving choice of time and some choice as to method of attack, the offensive position used offensively. With the intention to make an offensive movement if circumstances warrant. The leeward position left the weaker no choice but to run, or to accept action on its adversary's terms. Whatever may be thought of Hughes's skill, it must be conceded that his task was difficult. Still, it can be clearly thought down to two requisites. The first was to get in a blow at the French fleet, so as to reduce the present inequality, the second, to keep Suffren from getting Trincomalee, which depended wholly on the fleet. Suffren, on the other hand, if he could do Hughes, in an action, more injury than he himself received, would be free to turn in any direction he chose. Suffren having sighted Hughes's fleet at Madras, February 15, anchored his own four miles to the northward. Considering the enemy's line, supported by the batteries, to be too strong for attack, he again got under way at 4 p.m. and stood south. Hughes also weighed, standing to the southward all that night under easy sail, and at daylight found that the enemy's squadron had separated from the convoy, the ships of war being about twelve miles east. While the transports were nine miles southwest, from him, plate 14. A. A. This dispersal is said to have been due to the carelessness of the French frigates, which did not keep touch of the English. Hughes at once profited by it, chasing the convoy, c. knowing that the line of battle ships must follow. His copper-bottomed ships came up with and captured six of the enemy, five of which were English prizes. The sixth carried three hundred troops with military stores. Hughes had scored a point. Suffren of course followed in a general chase, and by 3 p.m. four of his best sailors were two or three miles from the sternmost English ships. Hughes's ships were now much scattered, but not injudiciously so, for they joined by signal at 7 p.m. Both squadrons stood to the southeast during the night, under easy sail. At daylight of the 17th, the date of the first of four actions fought between these two chiefs within seven months, 
the fleets were six or eight miles apart, the French bearing north-northeast from the English, B, B. The latter formed line ahead on the port tack, A, with difficulty, owing to the light winds and frequent calms. Admiral Hughes explains that he hoped to weather the enemy by this course so as to engage closely, counting probably on finding himself to windward when the sea breeze made. The wind continuing light, but with frequent squalls, from north-northeast, the French, running before it, kept the puffs longer and neared the English rapidly, Suffren's intention to attack the rear being aided by Hughes's course. The latter finding his rear straggling, bore up to line abreast, b, retreating to gain time for the ships to close on the center. These movements in line abreast continued till 20 minutes before 4 p.m. When, finding he could not escape attack on the enemy's terms, Hughes hauled his wind on the port tack and awaited it, c. Whether by his own fault or not, he was now in the worst possible position, waiting for an attack by a superior force at its pleasure. The rear ship of his line, the Exeter, was not closed up. And there appears no reason why she should not have been made the van, by forming on the starboard tack, and thus bringing the other ships up to her. PL 14. The method of Suffren's attack, C, is differently stated by him and by Hughes, but the difference is in detail only, the main facts are certain. Hughes says the enemy, steered down on the rear of our line in an irregular double line abreast, in which formation they continued till the moment of collision, when three of the enemy's ships in the first line bore right down upon the Exeter. While four more of their second line, headed by the heroes, in which M. De Suffren had his flag, hauled along the outside of the first line toward our center. At five minutes past for the enemy's three ships began their fire upon the Exeter, which was returned by her and her second ahead. The action became general from our rear to our center, the commanding ship of the enemy, with three others of their second line, leading down on our center, yet never advancing farther than opposite to the suburbi, our center ship. With little or no wind and some heavy rain during the engagement. Under these circumstances, the enemy brought eight of their best ships to the attack of five of ours, as the van of our line, consisting of the Monmouth, Eagle, Burford, and Worcester, could not be brought into action without tacking on the enemy, for which there was not enough wind. Here we will leave them, and give Suffren's account of how he took up his position. In his report to the Minister of Marine he says, I should have destroyed the English squadron, less by superior numbers than by the advantageous disposition in which I attacked it. I attacked the rear ship and stood along the English line as far as the sixth. I thus made three of them useless, so that we were twelve against six. I began the fight at half past three in the afternoon, taking the lead and making signal to form line as best could be done, without that I would not have engaged. At four I made signal to three ships to double on the enemy's rear, and to the squadron to approach within pistol shot. This signal, though repeated, was not executed. I did not myself give the example, in order that I might hold in check the three van ships, which by tacking would have doubled on me. However, except the brilliant, which doubled on the rear, no ship was as close as mine, nor received as many shots. The principal point of difference in the two accounts is, that Suffren asserts that his flagship passed along the whole English line, from the rear to the sixth ship. While Hughes says the French divided into two lines, which, upon coming near, steered, one on the rear, the other on the center, of his squadron. The latter would be the better maneuver. For if the leading ship of the attack passed, as Suffren asserts, along the enemy's line from the rear to the sixth, she should receive in succession the first fire of six ships, which ought to cripple her and confuse her line. Suffren also notes the intention to double on the rear by placing three ships to leeward of it. Two of the French did take this position. Suffren further gives his reason for not closing with his own ship, which led. But as those which followed him went no nearer, Hughes's attention was not drawn to his action. The French Commodore was seriously, and it would seem justly, angered by the inaction of several of his captains. Of the second in command he complained to the minister, being at the head, I could not well see what was going on in the rear. I had directed M. de Tromelin to make signals to ships which might be near him. He only repeated my own without having them carried out. 
this complaint was wholly justified. On the 6th of February, ten days before the fight, he had written to his second as follows. If we are so fortunate as to be to windward, as the English are not more than eight, or at most nine, my intention is to double on their rear. Supposing your division to be in the rear, you will see by your position what number of ships will overlap the enemy's line, and you will make signal to them to double, that is, to engage on the lee side. In any case, I beg you to order to your division the maneuvers which you shall think best fitted to assure the success of the action. The capture of Trincomalee and that of Negapatam, and perhaps of all Ceylon, should make us wish for a general action. The last two sentences reveal Suffren's own appreciation of the military situation in the Indian seas, which demanded, first, the disabling of the hostile fleet, next, the capture of certain strategic ports. That this diagnosis was correct is as certain as that it reversed the common French maxims, which would have put the port first and the fleet second as objectives. A general action was the first desideratum of Suffren, and it is therefore safe to say that to avoid such action should have been the first object of Hughes. The attempt of the latter to gain the windward position was consequently correct. And as in the month of February the sea breeze at Madras sets in from the eastward and southward about 11 a.m. He probably did well to steer in that general direction, though the result disappointed him. De Guichen in one of his engagements with Rodney shaped the course of his fleet with reference to being to windward when the afternoon breeze made, and was successful. What use Hughes would have made of the advantage of the wind can only be inferred from his own words, that he sought it in order to engage more closely. There is not in this the certain promise of any skillful use of a tactical advantage. Suffren also illustrates, in his words to Tromelin, his conception of the duties of a second in command, which may fairly be paralleled with that of Nelson in his celebrated order before Trafalgar. In this first action he led the main attack himself, leaving the direction of what may be called the reserve, at any rate, of the second half of the assault, to his lieutenant, who, unluckily for him, was not a Collingwood. And utterly failed to support him. It is probable that Suffren's leading was due not to any particular theory, but to the fact that his ship was the best sailor in the fleet and that the lateness of the hour and lightness of the wind made it necessary to bring the enemy to action speedily. But here appears a fault on the part of Suffren. Leading as he did involves, not necessarily but very naturally, the idea of example. And holding his own ship outside of close range, for excellent tactical reasons, led the captains in his wake naturally, almost excusably, to keep at the same distance, notwithstanding his signals. The conflict between orders and example, which cropped out so singularly at Vicksburg in our civil war, causing the misunderstanding and estrangement of two gallant officers, should not be permitted to occur. It is the business of a chief to provide against such misapprehensions by most careful previous explanation of both the letter and spirit of his plans. Especially is this so at sea, where smoke, slack wind, and intervening rigging make signals hard to read though they are almost the only means of communication. This was Nelson's practice, nor was Suffren a stranger to the idea. Dispositions well concerted with those who are to carry them out are needed, he wrote to Destang, three years before. The excuse which may be pleaded for those who followed him, and engaged, cannot avail for the rear ships, and especially not for the second in command, who knew Suffren's plans. He should have compelled the rear ships to take position to leeward, leading himself, if necessary. There was wind enough. For two captains actually engaged to leeward, one of them without orders, acting, through the impulse of his own goodwill and courage, on Nelson saying, no captain can do very wrong who places his ship alongside that of an enemy. He received the special commendation of Suffren, in itself an honor and a reward. Whether the failure of so many of his fellows was due to inefficiency, or to a spirit of faction and disloyalty, is unimportant to the general military writer, however interesting to French officers jealous for the honor of their service. Suffren's complaints, after several disappointments, became vehement. My heart, wrote he, is wrung by the most general defection. I have just lost the opportunity of destroying the English squadron. All, yes, all, might have got near, since we were to windward and ahead, and none did so. 
several among them had behaved bravely in other combats. I can only attribute this horror to the wish to bring the cruise to an end, to ill will, and to ignorance, for I dare not suspect anything worse. The result has been terrible. I must tell you, Monseigneur, that officers who have been long at the Isle of France are neither seamen nor military men. Not seamen, for they have not been at sea. And the trading temper, independent and insubordinate, is absolutely opposed to the military spirit. This letter, written after his fourth battle with Hughes, must be taken with allowance. Not only does it appear that Suffren himself, hurried away on this last occasion by his eagerness, was partly responsible for the disorder of his fleet, but there were other circumstances, and above all the character of some of the officers blamed. Which made the charge of a general disaffection excessive. On the other hand, it remains true that after four general actions, with superior numbers on the part of the French, under a chief of the skill and ardor of Suffren, the English squadron, to use his own plaintive expression, still existed. Not only so, but had not lost a single ship. The only conclusion that can be drawn is that of a French naval writer, quantity disappeared before quality. It is immaterial whether the defect was due to inefficiency or disaffection. The inefficiency which showed itself on the field of battle disappeared in the general conduct of the campaign where the qualities of the chief alone told. The battle of February 17 ended with a shift of wind to the southeast at 6 p.m. After two hours' action, the English were thus brought to windward, and their van ships enabled to share in the fight. Night falling, Suffren, at half past six, hauled his squadron by the wind on the starboard tack, heading northeast, while Hughes steered south under easy sail. It is said by Captain Chevalier, of the French Navy, that Suffren intended to renew the fight next day. In that case, he should have taken measures to keep within reach. It was too plainly Hughes's policy not to fight without some advantage, to allow the supposition that with one ship, that Exeter, lost to him through the concentration of so many enemies upon her, he would quietly await an attack. This is so plain as to make it probable that Suffren saw sufficient reason, in the results to his fleet and the misconduct of his officers, not to wish to renew action at once. The next morning the two fleets were out of sight of each other. The continuance of the north wind, and the crippled state of two of his ships, forced Hughes to go to Trincomalee, where the sheltered harbour allowed them to repair. Suffren, anxious about his transports, went to Pondicherry, where he anchored in their company. It was his wish then to proceed against Negapatam, but the commander of the troops chose to act against Kudlor. After negotiations and arrangements with Hyder Ali the army landed south of Porto Novo, and marched against Kudlor, which surrendered on the 4th of April. Meanwhile Suffren, anxious to act against his principal objective, had sailed again on the 23d of March. It was his hope to cut off two ships of the line which were expected from England. For this he was too late. The two 74s joined the main body at Madras, March 30th, Hughes had refitted at Trincomalee in a fortnight, and reached Madras again on the 12th of March. Soon after the reinforcement had joined him, he sailed again for Trincomalee with troops and military stores for the garrison. On the 8th of April Suffren's squadron was seen to the northeast, also standing to the southward. Hughes kept on, through that and the two following days, with light northerly winds. On the 11th he made the coast of Ceylon, fifty miles north of Trincomalee, and bore away for the port. On the morning of the 12th the French squadron in the northeast was seen crowding sail in pursuit. It was the day on which Rodney and de Grasse met in the West Indies, but the parts were reversed, here the French, not the English, sought action. The speed of the ships in both squadrons was very unequal, each had some coppered ships and some not coppered. Hughes found that his slow sailors could not escape the fastest of his enemy, a condition which will always compel a retreating force to hazard an action, unless it can resolve to give up the rear ships, and which makes it imperative for the safety as well as the efficiency, of a squadron that vessels of the same class should all have a certain minimum speed. The same cause, the danger of a separated ship, led the unwilling de Grasse, the same day, in another scene, to a risky maneuver and a great mishap. Hughes, with better reason, resolved to fight, and at 9 a.m. 
formed his line on the starboard tack, standing in shore, plate 15, A, the squadron in good order, with intervals of two cables between the ships. His account, which again varies from that of Suffren, giving a radically different idea of the tactics used by the French Commodore, and more to the credit of the latter's skill, will first be followed. He says. The enemy, bearing north by east, distant six miles, with wind at north by east, continued maneuvering their ships and changing their positions in line, till fifteen minutes past noon, when they bore away, a, to engage us. Five sail of their van stretching along, b, to engage the ships of our van, and the other seven sail, b, steering directly on our three center ships, the, Suburbi, the, Monmouth, her second ahead, and the, Monarca, her second astern. At half past one the engagement began in the van of both squadrons, three minutes after, I made the signal for battle. The French admiral in the Heroes and his second astern in Lorient, both 74s, bore down on the Suburbi within pistol shot. The Heroes continued in her position, giving and receiving a severe fire for nine minutes, and then stood on, greatly damaged, to attack the Monmouth, at that time engaged with another of the enemy's ships. Making room for the ships in his rear to come up to the attack of our center, where the engagement was hottest. At three, the Monmouth had her mizzenmast shot away, and in a few minutes her mainmast, and bore out of the line to leeward, C, C. And at forty minutes past three, the wind unexpectedly continuing far northerly without any sea breeze, and being careful not to entangle our ships with the land, I made signal to wear and halt by the wind in a line of battle on the larboard tack. Still engaging the enemy. Now here, practically, was concentration with a vengeance. In this, the hardest fight between these two hard fighters, the English loss was 137 killed and 430 wounded in 11 ships. Of this total, the two center ships, the flagship and her next ahead, lost 104 killed and 198 wounded, 53% of the entire loss of the squadron, of which they formed 18%. The casualties were very much heavier, in proportion to the size of the ships, than those of the leaders of the two columns at Trafalgar. The material injury to hulls, spars, etc., was yet more serious. The English squadron, by this concentration of the enemy upon a small fraction of it, was entirely crippled. Inferior when the action began, its inferiority was yet more decisive by the subtraction of two ships, and Suffren's freedom to move was increased. PL 15. But how far was this concentration intended by Suffren? For this we must go to the pages of two French writers, who based their narratives upon his own dispatches on record in the French Marine Office. The practical advantage gained by the French must also be tested by comparing the lists of casualties, and the injuries received by their individual ships. For it is evident that if both the squadrons received the same total amount of injury, but that with the English it fell on two ships, so that they could not be ready for action for a month or more. While with the French the damage was divided among the twelve, allowing them to be ready again in a few days, the victory tactically and strategically would rest with the latter. As regards Suffren's purpose, there is nothing to indicate that he meant to make such an attack as Hughes describes. Having twelve ships to the English eleven, his intention seems to have been to pursue the usual English practice, form line parallel to the enemy, bear down together, and engage ship to ship. To this he added one simple combination. The twelfth French ship, being unprovided with an opponent, was to engage the rear English ship on her lee side, placing her thus between two fires. In truth, a concentration upon the van and center, such as Hughes describes, is tactically inferior to a like effort upon the center and rear of a column. This is true of steamers even, which, though less liable to loss of motive power, must still turn round to get from van to rear, losing many valuable seconds. But it is specially true of sailing vessels, and above all in the light, baffling airs which are apt to mark the change of monsoon at the season when this fight was fought. Nelson emphasized his contempt of the Russians of his day by saying he would not hesitate to attack their van, counting upon throwing the whole line in confusion from their want of seamanship. But though entertaining a not much better opinion of the Spaniards, 
he threw the weight of attack on the rear of the Allied fleets at Trafalgar. In dealing with such seamen as the captains of Hughes's fleet, it would have been an error to assail the van instead of the rear. Only a dead calm could have kept the latter out of action. Suffren's attack is thus described by Captain Chevalier. After mentioning Hughes's forming line on the starboard tack, he says. This maneuver was imitated by the French, and the two squadrons ran on parallel lines, heading about west-northwest, a, a. At eleven, our line being well formed, Suffren made signal to keep away to west-southwest, by a movement altogether. Our ships did not keep their bearing upon the prescribed line, and the van, composed of the best sailors, came first within range of the enemy. At one, the leading ships of the English fleet opened fire upon the Tavenger and Artesian French van. These two ships, having left to return the fire, were at once ordered to keep away again. Suffren, who wished for a decisive action, kept his course, receiving without reply the shots directed upon his ship by the enemy. When at pistol range of the Superbi, he hauled to the wind, B, and the signal to open fire appeared at his mainmast head. Admiral Hughes having only eleven ships, the Fibizar, according to the dispositions taken by the commander-in-chief, was to attack on the quarter the rear ship of the English fleet and double on it to leeward. At the moment when the first cannon shots were heard, our worst sailors were not up with their stations. Breathing the letter, and not the spirit, of the Commodore's orders, the captains of these ships luffed at the same time as those which preceded them. Hence it resulted that the French line formed a curve, B, whose extremities were represented in the van by the Partesian and Venger, and in the rear by the Bizarre, Ajax, and Severe. In consequence, these ships were very far from those which corresponded to them in the enemy's line. It is evident from all this, written by a warm admirer of Suffren, who has had full access to the official papers, that the French chief intended an attack elementary in conception and difficult of execution. To keep a fleet on a line of bearing, sailing free, requires much drill, especially when the ships have different rates of speed, as had Suffren's. The extreme injury suffered by the Superbi and Monmouth, undeniably due to a concentration, cannot be attributed to Suffren's dispositions. The injuries which the heroes received at the beginning of the action did not allow her to remain by the Superbi. Not being able to back her topsails in time, the braces having been cut, she passed ahead, and was only stopped on the beam of the Monmouth. This accounts for the suffering of the latter ship, already injured, and now contending with a much larger opponent. The Superbi was freed from suffering only to be engaged by the next Frenchman, an equally heavy ship. And when the Monmouth drifted or bore up, to leeward, the French flagship also drifted so that for a few moments she fired her stern guns into the Superb's bow, C, D. The latter at the same time was engaged on the beam and quarter by two French ships, either with or without signal, came up to shield their Commodore. An examination of the list of casualties shows that the loss of the French was much more distributed among their ships than was the case with the English. No less than three of the latter escaped without a man killed, while of the French only one. The kernel of the action seems to have been in the somewhat fortuitous concentration of two French 74s and 164 on an English 74 and 64. Assuming the ships to have been actually of the same force as their rates, the French brought, counting broadside only, 106 guns against 69. Some unfavorable criticism was excited by the management of Admiral Hughes during the three days preceding the fight, because he refrained from attacking the French. Although they were for much of the time to leeward with only one ship more than the English, and much separated at that. It was thought that he had the opportunity of beating them in detail. The accounts accessible are too meager to permit an accurate judgment upon this opinion, which probably reflected the mess table and quarter deck talk of the subordinate officers of the fleet. Hughes's own report of the position of the two fleets is vague, and in one important particular directly contradictory to the French. If the alleged opportunity offered, the English admiral in declining to use it adhered to the resolve, with which he sailed, neither to seek nor shun the enemy, but to go directly to Trincomalee and land the troops and supplies he had on board. In other words, 
he was governed in his action by the French rather than the English naval policy, of subordinating the attack of the enemy's fleet to the particular mission in hand. If for this reason he did allow a favorable chance of fighting to slip, he certainly had reason bitterly to regret his neglect, in the results of the battle which followed. But in the lack of precise information the most interesting point to be noted is the impression made upon public and professional opinion. Indicating how strongly the English held that the attack of the enemy's fleet was the first duty of an English admiral. It may also be said that he could hardly have fared worse by attacking than he did by allowing the enemy to become the assailant, and certainly not worse than he would have fared had Suffren's captains been as good as his own. After the action, toward sunset, both squadrons anchored in fifteen fathoms of water, irregular soundings, three of the French ships taking the bottom on coral patches. Here they lay for a week two miles apart, refitting. Hughes, from the ruined condition of the Monmouth, expected an attack, but when Suffren had finished his repairs on the 19th, he got under way and remained outside for twenty-four hours, inviting a battle which he would not begin. He realized the condition of the enemy so keenly as to feel the necessity of justifying his action to the Minister of Marine, which he did for eight reasons unnecessary to particularize here. The last was the lack of efficiency and hearty support on the part of his captains. It is not likely that Suffren erred on the side of excessive caution. On the contrary, his most marked defect as a commander-in-chief was an ardor which, when in sight of the enemy, became impatience, and carried him at times into action hastily and in disorder. But if, in the details and execution of his battles, in his tactical combinations, Suffren was at times foiled by his own impetuosity and the shortcomings of most of his captains, in the general conduct of the campaign, in strategy. Where the personal qualities of the commander-in-chief mainly told, his superiority was manifest, and achieved brilliant success. Then ardor showed itself in energy, untiring and infectious. The eagerness of his hot provosal blood overrode difficulty, created resources out of destitution, and made itself felt through every vessel under his orders. No military lesson is more instructive nor of more enduring value than the rapidity and ingenuity with which he, without a port or supplies, continually refitted his fleet and took the field, while his slower enemy was dawdling over his repairs. The battle forced the English to remain inactive for six weeks, till the Monmouth was repaired. Unfortunately, Suffren's situation did not allow him to assume the offensive at once. He was short of men, provisions, and especially of spare spars and rigging. In an official letter after the action he wrote, I have no spare stores to repair rigging, the squadron lacks at least twelve spare topmasts. A convoy of supply ships was expected at Point de Gaulle's, which, with the rest of Ceylon, except Trincomalee, was still Dutch. He therefore anchored at Batacalo, south of Trincomalee, a position in which he was between Hughes and outward-bound English ships, and was favorably placed to protect his own convoys, which joined him there. On the 3d of June he sailed for Tranquibar, a Danish possession, where he remained two or three weeks, harassing the English communications between Madras and the fleet at Trincomalee. Leaving there, he sailed for Kudlor, to communicate with the commander of the land forces and Hyder Ali. The latter was found to be much discontented with the scanty cooperation of the French general. Suffren, however, had won his favor, and he expressed a wish to see him on his return from the expedition then in contemplation. For, true to his accurate instinct, the Commodore was bent upon again seeking out the English fleet, after beating which he intended to attack Negapatam. There was not in him any narrowness of professional prejudice. He kept always in view the necessity, both political and strategic, of nursing the alliance with the Sultan and establishing control upon the seaboard and in the interior. But he clearly recognized that the first step thereto was the control of the sea, by disabling the English fleet. The tenacity and vigor with which he followed this aim, amid great obstacles, joined to the clear-sightedness with which he saw it, are the distinguishing merits of Suffren amid the crowd of French fleet commanders, his equals in courage. But trammeled by the bonds of a false tradition and the perception of a false objective. Hughes meantime, having rigged jury masts to the Monmouth, had gone to Trincomalee, where his squadron refitted and the sick were landed for treatment. 
But it is evident, as has before been mentioned, that the English had not held the port long enough to make an arsenal or supply port, for he says, I will be able to remast the Monmouth from the spare stores on board the several ships. His resources were nevertheless superior to those of his adversary. During the time that Suffren was at Tranquilbar, worrying the English communications between Madras and Trincomalee, Hughes still stayed quietly in the latter port, sailing for Negapatam on the 23d of June, the day after Suffren reached Kudlor. The two squadrons had thus again approached each other, and Suffren hastened his preparations for attack as soon as he heard that his enemy was where he could get at him. Hughes awaited his movement. Before sailing, however, Suffren took occasion to say in writing home, Since my arrival in Ceylon, partly by the help of the Dutch, partly through the prizes we have taken, the squadron has been equipped for six months' service. And I have rations of wheat and rice assured for more than a year. This achievement was indeed a just source of pride and self-congratulation. Without a port, and destitute of resources, the French Commodore had lived off the enemy, the store ships and commerce of the latter had supplied his wants. To his fertility of resource and the activity of his cruisers, inspired by himself, this result was due. Yet he had but two frigates, the class of vessel upon which an admiral must mainly depend for this predatory warfare. On the 23d of March, both provisions and stores had been nearly exhausted. Six thousand dollars in money, and the provisions in the convoy, were then his sole resources. Since then he had fought a severe action, most expensive in rigging in men, as well as in ammunition. After that fight of April 12 he had left only powder and shot enough for one other battle of equal severity. Three months later he was able to report as above, that he could keep the sea on his station for six months without further supplies. This result was due wholly to himself, to his self-reliance, and what may without exaggeration be called his greatness of soul. It was not expected at Paris. On the contrary, it was expected there that the squadron would return to the Isle of France to refit. It was not thought possible that it could remain on a hostile coast, so far from its nearest base, and be kept in efficient condition. Suffren thought otherwise. He considered, with true military insight and a proper sense of the value of his own profession, that the success of the operations in India depended upon the control of the sea, and therefore upon the uninterrupted presence of his squadron. He did not shrink from attempting that which had always been thought impossible. This firmness of spirit, bearing the stamp of genius, must, to be justly appreciated, be considered with reference to the circumstances of his own time and of the preceding generations in which he grew up. Suffren was born July 17, 1729, and served during the wars of 1739 and 1756. He was first under fire at Matthews's action off Toulon, February 22, 1744. He was the contemporary of de Stang, de Guéchen, and de Grasse, before the days of the French Revolution, when the uprising of a people had taught men how often impossibilities are not impossible. Before Napoleon and Nelson had made a mock of the word. His attitude and action had therefore at the time the additional merit of originality, but his lofty temper was capable of yet higher proof. Convinced of the necessity of keeping the squadron on its station, he ventured to disregard not only the murmurs of his officers but the express orders of the court. When he reached Batacalo, he found dispatches directing him to return to the Isle of France. Instead of taking them as a release from the great burden of responsibility, he disobeyed, giving his reasons, and asserting that he on the spot could judge better than a minister in Europe what the circumstances demanded. Such a leader deserved better subordinates, and a better colleague than he had in the commander of the forces on shore. Whether or no the conditions of the general maritime struggle would have permitted the overthrow of the English East Indian power may be doubtful. But it is certain that among all the admirals of the three nations there was none so fitted to accomplish that result as Suffren. We shall find him enduring severer tests, and always equal to them. In the afternoon of the 5th of July Suffren's squadron came in sight of the English, anchored off Cudlor. An hour later, a sudden squall carried away the main and mizzen topmasts of one of the French ships. Admiral Hughes got under way, and the two fleets maneuvered during the night. The following day the wind favored the English, 
and the opponents found themselves in line of battle on the starboard tack, heading south-southeast, with the wind at southwest. The disabled French ship having by unpardonable inactivity failed to repair her injuries, the numbers about to engage were equal, eleven on each side. At eleven a.m. the English bore down together and engaged ship against ship. But as was usual under those conditions, the rear ships did not come to as close action as those ahead of them, plate 16, position I. Captain Chevalier carefully points out that their failure was a fair offset to the failure of the French rear on the 12th of April, but fails to note in this connection that the French van, both on that occasion and again on the 3d of September, bungled as well as the rear. There can remain little doubt, in the mind of the careful reader, that most of the French captains were inferior, as seamen, to their opponents. During this part of the engagement the fourth ship in the French order, the brilliant, A, lost her mainmast, bore up out of the line, and dropped gradually astern and to leeward, a uh, PL 16. At 1 p.m. When the action was hottest, the wind suddenly shifted to south-southeast, taking the ships on the port bow, position 2. For English ships, the Burford, Sultan, S, Worcester, and Eagle, seeing the breeze coming, kept off to port, toward the French line, the others were taken aback and paid off to starboard. The French ships, on the other hand, with two exceptions, the Brilliant, A, and Severe, B, paid off from the English. The effect of the change of wind was therefore to separate the main parts of the two squadrons, but to bring together between the lines four English and two French ships. Technical order was destroyed. The Brilliant, having dropped far astern of her position, came under the fire of two of the English rear, the Worcester and the Eagle, who had kept off in time and so neared the French. Suffren in person came to her assistance, position 3. A, and drove off the English, who were also threatened by the approach of two other French ships that had worn to the westward in obedience to signal. While this partial action was taking place, the other endangered French ship, the Severe, B, was engaged by the English, Sultan, S, and, if the French Captain M, de Siller, can be believed, by two other English ships. It is probable, from her place in the line, that the, Burford, also assailed her. However this may be, the, Severe, hauled down her flag, but while the, Sultan, was wearing away from her, she resumed her fire, raking the English ship. The order to surrender, given by the French captain and carried into execution by the formal well-established token of submission, was disregarded by his subordinates, who fired upon their enemy while the flag was down. In effect, the action of the French ship amounted to using an infamous ruse de guerre, but it would be unjust to say that this was intended. The positions of the different vessels were such that the Sultan could not have secured her prize. Other French ships were approaching and must have retaken it. The indignation of the French juniors at the weakness of their captain was therefore justified. Their refusal to be bound by it may be excused to men face to face with an unexpected question of propriety, in the heat of battle and under the sting of shame. Nevertheless, scrupulous good faith would seem to demand that their deliverance should be awaited from other hands, not bound by the action of their commander, or at least that the forbearing assailant should not have suffered from them. The captain, suspended and sent home by Suffren, and cashiered by the king, utterly condemned himself by his attempted defence, when Captain de Sillert saw the French squadron drawing off. For all the ships except the Brilliant had fallen off on the other tack, he thought it useless to prolong his defence, and had the flag hauled down. The ships engaged with him immediately ceased their fire, and the one on the starboard side moved away. At this moment that a severe fell off to starboard and her sails filled. Captain de Sillert then ordered the fire to be resumed by his lower deck guns, the only one still manned, and he rejoined his squadron. This action was the only one of the five fought by Suffren on the coast of India, in which the English admiral was the assailant. There can be found in it no indication of military conceptions, of tactical combinations. But on the other hand Hughes is continually showing the aptitudes, habits of thought, and foresight of the skillful seamen, as well as a courage beyond all proof. He was in truth an admirable representative of the average English naval officer of the middle of the 18th century. 
And while it is impossible not to condemn the general ignorance of the most important part of the profession, it is yet useful to remark how far thorough mastery of its other details, and dog determination not to yield. Made up for so signal a defect. As the Roman legions often redeemed the blunders of their generals, so did English captains and seamen often save that which had been lost by the errors of their admirals, errors which neither captain nor seamen recognized. Nor would probably have admitted. Nowhere were these solid qualities so clearly shown as in Suffren's battles, because nowhere else were such demands made upon them. No more magnificent instances of desperate yet useful resistance to overwhelming odds are to be found in naval annals, than that of the Monmouth, on April 12th, and of the Exeter, on February 17th. An incident told of the latter ship is worth quoting. At the heel of the action, when the Exeter was already in the state of a wreck, the master came to Commodore King to ask him what he should do with the ship, as two of the enemy were again bearing down upon her. He laconically answered, there is nothing to be done but to fight her till she sinks. She was saved. Suffren, on the contrary, was by this time incensed beyond endurance by the misbehavior of his captains. Sillert was sent home. But besides him two others, both of them men of influential connections, and one a relative of Suffren himself, were dispossessed of their commands. However necessary and proper this step, few but Suffren would have had the resolution to take it. For, so far as he then knew, he was only a captain in rank, and it was not permitted even to admirals to deal thus with their juniors. You may perhaps be angry, Monsignor, he wrote, that I have not used rigor sooner. But I beg you to remember that the regulations do not give this power even to a general officer, which I am not. It is immediately after the action of the 6th of July that Suffren's superior energy and military capacity begin markedly to influence the issue between himself and Hughes. The tussle had been severe. But military qualities began to tell, as they surely must. The losses of the two squadrons in men, in the last action, had been as one to three in favor of the English. On the other hand, the latter had apparently suffered more in sails and spars, in motive power. Both fleets anchored in the evening, the English off Negapatam, the French to leeward, off Cudlow. On the 18th of July Suffren was again ready for sea, whereas on the same day Hughes had but just decided to go to Madras to finish his repairs. Suffren was further delayed by the political necessity of an official visit to Hyder Ali, after which he sailed to Batacalo, arriving there on the 9th of August, to await reinforcements and supplies from France. On the 21st, these joined him. And two days later he sailed, now with fourteen ships of the line, for Trincomalee, anchoring off the town on the 25th. The following night the troops were landed, batteries thrown up, and the attack pressed with vigor. On the 30th and 31st the two forts which made the defensive strength of the place surrendered, and this all-important port passed into the hands of the French. Convinced that Hughes would soon appear, Suffren granted readily all the honors of war demanded by the governor of the place, contenting himself with the substantial gain. Two days later, on the evening of September 2d, the English fleet was sighted by the French lookout frigates. During the six weeks in which Suffren had been so actively and profitably employed, the English admiral had remained quietly at anchor, repairing and refitting. No precise information is available for deciding how far this delay was unavoidable. But having in view the well-known aptitude of English seamen of that age, it can scarcely be doubted that, had Hughes possessed the untiring energy of his great rival, he could have gained the few days which decided the fate of Trincomalee, and fought a battle to save the place. In fact, this conclusion is supported by his own reports, which state that on the 12th of August the ships were nearly fitted, and yet, though apprehending an attack on Trincomalee, he did not sail until the 20th. The loss of this harbour forced him to abandon the east coast, which was made unsafe by the approach of the northeast monsoon, and conferred an important strategic advantage upon Suffren. Not to speak of the political effect upon the native rulers in India. To appreciate thoroughly this contrast between the two admirals, it is necessary also to note how differently they were situated with regard to material for repairs. After the action of the 6th, Hughes found at Madras spars, cordage, stores, 
provisions, and material. Suffren at Cudlor found nothing. To put his squadron in good fighting condition, nineteen new topmasts were needed, besides lower masts, yards, rigging, sails, and so on. To take the sea at all, the masts were removed from the frigates and smaller vessels, and given to the ships of the line while English prizes were stripped to equip the frigates. Ships were sent off to the Straits of Malacca to procure other spars and timber. Houses were torn down on shore to find lumber for repairing the hulls. The difficulties were increased by the character of the anchorage, an open roadstead with frequent heavy sea, and by the near presence of the English fleet. But the work was driven on under the eyes of the commander-in-chief, who, like Lord Howe at New York, inspired the working parties by his constant appearance among them. Notwithstanding his prodigious obesity, Suffren displayed the fiery ardor of youth, he was everywhere where work was going on. Under his powerful impulse, the most difficult tasks were done with incredible rapidity. Nevertheless, his officers represented to him the bad state of the fleet, and the need of a port for the ships of the line. Until we have taken Trincomalee, he replied, the open roadsteads of the Coromandel coast will answer. It was indeed to this activity on the Coromandel coast that the success at Trincomalee was due. The weapons with which Suffren fought are obsolete. But the results wrought by his tenacity and fertility in resources are among the undying lessons of history. While the characters of the two chiefs were thus telling upon the strife in India, other no less lasting lessons were being afforded by the respective governments at home, who did much to restore the balance between them. While the English ministry, after the news of the Battle of Porto Praia, fitted out in November, 1781, a large and compact expedition, convoyed by a powerful squadron of six ships of the line, under the command of an active officer. To reinforce Hughes, the French dispatched comparatively scanty suckers in small detached bodies, relying apparently upon secrecy rather than upon force to assure their safety. Thus Suffren, while struggling with his innumerable embarrassments, had the mortification of learning that now one and now another of the small detachments sent to his relief were captured, or driven back to France. Before they were clear of European waters. There was in truth little safety for small divisions north of the Straits of Gibraltar. Thus the advantages gained by his activity were in the end sacrificed. Up to the fall of Trincomalee the French were superior at sea. But in the six months which followed, the balance turned the other way, by the arrival of the English reinforcements under Sir Richard Bickerton. With his usual promptness the French Commodore had prepared for further immediate action as soon as Trincomalee surrendered. The cannon and men landed from the ships were at once re-embarked, and the port secured by a garrison strong enough to relieve him of any anxiety about holding it. This great seaman, who had done as much in proportion to the means entrusted to him as any known to history, and had so signally illustrated the sphere and influence of naval power, had no intention of fettering the movements of his fleet. Or risking his important conquest, by needlessly taking upon the shoulders of the ships the burden of defending a seaport. When Hughes appeared, it was past the power of the English fleet by a single battle to reduce the now properly garrisoned post. Doubtless a successful campaign, by destroying or driving away the French sea power, would achieve this result. But Suffren might well believe that, whatever mishaps might arise on a single day, he could in the long run more than hold his own with his opponent. Seaports should defend themselves. The sphere of the fleet is on the open sea, its object offense rather than defense, its objective the enemy's shipping wherever it can be found. Suffren now saw again before him the squadron on which depended the English control of the sea. He knew that powerful reinforcements to it must arrive before the next season, and he hastened to attack. Hughes, mortified by his failure to arrive in time, for a drawn battle beforehand would have saved what a successful battle afterward could not regain, was in no humor to balk him. Still, with sound judgment, he retreated to the southeast, flying in good order, to use Suffren's expression. Regulating speed by the slowest ships, and steering many different courses, so that the chase which began at daybreak overtook the enemy only at two in the afternoon. The object of the English was to draw Suffren so far to leeward of the port that, if his ships were disabled, he could not easily regain it. The French numbered fourteen ships of the line to twelve English. 
This superiority, together with his sound appreciation of the military situation in India, increased Suffren's natural eagerness for action, but his ships sailed badly, and were poorly handled by indifferent and dissatisfied men. These circumstances, during the long and vexatious pursuit, chafed and fretted the hot temper of the Commodore, which still felt the spur of urgency that for two months had quickened the operations of the squadron. Signal followed signal, maneuver succeeded maneuver, to bring his disordered vessels into position. Sometimes they edged down, sometimes they brought to, says the English admiral, who was carefully watching their approach, in no regular order, as if undetermined what to do. Still, Suffren continued on, and at 2 p.m. Having been carried 25 miles away from his port, his line being then partly formed and within striking distance of the enemy, the signal was made to come to the wind to correct the order before finally bearing down. A number of blunders in executing this made matters worse rather than better, and the Commodore, at last losing patience, made signal 30 minutes later to attack, plate 17, A, following it with another for close action at pistol range. This being slowly and clumsily obeyed, he ordered a gun fired, as is customary at sea to emphasize a signal, unluckily this was understood by his own crew to be the opening of the action, and the flagship discharged all her battery. This example was followed by the other ships, though yet at the distance of half cannon shot, which, under the gunnery conditions of that day, meant indecisive action. Thus at the end and as the result of a mortifying series of blunders and bad seamanship, the battle began greatly to the disadvantage of the French, despite their superior numbers. The English, who had been retreating under short and handy sail, were in good order and quietly ready, whereas their enemies were in no order, b. Seven ships had foreached in rounding to, and now formed an irregular group ahead of the English van, as well as far from it, where they were of little service. While in the center a second confused group was formed, the ships overlapping and masking each other's fire. Under the circumstances the entire brunt of the action fell upon Suffren's flagship, A, and two others which supported him. While at the extreme rear a small ship of the line, backed by a large frigate, alone engaged the English rear, but these, being wholly overmatched, were soon forced to retire. PL 17. A military operation could scarcely be worse carried out. The French ships in the battle did not support each other, they were so grouped as to hamper their own fire and needlessly increase the target offered to the enemy. So far from concentrating their own effort, three ships were left, almost unsupported, to a concentrated fire from the English line. Time passed on, and our three ships, B, A, engaged on the beam by the center of the English fleet and raked, enfiladed, by van and rear, suffered greatly. After two hours the hero's sails were in rags, all her running rigging cut, and she could no longer steer. The illustre had lost her mizzenmast and main topmast. In this disorder such gaps existed as to offer a great opportunity to a more active opponent. Had the enemy tacked now, wrote the chief of staff in his journal, we would have been cut off and probably destroyed. The faults of an action in which every proper distribution was wanting are summed up in the results. The French had 14 ships engaged. They lost 82 killed and 255 wounded. Of this total, 64 killed and 178 wounded, or three-fourths, fell to three ships. Two of these three lost their main and mizzen masts and four topmast, in other words, were helpless. This was a repetition on a larger scale of the disaster to two of Hughes's ships on the 12th of April. But on that day the English admiral, being to leeward and in smaller force had to accept action on the adversary's terms, while here the loss fell on the assailant, who, to the advantage of the wind and choice of his mode of attack. Added superiority in numbers. Full credit must in this action be allowed to Hughes, who, though lacking in enterprise and giving no token of tactical skill or coup d'oeil, showed both judgment and good management in the direction of his retreat and in keeping his ship so well in hand. It is not easy to apportion the blame which rests upon his enemies. Suffren laid it freely upon his captains. It has been rightly pointed out, however, that many of the officers thus condemned in mass had conducted themselves well before, both under Suffren and other admirals. 
that the order of pursuit was irregular, and Suffren's signals followed each other with confusing rapidity. And finally that chance, for which something must always be allowed, was against the French, as was also the inexperience of several captains. It is pretty certain that some of the mishap must be laid to the fiery and inconsiderate haste of Suffren, who had the defects of his great qualities, upon which his coy and wary antagonist unwittingly played. It is noteworthy that no complaints of his captains are to be found in Hughes's reports. Six fell in action, and of each he speaks in terms of simple but evidently sincere appreciation, while on the survivors he often bestows particular as well as general commendation. The marked contrast between the two leaders, and between the individual ship commanders, on either side, makes this singularly instructive among naval campaigns. And the ultimate lesson taught is in entire accordance with the experience of all military history from the beginning. Suffren had genius, energy, great tenacity, sound military ideas, and was also an accomplished seaman. Hughes had apparently all the technical acquirements of the latter profession, would probably have commanded a ship equally well with any of his captains, but shows no trace of the qualities needed by a general officer. On the other hand, without insisting again upon the skill and fidelity of the English subordinates, it is evident that, to whatever it be attributed, the French single ships were as a rule incomparably worse handled than those of their opponents. For times, Suffren claims, certainly thrice, the English squadron was saved from overwhelming disaster by the difference in quality of the under-officers. Good troops have often made amends for bad generalship. But in the end the better leader will prevail. This was conspicuously the case in the Indian Seas in 1782 and 1783. War cut short the strife, but not before the issue was clearly indicated. The action of September 3rd, like that of July 6th, was brought to a close by a shift of wind to the southeast. When it came, the English line wore, and formed again on the other tack. The French also wore. And their van ships, being now to windward, stood down between their crippled ships and the enemy's line, c. Toward sundown Hughes hauled off to the northward, abandoning the hope of regaining Trincomalee, but with the satisfaction of having inflicted this severe retaliation upon his successful opponent. That firmness of mind which was not the least of Suffren's qualities was severely tried soon after the action off Trincomalee. In returning to port, a 74, the Orient, was run ashore and lost by mismanagement, the only consolation being that her spars were saved for the two dismasted ships. Other crippled masts were replaced as before by robbing the frigates, whose crews also were needed to replace the losses in battle. Repairs were pushed on with the usual energy, the defense of the port was fully provided for, and on the 30th of September the squadron sailed for the Coromandel coast, where the state of French interests urgently called for it. Cudlow was reached in four days, and here another incapable officer wrecked the Bazaar, of 64 guns, in picking up his anchorage. In consequence of the loss of these two ships, Suffren, when he next met the enemy, could oppose only 15 to 18 ships of the line, so much do general results depend upon individual ability and care. Hughes was at Madras, 90 miles north, whither he had gone at once after the late action. He reports his ships badly damaged. But the loss was so evenly distributed among them that it is difficult to justify his failure to follow up the injuries done to the French. At this season the monsoon wind, which has come for four or five months from southwest, changes to northeast, blowing upon the east coast of the peninsula, where are no good harbors. The consequent swell made the shore often unapproachable, and so forbade support from fleet to army. The change of the monsoon is also frequently marked by violent hurricanes. The two commanders, therefore, had to quit a region where their stay might be dangerous as well as useless. Had Trincomalee not been lost, Hughes, in the condition of his squadron, might have awaited there the reinforcements and supplies expected soon from England, for although the port is not healthy, it is secure and well situated. Bickerton had already reached Bombay, and was on his way now to Madras with five ships of the line. As things were, Hughes thought necessary to go to Bombay for the season, sailing or rather being driven to sea by a hurricane, on the 17th of October. 
Four days later Bickerton reached Madras, not having fallen in with the admiral. With an activity which characterized him he sailed at once, and was again in Bombay on the 28th of November. Hughes's ships, scattered and crippled by tempest, dropped in one by one, a few days later. Suffren held Trincomalee, yet his decision was not easy. The port was safe, he had not to fear an attack by the English fleet. And on the other hand, besides being sickly during the approaching monsoon, it was doubtful whether the provisions needed for the health of the crews could be had there. In short, though of strategic value from its strength and position, the port was deficient in resources. Opposed to Trincomalee there was an alternative in Acom, a harbour on the other side of the Bay of Bengal, at the west end of the island of Sumatra. This was healthy, could supply provisions, and, from its position with reference to the northeast monsoon, would permit ships to regain the Coromandel coast sooner than those in Bombay. When the milder ending of the season made landing more practicable. These simple considerations were not, however, the only elements in the really difficult problem before Suffren. The small results that followed this campaign must not hide the fact that great issues were possible, and that much might depend upon his decision. Owing to the French policy of sending out reinforcements in several small bodies, not only was there much loss, but great uncertainty prevailed among the scattered commands as to conditions elsewhere. This uncertainty, loss, and delay profoundly affected the political situation in India. When Suffren first reached the coast, the English had on their hands not only Hyder Ali, but the Marathas as well. Peace with the latter was signed on the 17th of May, 1782, but, owing probably to an opposition party among them, the ratifications were not exchanged until December. Both there and in the court of Hyder Ali there was division of interest. And representations were made from both to the French, who, though suspicious, could obtain no certain information of the treaty, that everything depended upon the relative military strength of themselves and the English. The presence and the actions of Suffren were all that France had to show, the prestige of his genius, the capture of Trincomalee, his success in battle. The French army, cooped up in Kudlor, was dependent upon the Sultan for money, for food, and for reinforcements, even the fleet called on him for money, for masts, for ammunition, for grain. The English, on the other hand, maintained their ground, though on the whole worsted, they lost no ships, and Bickerton's powerful squadron was known to have reached Bombay. Above all, while the French asked for money, the English lavished it. It was impossible for the French to make head against their enemy without native allies, it was essential to keep Hyder from also making peace. Here the inadequate support and faulty dispositions of the home government made themselves felt. The command in India, both by land and sea, was entrusted to General de Bussy, once the brilliant fellow worker with Duplex, now a gouty invalid of 64. With a view to secrecy, Bussy sailed from Cadiz in November, 1781, with two ships of the line, for Tenerife, where he was to be joined by a convoy leaving Brest in December. This convoy was captured by the English, only two of the vessels escaping to Bussy. The latter pursued his journey, and learning at the Cape of Good Hope that Bickerton's strong force was on the way, felt compelled to land there a great part of his troops. He reached the Isle of France on the 31st of May. The next convoy of 18 transports, sailing in April for India, was also intercepted. Two of the four ships of war were taken, as also ten of the transports, the remainder returned to Brest. A third detachment was more fortunate, reaching the Cape in May, but it was delayed there two months by the wretched condition of the ships and crews. These disappointments decided Bussy to remain at the island until joined by the expected ships from the Cape, and Suffren at this critical moment did not know what the state of things there was. The general had only written him that, as he could not reach the coast before the bad season, he should rendezvous at Acom. These uncertainties made a painful impression upon Hyder Ali, who had been led to expect Bussy in September, and had instead received news of Bickerton's arrival and the defection of his old allies, the Marathas. Suffren was forced to pretend a confidence which he did not feel, but which, with the influence of his own character and achievements, determined the Sultan to continue the war. This settled, the squadron sailed for Acom on 15 October, 
anchoring there the 2d of November. Three weeks afterward a vessel arrived from Bussy, with word that his departure was indefinitely delayed by an epidemic raging among the troops. Suffren therefore determined to hasten his own return to the coast, and sailed on the 20th of December. January 8, 1783, he anchored off Gunjam, 500 miles northeast of Kudlor, whence he would have a fair wind to proceed when he wished. It was his purpose to attack not only the coasting vessels but the English factories on shore as well, the surf being now often moderate. But learning on the 12th, from an English prize, the important and discouraging news of Hyder Ali's death, he gave up all minor operations, and sailed at once for Kudlor. Hoping to secure by his presence the continuance of the alliance as well as the safety of the garrison. He reached the place on the 6th of February. During his four months' absence, the failure of Bussey to appear with his troops, and the arrival of Bickerton, who had shown himself on both coasts, had seriously injured the French cause. The treaty of peace between the English and the Marathas had been ratified, and the former, released from this war and reinforced, had attacked the Sultan on the west, or Malabar, coast. The effect of this diversion was of course felt on the east coast, despite the efforts of the French to keep the new Sultan there. The sickness among the troops at the Isle of France had, however, ceased early in November. And had Bussy then started without delay, he and Suffren would now have met in the Carnatic, with full command of the sea and large odds in their favour ashore. Hughes did not arrive till two months later. Being thus alone, Suffren, after communicating with Tipu Saib, the new Sultan of Mysore, went to Trincomalee, and there he was at last joined, on the 10th of March, by Bussy, accompanied by three ships of the line and numerous transports. Eager to bring the troops into the field, Suffren sailed on the 15th with his fastest ships, and landed them the next day at Porto Novo. He returned to Trincomalee on the 11th of April, and fell in with Hughes's fleet of seventeen ships of the line off the harbour's mouth. Having only part of his force with him, no fight ensued, and the English went on to Madras. The southwest monsoon was now blowing. It is not necessary to follow the trivial operations of the next two months. Tipu being engaged on the other side of the peninsula and Bussy displaying little vigour, while Hughes was in superior force off the coast, the affairs of the French on shore went from bad to worse. Suffren, having but fifteen ships to eighteen English, was unwilling to go to leeward of Trincomalee, lest it should fall before he could return to it. Under these conditions the English troops advanced from Madras, passing near but around Kudlor, and encamped to the southward of it, by the sea. The supply ships and light cruisers were stationed off the shore near the army. While Admiral Hughes, with the heavy ships, anchored some twenty miles south, where, being to windward, he covered the others. In order to assure to Suffren the full credit of his subsequent course, it is necessary to emphasize the fact that Bussy, though commander-in-chief both by land and sea, did not venture to order him to leave Trincomalee and come to his support. Allowing him to feel the extremity of the danger, he told him not to leave port unless he heard that the army was shut up in Kudlor, and blockaded by the English squadron. This letter was received on the 10th of June. Suffren waited for no more. The next day he sailed, and forty-eight hours later his frigates saw the English fleet. The same day, the 13th, after a sharp action, the French army was shut up in the town, behind very weak walls. Everything now depended on the action of the fleets. Upon Suffren's appearance, Hughes moved away and anchored four or five miles from the town. Baffling winds prevailed for three days, but the monsoon resuming on the 16th, Suffren approached. The English admiral not liking to accept action at anchor, and to leeward, in which he was right, got under way. But attaching more importance to the weather gauge than to preventing a junction between the enemy's land and sea forces, he stood out into the offing with a southerly or south-southeast wind, notwithstanding his superior numbers. Suffren formed on the same tack, and some manoeuvring ensued during that night and the next day. At 8 p.m. of the 17th the French squadron, which had refused to be drawn to sea, anchored off Cudlor and communicated with the commander-in-chief. Twelve hundred of the garrison were hastily embarked to fill the numerous vacancies at the guns of the fleet. Until the 20th the wind, holding unexpectedly at west, 
denied Hughes the advantage which he sought. And finally on that day he decided to accept action and await the attack. It was made by Suffren with 15 ships to 18, the fire opening at quarter past 4 p.m. and lasting until half past 6. The loss on both sides was nearly equal. But the English ships, abandoning both the field of battle and their army, returned to Madras. Suffren anchored before Kudlor. The embarrassment of the British army was now very great. The supply ships on which it had depended fled before the action of the 20th, and the result of course made it impossible for them to return. The Sultan's light cavalry harassed their communications by land. On the 25th, the general commanding wrote that his mind was on the rack without a moment's rest since the departure of the fleet, considering the character of M. De Suffren, and the infinite superiority on the part of the French now that we are left to ourselves. From this anxiety he was relieved by the news of the conclusion of peace, which reached Kudlor on the 29th by flag of truce from Madras. If any doubt had remained as to the relative merits of the two sea commanders, the last few days of their campaign would have removed them. Hughes alleges the number of his sick and shortness of water as his reasons for abandoning the contest. Suffren's difficulties, however, were as great as his own, and if he had an advantage at Trincomalee, that only shifts the dispute a step back, for he owed its possession to superior generalship and activity. The simple facts that with fifteen ships he forced eighteen to abandon a blockade, relieved the invested army, strengthened his own crews, and fought a decisive action. Make an impression which does not need to be diminished in the interests of truth. It is probable that Hughes's self-reliance had been badly shaken by his various meetings with Suffren. Although the tidings of peace sent by Hughes to Bussey rested only upon unofficial letters, they were too positive to justify a continuance of bloodshed. An arrangement was entered into by the authorities of the two nations in India, and hostilities ceased on 8 July. Two months later, at Pondicherry, the official dispatches reached Suffren. His own words upon them are worth quoting, for they show the depressing convictions under which he had acted so noble a part, God be praised for the peace. For it was clear that in India, though we had the means to impose the law, all would have been lost. I await your orders with impatience, and heartily pray they may permit me to leave. War alone can make bearable the weariness of certain things. On the 6th of October, 1783, Suffren finally sailed from Trincomalee for France, stopping at the Isle of France and the Cape of Good Hope. The homeward voyage was a continued and spontaneous ovation. In each port visited the most flattering attentions were paid by men of every degree and of every nation. What especially gratified him was the homage of the English captains. It might well be so. None had so clearly established a right to his esteem as a warrior. On no occasion when Hughes and Suffren met, save the last, did the English number over twelve ships. But six English captains had laid down their lives, obstinately opposing his efforts. While he was at the Cape, a division of nine of Hughes's ships, returning from the war, anchored in the harbour. Their captains called eagerly upon the Admiral, the stout Commodore King of the Exeter, at their head. The good Dutchmen have received me as their saviour, wrote Suffren. But among the tributes which have most flattered me, none has given me more pleasure than the esteem and consideration testified by the English who are here. On reaching home, rewards were heaped upon him. Having left France as a captain, he came back a rear admiral, and immediately after his return the king created a fourth vice-admiralship, a special post to be filled by Suffren, and to lapse at his death. These honours were won by himself alone. They were the tribute paid to his unyielding energy and genius, shown not only in actual fight but in the steadfastness which held to his station through every discouragement, and rose equal to every demand made by recurring want and misfortune. Alike in the general conduct of his operations and on the battlefield under the fire of the enemy, this lofty resolve was the distinguishing merit of Suffren. And when there is coupled with it the clear and absolute conviction which he held of the necessity to seek and crush the enemy's fleet, we have probably the leading traits of his military character. The latter was the light that led him, the former the spirit that sustained him. As a tactician, in the sense of a driller of ships, imparting to them uniformity of action and manoeuvring, 
he seems to have been deficient, and would probably himself have admitted, with some contempt. The justice of the criticism made upon him in these respects. Whether or no he ever actually characterized tactics, meaning thereby elementary or evolutionary tactics, as the veil of timidity, there was that in his actions which makes the MOT probable. Such a contempt, however, is unsafe even in the case of genius. The faculty of moving together with uniformity and precision is too necessary to the development of the full power of a body of ships to be lightly esteemed. It is essential to that concentration of effort at which Suffren rightly aimed, but which he was not always careful to secure by previous dispositions. Paradoxical though it sounds, it is true that only fleets which are able to perform regular movements can afford at times to cast them aside. Only captains whom the habit of the drill ground has familiarized with the shifting phases it presents, can be expected to seize readily the opportunities for independent action presented by the field of battle. How and Jervis must make ready the way for the successes of Nelson. Suffren expected too much of his captains. He had the right to expect more than he got, but not that ready perception of the situation and that firmness of nerve which, except to a few favorites of nature, are the result only of practice and experience. Still, he was a very great man. When every deduction has been made, there must still remain his heroic constancy, his fearlessness of responsibility as of danger, the rapidity of his action. And the genius whose unerring intuition led him to break through the traditions of his service and assert for the navy that principal part which befits it. That offensive action which secures the control of the sea by the destruction of the enemy's fleet. Had he met in his lieutenants such ready instruments as Nelson found prepared for him, there can be little doubt that Hughes's squadron would have been destroyed while inferior to Suffren's, before reinforcements could have arrived. And with the English fleet it could scarcely have failed that the Coromandel coast also would have fallen. What effect this would have had upon the fate of the peninsula, or upon the terms of the peace, can only be surmised. His own hope was that, by acquiring the superiority in India, a glorious peace might result. No further opportunities of distinction in war were given to Suffren. The remaining years of his life were spent in honored positions ashore. In 1788, upon an appearance of trouble with England, he was appointed to the command of a great fleet arming at Brest, but before he could leave Paris he died suddenly on the 8th of December, in the 60th year of his age. There seems to have been no suspicion at the time of other than natural causes of death, he being exceedingly stout and of apoplectic temperament. But many years after a story, apparently well founded, became current that he was killed in a duel arising out of his official action in India. His old antagonist on the battlefield, Sir Edward Hughes, died at a great age in 1794. Footnotes This Commodore John Stone, more commonly known as Governor John Stone, was one of the three commissioners sent by Lord North in 1778 to promote a reconciliation with America. Owing to certain suspicious proceedings on his part, Congress declared it was incompatible with their honor to hold any manner of correspondence or intercourse with him. His title of governor arose from his being at one time governor of Pensacola. He had a most unenviable reputation in the English Navy. See Charnock's Biog, Novelis. This plate is taken almost wholly from Cunat's, by de Suffren. Page 299. La Serra, Essays History et Critiques sur la Marine Française. The question of attacking the English squadron at its anchors was debated in a council of war. Its opinion confirmed Suffren's decision not to do so. In contrasting this with the failure of the English to attack the French detachment in Newport, p. 394, it must be borne in mind that in the latter case there was no means of forcing the ships to leave their strong position, whereas by threatening Trincomalee, or other less important points, Suffren could rely upon drawing Hughes out. He was therefore right in not attacking, while the English before Newport were probably wrong. The dependence of Trincomalee upon the English fleet in this campaign affords an excellent illustration of the embarrassment and false position in which a navy finds itself when the defense of its seaports rests upon it. This bears upon a much debated point of the present day, and is worthy the study of those who maintain, too unqualifiedly, that the best coast defense is a navy. In one sense this is doubtless true, 
To attack the enemy abroad is the best of defenses, but in the narrow sense of the word, defense, it is not true. Trincomalee unfortified was simply a center round which Hughes had to revolve like a tethered animal, and the same will always happen under like conditions. Plate 14, Fig, D, shows the order of battle suffering intended in this action. The five rear ships of the enemy would each have two opponents close aboard. The leading French ship on the weather side was to be kept farther off, so that while attacking the sixth Englishman she could contain the van ships if they attempted to reinforce the rear by tacking. Troud, Butterley's navels. Between four and five hundred yards. The English and French flagships are denoted in the plan by their exceptional size. The Victory, Nelson's ship at Trafalgar, a 100 gun ship, lost 57 killed and 102 wounded. Hughes's ship, a 74, lost 59 killed and 96 wounded. Collingwood's ship, the Royal Sovereign, also of 100 guns, lost 47 killed and 94 wounded, the Monmouth, a 64, in Hughes's action lost 45 killed and 102 wounded. Troud, Butterley's Navals. Chevalier, Histoire de la Marine Française. This remark seems too self evident to need emphasis, yet it may be questioned whether naval men generally carry it in their stock of axioms. As always, that is turned their side to the enemy instead of approaching him. Chevalier. Annual Register. 1782. The British account differs materially as to the cause of the distance separating the two rears. In this action it did not fall to the Monmouth's lot to sustain a very considerable share, the enemy's rear being so far to leeward that the ships of the British rear could not, even whilst the wind was favourable. Close with them without considerably breaking the order of their own line, Memoir of Captain Alms, Naval Chronicle, Volume. 2. Such contradictions are common, and, except for a particular purpose, need not to be reconciled. Alm seems to have been not only a first-rate seaman, but an officer capable of resolute and independent action, his account is probably correct. Troud, Butterley's Navals. It was seen from Suffren's ship that the Severe's flag was down, but it was supposed that the ensign halyards had been shot away. The next day Hughes sent the captain of the Sultan to demand the delivery to him of the ship which had struck. The demand, of course, could not be complied with. The Sultan, Troud says, which had hoped to, to take possession of the Severe, was the victim of this action, she received during some time, without replying, the whole fire of the French ship. Annual Register, 1782. Cunat, Vida Suffren. The curves in, B, represent the movements of the ships after the shift of wind, which practically ended the battle. The ships themselves show the order in fighting. The enemy formed a semicircle around us and raked us ahead and astern, as the ship came up and fell off, with the helm to leeward. Journal de Bord du Bailey de Suffren. C. He added, it is frightful to have had four times in our power to destroy the English squadron, and that it still exists. There was not a single ship of Suffren's which had more than three-fourths of her regular complement of men. It must be added that soldiers and sepoys made up half of these reduced crews. Chevalier, page 463. You will have learned my promotion to Commodore and Rear Admiral. Now, I tell you in the sincerity of my heart and for your own ear alone, that what I have done since then is worth infinitely more than what I had done before. You know the capture and battle of Trincomalee. But the end of the campaign, and that which took place between the month of March and the end of June, is far above anything that has been done in the Navy since I entered it. The result has been very advantageous to the state, for the squadron was endangered and the army lost it. Private Letter of Suffren, September 13, 1783, quoted in the Journal de Bord du Bailey de Suffren. Chapter 13 Events in the West Indies after the surrender of Yorktown Encounters of de Grasse with Hood. Dot, the Sea Battle of the Saints. 1781-1782. The surrender of Cornwallis marked the end of the active war upon the American continent. The issue of the struggle was indeed assured upon the day when France devoted her sea power to the support of the colonists, 
but, as not uncommonly happens, the determining characteristics of a period were summed up in one striking event. From the beginning, the military question, owing to the physical characteristics of the country, a long seaboard with estuaries penetrating deep into the interior, and the consequent greater ease of movement by water than by land, had hinged upon the control of the sea and the use made of that control. Its misdirection by Sir William Howe in 1777, when he moved his army to the Chesapeake instead of supporting Burgoyne's advance, opened the way to the startling success at Saratoga. When amazed Europe saw 6,000 regular troops surrendering to a body of provincials. During the four years that followed, until the surrender of Yorktown, the scales rose and fell according as the one navy or the other appeared on the scene. Or as English commanders kept touch with the sea or pushed their operations far from its support. Finally, at the great crisis, all is found depending upon the question whether the French or the English fleet should first appear, and upon their relative force. The maritime struggle was at once transferred to the West Indies. The events which followed there were antecedent in time both to Suffren's battles and to the final relief of Gibraltar. But they stand so much by themselves as to call for separate treatment, and have such close relation to the conclusion of the war and the conditions of peace. As to form the dramatic finale of the one and the stepping stone of transition to the other. It is fitting indeed that a brilliant though indecisive naval victory should close the story of an essentially naval war. The capitulation of Yorktown was completed on the 19th of October, 1781, and on the 5th of November, de Grasse, resisting the suggestions of Lafayette and Washington that the fleet should aid in carrying the war farther south, sailed from the Chesapeake. He reached Martinique on the 26th, the day after the Marquis de Bull, commanding the French troops in the West Indies, had regained by a bold surprise the Dutch island of St. Eustatius. The two commanders now concerted a joint expedition against Barbados, which was frustrated by the violence of the trade winds. Foiled here, the French proceeded against the island of St. Christopher, or St. Kitts, Plate 18. On the 11th of January, 1782, the fleet, carrying 6,000 troops, anchored on the west coast off Basterra, the chief town. No opposition was met, the small garrison of 600 men retiring to a fortified post ten miles to the northwest, on Brimstone Hill, a solitary precipitous height overlooking the lee shore of the island. The French troops landed and pursued, but the position being found too strong for assault, siege operations were begun. The French fleet remained at anchor in Bass Terra Road. Meanwhile, news of the attack was carried to Sir Samuel Hood, who had followed de Grasse from the continent, and, in the continued absence of Rodney, was naval commander-in-chief on the station. He sailed from Barbados on the 14th, anchored at Antigua on the 21st, and there embarked all the troops that could be spared, about 700 men. On the afternoon of the 23d the fleet started for Ste. Kitts, carrying such sail as would bring it within striking distance of the enemy at daylight next morning. The English having but twenty-two ships to the French twenty-nine, and the latter being generally superior in force, class for class. It is necessary to mark closely the lay of the land in order to understand Hood's original plans and their subsequent modifications. For, resultless as his attempt proved, his conduct during the next three weeks forms the most brilliant military effort of the whole war. The islands of St. Kitts and Nevis, plates 18 and 19. Being separated only by a narrow channel, impracticable for ships of the line, are in effect one, and their common axis lying northwest and southeast, it is necessary for sailing ships, with the trade wind, to round the southern extremity of Nevis from which position the wind is fair to reach all anchorages on the lee side of the islands. Bass Terra is about twelve miles distant from the western point of Nevis, Fort Charles, and its roadstead lies east and west. The French fleet were anchored there in disorder, plate 18. A, three or four deep, not expecting attack, and the ships at the west end of the road could not reach those at the east without beating to windward, a tedious, and under fire a perilous process. A further most important point to note is that all the eastern ships were so placed that vessels approaching from the southward could reach them with the usual wind. Hood, therefore, 
we are told, intended to appear at early daylight, in order of and ready for battle, and fall upon the eastern ships, filing by them with his whole fleet, a, thus concentrating the fire of all upon a few of the enemy. Then turning away, so as to escape the guns of the others, he proposed, first wearing and then tacking, to keep his fleet circling in long procession, past that part of the enemy's ships chosen for attack. The plan was audacious, but undeniably sound in principle, some good could hardly fail to follow, and unless de Grasse showed more readiness than he had hitherto done, even decisive results might be hoped for. PL 18. The best laid plans, however, may fail, and Hood's was balked by the awkwardness of a lieutenant of the watch, who hove to, stopped, a frigate at night ahead of the fleet, and was consequently run down by a ship of the line. The latter also received such injury as delayed the movement, several hours being lost in repairing damages. The French were thus warned of the enemy's approach, and although not suspecting his intention to attack, de Grasse feared that Hood would pass down to leeward of him and disturb the siege of Brimstone Hill. An undertaking so rash for an inferior force that it is as difficult to conceive how he could have supposed it, as to account for his overlooking the weakness of his own position at anchor. At 1 p.m. of the 24th the English fleet was seen rounding the south end of Nevis, at 3 de Grasse got under way and stood to the southward. Toward sundown Hood also went about and stood south, as though retreating. But he was well to windward of his opponent, and maintained this advantage through the night. At daybreak both fleets were to leeward of Nevis, the English near the island, the French about nine miles distant, plate 19. Some time was spent in manoeuvring, with the object on Hood's part of getting the French admiral yet more to leeward. For, having failed in his first attempt, he had formed the yet bolder intention of seizing the anchorage his unskillful opponent had left, and establishing himself there in an impregnable manner. In this he succeeded, as will be shown. But to understand the justification for a movement confessedly hazardous, it must be pointed out that he thus would place himself between the besiegers of Brimstone Hill and their fleet. Or if the latter anchored near the hill, the English fleet would be between it and its base in Martinique, ready to intercept supplies or detachments approaching from the southward. In short, the position in which Hood hoped to establish himself was on the flank of the enemy's communications, a position the more advantageous because the island alone could not long support the large body of troops so suddenly thrown upon it. Moreover, both fleets were expecting reinforcements, Rodney was on his way and might arrive first, which he did, and in time to save St. Kitts, which he did not. It was also but four months since Yorktown, the affairs of England were going badly. Something must be done, something left to chance, and Hood knew himself and his officers. It may be added that he knew his opponent. At noon, when the hillsides of Nevis were covered with expectant and interested sightseers, the English fleet rapidly formed its line on the starboard tack and headed north for Bass Terra, Plate 19, A. A. The French, at the moment, were in column steering south, but went about at once and stood for the enemy in a bow and quarter line, A. A. At two the British had got far enough for Hood to make signal to anchor. At twenty minutes past two the van of the French came within gunshot of the English centre, B, 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 and shortly afterward the firing began, the assailants very properly directing their main effort upon the English rear ships, which, as happens with most long columns, had opened out, a tendency increased in this case by the slowness of the fourth ship from the rear, the Prudent. The French flagship, Ville de Paris, of 120 guns, bearing de Grasse's flag, pushed for the gap thus made, but was foiled by the Canada, 74, whose captain, Cornwallis, the brother of Lord Cornwallis, threw all his sails aback, and dropped down in front of the huge enemy to the support of the rear, an example nobly followed by the Resolution and the Bedford immediately ahead of him, a. The scene was now varied and animated in the extreme. The English van, which had escaped attack, was rapidly anchoring, b, in its appointed position. The commander-in-chief in the centre, proudly reliant upon the skill and conduct of his captains, made signal for the ships ahead to carry a press of sail, and gain their positions regardless of the danger to the threatened rear. The latter, closely pressed and outnumbered, stood on unswervingly, 
shortened sail, and came to anchor, one by one, in a line ahead, b, b, under the roar of the guns of their baffled enemies. The latter filed by, delivered their fire, and bore off again to the southward, leaving their former berths to their weaker but clever antagonists. PL 19. The anchorage thus brilliantly taken by Hood was not exactly the same as that held by de Grasse the day before, but as it covered and controlled it, his claim that he took up the place the other had left is substantially correct. The following night and morning were spent in changing and strengthening the order, which was finally established as follows, Plate 18, B, B. The van ship was anchored about four miles southeast from Bas Terra, so close to the shore that a ship could not pass inside her, nor, with the prevailing wind, even reach her, because of a point and shoal just outside, covering her position. From this point the line extended in a west-northwest direction to the twelfth or thirteenth ship, from a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half, where it turned gradually but rapidly to north, the last six ships being on a north and south line. Hood's flagship, the Barfla, of ninety guns, was at the apex of the salient angle thus formed. It would not have been impossible for the French fleet to take the anchorage they formerly held. But it and all others to leeward were forbidden by the considerations already stated, so long as Hood remained where he was. It became necessary therefore to dislodge him, but this was rendered exceedingly difficult by the careful tactical dispositions that have been described. His left flank was covered by the shore. Any attempt to enfilade his front by passing along the other flank was met by the broadsides of the six or eight ships drawn up and potents to the rear. The front commanded the approaches to Bas Terra. To attack him in the rear, from the northwest, was forbidden by the trade wind. To these difficulties was to be added that the attack must be made under sail against ships at anchor, to whom loss of spars would be of no immediate concern. And which, having springs out, could train their broadsides over a large area with great ease. Nevertheless, both sound policy and mortification impelled de Grasse to fight, which he did the next day, January 26. The method of attack, in single column of twenty-nine ships against a line so carefully arranged, was faulty in the extreme, but it may be doubted whether any commander of that day would have broken through the traditional fighting order. Hood had intended the same, but he hoped a surprise on an ill-ordered enemy, and at the original French anchorage it was possible to reach their eastern ships, with but slight exposure to concentrated fire. Not so now. The French formed to the southward and steered for the eastern flank of Hood's line. As their van ship drew up with the point already mentioned, the wind headed her, so that she could only reach the third in the English order, the first four ships of which, using their springs, concentrated their guns upon her. This vessel was supposed by the English to be the Pluton, and if so, her captain was Dalbert de Ryans, in Suffren's opinion the foremost officer of the French navy. The crash occasioned by their destructive broadsides, wrote an English officer who was present, was so tremendous that whole pieces of plank were seen flying from her offside ere she could escape the cool. Concentrated fire of her determined adversaries. As she proceeded along the British line, she received the first fire of every ship in passing. She was indeed in so shattered a state as to be compelled to bear away for St. Eustatius. And so ship after ship passed by, running the length of the line, plate 18, b, b, distributing their successive fires in gallant but dreary, ineffectual monotony over the whole extent. A second time that day de Grasse attacked in the same order, but neglecting the English van, directed his effort upon the rear and centre. This was equally fruitless, and seems to have been done with little spirit. From that time until the 14th of February, Hood maintained his position in sight of the French fleet, which remained cruising in the offing and to the southward. On the first a dispatch vessel arrived from Kempenfelt, informing him of the dispersal of the French reinforcements for the West Indies, which must have renewed his hopes that his bold attempt would be successful through Rodney's arrival. It was not, however, to be so. Brimstone Hill surrendered on the 12th, after a creditable defence. On the 13th de Grasse took his fleet, now amounting to 33 ships of the line, to Nevis, and anchored there. On the night of the 14th Hood summoned all his captains on board, had them set their watches by his, and at 11 p.m. 
one after another, without noise or signal, cut their cables and made sail to the northward, passing round that end of the island unnoticed, or at least unmolested, by the French. Both strategically and tactically Hood's conceptions and dispositions were excellent, and their execution was most honourable to the skill and steadiness of himself and his captains. Regarded as a single military operation, this was brilliant throughout, but when considered with reference to the general situation of England at the time, a much higher estimate must be formed of the Admiral's qualities. St. Kitts in itself might not be worth a great risk but it was of the first importance that energy and audacity should be carried into the conduct of England's naval war, that some great success should light upon her flag. Material success was not obtained. The chances, though fair enough, turned against Hood, but every man in that fleet must have felt the glow of daring achievement, the assured confidence which follows a great deed nobly done. Had this man been in chief command when greater issues were at stake, had he been first instead of second at the Chesapeake, Cornwallis might have been saved. The operation, seizing an anchorage left by the enemy, would have been nearly the same. And both situations may be instructively compared with Suffren's relief of Cudlor. The action of de Grasse, also, should be considered not only with reference to the particular occasion, but to the general condition of the war as well, and when thus weighed and further compared with other very similar opportunities neglected by this general officer, a fair estimate of his military capacity can be reached. This comparison, however, is better deferred to the now not very distant close of the campaign. The most useful comment to be made here is, that his action in failing to crush Hood at his anchors, with a force at least 50% greater was in strict accordance with the general French principle of subordinating the action of the fleet to so-called particular operations. For nothing is more instructive than to note how an unsound principle results in disastrous action. Hood's inferiority was such as to weaken, for offensive purposes, his commanding position. So long as de Grasse kept to windward, he maintained his communications with Martinique, and he was strong enough, too, to force communication when necessary with the troops before Brimstone Hill. It was probable, as the event showed, that the particular operation, the reduction of St. Kitts, would succeed despite the presence of the English fleet. And, the French navy has always preferred the glory of assuring a conquest to that, more brilliant perhaps but less real, of taking a few ships. So far de Grasse may be acquitted of any error beyond that of not rising above the traditions of his service. Some days, however, before the surrender of the island and the departure of the English fleet, he was joined by two ships of the line which brought him word of the dispersal of the expected convoy and reinforcements from Europe. He then knew that he himself could not be strengthened before Rodney's arrival, and that by that event the English would be superior to him. He had actually thirty-three ships of the line in hand, and a few miles off lay twenty-two English in a position where he knew they would await his attack, yet he let them escape. His own explanation implies clearly that he had no intention of attacking them at anchor. The day after the capitulation of Brimstone Hill was the moment to watch Hood closely. And to fight him as soon as he got under way from the conquered island. But our provisions were exhausted, we had only enough for thirty-six hours. Some supply ships had arrived at Nevis, and you will admit one must live before fighting. I went to Nevis, always to windward and in sight of the enemy, a league and a half from him, in order to take on board the necessary supplies as rapidly as possible. Hood decamped at night without signals, and the next morning I found only the sick whom he left behind. In other words, Hood having held his ground with consummate audacity and skill, when he had some chance of successful resistance, declined to await his adversary's attack under conditions overwhelmingly unfavorable. What shall be said of this talk about provisions? Did not the Comte de Grasse know a month before how long, to a day, the supplies on board would last? Did he not know, for days before Hood sailed, that he had with him every ship he could probably count on for the approaching campaign, while the English would surely be reinforced? And if the English position was as strong as good judgment, professional skill, and bold hearts could make it, had it not weak points? Were not the Lee ships to leeward? If they did attempt to beat to windward, had he not ships to contain them? If the van ship could not be reached, 
had he not force enough to double and treble on the third and following ships, as far down the line as he chose? A letter of sufferance, referring to a similar condition of things at Santa Lucia, but written three years before these events, seems almost a prophetic description of them. Notwithstanding the slight results of the two cannonades of December 15, we can yet expect success. But the only way to attain it is to attack vigorously the squadron, which in consequence of our superiority cannot hold out, despite their land works, which will become of no effect if we lay them on board, or anchor upon their buoys. If we delay, a thousand circumstances may save them. They may profit by the night to depart. There can be no doubt that the English would have sold their defeat dearly. But results in war must be paid for, and the best are in the long run the cheapest. A tight grip of a few simple principles, that the enemy's fleet was the controlling factor in the coming campaign, that it was therefore his true objective. That one fraction of it must be crushed without delay when caught thus separated, would have saved de Grasse a great blunder. But it is only fair to note that it would have made him an exception to the practice of the French navy. The hour was now close at hand when the French admiral should feel, even if he did not admit, the consequences of this mistake, by which he had won a paltry island and lost an English fleet. Rodney had sailed from Europe on the 15th of January, with twelve ships of the line. On the 19th of February he anchored at Barbados, and the same day Hood reached Antigua from St. Kitts. On the 25th the squadrons of Rodney and Hood met to windward of Antigua, forming a united fleet of 34 ships of the line. The next day de Grasse anchored in Fort Royal, thus escaping the pursuit which Rodney at once began. The English admiral then returned to Sta Lucia, where he was joined by three more ships of the line from England, raising his force to 37. Knowing that a large convoy was expected from France, before the arrival of which nothing could be attempted, Rodney sent a part of his fleet to cruise to windward and as far north as Guadeloupe. But the officer in charge of the French convoy, suspecting this action, kept well north of that island, and reached Fort Royal, Martinique, on the 20th of March. The ships of war with him raised de Grasse's fleet to 33 effective sail of the line and two 50-gun ships. The object of the united efforts of France and Spain this year was the conquest of Jamaica. It was expected to unite at Cap Francais, now Cap Haitian, in Haiti, 50 ships of the line and 20,000 troops. Part of the latter were already at the rendezvous. And de Grasse, appointed to command the combined fleets, was to collect in Martinique all the available troops and supplies in the French islands, and convoy them to the rendezvous. It was this junction that Rodney was charged to prevent. The region within which occurred the important operations of the next few days covers a distance of 150 miles, from south to north, including the islands of Sta Lucia, Martinique, Dominica, and Guadeloupe, in the order named. See Plate 11. Page 378. At this time the first was in English, the others in French, hands. The final, and for the moment decisive, encounter took place between, and a little to westward of, Dominica and Guadeloupe. These are twenty-three miles apart, but the channel is narrowed to thirteen by three islets called the Saints, lying ten miles south of Guadeloupe. It is said to have been de Grasse's intention, instead of sailing direct for Cap Francais, to take a circuitous course near the islands, which, being friendly or neutral, would give refuge to the convoy if pressed. The close pursuit of the English, who came up with him off Dominica, led him to forsake this plan, sending the convoy into Basse Terra at the south end of Guadeloupe. While with the fleet he tried to beat through the channel and pass east of the island, thus drawing the English away from the transports and ridding himself of the tactical embarrassment due to the latter's presence. Accidents to various ships thwarted this attempt, and brought about a battle disastrous to him and fatal to the joint enterprise. The anchorages of the two fleets, in Martinique and Sta Lucia, were thirty miles apart. The prevailing east wind is generally fair to pass from one to the other, but a strong westerly current, and the frequency of calms and light airs, tend to throw to leeward sailing ships leaving Sta Lucia for the northern island. A chain of frigates connected the English lookout ships off Martinique, by signal, with Rodney's flagship in Gros Islet Bay. 
Everything was astir at the two stations, the French busy with the multitudinous arrangements necessitated by a great military undertaking, the English with less to do. Yet maintaining themselves in a state of expectancy and preparation for instant action, that entails constant alertness and mental activity. On the 5th of April Rodney was informed that the soldiers were being embarked, and on the 8th, soon after daylight, the lookout frigates were seen making signal that the enemy was leaving port. The English fleet at once began to get under way, and by noon was clear of the harbour to the number of 36 of the line. At half past 2 p.m. The advanced frigates were in sight of the French fleet, which was seen from the mastheads of the main body just before sundown. The English stood to the northward all night, and at daybreak of the ninth were abreast Dominica, but for the most part becalmed. Inshore of them, to the northward and eastward, were seen the French fleet in convoy, the men of war numbering thirty-three of the line, besides smaller vessels, the convoy a hundred and fifty sail, under special charge of the two fifty-gun ships. The irregular and uncertain winds, common to the night and early hours of the day near the land, had scattered these unwieldy numbers. Fifteen sail of the line were in the channel between Dominica and the Saints, with a fresh trade wind, apparently beating to windward, the remainder of the ships of war and most of the convoy were still becalmed close under Dominica, plate XX. Position I, B. Gradually, however, one by one, the French ships were catching light airs off the land. And by favour of these, which did not reach so far as the English in the offing, drew out from the island and entered the more steady breeze of the channel, reinforcing the group which was thus possessed of that prime element of naval power. Mobility. At the same time light airs from the southeast crept out to the English van under hood, fanning it gently north from the main body of the fleet toward two isolated French ships, which, having fallen to leeward during the night, had shared the calms that left the English motionless, with their heads all round the compass. They had come nearly within gunshot, when a light puff from the northwest enabled the Frenchmen to draw away and approach their own ships in the channel. The farther the English van advanced, the fresher grew their wind, until they fairly opened the channel of the Saints and felt the trade wind. De Grasse signaled to the convoy to put into Guadeloupe, which order was so well carried out that they were all out of sight to the northward by two in the afternoon, and will appear no more in the sequel. The two French ships, already spoken of as fallen to leeward, not being yet out of danger from the English van, which had now a commanding breeze, and the latter being much separated from their rear and centre. De Grasse ordered his van to bear down and engage. This was obeyed by the ship signalled and by three others, in all by fourteen or fifteen, the action beginning at half past nine a.m., and lasting with intermissions until quarter past one p.m. Hood was soon forced to heave to, in order not to increase too much his separation from the main fleet, the French kept under way, approaching from the rear and passing in succession at half cannon shot to windward, plate XX, position I. As each ship drew ahead of the English division, she tacked, standing back to the southward until in position to resume her place in the order of attack, thus describing a continuous irregular curve of elliptical form. To windward of their opponents. The brunt of the attack fell upon eight or nine of the English, this number being successively increased as one ship after another, as the baffling airs served, drew out from the calm space under Dominica, but the French received similar accessions. While this engagement was going on, part of the English centre, eight ships with Rodney's flag among them, position I. A, by carefully watching the puffs and catspaws, had worked in with the land and caught the sea breeze, which was felt there sooner than in the offing. As soon as they had it, about eleven a.m. They stood to the north, being now on the weather quarter both of the English van and its assailants, position two, A. The latter, seeing this, tacked, and abandoning the contest for the moment, steered south to join their centre, lest Rodney's eight ships should get between them. At half past eleven the French again formed line on the starboard tack, most of their ships being now clear of the land, while the English rear was still becalmed. The greater numbers of the French enabled them to extend from north to south along the length of the English line, whereas the latter was still broken by a great gap between the van and centre, position two. The attack upon Hood was therefore hotly renewed, but the French centre and rear, B, 
having the wind, kept their distance, and held Rodney's division at long range. At quarter past one the French, finding that the whole British line was coming up with the wind, ceased firing, and at two Rodney hauled down the signal for battle, the enemy having withdrawn. PLXX. This action of the 9th of April amounted actually to no more than an artillery duel. One French ship, the Caton, a 64, d, received injuries which sent her into Guadeloupe. Two English were disabled, but repaired their injuries without leaving the fleet. The material advantage, therefore, lay with the latter. Opinions differ as to the generalship of the Comte de Grasse on this day, but they divide on the same basis of principle as to whether ulterior operations, or the chances of beating the enemy's fleet, are to determine an admiral's action. The facts of the case are these, 16 of the English fleet, all the rear and 4 of the center, position 2, C, were not able at any time to fire a shot. Apparently every French ship, first and last, might have been brought into action. At the beginning, 8 or 9 English were opposed to 15 French. At the end there were 20 English to 33 French, and these general proportions doubtless obtained throughout the four hours. De Grasse therefore found himself in the presence of a fleet superior to his own, in numbers at least, and by the favor of Providence that fleet so divided that nearly half of it was powerless to act. He had the wind, he had a fine body of captains. What was to prevent him from attacking Hood's nine ships with fifteen, putting one on each side of the six in the rear? Had those nine been thoroughly beaten, Rodney's further movements must have been hopelessly crippled. The French lost only five in their defeat three days later. The subsequent court-martial, however, laid down the French doctrine thus, the decision to persist in engaging with only a part of our fleet may be considered as an act of prudence on the part of the admiral, which might be dictated by the ulterior projects of the campaign. On this a French professional writer naturally remarks, that if an attack were made at all, it would be more prudent to make it in force. Less injury would fall on individual ships, while in the end the whole fleet would inevitably be drawn in to support any which, by losing spars, could not return to windward. Three times in one year had fortune thrown before de Grasse the opportunity of attacking English fleets with decisive odds on his side. Her favors were now exhausted. Three days more were to show how decidedly the ulterior projects of a campaign may be affected by a battle and the loss of a few ships. From the 9th to the morning of the 12th the French fleet continued beating to windward between Dominica and the Saints, in no regular order. On the night of the 9th the English hoped to to repair damages. The next day the chase to windward was resumed, but the French gained very decidedly upon their pursuers. On the night of the 10th two ships, the Jason and Zeal, collided. The Zeal was the bane of the French fleet during these days. She was one of those that were nearly caught by the enemy on the 9th, and was also the cause of the final disaster. The injuries to the Jason forced her to put into Guadeloupe. On the 11th the main body was to windward of the Saints, but the Zeal and another had fallen so far to leeward that de Grasse bore down to cover them thus losing much of the ground gained. On the night following, the Azeel was again in collision, this time with de Grasse's flagship, the latter lost some sails, but the other, which had not the right of way and was wholly at fault, carried away both foremast and bowsprit. The admiral sent word to the frigate Bestri to take the Azeel in tow. And here flits across the page of our story a celebrated and tragical figure, for the captain of the Pestri was the ill-fated explorer Lapiraus, the mystery of whose disappearance with two ships and their entire crews remained so long unsolved. Two hours were consumed in getting the ship underway in tow of the frigate, not very smart work under the conditions of weather and urgency, but by 5 a.m. The two were standing away for Bas Terra, where the Caton and Jason, as well as the convoy, had already arrived. The French fleet had thus lost three from its line of battle since leaving Martinique. The disabled ship had not long been headed for Bas Terra, when the faint streaks of dawn announced the approach of the 12th of April, a day doubly celebrated in naval annals. The sun had not quite set upon the exhausted squadrons of Suffren and Hughes, anchoring after their fiercest battle off Ceylon, 
when his early rays shone upon the opening strife between Rodney and de Grasse. The latter was at the time the greatest naval battle in its results that had been fought in a century, its influence on the course of events was very great, though far from as decisive as it might have been. It was attended with circumstances of unusual though somewhat factitious brilliancy, and particularly was marked by a maneuver that was then looked upon as exceptionally daring and decisive, breaking the line. It must be added that it has given rise to a storm of controversy. And the mass of details, as given by witnesses who should be reliable, are so confused and contradictory, owing mainly to the uncertainties of the wind, that it is impossible now to do more than attempt to reconcile them in a full account. Nevertheless, the leading features can be presented with sufficient accuracy, and this will first be done briefly and barely. The outline thus presented can afterward be clothed with the details which give color, life, and interest to the great scene. At daylight, about half past five, the English fleet, which had gone about at 2 a.m., was standing on the starboard tack, with the wind at southeast, an unusual amount of southing for that hour, plate XXI, A. It was then about fifteen miles from the Saints, which bore north-northeast, and ten from the French fleet, which bore northeast. The latter, owing to the events of the night, was greatly scattered, as much as eight or ten miles separating the weather, or easternmost, ships from the Lee, the flagship, Ville de Paris, being among the latter. Anxiety for the zeal, kept the French admiral, with the ships in his company, under short canvas, standing to the southward on the port tack, a. The English on the starboard tack, with the wind as they had it, headed east-northeast, and thus, as soon as there was light to see, found the French, broad on the lee bow, and one of them. De Grasse's ships, the zeal, towed by a frigate, square under our lee, a, with his bowsprit and foremast prostrate across his forecastle. To draw the French farther to leeward, Rodney detached four ships, b, to chase the zeal. As soon as de Grasse saw this he signalled his fleet to keep away, c, as Rodney wished, and at the same time to form the line of battle, thus calling down to him the ships to windward. The English line was also formed rapidly, and the chasing ships recalled at 7 a.m. de Grasse, seeing that if he stood on he would lose the weather gauge altogether, hauled up again on the port tack, c. And the breeze changing to east-southeast and east in his favor and knocking the English off, the race of the two fleets on opposite tacks, for the advantage of the wind, became nearly equal. The French, however, won, thanks to a superiority in sailing which had enabled them to draw so far to windward of the English on the previous days, and, but for the awkwardness of the zeal, might have cleared them altogether, plate XXI, B. Their leading ships first reached and passed the point where the rapidly converging tracks intersected, while the English leader, the Marlborough, struck the French line between the sixth and tenth ships, variously stated. The battle, of course, had by this time begun, the ninth ship in the French line, the Brave, opening fire at twenty minutes before eight a.m. upon the Marlborough. As there was no previous intention of breaking the line, the English leader kept away, in obedience to a signal from Rodney, and ran close along under the enemy's lee, followed in succession by all the ships as they reached her wake. The battle thus assumed the common and indecisive phase of two fleets passing on opposite tacks, the wind very light, however, and so allowing a more heavy engagement than common under these circumstances. The ships sliding by, at the rate of three to four knots. Since the hostile lines diverged again south of their point of meeting, de Grasse made signal to keep away four points to south-southwest, thus bringing his van, B, A, to action with the English rear. And not permitting the latter to reach his rear unscathed. There were, however, two dangers threatening the French if they continued their course. Its direction, south or south-southwest, carried them into the calms that hung round the north end of Dominica. And the uncertainty of the wind made it possible that by its hauling to the southward the enemy could pass through their line and gain the wind, and with it the possibility of forcing the decisive battle which the French policy had shunned. And this was in fact what happened. De Grasse therefore made signal at half-past eight to wear together and take the same tack as the English. This, however, was impossible the two fleets were too close together to admit the evolution. 
He then signaled to haul close to the wind and were in succession, which also failed to be done, and at five minutes past nine the dreaded contingency arose. The wind hauled to the southward, knocking off all the French ships that had not yet kept away, that is, all who had English ships close under their lee, plate XXI. C. Rodney, in the formidable, was at this time just drawing up with the fourth ship astern of de Grasse's flag. Luffing to the new wind, he passed through the French line, followed by the five ships next astern of him, C, A, while nearly at the same moment, and from the same causes, his sixth astern, C, B, led through the interval abreast him. Followed by the whole English rear. The French line of battle was thus broken in two places by columns of enemy's ships in such close order as to force its vessels aside, even if the wind had not conspired to embarrass their action. Every principle upon which a line of battle was constituted, for mutual support and for the clear field of fire of each ship, was thus overthrown for the French, and preserved for the English divisions which filed through. And the French were forced off to leeward by the interposition of the enemy's columns, besides being broken up. Compelled thus to forsake the line upon which they had been ranged, it was necessary to reform upon another, and unite the three groups into which they were divided, a difficult piece of tactics under any circumstances. But doubly so under the moral impression of disaster, and in presence of a superior enemy, who, though himself disordered, was in better shape, and already felt the glow of victory. PLXXI. It does not appear that any substantial attempt to reform was made by the French. To reunite, yes, but only as a flying, disordered mass. The various shifts of wind and movements of the divisions left their fleet, at midday, plate XXI. D, with the center, C, two miles northwest of and to leeward of the van, V, the rear, R, yet farther from the center and to leeward of it. Calms and short puffs of wind prevailed now through both fleets. At half past one p.m. A light breeze from the east sprang up, and de Grasse made signal to form the line again on the port tack, between three and four, not having succeeded in this, he made signal to form on the starboard tack. The two signals and the general tenor of the accounts show that at no time were the French reformed after their line was broken. And all the maneuvers tended toward, even if they did not necessitate, taking the whole fleet as far down as the most leewardly of its parts, d. In such a movement, it followed of course that the most crippled ships were left behind, and these were picked up, one by one, by the English, who pursued without any regular order, for which there was no need. As mutual support was assured without it. Shortly after 6 p.m. de Grasse's flagship, the Ville de Paris, struck her colors to the Barfla, carrying the flag of Sir Samuel Hood. The French account state that nine of the enemy's ships then surrounded her, and there is no doubt that she had been fought to the bitter end. Her name, commemorating the great city whose gift she had been to the king, her unusual size, and the fact that no French naval commander-in-chief had before been taken prisoner in battle, conspired to bestow a peculiar brilliancy upon Rodney's victory. Four other ships of the line were taken, and, singularly enough, upon these particular ships was found the whole train of artillery intended for the reduction of Jamaica. Such were the leading features of the Battle of the Saints, or, as it is sometimes styled, of the 12th of April, known to the French as the Battle of Dominica. Certain points which have so far been omitted for the sake of clearness, but which affect the issue, must now be given. When the day opened, the French fleet was greatly scattered and without order. De Grasse, under the influence of his fears for the Vizille, so precipitated his movements that his line was not properly formed at the moment of engaging. The van ships had not yet come into position, B, A, and the remainder were so far from having reached their places that de Vaudrill, commanding the rear division and last engaged, states that the line was formed under the fire of musketry. The English, on the contrary, were in good order, the only change made being to shorten the interval between ships from two to one cable's length, seven hundred feet. The celebrated stroke of breaking through the French line was due, not to previous intention, but to a shift of wind throwing their ships out of order and so increasing the spaces between them. 
while the gap through which Rodney's group penetrated was widened by the diadem on its north side being taken aback and paying round on the other tack, c. c. Sir Charles Douglas says the immediate effect, where the flagship broke through, was, the bringing together, almost if not quite in contact with each other, the four ships of the enemy which were nearest, on the north. To the point alluded to, c., and coming up in succession. This unfortunate group, composing now only one large single object at which to fire, was attacked by the Duke, Namur, and formidable, ninety-gun ships, all at once, receiving several broadsides from each, not a single shot missing. And great must have been the slaughter. The Duke, C. D., being next ahead of the flagship, had followed her leader under the French Lee. But as soon as her captain saw that the formidable had traversed the enemy's order, he did the same, passing north of this confused group and so bringing it under a fire from both sides. The log of the Thmagnanim, one of the group, mentions passing under the fire of two three-deckers, one on either side. As soon as the order was thus broken, Rodney hauled down the signal for the line, keeping flying that for close action, and at the same time ordered his van, which had now passed beyond and north of the enemy's rear, to go about and rejoin the English center. This was greatly delayed through the injuries to spars and sails received in passing under the enemy's fire. His own flagship and the ships with her went about. The rear, under Hood, instead of keeping north again to join the center, stood to windward for a time, and were then becalmed at a considerable distance from the rest of the fleet. Much discussion took place at a later day as to the wisdom of Rodney's action in breaking through his enemy's order, and to whom the credit, if any, should be ascribed. The latter point is of little concern. But it may be said that the son of Sir Charles Douglas, Rodney's chief of staff, brought forward an amount of positive evidence, the only kind that could be accepted to diminish the credit of the person wholly responsible for the results. Which proves that the suggestion came from Douglas, and Rodney's consent was with difficulty obtained. The value of the maneuver itself is of more consequence than any question of personal reputation. It has been argued by some that, so far from being a meritorious act, it was unfortunate, and for Rodney's credit should rather be attributed to the force of circumstances than to choice. It had been better, these say, to have continued along under the lee of the French rear, thus inflicting upon it the fire of the whole English line, and that the latter should have tacked and doubled on the French rear. This argument conveniently forgets that tacking, or turning round in any way, after a brush of this kind, was possible to only a part of the ships engaged. And that these would have much difficulty in overtaking the enemies who had passed on, unless the latter were very seriously crippled. Therefore this suggested attack, the precise reproduction of the Battle of Ushant, really reduces itself to the fleets passing on opposite tacks. Each distributing its fire over the whole of the enemy's line without attempting any concentration on a part of it. It may, and must, be conceded at once, that Rodney's change of course permitted the eleven rear ships of the French, D, R, to run off to leeward, having received the fire of only part of their enemy. While the English van had undergone that of nearly the whole French fleet. These ships, however, were thus thrown entirely out of action for a measurable and important time by being driven to leeward, and would have been still more out of position to help any of their fleet. Had not de Grasse himself been sent to leeward by Hood's division cutting the line three ships ahead of him. The thirteen leading French ships, obeying the last signal they had seen, were hugging the wind, the group of six with de Grasse, C, E, would have done the same had they not been headed off by Hood's division. The result of Rodney's own action alone, therefore, would have been to divide the French fleet into two parts, separated by a space of six miles, and one of them hopelessly to leeward. The English, having gained the wind, would have been in position easily to contain the eleven lee ships and to surround the nineteen weather ones in overwhelming force. The actual condition, owing to the two breaches in the line, was slightly different, the group of six with de Grasse being placed between his weather and lee divisions, two miles from the former, for from the latter, d. It seems scarcely necessary to insist upon the tactical advantages of such a situation for the English, even disregarding the moral effect of the confusion through which the French had passed. 
In addition to this, a very striking lesson is deducible from the immediate effects of the English guns in passing through. Of the five ships taken, three were those under whose sterns the English divisions pierced. Instead of giving and taking, as the parallel lines ran by, on equal terms, each ship having the support of those ahead and astern. The French ships near which the penetrating columns passed received each the successive fire of all the enemy's division. Thus Hood's thirteen ships filed by the two rear ones of the French van, the César, and Hector, fairly crushing them under this concentration of fire, while in like manner, and with like results, Rodney's six passed by the Glorieu. This, concentration by defiling, past the extremity of a column corresponds quite accurately to the concentration upon the flank of a line, and has a special interest. Because if successfully carried out it would be as powerful an attack now as it ever has been. If quick to seize their advantage, the English might have fired upon the ships on both sides of the gaps through which they passed, as the formidable actually did. But they were using the starboard broadsides, and many doubtless did not realize their opportunity until too late. The natural results of Rodney's act, therefore, were, 1, the gain of the wind, with the power of offensive action. 2, concentration of fire upon a part of the enemy's order, and, 3, the introduction into the ladder of confusion and division, which might, and did, become very great, offering the opportunity of further tactical advantage. It is not a valid reply to say that, had the French been more apt, they could have united sooner. A maneuver that presents a good chance of advantage does not lose its merit because it can be met by a prompt movement of the enemy, any more than a particular lunge of the sword becomes worthless because it has its appropriate parry. The chances were that by heading off the rear ships, while the van stood on, the French fleet would be badly divided. And the move was none the less sagacious because the two fragments could have united sooner than they did, had they been well handled. With the alternative action suggested, of tacking after passing the enemy's rear, the pursuit became a stern chase, in which both parties having been equally engaged would presumably be equally crippled. Signals of disability, in fact, were numerous in both fleets. Independently of the tactical handling of the two fleets, there were certain differences of equipment which conferred tactical advantage, and are therefore worth noting. The French appear to have had finer ships, and, class for class, heavier armaments. Sir Charles Douglas, an eminent officer of active and ingenious turn of mind, who paid particular attention to gunnery details, estimated that in weight of battery the 33 French were superior to the 36 English by the force of 484 gunships. And that after the loss of the Gazeal, Jason, and Caton, there still remained an advantage equal to 274s. The French Admiral La Graviere admits the generally heavier caliber of French cannon at this era. The better construction of the French ships and their greater draft caused them to sail and beat better, and accounts in part for the success of de Grasse in gaining to windward. For in the afternoon of the 11th only three or four of the body of his fleet were visible from the masthead of the English flagship, which had been within gunshot of them on the 9th. It was the awkwardness of the unlucky zeal, and of the Tamagnanime, which drew down de Grasse from his position of vantage, and justified Rodney's perseverance in relying upon the chapter of accidents to effect his purpose. The greater speed of the French as a body is somewhat hard to account for, because, though undoubtedly with far better lines, the practice of coppering the bottom had not become so general in France as in England. And among the French there were several uncoppered and worm-eaten ships. The better sailing of the French was, however, remarked by the English officers, though the great gain mentioned must have been in part owing to Rodney's lying by, after the action of the ninth, to refit. Due probably to the greater injury received by the small body of his vessels, which had been warmly engaged, with greatly superior numbers. It was stated, in narrating that action, that the French kept at half cannon range. This was to neutralize a tactical advantage the English had in the large number of carronades and other guns of light weight but large caliber, which in close action told heavily, but were useless at greater distances. The second in command, de Vaudrille, to whom was entrusted the conduct of that attack, expressly states that if he had come within reach of the carronades his ships would have been quickly unrigged. 
Whatever judgment is passed upon the military policy of refusing to crush an enemy situated as the English division was, there can be no question that, if the object was to prevent pursuit. The tactics of de Vaudreuil on the 9th was in all respects excellent. He inflicted the utmost injury with the least exposure of his own force. On the 12th, de Grasse, by allowing himself to be lured within reach of carronades, yielded this advantage, besides sacrificing to an impulse his whole previous strategic policy. Rapidly handled from their lightness, firing grape and shot of large diameter, these guns were peculiarly harmful in close action and useless at long range. In a later dispatch de Vaudrill says, the effect of these new arms is most deadly within musket range, it is they which so badly crippled us on the 12th of April. There were other gunnery innovations, in some at least of the English ships, which by increasing the accuracy, the rapidity, and the field of fire, greatly augmented the power of their batteries. These were the introduction of locks, by which the man who aimed also fired. And the fitting to the gun carriages of breastpieces and sweeps, so that the guns could be pointed farther ahead or astern, that is, over a larger field than had been usual. In fights between single ships, not controlled in their movements by their relations to a fleet, this improvement would at times allow the possessor to take a position whence he could train upon his enemy without the latter being able to reply. And some striking instances of such tactical advantage are given. In a fleet fight, such as is now being considered, the gain was that the guns could be brought to bear farther forward, and could follow the opponent longer as he passed astern, thus doubling, or more, the number of shots he might receive. And lessening for him the interval of immunity enjoyed between two successive antagonists. These matters of antiquated and now obsolete detail carry with them lessons that are never obsolete, they differ in no respect from the more modern experiences with the needle gun and the torpedo. And indeed this whole action of April 12, 1782, is fraught with sound military teaching. Perseverance in pursuit, gaining advantage of position, concentration of one's own effort, dispersal of the enemy's force, the efficient tactical bearing of small but important improvements in the material of war, have been dwelt on. To insist further upon the necessity of not letting slip a chance to beat the enemy in detail, would be thrown away on any one not already convinced by the bearing of April 9th on April 12th. The abandonment of the attack upon Jamaica, after the defeat of the French fleet, shows conclusively that the true way to secure ulterior objects is to defeat the force which threatens them. There remains at least one criticism, delicate in its character, but essential to draw out the full teachings of these events, that is, upon the manner in which the victory was followed up, and the consequent effects upon the war in general. The liability of sailing ships to injury in spars and sails, in other words, in that mobility which is the prime characteristic of naval strength, makes it difficult to say, after a lapse of time, what might or might not have been done. It is not only a question of actual damage received, which log books may record, but also of the means for repair, the energy and aptitude of the officers and seamen, which differ from ship to ship. As to the ability of the English fleet, however, to follow up its advantages by a more vigorous pursuit on the 12th of April, we have the authority of two most distinguished officers, Sir Samuel Hood, the second in command, and Sir Charles Douglas. The captain of the fleet, or chief of staff to the admiral. The former expressed the opinion that twenty ships might have been taken, and said so to Rodney the next day. While the chief of staff was so much mortified by the failure, and by the manner in which the admiral received his suggestions, as seriously to contemplate resigning his position. Advice and criticism are easy, nor can the full weight of a responsibility be felt, except by the man on whom it is laid, but great results cannot often be reached in war without risk and effort. The accuracy of the judgment of these two officers, however, is confirmed by inference from the French reports. Rodney justifies his failure to pursue by alleging the crippled condition of many ships, and other matters incident to the conclusion of a hard-fought battle, and then goes on to suggest what might have been done that night, had he pursued. By the French fleet, which went off in a body of twenty-six ships of the line. These possibilities are rather creditable to his imagination, considering what the French fleet had done by day. But as regards the body of twenty-six ships, de Vaudrill, who, after de Grasse's surrender, 
made the signal for the ships to rally round his flag, found only ten with him next morning, and was not joined by any more before the fourteenth. During the following days five more joined him at intervals. With these he went to the rendezvous at Cap Francais, where he found others, bringing the whole number who repaired thither to twenty. The five remaining, of those that had been in the action, fled to Curacao, six hundred miles distant, and did not rejoin until May. The body of twenty-six ships, therefore, had no existence in fact. On the contrary, the French fleet was very badly broken up, and several of its ships isolated. As regards the crippled condition, there seems no reason to think the English had suffered more, but rather less, than their enemy. And a curious statement, bearing upon this, appears in a letter from Sir Gilbert Blaine. It was with difficulty we could make the French officers believe that the returns of killed and wounded, made by our ships to the Admiral, were true. And one of them flatly contradicted me, saying we always gave the world a false account of our loss. I then walked with him over the decks of the formidable, and bid him remark what number of shot holes there were, and also how little her rigging had suffered. And asked if that degree of damage was likely to be connected with the loss of more than fourteen men, which was our number killed, and the greatest of any in the fleet, except the Royal Oak and Monarch. He owned our fire must have been much better kept up and directed than theirs. There can remain little doubt, therefore, that the advantage was not followed up with all possible vigor. Not till five days after the battle was Hood's division sent toward San Domingo, where they picked up in the Mona Passage the Jason and the Cotone, which had separated before the battle and were on their way to Cap Francais. These, and two small vessels with them, were the sole afterfruits of the victory. Under the conditions of England's war this cautious failure is a serious blot on Rodney's military reputation, and goes far to fix his place among successful admirals. He had saved Jamaica for the time. But he had not, having the opportunity, crushed the French fleet. He too, like de Grasse, had allowed the immediate objective to blind him to the general military situation, and to the factor which controlled it. To appreciate the consequences of this neglect, and the real indecisiveness of this celebrated battle, we must go forward a year and listen to the debates in Parliament on the conditions of peace, in February, 1783. The approval or censure of the terms negotiated by the existing ministry involved the discussion of many considerations. But the gist of the dispute was, whether the conditions were such as the comparative financial and military situations of the belligerents justified. Or whether it would have been better for England to continue the war rather than submit to the sacrifices she had made. As regards the financial condition, despite the gloomy picture drawn by the advocates of the peace, there was probably no more doubt then than there is now about the comparative resources of the different countries. The question of military strength was really that of naval power. The ministry argued that the whole British force hardly numbered 100 sail of the line, while the navies of France and Spain amounted to 140, not to speak of that of Holland. With so glaring an inferiority, what hopes of success could we derive either from the experience of the last campaign, or from any new distribution of our force in that which would have followed? In the West Indies we could not have had more than 46 sail to oppose to 40, which on the day that peace was signed lay in Cadiz Bay, with 16,000 troops on board, ready to sail for that quarter of the world where they would have been joined by twelve of the line from Havana and ten from San Domingo. Might we not too reasonably apprehend that the campaign in the West Indies would have closed with the loss of Jamaica itself, the avowed object of this immense armament? These are certainly the reasonings of an avowed partisan, for which large allowances must be made. The accuracy of the statement of comparative numbers was denied by Lord Keppel, a member of the same party, and but lately at the head of the Admiralty, a post which he had resigned because he disapproved the treaty. English statesmen, too, as well as English seamen, must by this time have learned to discount largely the apparent, when estimating the real, power of the other navies. Nevertheless, how different would have been the appreciation of the situation, both moral and material, had Rodney reaped the full fruits of the victory which he owed rather to chance than to his own merit, great as that undeniably was. A letter published in 1809, anonymous, but bearing strong internal evidence of being written by Sir Gilbert Blaine, 
the physician of the fleet and long on intimate terms with Rodney, who was a constant sufferer during his last cruise. States that the Admiral thought little of his victory on the 12th of April, 1782. He would have preferred to rest his reputation upon his combinations against de Guichen, April 17, 1780, and looked upon that opportunity of beating, with an inferior fleet, such an officer, whom he considered the best in the French service. As one by which, but for the disobedience of his captains, he might have gained immortal renown. Few students will be inclined to question this estimate of Rodney's merit on the two occasions. Fortune, however, decreed that his glory should depend upon a battle, brilliant in itself, to which his own qualities least contributed, and denied him success when he most deserved it. The chief action of his life in which merit and success met, the destruction of Langara's fleet off Cape St. Vincent, has almost passed into oblivion. Yet it called for the highest qualities of a seaman, and is not unworthy of comparison with Hawke's pursuit of Conflans. Within the two years and a half which had elapsed since Rodney was appointed to his command he had gained several important successes, and, as was remarked, had taken a French, a Spanish, and a Dutch admiral. In that time he had added twelve line of battle ships, all taken from the enemy, to the British navy, and destroyed five more. And to render the whole still more singularly remarkable, the Ville de Paris was said to be the only first-rate man-of-war that ever was taken and carried into port by any commander of any nation. Notwithstanding his services, the party spirit that was then so strong in England, penetrating even the army and navy, obtained his recall upon the fall of Lord North's ministry, and his successor, a man unknown to fame, had already sailed when news arrived of the victory. In the fallen and discouraging state of English affairs at the time, it excited the utmost exultation, and silenced the strictures which certain parts of the Admiral's previous conduct had drawn forth. The people were not in a humour to be critical, and amid the exaggerated notions that prevailed of the results achieved, no one thought of the failure to obtain greater. This impression long prevailed. As late as 1830, when Rodney's life was first published, it was asserted that the French navy had been so effectually crippled and reduced by the decisive victory of the 12th of April. As to be no longer in a condition to contest with Great Britain the Empire of the Seas. This is nonsense, excusable in 1782, but not to the calm thought of after days. The favourable terms obtained were due to the financial embarrassment of France, not to her naval humiliation. And if there was exaggeration in the contention of the advocates of peace that England could not save Jamaica, it is probable that she could not have recovered by arms the other islands restored to her by the treaty. The memory of de Grasse will always be associated with great services done to America. His name, rather than that of Rochambeau, represents the material succor which France gave to the struggling life of the young republic, as Lafayette's recalls the moral sympathy so opportunely extended. The incidents of his life, subsequent to the great disaster which closed his active career, cannot be without interest to American readers. After the surrender of the Ville de Paris, de Grasse accompanied the English fleet and its prizes to Jamaica, whither Rodney repaired to refit his ships, thus appearing as a captive upon the scene of his intended conquest. On the 19th of May he left the island, still a prisoner, for England. Both by naval officers and by the English people he was treated with that flattering and benevolent attention which comes easily from the victor to the vanquished, and of which his personal valour at least was not unworthy. It is said that he did not refuse to show himself on several occasions upon the balcony of his rooms in London, to the populace shouting for the valiant Frenchman. This undignified failure to appreciate his true position naturally excited the indignation of his countrymen, the more so as he had been unsparing and excessive in denouncing the conduct of his subordinates on the unlucky 12th of April. He bears his misfortune, wrote Sir Gilbert Blaine, with equanimity, conscious, as he says, that he has done his duty. He attributes his misfortune, not to the inferiority of his force, but to the base desertion of his officers in the other ships, to whom he made the signal to rally, and even hailed them to abide by him, but was abandoned. This was the keynote to all his utterances. Writing from the English flagship, the day after the battle, he threw upon the greater part of his captains the misfortunes of the day. Some had disobeyed his signals. 
others, and notably the captains of the Thalangadok and Kuran, that is to say his next ahead and astern, had abandoned him. He did not, however, confine himself to official reports, but while a prisoner in London published several pamphlets to the same effect, which he sent broadcast over Europe. The government, naturally thinking that an officer could not thus sully the honor of his corps without good reason, resolved to search out and relentlessly punish all the guilty. The captains of the Languedoc and Couron were imprisoned as soon as they reached France, and all papers, logs, etc., bearing upon the case were gathered together. Under all the circumstances it is not to be wondered at that on his return to France, de Grasse, to use his own words, found no one to hold out a hand to him. It was not till the beginning of 1784 that all the accused and witnesses were ready to appear before the court-martial. But the result of the trial was to clear entirely and in the most ample manner almost every one whom he had attacked, while the faults found were considered of a character entitled to indulgence, and were awarded but slight punishment. Nevertheless, cautiously observes a French writer, one cannot but say, with the court, that the capture of an admiral commanding thirty ships of the line is an historical incident which causes the regret of the whole nation. As to the conduct of the battle by the admiral, the court found that the danger of the Vizil on the morning of the twelfth was not such as to justify bearing down for so long a time as was done. That the crippled ship had a breeze which was not then shared by the English, five miles away to the southward, and which carried her into Bas Terra at 10 a.m. That the engagement should not have been begun before all the ships had come into line. And finally, that the fleet should have been formed on the same tack as the English, because, by continuing to stand south, it entered the zone of calms and light airs at the north end of Dominica. De Grasse was much dissatisfied with the finding of the court, and was indiscreet enough to write to the Minister of Marine, protesting against it and demanding a new trial. The minister, acknowledging his protest, replied in the name of the king. After commenting upon the pamphlets that had been so widely issued, and the entire contradiction of their statements by the testimony before the court, he concluded with these weighty words. The loss of the battle cannot be attributed to the fault of private officers. It results, from the findings, that you have allowed yourself to injure, by ill-founded accusations, the reputation of several officers, in order to clear yourself in public opinion of an unhappy result. The excuse for which you might perhaps have found in the inferiority of your force, in the uncertain fortune of war, and in circumstances over which you had no control. His Majesty is willing to believe that you did what you could to prevent the misfortunes of the day, but he cannot be equally indulgent to your unjust imputations upon those officers of his navy who have been cleared of the charges against them. His Majesty, dissatisfied with your conduct in this respect, forbids you to present yourself before him. I transmit his orders with regret, and add my own advice to retire, under the circumstances, to your province. De Grasse died in January, 1788. His fortunate opponent, rewarded with peerage and pension, lived until 1792. Hood was also created a peer, and commanded with distinction in the early part of the wars of the French Revolution, winning the enthusiastic admiration of Nelson, who served under him. But a sharp difference with the Admiralty caused him to be retired before achieving any brilliant addition to his reputation. He died in 1816, at the great age of 92. Footnotes. The curve, a, a, represents the line which Hood proposed to follow with his fleet, the wind being supposed east-southeast. The positions B, 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 refer to the proceedings of a subsequent day and have nothing to do with the diagram at A. When a fleet is in line ahead, close to the wind, on one tack, and the ships go about together, they will, on the other tack, be on the same line, but not one ahead of the other. This formation was called Bowanquarter Line. A spring is a rope taken from the stern or quarter of a ship at anchor, to an anchor properly placed, by which means the ship can be turned in a desired direction. In the council of war of the Allied fleets on the expediency of attacking the English squadron anchored at Torbay, p. 408, an opponent of the measure urged that the whole of the combined fleets could not bear down upon the English in a line of battle abreast, that of course they must form the line of battle ahead, and go down upon the enemy singly. 
by which they would run the greatest risk of being shattered and torn to pieces, etc. Beetson, Volume 5, page 396. In war, as in cards, the state of the score must at times dictate the play. And the chief who never takes into consideration the effect which his particular action will have on the general result, nor what is demanded of him by the condition of things elsewhere, both political and military, lacks an essential quality of a great general. The audacious manner in which Wellington stormed the redoubt of Francisco, at Ciudad Rodrigo, and broke ground on the first night of the investment. The more audacious manner in which he assaulted the place before the fire of the defense had in any way lessened, and before the counter's carp had been blown in, were the true causes of the sudden fall of the place. Both the military and political state of affairs warranted this neglect of rules. When the general terminated his order for the assault with this sentence, Ciudad Rodrigo must be stormed this evening, he knew well that it would be nobly understood, Napier's Peninsular War. Judging that the honor of His Majesty's arms, and the circumstances of the war in these seas, required a considerable degree of enterprise. I felt myself justified in departing from the regular system, Sir John Jervis's report of the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. By Kempenfeldt's attack upon de Guachin's convoy, and the following gale in December, 1781. See page 408. Kurgelin, Guerre Maritime de 1778. Letter of de Grasse to Kurgelin, dated Paris. January 8, 1783. Page 263. See pages 366, 426. See map 4. Of the Atlantic Ocean, page 532. Weather quarter is behind, but on the windward side. April 29, 1781, off Martinique, 24 ships to 18, January, 1782, 30 to 22, April 9, 1782, 30 to 20. The difference of time from Trincomalee to the Saints is nine hours and a half. The account of the transactions from April 9th to April 12th is based mainly upon the contemporary plates and descriptions of Lt. Matthews, R.N. and the much later, naval researches, of Capt. Thomas White, also of the British Navy, who were eyewitnesses, both being checked by French and other English narratives. Matthews and White are at variance with Rodney's official report as to the tack on which the English were at daybreak. But the latter is explicitly confirmed by private letters of Sir Charles Douglas, sent immediately after the battle to prominent persons, and is followed in the text. Letter of Sir Charles Douglas, Rodney's Chief of Staff, United Service Journal, 1833, Part 1, page 515. De Grasse calls this distance three leagues, while some of his captains estimated it to be as great as five. The French, in mid-channel, had the wind more to the eastward. The positions of the French ships captured are shown by a cross in each of the three successive stages of the battle, B, C, D. The distance of the weathermost French ships from the Ville de Paris, when the signal to form line of battle was made, is variously stated at from six to nine miles. The other two French ships taken were the Ville de Paris, which, in her isolated condition, and bearing the flag of the commander-in-chief, became the quarry around which the enemy's ships naturally gathered, and the Ardent, of sixty-four guns, which appears to have been intercepted in a gallant attempt to pass from the van to the side of her admiral in his extremity. The latter was the solitary prize taken by the Allied Great Armada in the English Channel, in 1779. Official Letter of the Marquis de Vaudrille. Guerin, Histoire de la Marine Francaise, Volume 5, page 513. See United Service Journal, 1834, Part 2. pp. 109 and following. See Letter of Sir Howard Douglas in United Service Journal, 1834, Part 2. Page 97, also, Naval Evolutions, by same author. The letters of Sir Samuel Hood have not come under the author's eye. Rodney's Life, Volume 2. Page 248. There were only twenty-five in all. Guerin, Volume 5, Page 511. Rodney's Life, Volume 2. Page 246. 
Annual Register, 1783, page 151. Annual Register, 1783, page 157, Life of Admiral Keppel, Volume 2. Page 403. Naval Chronicle, Volume 25. Page 404. Page 404. Yet here also the gossip of the day, as reflected in the naval Atalantis, imputed the chief credit to Young, the captain of the flagship. Sir Gilbert Blaine stated, many years later, when it was close upon sunset, it became a question whether the chase should be continued. After some discussion between the admiral and captain, at which I was present, the admiral being confined with the gout, it was decided to persist in the same course with the signal to engage to leeward. United Service Journal, 1830, Part 2. p. 479. Rodney was a strong Tory. Almost all the other distinguished admirals of the day, notably Keppel, Howe, and Barrington, were Whigs, a fact unfortunate for the naval power of England. Rodney's Life, Volume 2. Page 242. Chevalier, Page 311. Kerguelen, Guerre Maritime de 1778. Letter of de Grasse to Kerguelen, Page 263. Troud, Butterley's Navals. It is interesting to note in this connection that one of the ships near the French admiral, when he surrendered, was the Pluton, which, though the extreme rear ship, had nevertheless thus reached a position worthy of the high reputation of her captain, Dalbert de Ryans. Troud, Volume 2. Page 147. That is, Commanders of Single Ships. Chapter 14. Critical Discussion of the Maritime War of 1778. The War of 1778, between Great Britain and the House of Bourbon, which is so inextricably associated with the American Revolution, stands by itself in one respect. It was purely a maritime war. Not only did the Allied kingdoms carefully refrain from continental entanglements, which England in accordance with her former policy strove to excite, but there was between the two contestants an approach to equality on the sea which had not been realized since the days of Tourville. The points in dispute, the objects for which the war was undertaken or at which it aimed, were for the most part remote from Europe. And none of them was on the continent with the single exception of Gibraltar, the strife over which, being at the extreme point of a rugged and difficult salient, and separated from neutral nations by the whole of France and Spain, never threatened to drag in other parties than those immediately interested. No such conditions existed in any war between the accession of Louis XIV and the downfall of Napoleon. There was a period during the reign of the former in which the French navy was superior in number and equipment to the English and Dutch. But the policy and ambition of the sovereign was always directed to continental extension, and his naval power, resting on inadequate foundations, was ephemeral. During the first three quarters of the 18th century there was practically no check to the sea power of England. Great as were its effects upon the issues of the day, the absence of a capable rival made its operations barren of military lessons. In the later wars of the French Republic and Empire, the apparent equality in numbers of ships and weight of batteries was elusive. Owing to the demoralization of the French officers and seamen by causes upon which it is not necessary here to enlarge. After some years of courageous but impotent effort, the tremendous disaster of Trafalgar proclaimed to the world the professional inefficiency of the French and Spanish navies, already detected by the keen eyes of Nelson and his brother officers. And upon which rested the contemptuous confidence that characterized his attitude, and to some extent his tactics, toward them. Thenceforward the emperor, turned his eyes from the only field of battle where fortune had been unfaithful to him, and deciding to pursue England elsewhere than upon the seas, undertook to restore his navy. But without reserving to it any share in a strife become more than ever furious. Up to the last day of the empire he refused to offer to this restored navy, full of ardor and confidence, the opportunity to measure itself with the enemy. Great Britain resumed her old position as unquestioned mistress of the seas. The student of naval war will therefore expect to find a particular interest in the plans and methods of the parties to this great contest, and especially where they concern the general conduct of the whole war.
or of certain large and clearly defined portions of it. In the strategic purpose which gave, or should have given, continuity to their actions from first to last, and in the strategic movements which affected for good or ill the fortunes of the more limited periods, which may be called naval campaigns. For while it cannot be conceded that the particular battles are, even at this day, wholly devoid of tactical instruction, which it has been one of the aims of the preceding pages to elicit, it is undoubtedly true that, like all the tactical systems of history, they have had their day, and their present usefulness to the student is rather in the mental training, in the forming of correct tactical habits of thought, than in supplying models for close imitation. On the other hand, the movements which precede and prepare for great battles, or which, by their skillful and energetic combinations, attain great ends without the actual contact of arms, depend upon factors more permanent than the weapons of the age, and therefore furnish principles of more enduring value. In a war undertaken for any object, even if that object be the possession of a particular territory or position, an attack directly upon the place coveted may not be, from the military point of view, the best means of obtaining it. The end upon which the military operations are directed may therefore be other than the object which the belligerent government wishes to obtain, and it has received a name of its own, the objective. In the critical consideration of any war it is necessary, first, to put clearly before the student's eye the objects desired by each belligerent. Then, to consider whether the objective chosen is the most likely, in case of success, to compass those objects, and finally, to study the merits or faults of the various movements by which the objective is approached. The minuteness with which such an examination is conducted will depend upon the extent of the work which the inquirer proposes to himself. But it will generally conduce to clearness if an outline, giving only the main features unencumbered by detail, should precede a more exhaustive discussion. When such principal lines are thoroughly grasped, details are easily referred to them, and fall into place. The effort here will be confined to presenting such an outline, as being alone fitted to the scope of this work. The principal parties to the War of 1778 were, on the one hand, Great Britain, on the other, the House of Bourbon, controlling the two great kingdoms of France and Spain. The American colonies, being already engaged in an unequal struggle with the mother country, gladly welcomed an event so important to them. While in 1780 Holland was deliberately forced by England into a war from which she had nothing to gain and all to lose. The object of the Americans was perfectly simple, to rid their country out of the hands of the English. Their poverty and their lack of military sea power, with the exception of a few cruisers that preyed upon the enemy's commerce, necessarily confined their efforts to land warfare which constituted indeed a powerful diversion in favour of the Allies and an exhausting drain upon the resources of Great Britain, but which it was in the power of the latter to stop at once by abandoning the contest. Holland, on the other hand, being safe from invasion by land, showed little desire for anything more than to escape with as little external loss as possible, through the assistance of the Allied navies. The object of these two minor parties may therefore be said to have been the cessation of the war, whereas the principles hoped from its continuance certain changed conditions, which constituted their objects. With Great Britain also the object of the war was very simple. Having been led into a lamentable altercation with her most promising colonies, the quarrel had gone on step by step till she was threatened with their loss. To maintain forcible control when willing adhesion had departed, she had taken up arms against them, and her object in so doing was to prevent a break in those foreign possessions with which, in the eyes of that generation, her greatness was indissolubly connected. The appearance of France and Spain as active supporters of the colonists' cause made no change in England's objects, whatever change of objective her military plans may, or should, have undergone. The danger of losing the continental colonies was vastly increased by these accessions to the ranks of her enemies, which brought with them also a threat of loss, soon to be realized in part, of other valuable foreign possessions. England, in short, as regards the objects of the war, was strictly on the defensive, she feared losing much, and at best only hoped to keep what she had. By forcing Holland into war, however, she obtained a military advantage. For, without increasing the strength of her opponents, several important but ill-defended military and commercial positions were thereby laid open to her arms. 
The views and objects of France and Spain were more complex. The moral incentives of hereditary enmity and desire of revenge for the recent past doubtless weighed strongly, as in France did also the sympathy of the salons and philosophers with the colonists' struggle for freedom. But powerfully as sentimental considerations affect the action of nations, only the tangible means by which it is expected to gratify them admit of statement and measurement. France might wish to regain her North American possessions. But the then living generation of colonists had too keen personal recollection of the old contests to acquiesce in any such wishes as to Canada. The strong inherited distrust of the French, which characterized the Americans of the revolutionary era, has been too much overlooked in the glow of gratitude which followed the effectual sympathy and assistance then given. But it was understood at the time, and France felt, that to renew those pretensions might promote, between people of the same race only recently alienated, a reconciliation by just concessions. Which a strong and high-minded party of Englishmen had never ceased to advocate. She therefore did not avow, perhaps did not entertain, this object. On the contrary, she formally renounced all claim to any part of the continent which was then, or had recently been, under the power of the British crown but stipulated for freedom of action in conquering and retaining any of the West India Islands, while all the other colonies of Great Britain were, of course, open to her attack. The principal objects at which France aimed were therefore the English West Indies and that control of India which had passed into English hands, and also to secure in due time the independence of the United States. After they had wrought a sufficient diversion in her favour. With the policy of exclusive trade which characterized that generation, the loss of these important possessions was expected to lessen that commercial greatness upon which the prosperity of England depended, to weaken her and to strengthen France. In fact, the strife which should be greater may be said to have been the animating motive of France, all objects were summed up in the one supreme end to which they contributed, maritime and political superiority over England. Preponderance over England, in combination with France, was also the aim of the equally humbled but less vigorous kingdom of Spain. But there was a definiteness in the injuries suffered and the object specially sought by her which is less easily found in the broader views of her ally. Although no Spaniard then living could remember the Spanish flag flying over Menorca, Gibraltar, or Jamaica, the lapse of time had not reconciled the proud and tenacious nation to their loss. Nor was there on the part of the Americans the same traditional objection to the renewal of Spanish sovereignty over the two Floridas that was felt with reference to Canada. Such, then, were the objects sought by the two nations, whose interposition changed the whole character of the American Revolutionary War. It is needless to say that they did not all appear among the causes, or pretexts, avowed for engaging in hostility. But sagacious English opinion of the day rightly noted, as embodying in a few words the real ground of action of the United Bourbon Courts, the following phrase in the French Manifesto, to avenge their respective injuries. And to put an end to that tyrannical empire which England has usurped, and claims to maintain upon the ocean. In short, as regards the objects of the war the Allies were on the offensive, as England was thrown upon the defensive. The tyrannical empire which England was thus accused, and not unjustly, of exercising over the seas, rested upon her great sea power, actual or latent. Upon her commerce and armed shipping, her commercial establishments, colonies, and naval stations in all parts of the world. Up to this time her scattered colonies had been bound to her by ties of affectionate sentiment. And by the still stronger motive of self-interest through the close commercial connection with the mother country and the protection afforded by the constant presence of her superior navy. Now a break was made in the girdle of strong ports upon which her naval power was based, by the revolt of the continental colonies. While the numerous trade interests between them and the West Indies, which were injured by the consequent hostilities, tended to divide the sympathies of the islands also. The struggle was not only for political possession and commercial use. It involved a military question of the first importance, whether a chain of naval stations covering one of the shores of the Atlantic, linking Canada and Halifax with the West Indies, and backed by a thriving seafaring population, should remain in the hands of a nation which had so far used its unprecedented sea power with consistent, resolute aggressiveness, and with almost unbroken success. 
While Great Britain was thus embarrassed by the difficulty of maintaining her hold upon her naval bases, which were the defensive element of her naval strength, her offensive naval power, her fleet, was threatened by the growth of the armed shipping of France and Spain, which now confronted her upon the field which she had claimed as her own, with an organized military force of equal or superior material strength. The moment was therefore favorable for attacking the great power whose wealth, reaped from the sea, had been a decisive factor in the European wars of the past century. The next question was the selection of the points of attack, of the principal objectives upon which the main effort of the assailants should be steadily directed, and of the secondary objectives by which the defense should be distracted and its strength dissipated. One of the wisest French statesmen of that day, Turgot, held that it was to the interest of France that the colonies should not achieve their independence. If subdued by exhaustion, their strength was lost to England. If reduced by a military tenure of controlling points, but not exhausted, the necessity of constant repression would be a continual weakness to the mother country. Though this opinion did not prevail in the councils of the French government, which wished the ultimate independence of America, it contained elements of truth which effectually molded the policy of the war. If benefit to the United States, by effecting their deliverance, were the principal object, the continent became the natural scene, and its decisive military points the chief objectives of operations. But as the first object of France was not to benefit America, but to injure England, sound military judgment dictated that the continental strife, so far from being helped to a conclusion, should be kept in vigorous life. It was a diversion ready made to the hand of France and exhausting to Great Britain, requiring only so much support as would sustain a resistance to which the insurgents were bound by the most desperate alternatives. The territory of the thirteen colonies therefore should not be the principal objective of France, much less that of Spain. The commercial value of the English West Indies made them tempting objects to the French, who adapted themselves with peculiar readiness to the social conditions of that region, in which their colonial possessions were already extensive. Besides the two finest of the Lesser Antilles, Guadeloupe and Martinique, which she still retains, France then held Estier Lucia and the western half of Haiti. She might well hope by successful war to add most of the English Antilles, and thus to round off a truly imperial tropical dependency. While, though debarred from Jamaica by the susceptibilities of Spain, it might be possible to win back that magnificent island for an allied and weaker nation. But however desirable as possessions, and therefore as objects, the smaller Antilles might be, their military tenure depended too entirely upon control of the sea for them to be in themselves proper objectives. The French government, therefore, forbade its naval commanders to occupy such as they might seize. They were to make the garrisons prisoners, destroy the defenses, and so retire. In the excellent military port of Fort Royal, Martinique, in Cap Francais, and in the strong allied harbor of Havana, a fleet of adequate size found good, secure, and well-distributed bases, while the early and serious loss of Sta. Lucia must be attributed to the mismanagement of the French fleet and the professional ability of the English admiral. On shore, in the West Indies, the rival powers therefore found themselves about equally provided with the necessary points of support. Mere occupation of others could not add to their military strength, thenceforth dependent upon the numbers and quality of the fleets. To extend occupation further with safety, the first need was to obtain maritime supremacy, not only locally, but over the general field of war. Otherwise occupation was precarious unless enforced by a body of troops so large as to entail expense beyond the worth of the object. The key of the situation in the West Indies being thus in the fleets, these became the true objectives of the military effort. And all the more so because the real military usefulness of the West Indian ports in this war was as an intermediate base, between Europe and the American continent, to which the fleets retired when the armies went into winter quarters. No sound strategic operation on shore was undertaken in the West Indies except the seizure of Sta Lucia by the English, and the abortive plan against Jamaica in 1782. Nor was any serious attempt against a military port, as Barbados or Fort Royal, possible, until naval preponderance was assured either by battle or by happy concentration of force. The key of the situation, it must be repeated, was in the fleet. 
The influence of naval power, of an armed fleet, upon the war on the American continent has also been indicated in the opinions of Washington and Sir Henry Clinton. While the situation in the East Indies, regarded as a field by itself, has been so largely discussed under the head of Suffren's campaign, that it needs here only to repeat that everything there depended upon control of the sea by a superior naval force. The capture of Trincomalee, essential as it was to the French squadron which had no other base, was, like that of Sta. Lucia, a surprise, and could only have been effected by the defeat, or, as happened, by the absence of the enemy's fleet. In North America and India sound military policy pointed out, as the true objective, the enemy's fleet, upon which also depended the communications with the mother countries. There remains Europe, which it is scarcely profitable to examine at length as a separate field of action, because its relations to the universal war are so much more important. It may simply be pointed out that the only two points in Europe whose political transfer was an object of the war were Gibraltar and Menorca, the former of which was throughout, by the urgency of Spain, made a principal objective of the Allies. The tenure of both these depended, obviously, upon control of the sea. In a sea war, as in all others, two things are from the first essential, a suitable base upon the frontier, in this case the seaboard, from which the operations start, and an organized military force, in this case a fleet. Of size and quality adequate to the proposed operations. If the war, as in the present instance, extends to distant parts of the globe, there will be needed in each of those distant regions secure ports for the shipping, to serve as secondary, or contingent, bases of the local war. Between these secondary and the principal, or home, bases there must be reasonably secure communication, which will depend upon military control of the intervening sea. This control must be exercised by the navy, which will enforce it either by clearing the sea in all directions of hostile cruisers, thus allowing the ships of its own nation to pass with reasonable security. Or by accompanying in force, convoying, each train of supply ships necessary for the support of the distant operations. The former method aims at a widely diffused effort of the national power, the other at a concentration of it upon that part of the sea where the convoy is at a given moment. Whichever be adopted, the communications will doubtless be strengthened by the military holding of good harbors, properly spaced yet not too numerous, along the routes, as, for instance, the Cape of Good Hope and the Mauritius. Stations of this kind have always been necessary, but are doubly so now, as fuel needs renewing more frequently than did the provisions and supplies in former days. These combinations of strong points at home and abroad, and the condition of the communications between them, may be called the strategic features of the general military situation, by which, and by the relative strength of the opposing fleets. The nature of the operations must be determined. In each of the three divisions of the field, Europe, America, and India, under which for sake of clearness the narrative has been given, the control of the sea has been insisted upon as the determining factor. And the hostile fleet therefore indicated as the true objective. Let the foregoing considerations now be applied to the whole field of war, and see how far the same conclusion holds good of it, and if so, what should have been the nature of the operations on either side. In Europe the home base of Great Britain was on the English Channel, with the two principal arsenals of Plymouth and Portsmouth. The base of the Allied powers was on the Atlantic, the principal military ports being Brest, Farrell, and Cadiz. Behind these, within the Mediterranean, were the dockyards of Toulon and Cartagena, over against which stood the English station Port Mahone, in Menorca. The latter, however, may be left wholly out of account, being confined to a defensive part during the war, as the British fleet was not able to spare any squadron to the Mediterranean. Gibraltar, on the contrary, by its position, effectually watched over detachments or reinforcements from within the straits, provided it were utilized as the station of a body of ships adequate to the duty. This was not done. The British European fleet being kept tied to the channel, that is, to home defense, and making infrequent visits to the rock to convoy supplies essential to the endurance of the garrison. There was, however, a difference in the parts played by Port Mahone and Gibraltar. The former, being at the time wholly unimportant, received no attention from the Allies until late in the war, when it fell after a six-month siege. Whereas the latter, 
being considered of the first importance, absorbed from the beginning a very large part of the Allied attack, and so made a valuable diversion in favor of Great Britain. To this view of the principal features of the natural strategic situation in Europe may properly be added the remark, that such aid as Holland might be inclined to send to the Allied fleets had a very insecure line of communication. Being forced to pass along the English base on the channel. Such aid in fact was never given. In North America the local bases of the war at its outbreak were New York, Narragansett Bay, and Boston. The two former were then held by the English, and were the most important stations on the continent, from their position, susceptibility of defense, and resources. Boston had passed into the hands of the Americans, and was therefore at the service of the Allies. From the direction actually given to the war, by diverting the active English operations to the southern states in 1779, Boston was thrown outside the principal theater of operations, and became from its position militarily unimportant. But had the plan been adopted of isolating New England by holding the line of the Hudson and Lake Champlain, and concentrating military effort to the eastward, it will be seen that these three ports would all have been of decisive importance to the issue. South of New York, the Delaware and Chesapeake Bays undoubtedly offered tempting fields for maritime enterprise. But the width of the entrances, the want of suitable and easily defended points for naval stations near the sea, the wide dispersal of the land forces entailed by an attempt to hold so many points, and the sickliness of the locality during a great part of the year, should have accepted them from a principal part in the plan of the first campaigns. It is not necessary to include them among the local bases of the war. To the extreme south the English were drawn by the ignis fatuous of expected support among the people. They failed to consider that even if a majority there preferred quiet to freedom, that very quality would prevent them from rising against the revolutionary government by which, on the English theory, they were oppressed. Yet upon such a rising the whole success of this distant and in its end most unfortunate enterprise was staked. The local base of this war apart was Charleston, which passed into the hands of the British in May, 1780, eighteen months after the first expedition had landed in Georgia. The principal local bases of the war in the West Indies are already known through the previous narrative. They were for the English, Barbados, Sta Lucia, and to a less degree Antigua. A thousand miles to leeward was the large island of Jamaica, with a dockyard of great natural capabilities at Kingston. The Allies held, in the first order of importance, Fort Royal in Martinique, and Havana. In the second order, Guadeloupe and Cap Francais. A controlling feature of the strategic situation in that day, and one which will not be wholly without weight in our own, was the trade wind, with its accompanying current. A passage to windward against these obstacles was a long and serious undertaking even for single ships, much more for larger bodies. It followed that fleets would go to the western islands only reluctantly, or when assured that the enemy had taken the same direction, as Rodney went to Jamaica after the Battle of the Saints, knowing the French fleet to have gone to Cap Francais. This condition of the wind made the windward, or eastern, islands points on the natural lines of communication between Europe and America, as well as local bases of the naval war, and tied the fleets to them. Hence also it followed that between the two scenes of operations, between the continent and the Lesser Antilles, was interposed a wide central region into which the larger operations of war could not safely be carried except by a belligerent possessed of great naval superiority, or unless a decisive advantage had been gained upon one flank. In 1762, when England held all the windward islands, with undisputed superiority at sea, she safely attacked and subdued Havana. But in the years 1779 to 1782 the French sea power in America and the French tenure of the Windward Islands practically balanced her own, leaving the Spaniards at Havana free to prosecute their designs against Pensacola and the Bahamas. In the central region mentioned. Posts like Martinique and Sta Lucia had therefore for the present war great strategic advantage over Jamaica, Havana, or others to leeward. They commanded the latter in virtue of their position, by which the passage westward could be made so much more quickly than the return. While the decisive points of the continental struggle were practically little farther from the one than from the other. This advantage was shared equally by most of those known as the Lesser Antilles. 
But the small island of Barbados, being well to windward of all, possessed peculiar advantages, not only for offensive action, but because it was defended by the difficulty with which a large fleet could approach it. Even from so near a port as Fort Royal. It will be remembered that the expedition which finally sat down before St. Kitts had been intended for Barbados, but could not reach it through the violence of the trade wind. Thus Barbados, under the conditions of the time, was peculiarly fitted to be the local base and depot of the English war, as well as a wayside port of refuge on the line of communications to Jamaica, Florida, and even to North America, while Sta. Lucia, a hundred miles to leeward, was held in force as an advanced post for the fleet, watching closely the enemy at Fort Royal. In India the political conditions of the peninsula necessarily indicated the eastern, or Coromandel, coast as the scene of operations. Trincomalee, in the adjacent island of Ceylon, though unhealthy, offered an excellent and defensible harbour, and thus acquired first-rate strategic importance, all the other anchorages on the coast being mere open roadsteads. From this circumstance the trade winds, or monsoons, in this region also had strategic bearing. From the autumnal to the spring equinox the wind blows regularly from the northeast, at times with much violence, throwing a heavy surf upon the beach and making landing difficult. But during the summer months the prevailing wind is southwest, giving comparatively smooth seas and good weather. The change of the monsoon, in September and October, is often marked by violent hurricanes. Active operations, or even remaining on the coast, were therefore unadvisable from this time until the close of the northeast monsoon. The question of a port to which to retire during this season was pressing. Trincomalee was the only one, and its unique strategic value was heightened by being to windward, during the fine season, of the principal scene of war. The English harbour of Bombay on the west coast was too distant to be considered a local base, and rather falls, like the French islands Mauritius and Bourbon, under the head of stations on the line of communications with the mother country. Such were the principal points of support, or bases, of the belligerent nations, at home and abroad. Of those abroad it must be said, speaking generally, that they were deficient in resources, an important element of strategic value. Naval and military stores and equipments, and to a great extent provisions for sea use, had to be sent them from the mother countries. Boston, surrounded by a thriving, friendly population, was perhaps an exception to this statement, as was also Havana, at that time an important naval arsenal, where much shipbuilding was done. But these were distant from the principal theaters of war. Upon New York and Narragansett Bay the Americans pressed too closely for the resources of the neighboring country to be largely available, while the distant ports of the East and West Indies depended wholly upon home. Hence the strategic question of communications assumed additional importance. To intercept a large convoy of supply ships was an operation only secondary to the destruction of a body of ships of war. While to protect such by main strength, or by evading the enemy's search, tax the skill of the governments and naval commanders in distributing the ships of war and squadrons at their disposal, among the many objects which demanded attention. The address of Kempenfelt and the bad management of Guichen in the North Atlantic, seconded by a heavy gale of wind, seriously embarrassed de Grasse in the West Indies. Similar injury, by cutting off small convoys in the Atlantic, was done to Suffren in the Indian seas, while the latter at once made good part of these losses and worried his opponents by the success of his cruisers preying on the English supply ships. Thus the navies, by which alone these vital streams could be secured or endangered, bore the same relation to the maintenance of the general war that has already been observed of the separate parts. They were the links that bound the whole together, and were therefore indicated as the proper objective of both belligerents. The distance from Europe to America was not such as to make intermediate ports of supply absolutely necessary. While if difficulty did arise from an unforeseen cause, it was always possible, barring meeting an enemy, either to return to Europe or to make a friendly port in the West Indies. The case was different with the long voyage to India by the Cape of Good Hope. Bickerton, leaving England with a convoy in February, was thought to have done well in reaching Bombay the following September. While the ardent Suffren, sailing in March, took an equal time to reach Mauritius, whence the passage to Madras consumed two months more. 
A voyage of such duration could rarely be made without a stop for water, for fresh provision, often for such refitting as called for the quiet of a harbor, even when the stores on board furnished the necessary material. A perfect line of communications required, as has been said, several such harbors, properly spaced, adequately defended, and with abundant supplies, such as England in the present day holds on some of her main commercial routes. Acquisitions of her past wars In the War of 1778 none of the belligerents had such ports on this route, until by the accession of Holland, the Cape of Good Hope was put at the disposal of the French and suitably strengthened by Suffren. With this and the Mauritius on the way, and Trincomalee at the far end of the road, the communications of the Allies with France were reasonably guarded. England, though then holding ST. Helena, depended, for the refreshment and refitting of her India-bound squadrons and convoys in the Atlantic, upon the benevolent neutrality of Portugal, extended in the islands of Madeira and Cape Verde and in the Brazilian ports. This neutrality was indeed a frail reliance for defense, as was shown by the encounter between John Stone and Suffren at the Cape Verde. But there being several possible stopping places, and the enemy unable to know which, if any, would be used, this ignorance itself conferred no small security. If the naval commander did not trust it to the neglect of proper disposition of his own force, as did John Stone at Porto Praia. Indeed, with the delay and uncertainty which then characterized the transmission of intelligence from one point to another, doubt where to find the enemy was a greater bar to offensive enterprises than the often slight defenses of a colonial port. This combination of useful harbors and the conditions of the communications between them constitute, as has been said, the main strategic outlines of the situation. The Navy, as the organized force linking the whole together, has been indicated as the principal objective of military effort. The method employed to reach the objective, the conduct of the war, is still to be considered. Before doing this a condition peculiar to the sea, and affecting the following discussion, must be briefly mentioned, that is, the difficulty of obtaining information. Armies pass through countries more or less inhabited by a stationary population, and they leave behind them traces of their march. Fleets move through a desert over which wanderers flit, but where they do not remain. And as the waters close behind them, an occasional wave from the decks may indicate their passage, but tells nothing of their course. The sail spoken by the pursuer may know nothing of the pursued, which yet passed the point of parley but a few days or hours before. Of late, careful study of the winds and currents of the ocean has laid down certain advantageous routes, which will be habitually followed by a careful seaman, and afford some presumption as to his movements. But in 1778 the data for such precision were not collected, and even had they been, the quickest route must often have been abandoned for one of the many possible ones, in order to elude pursuit or lying in wait. In such a game of hide-and-seek the advantage is with the sought, and the great importance of watching the outlets of an enemy's country, of stopping the chase before it has got away into the silent desert, is at once evident. If for any reason such a watch there is impossible, the next best thing is, not attempting to watch routes which may not be taken, to get first to the enemy's destination and await him there. But this implies a knowledge of his intentions which may not always be obtainable. The action of Suffren, when pitted against John Stone, was throughout strategically sound, both in his attack at Porto Praia and in the haste with which he made for their common destination. While the two failures of Rodney to intercept the convoys to Martinique in 1780 and 1782, though informed that they were coming, show the difficulty which attended lying in wait even when the point of arrival was known. Of any maritime expedition two points only are fixed, the point of departure and that of arrival. The latter may be unknown to the enemy. But up to the time of sailing, the presence of a certain force in a port, and the indications of a purpose soon to move, may be assumed to be known. It may be of moment to either belligerent to intercept such a movement. But it is more especially and universally necessary to the defense, because, of the many points at which he is open to attack, it may be impossible for him to know which is threatened. Whereas the offense proceeds with full knowledge direct to his aim, if he can deceive his opponent. The importance of blocking such an expedition becomes yet more evident should it at any time be divided between two or more ports. 
a condition which may easily arise when the facilities of a single dockyard are insufficient to fit out so many ships in the time allowed, or when, as in the present war, allied powers furnish separate contingents. To prevent the junction of these contingents is a matter of prime necessity, and nowhere can this be done so certainly as off the ports whence one or both is to sail. The defense, from its very name, is presumably the less strong, and is therefore the more bound to take advantage of such a source of weakness as the division of the enemy's force. Rodney in 1782 at Estier. Lucia, watching the French contingent at Martinique to prevent its union with the Spaniards at Cap Francais, is an instance of correct strategic position. And had the islands been so placed as to put him between the French and their destination, instead of in their rear, nothing better could have been devised. As it was, he did the best thing possible under the circumstances. The defense, being the weaker, cannot attempt to block all the ports where divisions of the enemy lie, without defeating his aim by being an inferior force before each. This would be to neglect the fundamental principles of war. If he correctly decide not to do this, but to collect a superior force before one or two points, it becomes necessary to decide which shall be thus guarded and which neglected. A question involving the whole policy of the war after a full understanding of the main conditions, military, moral, and economic, in every quarter. The defensive was necessarily accepted by England in 1778. It had been a maxim with the best English naval authorities of the preceding era, with Hawke and his contemporaries, that the British Navy should be kept equal in numbers to the combined fleets of the Bourbon kingdoms, a condition which, with the better quality of the personnel and the larger maritime population upon which it could draw, would have given a real superiority of force. This precaution, however, had not been observed during recent years. It is of no consequence to this discussion whether the failure was due to the inefficiency of the ministry, as was charged by their opponents, or to the misplaced economy often practiced by representative governments in time of peace. The fact remains that, notwithstanding the notorious probability of France and Spain joining in the war, the English navy was inferior in number to that of the Allies. In what have been called the strategic features of the situation, the home bases, and the secondary bases abroad, the advantage upon the whole lay with her. Her positions, if not stronger in themselves, were at least better situated, geographically, for strategic effect. But in the second essential for war, the organized military force, or fleet, adequate to offensive operations, she had been allowed to become inferior. It only remained, therefore, to use this inferior force with such science and vigor as would frustrate the designs of the enemy, by getting first to sea, taking positions skillfully, anticipating their combinations by greater quickness of movement, harassing their communications with their objectives, and meeting the principal divisions of the enemy with superior forces. It is sufficiently clear that the maintenance of this war, everywhere except on the American continent, depended upon the mother countries in Europe and upon open communication with them. The ultimate crushing of the Americans, too, not by direct military effort but by exhaustion, was probable, if England were left unmolested to strangle their commerce and industries with her overwhelming naval strength. This strength she could put forth against them, if relieved from the pressure of the Allied navies, and relief would be obtained if she could gain over them a decided preponderance, not merely material but moral, such as she had twenty years later. In that case the Allied courts, whose financial weakness was well known, must retire from a contest in which their main purpose of reducing England to an inferior position was already defeated. Such preponderance, however, could only be had by fighting. By showing that, despite inferiority in numbers, the skill of her seamen and the resources of her wealth enabled her government, by a wise use of these powers, to be actually superior at the decisive points of the war. It could never be had by distributing the ships of the line all over the world, exposing them to be beaten in detail while endeavouring to protect all the exposed points of the scattered empire. The key of the situation was in Europe, and in Europe in the hostile dockyards. If England were unable, as she proved to be, to raise up a continental war against France, then her one hope was to find and strike down the enemy's navy. Nowhere was it so certainly to be found as in its home ports, nowhere so easily met as immediately after leaving them. 
this dictated her policy in the Napoleonic Wars. When the moral superiority of her navy was so established that she dared to oppose inferior forces to the combined dangers of the sea and of the more numerous and well-equipped ships lying quietly at anchor inside. By facing this double risk she obtained the double advantage of keeping the enemy under her eyes, and of sapping his efficiency by the easy life of port. While her own officers and seamen were hardened by the rigorous cruising into a perfect readiness for every call upon their energies. We have no reason, proclaimed Admiral Villeneuve in 1805, echoing the words of the Emperor, to fear the sight of an English squadron. Their seventy-fours have not five hundred men on board, they are worn out by a two years' cruise. A month later he wrote, the Toulon squadron appeared very fine in the harbour, the crews well clothed and drilling well, but as soon as a storm came, all was changed. They were not drilled in storms. The Emperor, said Nelson, now finds, if emperors hear truth, that his fleet suffers more in a night than ours in one year. These gentlemen are not used to the hurricanes, which we have braved for twenty-one months without losing mast or yard. It must be admitted, however, that the strain was tremendous both on men and ships, and that many English officers found in the wear and tear an argument against keeping their fleets at sea off the enemy's coast. Every one of the blasts we endure, wrote Collingwood, lessens the security of the country. The last cruise disabled five large ships and two more lately, several of them must be docked. I have hardly known what a night of rest is these two months, wrote he again, this incessant cruising seems to me beyond the powers of human nature. Calder is worn to a shadow, quite broken down, and I am told Graves is not much better. The high professional opinion of Lord Howe was also adverse to the practice. Besides the exhaustion of men and ships, it must also be admitted that no blockade could be relied on certainly to check the exit of an enemy's fleet. Villeneuve escaped from Toulon, Missiacy from Roquefort. I am here watching the French squadron in Roquefort, wrote Collingwood, but feel that it is not practicable to prevent their sailing. And yet, if they should get by me, I should be exceedingly mortified. The only thing that can prevent their sailing is the apprehension that they may get among us, as they cannot know exactly where we are. Nevertheless, the strain then was endured. The English fleets girdled the shores of France and Spain, losses were made good, ships were repaired, as one officer fell, or was worn out at his post, another took his place. The strict guard over Brest broke up the Emperor's combinations. The watchfulness of Nelson, despite an unusual concurrence of difficulties, followed the Toulon fleet, from the moment of its starting, across the Atlantic and back to the shores of Europe. It was long before they came to blows, before strategy stepped aside and tactics completed the work at Trafalgar. But step by step and point by point the rugged but disciplined seamen, the rusty and battered but well-handled ships, blocked each move of their unpractised opponents. Disposed in force before each arsenal of the enemy, and linked together by chains of smaller vessels, they might fail now and again to check a raid, but they effectually stopped all grand combinations of the enemy's squadrons. The ships of 1805 were essentially the same as those of 1780. There had doubtless been progress and improvement, but the changes were in degree, not in kind. Not only so, but the fleets of twenty years earlier, under Hawke and his fellows, had dared the winters of the Bay of Biscay. There is not in Hawke's correspondence, says his biographer, the slightest indication that he himself doubted for a moment that it was not only possible, but his duty, to keep the sea, even through the storms of winter. And that he should soon be able to, make downright work of it. If it be urged that the condition of the French navy was better, the character and training of its officers higher, than in the days of Hawke and Nelson, the fact must be admitted. Nevertheless, the Admiralty could not long have been ignorant that the number of such officers was still so deficient as seriously to affect the quality of the deck service. And the lack of seamen so great as to necessitate filling up the complements with soldiers. As for the personnel of the Spanish navy, there is no reason to believe it better than fifteen years later, when Nelson, speaking of Spain giving certain ships to France, said, I take it for granted not manned, by Spaniards as that would be the readiest way to lose them again. In truth, however, it is too evident to need much arguing, 
that the surest way for the weaker party to neutralize the enemy's ships was to watch them in their harbors and fight them if they started. The only serious objection to doing this, in Europe, was the violence of the weather off the coasts of France and Spain, especially during the long nights of winter. This brought with it not only risk of immediate disaster, which strong, well-managed ships would rarely undergo, but a continual strain which no skill could prevent. And which therefore called for a large reserve of ships to relieve those sent in for repairs, or to refresh the crews. The problem would be greatly simplified if the blockading fleet could find a convenient anchorage on the flank of the route the enemy must take, as Nelson in 1804 and 1805 used Madalena Bay in Sardinia when watching the Toulon fleet. A step to which he was further forced by the exceptionally bad condition of many of his ships. So Sir James Samares in 1800 even used Duarnanez Bay, on the French coast, only five miles from Brest, to anchor the inshore squadron of the blockading force in heavy weather. The positions at Plymouth and Torbay cannot be considered perfectly satisfactory from this point of view, not being, like Madalena Bay, on the flank of the enemy's route, but like Sta Lucia, rather to its rear. Nevertheless, Hawke proved that diligence and well-managed ships could overcome this disadvantage, as Rodney also afterward showed on his less tempestuous station. In the use of the ships at its disposal, taking the War of 1778 as a whole, the English ministry kept their foreign detachments in America, and in the West and East Indies, equal to those of the enemy. At particular times, indeed, this was not so. But speaking generally of the assignment of ships, the statement is correct. In Europe, on the contrary, and in necessary consequence of the policy mentioned, the British fleet was habitually much inferior to that in the French and Spanish ports. It therefore could be used offensively only by great care, and through good fortune in meeting the enemy in detail. And even so an expensive victory, unless very decisive, entailed considerable risk from the consequent temporary disability of the ships engaged. It followed that the English home, or channel, fleet, upon which depended also the communications with Gibraltar and the Mediterranean, was used very economically both as to battle and weather, and was confined to the defense of the home coast. Or to operations against the enemy's communications. India was so far distant that no exception can be taken to the policy there. Ships sent there went to stay, and could be neither reinforced nor recalled with a view to sudden emergencies. The field stood by itself. But Europe, North America, and the West Indies should have been looked upon as one large theatre of war, throughout which events were mutually dependent, and whose different parts stood in close relations of greater or less importance. To which due attention should have been paid. Assuming that the navies, as the guardians of the communications, were the controlling factors in the war, and that the source, both of the navies and of those streams of supplies which are called communications, was in the mother countries. And they're centralized in the chief arsenals, two things follow, first, the main effort of the power standing on the defensive, of Great Britain, should have been concentrated before those arsenals. And secondly, in order to such concentration, the lines of communication abroad should not have been needlessly extended, so as to increase beyond the strictest necessity the detachments to guard them. Closely connected with the last consideration is the duty of strengthening, by fortification otherwise, the vital points to which the communications led, so that these points should not depend in any way upon the fleet for protection. But only for supplies and reinforcements, and those at reasonable intervals. Gibraltar, for instance, quite fulfilled these conditions, being practically impregnable, and storing supplies that lasted very long. If this reasoning be correct, the English dispositions on the American continent were very faulty. Holding Canada, with Halifax, New York, and Narragansett Bay, and with the line of the Hudson within their grip, it was in their power to isolate a large, perhaps decisive, part of the insurgent territory. New York and Narragansett Bay could have been made unassailable by a French fleet of that day, thus assuring the safety of the garrisons against attacks from the sea and minimizing the task of the navy. While the latter would find in them a secure refuge, in case an enemy's force eluded the watch of the English fleet before a European arsenal and appeared on the coast. Instead of this, these two ports were left weak, and would have fallen before a Nelson or a Farragut, 
while the army in New York was twice divided, first to the Chesapeake and afterward to Georgia. Neither part of the separated forces being strong enough for the work before it. The control of the sea was thus used in both cases to put the enemy between the divided portions of the English army, when the latter, undivided, had not been able to force its way over the ground thus interposed. As the communication between the two parts of the army depended wholly upon the sea, the duty of the navy was increased with the increased length of the lines of communication. The necessity of protecting the seaports and the lengthened lines of communication thus combined to augment the naval detachments in America, and to weaken proportionately the naval force at the decisive points in Europe. Thus also a direct consequence of the southern expedition was the hasty abandonment of Narragansett Bay, when D'Estaing appeared on the coast in 1779, because Clinton had not force enough to defend both it and New York. In the West Indies the problem before the English government was not to subdue revolted territory, but to preserve the use of a number of small, fruitful islands. To keep possession of them itself, and to maintain their trade as free as possible from the depredations of the enemy. It need not be repeated that this demanded predominance at sea over both the enemy's fleets and single cruisers, commerce destroyers, as the latter are now styled. As no vigilance can confine all these to their ports, the West Indian waters must be patrolled by British frigates and lighter vessels. But it would surely be better, if possible, to keep the French fleet away altogether than to hold it in check by a British fleet on the spot, of only equal force at any time, and liable to fall, as it often did, below equality. England, being confined to the defensive, was always liable to loss when thus inferior. She actually did lose one by one, by sudden attack, most of her islands, and at different times had her fleet shut up under the batteries of a port. Whereas the enemy, when he found himself inferior, was able to wait for reinforcements, knowing that he had nothing to fear while so waiting. Nor was this embarrassment confined to the West Indies. The nearness of the islands to the American continent made it always possible for the offense to combine his fleets in the two quarters before the defense could be sure of his purpose. And although such combinations were controlled in some measure by well understood conditions of weather and the seasons, the events of 1780 and 1781 show the perplexity felt from this cause by the ablest English admiral, whose dispositions, though faulty, but reflected the uncertainties of his mind. When to this embarrassment, which is common to the defensive in all cases, is added the care of the great British trade upon which the prosperity of the empire mainly depended. It must be conceded that the task of the British admiral in the West Indies was neither light nor simple. In Europe, the safety of England herself and of Gibraltar was gravely imperiled by the absence of these large detachments in the Western Hemisphere, to which may also be attributed the loss of Menorca. When 66 Allied ships of the line confronted the 35 which alone England could collect, and drove them into their harbours. There was realised that mastery of the channel which Napoleon claimed would make him beyond all doubt master of England. For thirty days, the thirty ships which formed the French contingent had cruised in the Bay of Biscay, awaiting the arrival of the tardy Spaniards, but they were not disturbed by the English fleet. Gibraltar was more than once brought within sight of starvation, through the failure of communications with England. And its deliverance was due, not to the power of the English navy suitably disposed by its government, but to the skill of British officers and the inefficiency of the Spaniards. In the great final relief, Lord Howe's fleet numbered only 34 to the Allied 49. Which, then, in the difficulties under which England laboured, was the better course, to allow the enemy free exit from his ports and endeavour to meet him by maintaining a sufficient naval force on each of the exposed stations. Or to attempt to watch his arsenals at home, under all the difficulties of the situation, not with the vain hope of preventing every raid, or intercepting every convoy, but with the expectation of frustrating the greater combinations. And of following close at the heels of any large fleet that escaped. Such a watch must not be confounded with a blockade, a term frequently, but not quite accurately, applied to it. I beg to inform your lordship, wrote Nelson, that the port of Toulon has never been blockaded by me, quite the reverse. Every opportunity has been offered the enemy to put to sea, for it is there we hope to realize the hopes and expectations of our country. Nothing, he says again, 
ever kept the French fleet in Toulon or Brest when they had a mind to come out. And although the statement is somewhat exaggerated, it is true that the attempt to shut them up in port would have been hopeless. What Nelson expected by keeping near their ports, with enough lookout ships properly distributed, was to know when they sailed and what direction they took, intending, to use his own expression, to follow them to the antipodes. I am led to believe, he writes at another time, that the feral squadron of French ships will push for the Mediterranean. If it joined that in Toulon, it will much outnumber us. But I shall never lose sight of them, and Pellew, commanding the English squadron off Farrell, will soon be after them. So it happened often enough during that prolonged war that divisions of French ships escaped, through stress of weather, temporary absence of a blockading fleet, or misjudgment on the part of its commander. But the alarm was quickly given, some of the many frigates caught sight of them, followed to detect their probable destination, passed the word from point to point and from fleet to fleet and soon a division of equal force was after them. To the antipodes, if need were. As, according to the traditional use of the French navy by French governments, their expeditions went not to fight the hostile fleet, but with ulterior objects. The angry buzz and hot pursuit that immediately followed was far from conducive to an undisturbed and methodical execution of the program laid down, even by a single division. While to great combinations, dependent upon uniting the divisions from different ports, they were absolutely fatal. The adventurous crews of Bruix, leaving Brest with 25 ships of the line in 1799, the rapidity with which the news spread, the stirring action and individual mistakes of the English. The frustration of the French projects and the closeness of the pursuit, the escape of Missiacy from Roquefort in 1805, of the divisions of Willemez and Lysigs from Brest in 1806, all these may be named. Along with the Great Trafalgar Campaign, as affording interesting studies of a naval strategy following the lines here suggested. While the campaign of 1798, despite its brilliant ending at the Nile, may be cited as a case where failure nearly ensued, owing to the English having no force before Toulon when the expedition sailed. And to Nelson being insufficiently provided with frigates. The nine weeks cruise of Gantome in the Mediterranean, in 1808, also illustrates the difficulty of controlling a fleet which has been permitted to get out, unwatched by a strong force, even in such narrow waters. North Atlantic Ocean No parallel instances can be cited from the War of 1778, although the old monarchy did not cover the movements of its fleets with the secrecy enforced by the stern military despotism of the empire. In both epochs England stood on the defensive. But in the earlier war she gave up the first line of the defense, off the hostile ports, and tried to protect all parts of her scattered empire by dividing the fleet among them. It has been attempted to show the weakness of the one policy, while admitting the difficulties and dangers of the other. The latter aims at shortening and deciding the war by either shutting up or forcing battle upon the hostile navy, recognizing that this is the key of the situation, when the sea at once unites and separates the different parts of the theater of war. It requires a navy equal in number and superior in efficiency, to which it assigns a limited field of action, narrow to the conditions which admit of mutual support among the squadrons occupying it. Thus distributed, it relies upon skill and watchfulness to intercept or overtake any division of the enemy which gets to sea. It defends remote possessions and trade by offensive action against the fleet, in which it sees their real enemy and its own principal objective. Being near the home ports, the relief and renewal of ships needing repairs are accomplished with the least loss of time, while the demands upon the scantier resources of the bases abroad are lessened. The other policy, to be effective, calls for superior numbers, because the different divisions are too far apart for mutual support. Each must therefore be equal to any probable combination against it, which implies superiority everywhere to the force of the enemy actually opposed, as the latter may be unexpectedly reinforced. How impossible and dangerous such a defensive strategy is, when not superior in force, is shown by the frequent inferiority of the English abroad, as well as in Europe, despite the effort to be everywhere equal. How at New York in 1778, Byron at Granada in 1779, Graves off the Chesapeake in 1781, Hood at Martinique in 1781 and at St. Kitts in 1782, all were inferior, 
at the same time that the Allied fleet in Europe overwhelmingly outnumbered the English. In consequence, unseaworthy ships were retained, to the danger of their crews and their own increasing injury, rather than diminish the force by sending them home. For the deficiencies of the colonial dockyards did not allow extensive repairs without crossing the Atlantic. As regards the comparative expense of the two strategies, the question is not only which would cost the more in the same time, but which would most tend to shorten the war by the effectiveness of its action. The military policy of the Allies is open to severer condemnation than that of England, by so much as the party assuming the offensive has by that very fact an advantage over the defensive. When the initial difficulty of combining their forces was overcome, and it has been seen that at no time did Great Britain seriously embarrass their junction, the Allies had the choice open to them where, when, and how to strike with their superior numbers. How did they avail themselves of this recognized enormous advantage? By nibbling at the outskirts of the British Empire, and knocking their heads against the Rock of Gibraltar. The most serious military effort made by France, in sending to the United States a squadron and division of troops intended to be double the number of those which actually reached their destination, resulted, in little over a year. In opening the eyes of England to the hopelessness of the contest with the colonies and thus put an end to a diversion of her strength which had been most beneficial to her opponents. In the West Indies one petty island after another was reduced, generally in the absence of the English fleet, with an ease which showed how completely the whole question would have been solved by a decisive victory over that fleet. But the French, though favoured with many opportunities, never sought to slip the knot by the simple method of attacking the force upon which all depended. Spain went her own way in the Floridas, and with an overwhelming force obtained successes of no military value. In Europe the plan adopted by the English government left its naval force hopelessly inferior in numbers year after year. Yet the operations planned by the Allies seem in no case seriously to have contemplated the destruction of that force. In the crucial instance, when Derby's squadron of 30 sail of the line was hemmed in the open roadstead of Torbay by the Allied 49. The conclusion of the Council of War not to fight only epitomized the character of the action of the combined navies. To further embarrass their exertions in Europe, Spain, during long periods, obstinately persisted in tying down her fleet to the neighborhood of Gibraltar. But there was at no time practical recognition of the fact that a severe blow to the English navy in the Straits, or in the English Channel, or on the open sea, was the surest road to reduce the fortress. Brought more than once within measurable distance of starvation. In the conduct of their offensive war the Allied courts suffered from the divergent councils and jealousies which have hampered the movements of most naval coalitions. The conduct of Spain appears to have been selfish almost to disloyalty, that of France more faithful, and therefore also militarily sounder. For hearty cooperation and concerted action against a common objective, wisely chosen, would have better forwarded the objects of both. It must be admitted, too, that the indications point to inefficient administration and preparation on the part of the Allies, of Spain especially, and that the quality of the personnel was inferior to that of England. Questions of preparation and administration, however, though of deep military interest and importance, are very different from the strategic plan or method adopted by the Allied courts in selecting and attacking their objectives. And so compassing the objects of the war. And their examination would not only extend this discussion unreasonably, but would also obscure the strategic question by heaping up unnecessary details foreign to its subject. As regards the strategic question, it may be said pithily that the phrase, ulterior objects, embodies the cardinal fault of the naval policy. Ulterior objects brought to naught the hopes of the Allies, because, by fastening their eyes upon them, they thoughtlessly passed the road which led to them. Desire eagerly directed upon the ends in view, or rather upon the partial, though great, advantages which they constituted their ends, blinded them to the means by which alone they could be surely attained. Hence, as the result of the war, everywhere failure to attain them. To quote again the summary before given, their object was, to avenge their respective injuries, and to put an end to that tyrannical empire which England claims to maintain upon the ocean. The revenge they had obtained was barren of benefit to themselves. They had, so that generation thought, 
injured England by liberating America. But they had not righted their wrongs in Gibraltar and Jamaica, the English fleet had not received any such treatment as would lessen its haughty self-reliance, the armed neutrality of the northern powers had been allowed to pass fruitlessly away. And the English empire over the seas soon became as tyrannical and more absolute than before. Barring questions of preparation and administration, of the fighting quality of the Allied fleets as compared with the English, and looking only to the indisputable fact of largely superior numbers. It must be noted as the supreme factor in the military conduct of the war, that, while the Allied powers were on the offensive and England on the defensive, the attitude of the Allied fleets in presence of the English navy was habitually defensive. Neither in the greater strategic combinations, nor upon the battlefield, does there appear any serious purpose of using superior numbers to crush fractions of the enemy's fleet, to make the disparity of numbers yet greater. To put an end to the empire of the seas by the destruction of the organized force which sustained it. With the single brilliant exception of Suffren, the Allied navies avoided or accepted action, they never imposed it. Yet so long as the English navy was permitted thus with impunity to range the seas, not only was there no security that it would not frustrate the ulterior objects of the campaign, as it did again and again. But there was always the possibility that by some happy chance it would, by winning an important victory, restore the balance of strength. That it did not do so is to be imputed as a fault to the English ministry. But if England was wrong in permitting her European fleet to fall so far below that of the Allies, the latter were yet more to blame for their failure to profit by the mistake. The stronger party, assuming the offensive, cannot plead the perplexities which account for, though they do not justify, the undue dispersal of forces by the defense anxious about many points. The national bias of the French, which found expression in the line of action here again and for the last time criticized, appears to have been shared by both the government and the naval officers of the day. It is the key to the course of the French navy, and, in the opinion of the author, to its failure to achieve more substantial results to France from this war. It is instructive, as showing how strong a whole tradition has over the minds of men, that a body of highly accomplished and gallant seamen should have accepted, apparently without a murmur, so inferior a role for their noble profession. It carries also a warning, if these criticisms are correct, that current opinions and plausible impressions should always be thoroughly tested, for if erroneous they work sure failure, and perhaps disaster. There was such an impression largely held by French officers of that day, and yet more widely spread in the United States now, of the efficacy of commerce destroying as a main reliance in war. Especially when directed against a commercial country like Great Britain. The surest means in my opinion, wrote a distinguished officer, Lamont Piquet, to conquer the English is to attack them in their commerce. The harassment and distress caused to a country by serious interference with its commerce will be conceded by all. It is doubtless a most important secondary operation of naval war, and is not likely to be abandoned till war itself shall cease. But regarded as a primary and fundamental measure, sufficient in itself to crush an enemy, it is probably a delusion, and a most dangerous delusion, when presented in the fascinating garb of cheapness to the representatives of a people. Especially is it misleading when the nation against whom it is to be directed possesses, as Great Britain did and does, the two requisites of a strong sea power, a widespread healthy commerce and a powerful navy. Where the revenues and industries of a country can be concentrated into a few treasure ships, like the flotta of Spanish galleons, the sinew of war may perhaps be cut by a stroke. But when its wealth is scattered in thousands of going and coming ships, when the roots of the system spread wide and far, and strike deep, it can stand many a cruel shock and lose many a goodly bow without the life being touched. Only by military command of the sea by prolonged control of the strategic centers of commerce, can such an attack be fatal, and such control can be wrung from a powerful navy only by fighting and overcoming it. For two hundred years England has been the great commercial nation of the world. More than any other her wealth has been entrusted to the sea in war as in peace. Yet of all nations she has ever been most reluctant to concede the immunities of commerce and the rights of neutrals. Regarded not as a matter of right, but of policy, history has justified the refusal. And if she maintain her navy in full strength, the future will doubtless repeat the lesson of the past. 
The preliminaries of the peace between Great Britain and the Allied courts, which brought to an end this great war, were signed at Versailles, January 20, 1783. An arrangement having been concluded between Great Britain and the American commissioners two months before, by which the independence of the United States was conceded. This was the great outcome of the war. As between the European belligerents, Great Britain received back from France all the West India Islands she had lost, except Tobago, and gave up Sta. Lucia. The French stations in India were restored. And Trincomalee being in the possession of the enemy, England could not dispute its return to Holland, but she refused to cede Negapatam. To Spain, England surrendered the two Floridas and Menorca, the latter a serious loss had the naval power of Spain been sufficient to maintain possession of it, as it was, it again fell into the hands of Great Britain in the next war. Some unimportant redistribution of trading posts on the west coast of Africa was also made. Trivial in themselves, there is but one comment that need be made upon these arrangements. In any coming war their permanency would depend wholly upon the balance of sea power, upon that empire of the seas concerning which nothing conclusive had been established by the war. The definitive treaties of peace were signed at Versailles, September 3, 1783. Footnotes Julien de la Gravier, Guerres Maritimes, Volume 2. Page 255. See Map of the Atlantic Ocean, page 532. It may be said here in passing, that the key to the English possessions in what was then called West Florida was at Pensacola and Mobile, which depended upon Jamaica for support. The conditions of the country, of navigation, and of the general continental war forbidding assistance from the Atlantic. The English force, military and naval, at Jamaica was only adequate to the defense of the island and of trade, and could not afford sufficient relief to Florida. The capture of the latter and of the Bahamas was effected with little difficulty by overwhelming Spanish forces, as many as fifteen ships of the line and seven thousand troops having been employed against Pensacola. These events will receive no other mention. Their only bearing upon the general war was the diversion of this imposing force from joint operations with the French, Spain here, as at Gibraltar, pursuing her own aims instead of concentrating upon the common enemy. A policy as short-sighted as it was selfish. In other words, having considered the objects for which the belligerents were at war and the proper objectives upon which their military efforts should have been directed to compass the objects. The discussion now considers how the military forces should have been handled. By what means and at what point the objective, being mobile, should have been assailed. Orders of Admiral Villeneuve to the captains of his fleet, December 20, 1804. Letter of Villeneuve, January, 1805. Letters and Dispatches of Lord Nelson. Life and Letters of Lord Collingwood. Burroughs, Life of Lord Hawke. Of this Rodney said, the evacuating Rhode Island was the most fatal measure that could possibly be adopted. It gave up the best and noblest harbor in America, from whence squadrons, in 48 hours, could blockade the three capital cities of America, namely, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. The whole letter, private to the First Lord of the Admiralty, is worth reading. Life of Rodney, Volume 2. Page 429. The loss of Sta. Lucia does not militate against this statement, being due to happy audacity and skill on the part of the English admiral, and the professional incapacity of the commander of the greatly superior French fleet. The plan of campaign traced by the Directory for Bruix became impossible of execution, the delay in the junction of the French and Spanish squadrons having permitted England to concentrate sixty ships in the Mediterranean. Troud, Volume 3. Page 158. The combined squadrons of France and Spain, under Bruix, reached Brest on their return only twenty-four hours before Lord Keith, who had followed them from the Mediterranean. James, Naval History of Great Britain The high professional attainments of many of the French officers is not overlooked in this statement. The quality of the personnel was diluted by an inferior element, owing to the insufficient number of good men. The personnel of our crews had been seriously affected by the events of the campaign of 1779. 
At the beginning of 1780 it was necessary either to disarm some ships, or to increase the proportion of soldiers entering into the composition of the crews. The minister adopted the latter alternative. New regiments, drawn from the land army, were put at the disposal of the navy. The corps of officers, far from numerous at the beginning of hostilities, had become completely inadequate. Rear Admiral de Goechen met the greatest difficulty in forming the complements, both officers and crews, for his squadron. He took the sea, February 3, with ships badly manned, as he wrote to the minister. Chevalier, hissed. De la Marine Francaise, page 184. During the last war, of 1778, we had met the greatest difficulty in supplying officers to our ships. If it had been easy to name admirals, commodores, and captains, it had been impossible to fill the vacancies caused by death, sickness, or promotion among officers of the rank of lieutenant and ensign. Chevalier, Marine Francaise sous la République, page 20. The vital center of English commerce is in the waters surrounding the British islands. And as the United Kingdom now depends largely upon external sources of food supply, it follows that France is the nation most favorably situated to harass it by commerce destroying. On account of her nearness and her possession of ports both on the Atlantic and the North Sea. From these issued the privateers which in the past preyed upon English shipping. The position is stronger now than formerly, Cherbourg presenting a good channel port which France lacked in the old wars. On the other hand steam and railroads have made the ports on the northern coasts of the United Kingdom more available, and British shipping need not, as formerly, focus about the channel. Much importance has been attached to the captures made during the late summer maneuvers, 1888, by cruisers in and near the English Channel. The United States must remember that such cruisers were near their home ports. Their line of coal supply may have been 200 miles, it would be a very different thing to maintain them in activity 3,000 miles from home. The furnishing of coal, or of such facilities as cleaning the bottom or necessary repairs, in such a case, would be so unfriendly to Great Britain, that it may well be doubted if any neighboring neutral nation would allow them. Commerce destroying by independent cruisers depends upon wide dissemination of force. Commerce destroying through control of a strategic center by a great fleet depends upon concentration of force. Regarded as a primary, not as a secondary, operation, the former is condemned, the latter justified, by the experience of centuries. Index Alberoni, Cardinal, Minister to Philip V, of Spain Naval and general policy of Failure of his schemes Dismissed Anson, British Admiral, Expedition to the Pacific Captures a French squadron Arbuthnet, British Admiral, Engagement with French fleet off the Chesapeake Armed neutrality, the, of the Baltic powers Arnold, Benedict, Treason of Expedition to James River Barbados, strategic value of. Ineffectual attempt of the French against. Barrington, British Admiral, energy of. Takes Sta Lucia and resists an attack by superior French fleet. Second in command at Battle of Granada. Refuses the command of the Channel Fleet. A Whig in politics. Battles, land, Austerlitz. Blenheim. Boyne. Camden. Ciudad Rodrigo, storming of, note. Jena. Matoris. Plassey. Savannah, assault on. Yorktown, capitulation of. Battles, naval, the list of the principal naval battles, with plans, will be found on pages 23, 24. Actium. Augusta. Boscoen and de la Clue. Bing off Menorca. Plan. Cape Passaro. Chesapeake. Copenhagen. La Hogue. Plan. La Pinto. Lowestoft. Malaga. Mobile. Navarino, note. New Orleans. Nile. Pocock and Datch. Plan. Port Hudson. Rio de Janeiro. Expedition against. 
Rodney and Langara, and note. Sconevelt. Sta Lucia. St. Vincent, note. Plan. Suffren and Hughes, fifth action. Trafalgar, note. Vigo Galleons. Benbow, British Admiral. Sent to West Indies. Treason of his captains. Killed in battle. Bickerton, British Admiral. Conducts a powerful convoy to the East Indies. Arrived in India. Activity of. Effects of arrival of. Blaine, Sir Gilbert, physician to British fleet, letters of, note. Blockade. Of French ports by English fleets, note, and note. Of southern coast of United States, note. Napoleon forces England to. With consequent effect on American privateering. Definition of efficient. Dangers to United States from. Offensive and defensive use of, note. Declaration of the armed neutrality concerning. Position taken off an enemy's port not necessarily a blockade in strict sense of the word. Boscawen, British Admiral. Expedition to India, failure of. Intercepts French ships off the sea. Lawrence. Takes Louisbourg. Disperses or destroys French fleet from Toulon. Burgoyne, British General. Expedition from Canada. Effect of his surrender. Bussy, French general. Second to duplex in India. Intrigues with Nabob of Bengal. Invades Orissa. Again sent to India during American Revolution. Delayed en route. Reaches India. Besieged in Kudlore by the English. Relieved by Suffren. Bing, Sir George, British Admiral. Sent to Mediterranean. Destroys Spanish fleet at Cape Passaro. Policy at Messina. Bing, John, British Admiral. Sails to relieve Port Mahone. Action with the French fleet. Returns to Gibraltar, is relieved, tried. And shot. Byron, British Admiral. Commander-in-Chief at Battle of Granada. Cape of Good Hope. A halfway naval station. Discovery of passage round. Acquired by Holland. Acquired by England during the Napoleonic Wars. English expedition against. Saved by Suffren. Utility to France. Suffren's reception at. Carlos III. King of the Two Sicilies. Enters into Bourbon family compact. Forced to withdraw his troops by a British Commodore. Succeeds to the Spanish throne. Enters into secret alliance with France. Losses in Seven Years' War. Again enters alliance with France against England. Charles, Archduke. Claimant to Spanish throne as Carlos III. Lands at Lisbon. Lands in Catalonia and takes Barcelona. Takes and loses Madrid. Antipathy of Spaniards to. Inherits Empire of Austria and elected Emperor Charles VI. Of Germany. Makes, as King of Spain, secret commercial treaty with England. Discontented with Treaty of Utrecht. Renounces claim to Spanish throne. Joins Quadruple Alliance. Obtains Naples and Sicily. Loses Naples and Sicily. Dies, leaving no son. Succeeded by Maria Theresa. Charles II, naval policy of. Restoration of. Political motives. Seeds Dunkirk. Policy of commerce destroying. Bargains with Louis XIV. Declares war against Holland. Makes peace with Holland. Forms alliance with Holland. Dies. Choiseau, minister to Louis XV. Plans for invading England and Scotland. Makes close alliance with Spain. Policy after seven years war. Naval reforms. Supports Spain in dispute with England over the Falkland Islands. Dismissed. Clerk, John. Work on naval tactics, and note. Clinton, Sir Henry, British General. 
Expedition up the Hudson. Commander-in-Chief in America. Opinions as to influence of sea power. Sends detachments to the Chesapeake. Directs Cornwallis to occupy Yorktown. Outwitted by Washington and Rochambeau. Clive, Robert, afterward Lord. Letter of. Note. Indian career begins. Retakes Calcutta. Defeats Nabob of Bengal, takes Shandernagore, and wins Battle of Plassey. Reduces Bengal. Colbert. Becomes minister under Louis XIV. Commercial and naval policy. Thwarted by the king. His trust in the resources of France. Collingwood, British admiral. Leads a column at Trafalgar. His conduct at Battle of Cape St. Vincent. Reverses Nelson's orders after his death. Loss in his ship at Trafalgar, note. Blockading duty off French coast, letters. Colonies. Origin of. Character of. Effect on England of. Weakness of Spain through. Effect of national character on. Growth of English colonial system. Colbert's policy. Navy essential to security of. Support to sea power by. Dutch. New York and New Jersey seized by English. Loss of French colonies. Loss of Spanish colonies. French colonial policy. Spanish colonial policy. Colonial expansion the characteristic motive of the wars from 1739 to 1783. Value of smaller West India Islands. The English in India. Vernon's and Anson's expedition against Spanish. Florida and the Bahamas recovered by Spain, note. British North American, character of. Extension over all the continent east of the Mississippi. Quarrel with mother country. Military situation of. Alliance with France. Effect of sea power upon their struggle. Object of. Policy of France in their struggle. Distribution of colonial possessions at Peace of 1783. Commander-in-Chief. Position of a naval, in battle. Question raised by action of the Due de Chartres. Illustrated by practice of Howe, Nelson, Farragut. Orders of French government. Commerce. Attempts to control by force. Trade routes. Water carriage easier and cheaper than land. Advantages of rivers and inlets to Secure seaports and a navy necessary to security of The basis of a healthy navy War upon, sea commerce destroying Influence of Baltic trade upon sea power Effect of Central American Canal on Effect of physical conditions on Decay of Spanish Effect of national character on Solicitude of English government concerning The Navigation Act Influence of the wealth of England on history Commercial spirit of the Dutch Colbert's policy for developing Decay of French, under Louis XIV Improvement of French, under Louis XV Government influence on Dangers to United States, by blockades Commercial policy of United States French, in 1660. Dutch, in 1660. Rivalry of English and Dutch. Leibniz's proposition to Louis XIV. To seize Egypt. Influence of Dutch wealth. Sufferings of Dutch. Gains to English, by policy of Louis XIV. Effect of injury to, in hastening war. Bearing of, upon war of Spanish succession. Methuen Treaty of, with Portugal. Concession to England of the Asiento, or slave trade. Growth of English, during 18th century. Secret Treaty of, made with England by claimant to Spanish throne. Decay of Dutch, in early part of 18th century. English, contraband with Spanish America. Sufferings of, 1740 to 1748. Sufferings of, 1756 to 1763. Prosperity of English commerce, 
1756-1763. Effect of commercial interests on the results at Yorktown. Great Center of English, Note. Policy of Great Britain as to neutral. Commerce destroying, cruising warfare. A strategic question. Dependence on geographical position. Diffusion of effort. Disadvantageous position of United States, note. Spanish treasure ships. English and Dutch commerce defy. Charles II. Resorts to it as a substitute for great fleets. Disastrous results. Discussion of, as a principal mode of warfare. Dependent upon a near base or upon powerful fleets. Illustrations, 1652-1783. Injurious reaction on the nation relying upon it. Illustrations. Mistaken conclusions drawn from American privateering in 1812, and from the Confederate cruisers. Effect of great navies. Illustrations, after Battle of Sol Bay. After Battle of Texel. Decline of Dutch Navy and consequent increase of commerce destroying by French privateers. In the War of 1689-1697, Discussion. In the War of 1702-1713. In War of 1739-1748. In Seven Years' War, Discussion, Note. In American Revolution, and Note, and Note. French Privateering. Peculiar Character of French Privateering, 1689-1713. Conflans, French Admiral. Commands fleet intended for invasion of England. Sails from Brest. Encounters Hawk and is defeated by him. Cornwallis, British General. Wins Battle of Camden. Overrun Southern States. Marches into Virginia. Takes position at Yorktown. Surrounded by enemies. Capitulates. Cornwallis, Captain British Navy. Gallant conduct in Hood's action at St. Christopher. Corsica. Island of, naturally Italian. A dependency of Genoa. Genoa cedes fortified harbors to France. Whole island ceded to France. Strategic value. Cromwell, Oliver. Naval policy of. Issues Navigation Act. Condition of Navy under. Takes Jamaica. Takes Dunkirk. Datch, French Commodore. Reaches India. First and Second Battles with Pocock. Ill will to the French Governor, Lally. Goes to the Isle of France. Return to the Peninsula, and Third Battle with Pocock. Abandons the Peninsula. De Barris, French Commodore. Commands French squadron at Newport, and takes part in operations against Cornwallis. De La Clue, French Commodore. Sails from Toulon to join Brest Fleet. Encounters and beaten by Boscoen. D'Estaing, French Admiral. Transferred from the Army to the Navy. Long passage from Toulon to the Delaware. Fails to attack the British fleet in New York. Runs British batteries at Newport. Sails in pursuit of House Fleet, and receives injuries in a gale. Goes to Boston. Foiled by Howe on all points. Goes to West Indies. Failure at Estier Lucia. Capture of St. Vincent and Granada. Action with Byron's fleet. Professional character. Ineffectual assault on Savannah. Return to France. Destries, French Admiral. Commands French contingent to the Allied fleet at Sol Bay. At Sconevelt. At the Texel. Equivocal action at the Battle of the Texel. Notice of. De Grasse, French Admiral. Sails from Brest for West Indies. Partial action with Hood off Martinique. Takes Tobago, and goes thence to San Domingo. Determines to go to Chesapeake Bay. Thoroughness of his action. Anchors in Linhaven Bay. Skillful management when opposed by graves. Share in results at Yorktown. Declines to remain longer in the United States. 
return to West Indies, and expedition against St. Kitts Island. Outgeneraled by Hood. Criticisms upon his actions. Return to Martinique. In command of combined fleet in expedition against Jamaica. Sails from Martinique. Partial action of April 9, 1782. Battle of the Saints. Surrenders with his flagship. Later career and death. Findings of the court martial on. De Guichin, French Admiral. Wary tactics of. Takes command in West Indies. Actions with Rodney. Returns to France. Chief command of Allied fleets in Europe. Abortive action at Torbay, and note. Injuries to convoy under his care. Rodney's opinion of. Difficulty in manning his fleet, note. Dorvilliers, French Admiral. Instructions to. Appointed to command Brest Fleet. Commander-in-Chief at Battle of Ushant. Commands Allied fleets in English Channel, 1779, and note. Retires from the Navy. De Ryans, Dalbert, Captain in French Navy. Leads in the attack on Hood's position at St. Kitts. Suffren's opinion of. Gallantry at time of de Grasse's defeat, note. De Tournay, French Commodore. Commands fleet which convoys Rochambeau to America. Position occupied in Newport. Washington's Memorandum to. De Vaudrill, French Commodore. Second in command to de Grasse. Conducts partial attack of April 9, 1782. Assumes command after de Grasse's capture. Derby, British Admiral. Relieves Gibraltar, note. Retreats before superior Allied fleet. Destouches, French Commodore. Engagement with English fleet off the Chesapeake. Douglas, Sir Charles, Captain British Navy. Chief of Staff to Rodney, note. Letters of, and note. Credit of breaking French line claimed for. Opinion as to Rodney's failure to pursue his success. Du Bois, Cardinal. Minister of Philippe d'Orleans. His policy. Death. Du Gay Truin, French privateer. Expedition against Rio de Janeiro. Duplex. Advances the power of France in India. His ambition and policy. Problem before him in India. Foiled by lack of sea power. Quarrel with La Bourdonnaise. Seizes Madras. Successful defense of Pondicherry. Extends his power in the peninsula. Is recalled to France. Duquesne, French admiral. Compares French and Dutch officers. Commands at Battle of Stromboli. Tactics of. Commands at Battle of Augusta. Egypt. Napoleon's expedition to. Leibniz proposes to Louis XIV. To seize. Commanding commercial and strategic position of. Occupation of, by England. Importance of, to India. Elliot, British general. Commands at Gibraltar during the Great Siege. England, sea under colonies, commerce, commerce destroying, geographical position, government, inhabitants, character and number of, naval policy, naval tactics, sea power, strategy. Extent of territory. Its effect upon the sea power of a country. Falkland Islands. Dispute concerning. Farragut, American Admiral. At Mobile. At Port Hudson. At New Orleans. Practice of, as to his position in order of battle. Fleury, Cardinal. Minister of Louis XV. Peace Policy. Commercial expansion of France under. Accord with Walpole. Policy, continental rather than maritime. Supports claimant to Polish throne. Arranges Bourbon family compact with Spain. Acquires Bar and Lorraine for France. Allows the navy to decay. Death. France. See under colonies, commerce, commerce destroying, geographical. Position. Government, inhabitants, 
character, and number of naval. Policy, naval tactics, sea power, strategy. Frederick, King of Prussia. Seizes Silesia. Silesia ceded to. Open Seven Years' War. Desperate struggle of. Losses in the war. Results of the war to. Partition of Poland. Gardiner's Bay, Long Island. Useful as a base of operations to an enemy of the United States. Station of English Fleet. Geographical position. Its effect upon the sea power of countries. Gibraltar. Strategic question. Taken by Rook. Strategic value. Value to England. Offers to restore to Spain. Attacks on. Siege of. Government. Character and policy of, effect upon the sea power of countries. English. Dutch. French. United States. Graves, British Admiral. Commanding in New York, sails to relieve Cornwallis. Outmaneuvered by de Grasse. Criticisms on. Graves, British Captain, afterward Admiral. Urges Rodney to attack French squadron anchored in Newport. Second to Nelson at Copenhagen, note. Blockading on French coast. Great Britain. See England. Hannibal. See Second Punic War. Havana. Strategic value of. Taken by the English. Restored at Peace of Paris. Hawk, Sir Edward, afterward Lord, British Admiral. Distinguishes himself at the Battle of Toulon. Captures a French squadron. Seizes French shipping in the Atlantic. Relieves Bing in the Mediterranean. Blockade of Brest. Brilliant action in Quiberon Bay. Maxim as to strength of English fleet. Henry IV, of France. Policy of. Herbert, British Admiral. Commands Allied English and Dutch fleets at Battle of Beachy Head. Holland. Sea under colonies, commerce, commerce destroying. Geographical position, government, inhabitants, character, and number. Of, naval policy, naval tactics, routers, sea power, strategy. Hood, Sir Samuel, afterward Lord, British Admiral. Trade of subordination in, note. Action with de Grasse off Martinique. Sent by Rodney to America with fourteen ships. Second in command in action off Chesapeake. Temporary chief command in West Indies. Brilliant action at St. Christopher's Island. Junction with Rodney. Partial action of April 9, 1782. At Battle of the Saints. De Grasse's flagship strikes to his. Opinion as to Rodney's failure to pursue his advantage. Captures four French ships. Later career and death. Host, Paul. Work on naval tactics. How, Lord, British Admiral. Naval policy of. At Philadelphia. At New York. At Newport. Energy and skill of. Commands Channel Fleet. Relieves Gibraltar. A Whig in politics. Opinion as to blockades. How, Sir William, British General. Commander-in-Chief in America. Expedition to the Chesapeake. Indolence of. Hughes, Sir Edward, British Admiral. Arrives in India. Takes Negapatam and Trincomalee. First meeting with Suffren. Task in India. First battle with Suffren Squadron. Second battle with Suffren. Contemporary criticisms on. Third Battle with Suffren. Tactics of. Slowness of, loses Trincomalee. Fourth Battle with Suffren. Praise bestowed by, upon his captains. Goes to Bombay from Coromandel Coast. Returns to Madras. Supports English Siege of Kudlor. Fifth Battle with Suffren. Abandons the field. Death. Hyder Ali, Sultan of Mysore. War upon the English. 
Denied the aid of the French squadron. Suffren communicates with. Visited by Suffren. Negotiations of Suffren with. Death of. Inhabitants, character of. Effect upon the sea power of a country. Inhabitants, number of. Effect upon the sea power of a country, reserve strength. Italy. Geographical position of. Physical conformation of. Necessity for a navy. Sicilian revolt against Spain, 1674. Spanish possessions in, 1700. Sardinia taken by Allied fleets. Disposition of Spanish provinces in, at peace of 1713. Sicily transferred to Austria, and Sardinia to House of Savoy, 1719. Spanish expedition into. Foundation of Bourbon Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Spanish operations against Austria, 1741. King of Naples forced to withdraw troops from Spanish army by English fleet. Disposition of provinces of, at peace of 1748. Transfer of Corsica to France by Genoa. Acquisition of Malta by England. Jamaica. Taken by English, under Cromwell. Wish of Spain to recover. Strategic value of. Combined expedition against. Frustrated by Rodney's victory over de Grasse. Rodney repairs to, after his victory. James II. A seaman by profession. Commands at Battle of Lowestoft, as Duke of York. Commands at the Battle of Sol Bay. Deprived of the command. Succeeds to the throne. Interest in the navy. Flight from England. Lands in Ireland. Defeated at the Boyne. At Cape La Hook. Death. Jenkins. Captain of a merchant brig, the story of his ears. Jervis, Sir John, afterward Earl St. Vincent, British Admiral. Naval policy of. Tactics at Cape St. Vincent, note. Testimony at Keppel's court martial. John Stone, British Commodore. Sales for Cape of Good Hope. Commissioner to American Congress, note. Attacked by Suffren at the Cape Verde Islands. Anticipated by Suffren at the Cape. Returns unsuccessful to England. Kempenfelt, British Admiral. Cuts off part of de Guachin's convoy. Keppel, Lord, British Admiral. Appointed to command Channel Fleet. Battle of Ushant. Head of Admiralty and disapproves Treaty of Peace. A Whig in politics. King, British Commodore. Stubborn defense of the Exeter. Visit Suffren at the Cape of Good Hope. La Bourdonnaise. Governor of the Isle of France. His active administration. Prepares to attack English commerce in the East Indies. Takes and ransoms Madras, quarrels with Duplex, squadron wrecked, returns to France, and dies. Letendwer, French Commodore. Brilliant defense of. Lafayette, Marquis de. Arrival in America. Operations in Virginia. Expressions of Washington to, as to necessity of naval help. Associations of his name to Americans. La Galissonier, French Admiral. Commands the fleet in the expedition to Menorca. Defeats Bing's attempt to relieve Port Mahon. Lally, French Governor of India. Reaches India. Quarrels with Commodore Datch. Takes Fort Asti. David. Besieges Madras, but fails. Fall of French power under. Langara, Spanish Admiral. Defeated and captured by Rodney. Action at Toulon in 1793. Leibniz. Proposes to Louis XIV. The occupation of Egypt. Louis XIV. Growth of French navy under. Enmity to Holland. Policy of. Naval policy of. Assumes personal government. Initiates general wars. Condition of France at accession of. Commercial policy of. Aggressions of. 
Declares war against Holland. Campaign in Holland. Evacuates Holland. Sicilian episode. Peace with Holland. Declares war against Germany. Against Holland. Supports invasion of Ireland. Plans invasion of England. Concessions by, at peace of Ryswick. Effect of policy of, on sea power. Accepts bequest of Spanish throne to his grandson. Reduced to extremities in war of Spanish succession. Humiliating concessions at peace of Utrecht. Exhaustion of France under. Privateering under. Death of. Louis XV. Ascends throne. Condition of French commerce under. Condition of French navy. Restoration of the navy. Defensive alliance with Spain. Offensive alliance with Spain. Death. Louis XVI. Begins to reign. Naval policy of. General policy of. Treaty with the United States. Breach with England. Louisbourg, Cape Breton Island. Strategic importance of. Retained by France at Peace of Utrecht. Taken by New England colonists. Restored to France at Peace of Aix La Chapelle. Taken by Boscoan. Madras. Capital of a British presidency in India. Taken by French. Exchanged for Louisbourg at Peace of 1748. Besieged by French in 1759. Danger from Hyder Ali in 1780. Principal British naval station during the struggle. 1781 to 1783. Danger of roadstead, in northeast monsoon. Marathas, the. Position in India of, and war with English. Peace with the English. Maria Theresa. Ascends Austrian throne. War with Prussia, France, and Spain. War with Prussia, in alliance with France and Russia. Martinique, French West India Island. Base for commerce destroying. Taken by the English. Effects of this conquest. Restored to France at Peace of Paris. Principal base of French Navy in West Indies. Actions near. Strategic position of. Matthews, British Admiral. Commander-in-chief in the Mediterranean and Minister to Sardinia. Action with combined French and Spanish fleets. Court-martialed and cashiered. Mazarin, Cardinal. Policy of. Death. Mediterranean Sea. Control of, influence on Second Punic War. Strategic points in. Advantage of strategic study of. Analogy to Caribbean Sea. Increase of English power in. Austria established in. Sardinia given to House of Savoy. Foundation of Bourbon Kingdom of Two Sicilies. Strengthens France in. English Navy in. France acquires Corsica. England loses Menorca in American Revolution. Monk, British General and Admiral. Saying about Dutch trade. Commands English fleet in the Four Days Battle. Tactics of. Merits of. Opposition to laying up the heavy ships. Death. Morogues, Bigot de. Work on naval tactics. Napoleon I. Recommends study of military history. Egyptian expedition. Trafalgar campaign, note. Favorite objective. Naval policy. Influence of French Navy on American privateering in 1812. Naval policy. Value of reserve force. Colonial. In peace. In war. Soldiers commanding ships. Commerce destroying and privateering, see Commerce destroying, Bourbon Family Compact. Significance of the wars from 1739 to 1783. Dutch. English. French, and note. Maritime inscription. Leibniz's proposition to Louis XIV. Italian. Spanish, note. United States, note. Naval tactics. 
unsettled condition of modern qualities of galleys, steamers, and sailing ships. Windward and leeward positions. Change of, from age to age. Fire ships. Torpedo cruisers. Group formation. Close hauled line of battle. Breaking the line. Refusing the van. Concentration by defiling. Concentration by doubling. General chase with melee. French, in 18th century, and note. English, in 18th century, and note. Monks. Rooters. Duquesnes. Herberts. Tourvilles. Rooks. Bings. Hawks. Keppels and Dorvilliers. Barringtons. Byrons. Destangs. Rodneys. De Grasses. Arbuthnet and De Stuchesses. Graves. Suffrens. Hoods. Clerks work on. Hosts work on. Morogues work on. Position of commander in chief in battle. Effect on, of changes in naval material, note, note. Navies, condition of. British, under Cromwell. Under Charles II. Character of vessels, 1660. Qualities of officers, 1660. Decline of, under Charles II. Improvement of, by James II. Numbers in 1691. Deterioration under William III. Improvement under Anne. Numbers and condition of, in 1727, 1734, and 1744. Inefficiency of officers, 1744. Numbers of, 1756 to 1763. Numbers of, in 1778. Professional skill of officers in American Revolution, and note. Administration of. Dutch, prior to 1660. Character of ships. Professional qualities of officers. Duquesne's estimate of Dutch officers. Decline of, after 1675. Decline of, during War of Spanish Succession. Practical disappearance of, after 1713. French. Numbers in 1661. Numbers in 1666. Numbers, 1683 to 1690. Administration of, 1660 to 1695. Condition of, at end of Louis XIV's reign. Character of vessels in 1660. Professional qualities of officers in 17th and 18th centuries. Decay in number and condition, 1713 to 1760. Revival of, 1760. Numbers of, in 1761 and 1770. Discipline during War of 1778. Numbers in 1778. Superior to British in size and batteries of ships. Professional skill of officers, note. Administration of, and note. Numbers of, in 1791. Numbers of, in 1814. Spanish, condition of, anterior to 1660. In 1675. Restoration by Alberoni. Destruction of ships at Cape Passaro and of dockyards. Numbers of, 1747. Numbers of, 1756. Numbers of, in 1761. Numbers of, in 1779. Superior to British in size and batteries of ships. Administration of, and note. Character of the personnel. Nelson, Horatio, afterward Lord, British Admiral. Tactics at the Battle of the Nile. Trafalgar Campaign, note. Tactics at Trafalgar. Enforces Navigation Act. Orders at Trafalgar. At Battle of Cape St. Vincent. Celebrated sayings of. Attachment of subordinates to. Position assumed by him in battle. Nile, Battle of the. Tactical principles. Strategic effect. French rear at. Nelson at. 
Optum, Dutch Admiral. Commands at Battle of Lowestoft and is killed. Orleans, Philippe D. Regent of France during minority of Louis XV. Insecurity of position. Concessions to England. Policy of. Alliance with England against Spain. Death. Peace. Aix La Chapelle, 1748. Breda, 1667. Nguyen, 1678. Nistad, 1721. Paris, 1763. Ryswick, 1697. Utrecht, 1713. Versailles, 1783. Philip, Duke of Anjou, afterward Philip V, of Spain. Spanish throne bequeathed to. War declared against, by England, Holland, and Germany. Loses Gibraltar. Besieges Gibraltar. Loses Barcelona and Catalonia. Driven from Madrid. Recovers all Spain, except Catalonia. Acknowledged King of Spain by Treaty of Utrecht. Deprived of Netherlands and Italian dependencies. Enmity to the Regent Orleans. Seizes Sardinia. Attacks Sicily. Brought to terms by France and the Sea Powers. Makes alliance with the Emperor Charles VI. Attacks Gibraltar. Physical conformation. Its effect upon the sea power of countries. Pitt, William. Dislike of George II. 2. Becomes Prime Minister. Policy of. Prosperity of commerce under. Offers to restore Gibraltar to Spain. Respect for Portuguese neutrality. Declines mediation of Spain. Waning of his influence. Purposes war against Spain. Resigns his office. His plans adopted by successors. Opposes the Peace of Paris. Effect of his policy on the history of England. Pocock, British Admiral. Commands British fleet in India and fights three battles with French fleet. Commands fleet in combined expedition against Havana. Port Mahon and Menorca. Lost to Spain frequently through maritime weakness. Ceded to England in 1713. Strategic importance of. French expedition against. Being defeated in his attempt to relieve. Surrender of, to France. Pitt's offer to exchange Gibraltar for. Restored to England at peace of 1763. Taken from England in 1782. Ceded to Spain in 1783. Again taken by England. Portugal. Decay in sea power and wealth. Cedes Bombay and Tangiers to England. Dependence on England. Methuen Treaty. Alliance with England and Holland, 1704. Advantage of, to England. French and Spaniards invade. England repels the invasion. Benevolent neutrality of colonial ports to England. Ramachuel. Work on naval tactics. Rhode Island. Occupied by the English in the American Revolution. Attack upon by French and Americans. English evacuate. French occupy. French position in. Strategic value of, note. Richelieu, Cardinal. Policy of. Alliance with Spain. Rochambeau, French general. Arrival in America. Dispatches to de Grasse. Consultation with Washington. Marches against Cornwallis. Rodney, Sir George B., afterward Lord, British Admiral. Command squadron in reduction of Martinique. Commander-in-chief in West Indies. Takes or disperses a Spanish squadron, and note. Personal and military character. Actions with de Guichin. Divides his fleet and goes to New York. Seizes Dutch West India Islands. Sends Hood with fourteen ships to New York, and returns to England. Returns to West Indies. Sails in chase of de Grasse. Action of April 9, 1782. Battle of April 12, 1782. 
criticism upon his tactics. Criticism upon his failure to pursue the beaten enemy. His successes. Rewards and death. Opinion as to evacuation of Rhode Island, note. Rook, Sir George, British Admiral. Relieves Londonderry. Burns French ships at Cape La Hook. Unsuccessful expedition against Cadiz. Destroys the galleons at Vigo Bay. Takes Gibraltar. Commands at the Battle of Malaga. Rupert, Prince. At Four Days Battle. Commands English fleet at Battles of Sconevelt and of the Texel. Russell, British Admiral. Commands Allied English and Dutch fleets in 1691. At Battle of La Hogue. Ruder, Dutch Admiral. Greatest naval officer of 17th century. Commands at Battle of the Four Days. Badly supported by his officers. Tactics of. Destroys English shipping in the Thames. Strategy of. Commands at the Battles of Sol Bay. Sconevelt. Texel. Military character. Sent to Mediterranean with inadequate force. Commands at Battle of Stromboli. Killed at Battle of Augusta. Sea power. A history of conflicts. Elements of. Affected by geographical position of countries. By physical conformation. By extent of territory. By number of population. By national character. By policy of government. Policy of England as to. Policy of Holland. Of France. Influence of colonies on, see also colonies. Weakness of the United States in. Dependent upon commerce, see also commerce. Strategic bearing, see also strategy. Policy of Richelieu. Spanish, in 1660. Dutch, in 1660. English, in 1860. Mistakes of Louis XIV. Colbert's measures. Effects of commerce destroying on, note. See also commerce destroying. Influence of, upon Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. Upon Second Punic War. Upon Third Anglo-Dutch War. Upon English Revolution. Upon France. Upon War of Spanish Succession. Upon Alberoni's ambitions. Upon Peter the Great. In India. Upon War of Austrian Succession. Upon Seven Years' War. Upon Portugal. At Peace of Paris. In remote and disordered countries. Upon British policy since 1763. Washington's opinions as to. American Revolution. Influence of, upon conditions of peace, 1783. Spain. Geographical position. Results of maritime weakness of. Dependence of finances upon treasure ships. Effect of national character upon sea power. Unity of aim with Austria. Policy of Richelieu toward. Condition of, in 1660. Condition of navy, in 1660. Aggressions of Louis XIV. On. Failure of the Austrian line of kings. Alliance with Holland and Germany against France. Revolt of Sicily against. Territory lost at Peace of Nijmegen. Joins League of Augsburg. Dependence upon Dutch and English fleets. Possessions in year 1700. Throne of, bequeathed to Philip, Duke of Anjou. War of the Succession. Bourbon line of kings established. Losses of territory at peace of 1713. Alberoni's ministry in. Grievances against England, 1720-1739. Conquers the two Sicilies in war of Polish succession. Family compact with France. War with England. Possessions in 1739. Peace of Aix la Chapelle. Lack of results from war with England. Enters Seven Years' War as the ally of France against England. Loss of colonies and treasures. Loss of possessions by Peace of Paris, 
1763. Political relations with France. Dispute with England over Falkland Islands. Objects in the War of 1779-1782. Rupture with England and alliance with France. Inefficiency of Navy, and Note. Policy in War of 1779, Note. Territorial gains by Peace of 1783. See also Colonies, Commerce, Naval Policy. Sta Lucia, West India Island. Taken by English. Ceded to France at Peace of Paris. Strong harbor and strategic position. Taken by Admiral Barrington, Note. Rodney watches de Grasse from. An advanced strategic position. Restored to France at Peace of 1783. Strategy. Permanence of its principles. Illustrations. Definition of naval. Trafalgar campaign, note. Bearing of geographical position on. Mediterranean and Caribbean seas. Bearing of physical conformation of coast on. Blockade of coast of Confederate states. Value of commerce destroying, see commerce destroying. Word, defense, two distinct ideas, note. Naval, of the British. Naval, of the Dutch. Naval, of the French, note. Features of War of Spanish Succession. Silent action of sea power. General military situation, in 1740. England in Seven Years' War. Mutual dependence of seaports and fleets. Value of colonies. Importance of coal, note, note. Military situation in America in 1777. General strategic situation in 1778. British difficulties in American Revolution. Suffren's naval. Situation in India. Hood's naval. Rodney's naval. Influence of trade winds and monsoons. Elements essential to all naval wars. Difficulty of procuring information at sea. General discussion of War of 1778. See also naval policy and sea power. Suffren, French Admiral. Criticism on Destang's conduct at Sta Lucia. Commands leading French ship in Destang's battle off Grenada. Criticism on Destang's conduct in the battle. Sales from Brest in company with de Grasse's fleet. Parts Company, off the Azores, for India. Orders to secure Cape of Good Hope. Action with British squadron at the Cape Verde Islands. Military discussion of his conduct. Arrival in India. Lack of seaports on which to base operations. First battle with squadron of Sir Edward Hughes. Tactics in the action. Estimate of the strategic situation in India. Second battle with Hughes. Tactics in it. Strategic action. Military character. Third battle with Hughes. Takes Trincomalee. Activity of. Fourth battle with Hughes. Wreck of two of squadron. Goes to Sumatra. Returns to Trincomalee. Relieves Cudlower besieged by the English. Fifth battle with Hughes. Conclusion of peace. Return to France. Rewards. Later career and death. Tourville, French Admiral. Commands at the Battle of Beachy Head. Sluggish pursuit of the enemy. Military character. Celebrated cruise in 1691. Commands at Battle of La Hogue. Tactics and brilliant defense at La Hogue. Destruction of French ships. Supports the army in Catalonia. Destroys or disperses a great English convoy. Death. Trafalgar, Battle of. Final act of a strategic combination, note. Tactics at. Effects of. Nelson's position at. Collingwood's action after Nelson's death. Trincomalee. In Ceylon, Dutch influence in. Passes into the hands of the English. Effect upon the contest in India, note, note. Strategic value of. Taken by Suffren. 
restored to Holland at peace of 1783. Two Sicilies, the acquired by Austria. Foundation of Bourbon Kingdom of Forced by British fleet to withdraw troops from Spanish army. United Provinces. See Holland. Vernon, British Admiral. Takes Porto Bello, is repulsed from Cartagena and Santiago de Cuba. Villeneuve, French Admiral, Trafalgar. Campaign, Note. At the Battle of the Nile. Suicide. Walpole, Sir Robert. Prime Minister of England. Peace Policy of Naval Demonstrations Struggle with the War Party in England Neutrality causes Austria to lose the two Sicilies Forced into war with Spain Accord with Fleury Confidence betrayed by Fleury Driven from office Death War, Second Punic Influence of sea power upon Wars American Revolution, 397. Anglo-Dutch, 2nd. Anglo-Dutch, 3rd, England in alliance with France. Austrian succession. France against Holland, Germany, and Spain, 1674-1678. Great Britain against Spain. League of Augsburg. Maritime War of 1778. Polish succession. Russia and Sweden. Seven years. Spanish succession, 1702-1713. Washington, George. At Pittsburgh and in Braddock's expedition. Opinion as to the line of the Hudson, note. Comments on Destang's cruise, note. Dispatches to de Grasse. Meeting with Rochambeau. Result of their deliberations. Marches from New York to Virginia. Opinions as to the influence of sea power on the American Revolution. William III. Naval policy of. Becomes ruler of Holland. General policy. Expedition to England. Becomes king of England. Difficulties of his position. Goes to Ireland. Wins the Battle of the Boyne. Dies.